tale well calculated to keep you in... Suspense. How powerful is the curse of Ram Carr? Listen now to The Green Idol, starring Parker Fennelly, and written especially for Suspense by Jack Bundy. Now, I, uh, I do not suggest that you try any strong-arm methods here in the city of Mecca, Mr. Hesher. <laughs> you might have cause to regret it. You see, some of these devils have the very bad habit of putting a curse on one that, that might have the most dire results. Oh. oh, I'm quite serious about it, really. My Harry Duck, I'm sure glad that you're along on this here tour to sort of steer us around. Oh, I'm enjoying it every bit as much as you are, Mr. Hesher, in spite of the fact that I've seen this country before. And I sure am glad you had that travel agency change a course for us, too. Good, good. Ain't you, Ethel? Please, Herbert, it's Arn, not ain't. Yeah, that's what I meant. But ain't you? Oh, Herbert. Yes, sir. Who would ever have thought that a couple of just plain country folks, like me and Ethel here, would ever end up halfway across the world here in Arabia? Right here in this holy city of... Uh, this, what did you say the name of this town is, Dr. Etherington? Uh, Mecca, Mr. Yeah, that's Hesher. it, that's it, mm-hmm. Mecca, right here in Mecca. And from what I see out there in the streets on the way over to this hotel, well, Ethel, this really ought to be the place for you to pick up all them souvenirs you want for the folks back home. Especially that one shop the doc here told us to look out for. Well, we'll see, Herbert. Oh, uh, well... Hamid, is that his name, Doc? Yes, yes, that's the name. But uh, uh, let me warn you, though, Mr. Hesher, some of these uh, shop owners drive a pretty hard bargain. Uh, don't let them uh, uh, take you, as you Americans say, uh, particularly Al Hamid, the Hindu. <laughs> take me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> take me, one of the best old horse traders ever lived. Now, don't start boasting, Herbert. Well, don't you worry, none, Doc. You see what I done to that crook that tried to jip me back there in Paris, France, didn't uh, you? Th- this is not Paris, Mr. Hesher, and, and some of these devils have the very bad habit of putting a curse on one that might have the most dire results. A curse? Yes. Oh, oh now, Dr. Everington, you're joking, of course. Of course he is. No, 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 Mrs. Oh. Hesher, I'm not, I'm not. I'm really quite serious about it. Oh, now, listen, Doc. You know as well as I do that all that kind of talk is just a lot of superstition. Well, I, too, felt that way uh, for a long time, but... But now, well, I'm not so certain. Ah, superstition, that's all it is. And me, I ain't superstitious. Are you sure? What? Well, isn't there a little superstition in all of us? Just a little? Oh, yes, I suppose there is, really. A little. No, no, of course there ain't. Foolishness, that's all. And don't you let the dark here scare you, Ethel. Now... When are we going to get out and look around the town? Right now, Doc? Well, this afternoon I must visit with an old school chum. I promised to look him up the moment we arrived and then have dinner with him. But uh, I shall see you here at the hotel this evening, shan't I? And then we can plan a tour of the city tomorrow. How's that? We'll be here, Doc. And probably all loaded down with souvenirs that I've picked up by out trading some of these natives. Well, I I hope you do very well. I'm sure we will, Doctor. But, uh, please. Yeah? Just... Remember my warning. Oh, sure, sure, sure. Oh, Herbert, I just love it. I just love this colorful, romantic old city. Yeah, it's mighty pretty, Ethel, in spite of all the dirt and noise and all. I tell you, I never see so many people wearing so many colors in all my born days. (laughs) It's exciting, too, and a little mysterious, all the crooked, narrow little streets and alleys, and the old mosques, especially that big one, the Great Mosque. Yes, yes. And look, look, Herbert, there's one of those, um, oh dear, those, um, well, let me look in the guidebook. Yes, here. It's called a um, a minaret. Mm -hmm. That's where the Muslim calls all the people to prayer or something. Too many beggars around here to shoot me. Get away, you... Go on, Al. Leave us alone. But I think they're very picturesque, even though they are awfully dirty. You know what tickled me, though? What? Seeing that camel train coming in at the other end there. I wonder how camels would do back in Maine. (laughs) Well, according to the guidebook... Most of those camels have come from a place called, um, Zida. Oh, is that so? Zida. Where is that? Oh, how should I know? <laughs> but that's what the book says. Hey, look, look. <gasps> look at that big square black thing over there in front of the great mosque. Why, yes. Looks like a great big kind of block of cement. Now, let me see. Um, 
Bird. Yeah. That's what they call the Kaaba. Kaaba, huh? Uh huh. Yes, it's it's a very holy shrine. Yeah. And what are they chasing each other all around it for? You see them? All them Arabs, I guess they are. Oh, that's one of their religious ceremonies. Oh, you're joking me. No, I'm not, Herbert. See what it says here? Those men are Muslims. Muslims? Yes. And when they come here to Mecca, they have to run around the Kaaba seven times and then kiss it, then go and drink out of a holy well. Ah, uh, be dug, huh? I'd sure like to see what would happen if somebody started running seven times around the church back home there <laughs> and kissing the side of it. Folks would think he'd been staying out in the sun too long. But look over there, Ethel. You see that dirty little man sitting there cross-legged on the ground, playing on that little flute or whatever it is, and that, look, the snake weaving around in front of him out of that basket. Oh, oh, that's awful. They call him a snake charmer. I see one of them in the circus once over to Bangor. Come on, let's go over and watch him. That's a horrible-looking snake. Ooh. Cobra. That's what they call it. That's a hooded cobra. I see a picture of it one time in a book. I don't care what they call it. I don't like it. He sure has got it charmed, all right. Look, see the way it sways back and forth while he plays to it back and forth. <laughs> oh, it makes me shudder. Herbert, let's go somewhere else. Tell fortune, Fendi. What? I tell you all the future in the magic sun. Oh, say, now that's an idea. How about it, Ethel? Want your fortune told? No. Let, let's go and see if we can't find that Al Hamid's curio shop the doctor told us about. No, no, come on. Let's get our fortune told. I don't like that horrid snake. It gives me the shiver. Well, I want mine told oh. anyway. Yes, you go right ahead, mister. Go ahead. Yes, side. Now, you want to look at the palm of my hand, or have you got tea leaves or something? No, side. I tell him the magic sand. Magic sand, eh? Yeah. <laughs> come on, Ethel. Come on. Get a load of it. Oh, darn. La, 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 la. What? La, la, oh, Wait a minute, wait a minute. Instead of singing it, just say it. Shows I can understand it, huh? Look now, Sahib. I stir the magic sand around. Please, the Herbert, round. I don't like this man. I don't like his dirty old snake. Just wait now. Arab Sidi. Now, I look in future. Yeah? In future, I see, I... <laughs> no... No. What? What are you talking about? Oh, no, I cannot tell you go away. Now, don't start pulling that stuff. You go away. Well, what about that fortune you was going to tell me? Uh, I will not tell you. Mekto! Mekto! Herbert, I don't like the way he's looking at us. It is best you do not know, Sai. Now, listen here, mister. Are you going to tell my fortune or ain't you? No, no, no. It's trouble. Much trouble. You must beware. What are you talking? Beware of what? Beware the fingers of death. Oh, Herbert, no. Herbert, I don't like this. Beware the fingers of death. Yeah? <laughs> what kind of fingers is that supposed to mean? I do not know, Saki. I only know I see them in the sand. You go now. Okay. Okay, mister. If that's your idea of a joke... Scaring all the tourists with a little mumbo jumbo. Herbert. Now, here you are. Here's a royal for your trouble. Come on now, Ethel. We'll look for that shop now. Do not forget, Effendi. I have warned you. I have warned you. Beware the fingers of death. Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> hey, pretty good act, huh? Herbert, he wasn't joking. Oh, come on now, Ethel. Just a lot of crazy nonsense for the tourist trade, that's all. Is it? That strange look in his eyes, the way he looked at me. Well, sure, that's just part of the act he was putting on. If only I could believe it. Well, of course you can. Now, just come along and forget all about it. No, I can't. I'm frightened, Herbert. I'm frightened. Son of a gun, Ethel, I swore. I... Never in all my born days. Herbert, please, don't say I swan anymore. Everybody will think you're just an old hick. Oh, well, I'm sorry. But what's the matter with being a hick? If I'm a successful one, huh? Took more than a couple of carloads of potatoes to pay for this nice trip to all these foreign countries, and I'm the man that raised them. So what if I am an old hick? Well, you know what I mean. Pretty smart one, too. <laughs> I married up with you, didn't I? Good looking? <laughs> That's because I was the smart one. Uh, Woman, how you do go no. on. <laughs> but like I say, I swear I never did see so much fancy junk laying around in one little store in all my life. 
No wonder Doc Arrington said to be sure and look in at this Al Hamid's place. I think it's just wonderful. Oh, all this lovely brass work and those lovely rugs and... Herbert, just look at this one, Herbert. A real genuine oriental rug. Yeah, yeah, I know, Ethel, but don't make like you like it too much or old Al Hamid here, he'll never leave us alone until we buy it. You see the way he keeps watching us out of the corner of his eye? Oh, pay no attention to him. I could just go wild buying things in a place like this. Yeah, well, you just better not now. But I still haven't found something that I can take back for the house. Oh, now wait. What? Look, dear. This quaint little green idol up here on the shelf. Oh, yeah, that's a mighty smart piece of carving, isn't it? You mean, isn't it? And see, it's carved out of some kind of solid stone. Now, isn't that interesting? Yeah. Silly looking face on it, though, like he's mad at something. I wonder why it's been stained this funny green color. Oh, don't ask me. Maybe it's one of them religious things. I want it, Herbert. It's so unusual and quaint, and, and look, the hair on it almost looks real. It does, huh? Well, doesn't it? Well, who ever heard of green hair? Woman, you are a cautious. But it's such fine carving, even to the toes and the long, slim fingers on it. Herbert, it's just exactly what I want. Well, if you ask me, it's kind of strange, eerie looking, if you really think about it. And I tell you this, too. What's that? Nobody else we know would ever have anything as interesting as unique to put on the mantelpiece. Well... All right. You want me to buy it for you? Oh, yes, please. If it isn't too expensive. Just leave that to me. Only take it off the shelf so I can look at it close. Sure. Yeah. Well? Yes. I do want it. Here he comes. Just you remember what Dr. Edmonton said about him. He has a wonderful collection, but he might almost knife you to drive a bargain his way. Now, don't you worry, Ethel. I'll make this crook think he's just amateur. Let's see now. First, I'll... Uh, stop! You must pull it back. What? You are infidels. You must not touch the idol with your hands. Oh, so it's an idol. Uh, well, that's what I thought. You see, Ethel... I beg of you, sir, before it is too late. You set it back upon the shelf. Now, just take it easy, Mr. Hamid. Take it easy. Well, give it to me. Give it to me. I said take it easy now. It just happens, me and my wife here, we're thinking of buying this little knick-knack from you. No, 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 no. So no. instead of raising all this cane, just calm down and tell me how much you want for it. Yeah? How much? No, no, it is not for sale, Sam. And for your own sake, you must put it back on the shelf. Put it back. Not for sale, huh? No. Well, then you just tell me why. What's all fired special about this, huh? It's not meant to be touched by infidel hands, Sam. Ben Herbert. It is a god. It is a what? It is the god Ramkar. And I warn you, it has many magic in it. Oh, many magic, huh? Yes, for son of Shiva can bring much good. Son of what? Shiva, Sam, Shiva. But for infidel, for non-believer, means only much bad, much trouble. Now, wait. Who is it you're kidding, mister? I have warned you. You must put it back before too late. Well, maybe I'd better hurt, but... Yes, yes, yes. No, sir, Ethel. Now, you look here, mister. If you think I believe in this hocus-pocus you're trying to hand me, you're all oh, wrong. Sir, listen to me. I beg of now, you. Now, you just listen to me. You had it up here on a shelf with the rest of this junk. You had it up on display. So that means you put it there to sell. And if your price ain't too high, why, we'll just buy it and we'll take it along. But I tell you, you must not have his magic, his trouble. Herbert. Now, don't give me that magic stuff. Is that all you people here in this town talk about? Well, you don't fool me and my wife one bit. Uh, how about ten royals for it? Is that enough? No. Okay, okay, you drive a hard bargain, Mr. L. Hammett, but here, yeah. here, yeah, I'll make it twenty. I have tell you, sir, but... Thirty, thirty. Is that what you want? No, no, no. I have tell you... I, I, All right, then, 40. But, Mr. Hammond, that is my last offer. No, no, no. 50? Not even for 100, Neal. You say 100? All right. All right, Mr. Hammond, you win, I guess. I win? Yeah. There's just no little green old idol in the whole world that's worth a hundred riles. Oh, thank you, sir. I'm so glad you finally agreed. But as long as that's the price, and Ethel here, she wants it, okay, it's sold. What? Me, uh, sir. Hundred riles. Eighty, ninety, a hundred. No, 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 no. You do not understand. So, Ethel, you just tuck that in your bag and we'll get out of here. No! Go ahead, Ethel. Well, all right, but... No, you must give it back to me. <laughs> hey, now, just a minute here. I take it, I take you it. You take your hands off my wife. Give it back to me. I said hands off her. Oh. oh, Herbert, you hit him too hard. You've hurt him. Yeah, well, served him right. Who's he think he is, anyway, laying his hands on my wife that way? Well, I know her, All on account you... of a couple of dollars worth of foreign money. And you do want that little idol, 
don't you, honey? Well, of course, dear. I love it, and I'm glad to have it. Just the same, it Herbert. It sure I... proves that Doc Etherington was right. You got to be tough with these fellas, laying his hands on you that way. I'm, I'm sure he didn't mean to hurt me, though. And look at him. All right, don't you worry your pretty little head about him. He'll be okay. Come on, we'll go on back to the hotel. Have some dinner and then sit around and talk with Doc Etherington when he gets in. Come on, Ethel, come on. See, he's okay now. Yes. What? Oh, Mr. Hammett, I'm so sorry. Curse of Ramkar. What's that? Curse of Ramkar be upon you. Yeah, well, the curse of Ramkar on you, too. Come on, Ethel. Yes, I, I think we'd better. Curse of Ramkar upon you. Omar dami panu briga. Ramkar dami briga. Oh, yeah. And the same to you. <laughs> Yeah. Well, kind of showed him, didn't we? Well, didn't we? Well, did we? We sure did. You really shouldn't have lost your temper that way. And Herbert. Herbert. What, what is the matter, Ethel? That curse he uttered. Oh, that. But do you think... Do you think maybe there might be something in it? Ethel. Come on, come on with you. Even Dr. Everington mentioned it. Mentioned such things. Don't you remember? He said we should be careful, too. Now you listen here to me, Ethel. There's nothing in them silly mumbo-jumbo things. There never was and there never will be. Okay? But how can you be sure? Because I am sure, that's all. But now what? I hope you're right. Well, I'm sorry you had trouble with that little Hindu shopkeeper, Al Hamid, but uh, then I, I, I did warn you to watch out for him, didn't I? Oh, well, Doc, it wasn't too bad. Only when he put his dukes on Ethel, I tell you, I... Really? Yes. Uh, hmm. Just didn't like my offer, I guess, on the little green idol she'd picked out. Uh, uh, little green idol? Yeah, carved out of a hunk of stone. About so big. Not much to look at, but Ethel, she wanted it, so I got it for her. She figures to take it home and put it up on the mantel. Uh, green? Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I, uh, I think I'd like to see it, Mr. Hesher. As a matter of fact, I think I'd better see it. Well, sure. I'll be glad to show it to you. I'd ask you up to the room to look at it right now, Doc. Only Ethel, she turned in kind of early. You know, all the excitement, all the walking around, you know. Yes, yes, of course. And uh, she feels all right? Sure, sure. Fine, fine. That's why I come down here to the bar for a couple of nightcaps, too. And in the hopes that you'd show up so as I could buy one for you, too. It's getting kind of late, Doc, but how about it? Well, thank you, thank you. But I've really had quite enough to drink with my friend Orloff. But, uh... May I see the idol in the morning? I don't know why not. Good, good. And now, if you don't want a nightcap, well, I think I'll go on up and hit the hay myself. Oh, by all means, by all means. Well, good night, Doc. Good night. <clears throat> Going up, sir? Right you are, Sonny. Your floor, sir? Third floor, Sonny. Number three. Yes, sir. Well... Mighty interesting little town you got here, you know that? <laughs> Thank you, sir. I'm glad you like it. Here we are. Third floor, please. Yeah. Good night, sir. Good night. See, now wait. Yes, sir? I don't know who's making that music this time of night out there, but... Music, sir? Yeah, but my wife, she had a headache after supper and she needs her sleep. That ain't what you call conducive, that kind of music. But, sir, I don't hear any music. Well, I do. So you find out where it's coming from and make them stop it, will you? Well, yes, sir. A little bit of that atmosphere stuff is all right, but when they keep it up all night... No! What? No! No! Ethel, is that you? I thought you'd be sound asleep. Ethel! What, what is the matter, Ethel? Ethel, why did you lock this door? Open it up. Ethel! Ethel! Okay, then. Ethel. Yes, she'll pull through all right, Mr. Hesher, but um, 
I've instructed the nurse she is not to be disturbed by anyone, not even by you. Okay, Doc. Thank the Lord she'll be all right again. Yes. Now, listen to me. In a brief moment of consciousness a few moments ago, she said that it was the green idol that choked her that way. She said that it came across the room to her, growing in size, growing as it approached her. Well, you, you don't believe that, do you, Doc? There were long finger marks upon her neck, and they were a green color, as though from a stain. Where is that idol? Well, that's the strange part of it. The idol is nowhere to be found. That Hindu, he put a curse onto us. He's the one that done it. But you, you yourself told me the door of her room was locked from the inside, and no man living could have scaled the wall to get in by the window. That Hindu, that Al Hamid. Come on, Doc. We're going calling on him. You know, Doc, you come on in with me. All right. But I still think we'd have done better had we consulted the authorities, Mr. Hesher. After all... Yeah, this... but I learned a long time ago. Doc. Good heavens. Someone's done him in. Yeah. Strangled him, Doc. His, his face, look, it's purple. Yes, but look, look here. The same long green finger marks on his neck. Now do you believe? It's the curse of the idol of Ramka. I threw it back at him, Doc. I didn't know. I didn't think it meant anything. Wait, else. wait. Here. Clasped in his hand. What? What is it, Doc? The killer, I suspect. The little green idol. Suspense. You have been listening to The Green Idol, starring Parker Fennelly, and written especially for Suspense by Jack Bundy. In a moment, a word about next week's story of suspense. Do you want your child to be fit as a fiddle? Then now is the time to make sure the school he attends has an efficient physical fitness program. Each school should test every pupil's physical abilities and note his progress. Special attention should be given to physically underdeveloped children. And all youngsters should be given at least 15 minutes a day of vigorous physical training. Find out if your child's school is adopting these ideas. Worked out by the President's Council on Youth Fitness. Suspense is produced and directed by Bruno Zerato Jr. Musical supervision by Ethel Huber. Featured in tonight's story were Abby Lewis as Ethel, Mercer McLeod as Dr. Etherington, Louis Van Ruten as Al Hamid, Guy Rep as the Fakir, and Ronnie Liss as the Elevator Boy. Listen again next week when we return with The Man in the Fog, written by Joseph Cochran. Another tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Get in the game with Phil Rizzuto's Sports Time Monday through Saturday on the CBS Radio Network. creaking door. This is your host to welcome you into the inner sanctum once again. Come in. Our little place may not be a mansion, but it has its advantages. For one thing, it's thoroughly scare conditioned. The scream pipes are always in good working order, and the rent's quite reasonable. We get a cut rate. <laughs> your warning. Whatever happens from now on, you asked for. Just be sure the family is provided for. Hmm. And now to our happy little anecdote for tonight. Bird song for a murderer. 
My name is Carl Warner. I'm not a young man any longer, but I don't mind that. I wasn't very happy when I was young. Now, well, at least I'm not unhappy. And late at night, after Elaine has gone upstairs to bed, uh, she's my wife, and she's very pretty and younger than I am, and perhaps I made a mistake in marrying her, but, well, anyway, late at night, I go into the room where I keep the birds, and then, listening to them sing, I get as close to happiness as I can expect. I stay an hour. And I cover their cages. And then they know it's time to sleep. And they sleep. Even on the stormiest of nights. And this was a stormy night. Someone knocked at the front door. It was late. We know very few people. We kept to ourselves, mostly Elaine and I, so... I was worried a little when I opened the door. Yes? Mind if I come in, Mr. Warner? It's kind of damp out. No, of course not. You... You seem to know me. I do, don't I? But I don't know you. My name is Brule. Chester Brule. Oh, uh, Chester Brule. I, I still don't know. Remember? Well, it doesn't matter. What? What did you want? Nice place you got here. Much nicer than Cragmount. Cragmount? Cragmount Asylum for the Insane. You... You work there? I used to work there. Oh, this is all very interesting. Funny but... thing happened just before I left. One of the inmates escaped. This baby was a homicidal maniac. Homicidal. Yeah, that's right. I don't see what all this has to do with me. I didn't say it had. There was one funny thing about this inmate. What's that? Loved canaries. Loved to listen to them sing. Psychiatrists at Cragmount found it very interesting. Bird song was the only thing that kept the murderous impulses down. I, I... Uh, uh, Mr. Warner, I'm out of work. <laughs> It's too bad. You're not doing badly. Nice house, furnishings. Didn't I hear canaries singing before I come into the house? Maybe. Maybe you did. So, uh, 5,000 in the morning? No. I think yes. Otherwise, Cragmount will be happy to hear from me. Eleven Crescent Place. Room 2B, in the morning. You can show me to the door now. Of course. Good night, Mr. Warner. Till we meet again. I watched him go out into the blackness, and the blackness swallow him. The birds were quiet. I thought for a moment of taking the covers off the cages and letting the birds sing, and then... Then I thought that tonight it might be better if I didn't let the birds sing. Okay, okay. Uh, who is... Couldn't wait till morning, huh? I didn't expect it. Wait. Wait, that knife. No. No. Ah. I shouldn't have let you. Surprise. Surprise. It's a bit of bad night. I couldn't have slept more than two or three hours. Fortunately, Elaine and I had separate rooms. And at breakfast the next morning, she was fresh and young and beautiful. Carl, uh, 
Why are you staring at me in that funny way? Oh, nothing. You, you really shouldn't read at meals. Oh, it's only the paper. So many exciting things happen. I can't wait till I get to them. Still. Oh, isn't that terrible? What is? A man was murdered last night. Not very far from here. Crescent Place. Crescent Place. Such an odd name. Chester Brule. Uh, God, your coffee cup. Sorry, I... I wish you wouldn't read the paper. It says that his canary... He had a canary car. Was singing when the landlady found the body. Oh, that's pathetic. Elaine, I told you not to read that paper. The Give it to me. I can't you're tearing the paper up. What's the matter? I, I, I'm nervous this morning. Don't remember you ever having been like this before. I told you I was nervous. Now look, darling. Why don't you go into the aviary? Listen to the birds for a while. You love them so, and they have such a nice effect on you. I went into the aviary, as she suggested, and I listened to the birds. But it was quite a little while before I stopped trembling. Carl? Yes, dear? Come into the kitchen. All right. I've been washing the breakfast dishes, darling, and found this among them. Carving knife. This isn't that funny. Besides, look at it. The blade's all covered with brown steel. I, I see. Sure, I washed it after dinner last night. Did you use it for anything? No, darling. Now give it to me and I'll wash it now. Oh, I can do it. I just wondered what... Oh, the door. Will no, you... No, you give me the knife. And you answer the door. I said you answer the door. All right. There's nothing to shout about. I don't know what's the matter with you this morning. I washed the knife. Quickly, but carefully. Very quickly, but very carefully. It didn't take long. The, the stains hadn't hardened much. The, the brown stains. Carl. Yes? Someone to see you. A man. What does he want? He didn't say, except that it was important. I'll go see him. But he said he's a lieutenant. A lieutenant Greg. From the police. There are 17 steps between the kitchen and our living room. I know because I counted them while I was walking to see Lieutenant Greg of the police. 17 steps. To make my face polite, relaxed, smiling. But would I be able to hide the trembling of my hands? Your Lieutenant Greg. My wife said you wanted to see me. Yes, that's right. Mr. Warner, did you know a man named Chester Brule? Chester Brule? Why, I, I can't say offhand. I've got such a bad memory for names. I may or I may not. Why? He's murdered last night. You see, we found your name and address in Brule's address book. I see. We thought you might be able to help us. Well, the fact that my name is in his address book doesn't mean... Prove that... anything? Well, of course not. Uh, would the fact that Brule used to be an attendant in an insane asylum mean anything to you? Why should it mean anything to me? Well, I didn't say it should, Mr. Warner. I just thought... Well, it doesn't. Well, I guess that's that. You know, funny thing... There was a bird cage in Brule's room with a canary in it, singing its head off. Huh? Well, lots of people are fond of canaries. Sure, sure. What was funny about it is that Brule's landlady swears Brule never had a bird. That... that is funny. Why, it looks, the killer knifed Brule and then left the cage and the bird in it behind him. Doesn't make any sense. Unless you figure that the guy who killed Brule was insane. The birds have been quiet, but the slam of the door may be started them off. And I knew that somehow I would have to get the cage and the bird in it out of Brule's room. I didn't know how I'd do it, but I'd do it no matter how insane it was. <laughs> dark when I got to Crescent Place. Dark on a lonely street. 
There was no one in front of the house, nothing to show that a man had died inside the night before with a knife in his throat. The door was open. There was a dim light in the vestibule, leaving the stairs beyond in, in darkness. I went up them to the second floor. There was no one in the corridor. The door of 2B opened and I went in. There was no light. The moon cast a pale glimmer over the room and someone in a chair near the window. For a moment I thought it was brew, but... but there was no blood. And then I realized it was a policeman in uniform, asleep. The cage was near the sleeping man. Would his sleep be sound enough? I reached out lifted the cage, reached the door, and closed it. I... I was safe. Hello? Yes? Oh, I'm so glad you're home. That Lieutenant Gregg is here again. Gregg? Where? In the bird room. Why did you take him to the bird room? He asked me to. All right. Oh, Lieutenant Gregg. Oh, hello, Mr. Warner. Quite a collection of canaries you've got here. Yes, I have. Uh, were you home all last night? Of course. This is still about Chester Bull's murder? Mm-hmm. Say, uh, remember my mentioning I thought that the man who'd killed Brule and left the birdcage behind him must be insane? Well, you, you did say something of the sort. Yeah, yeah. And then there's the fact that Brule used to work with insane people... Begins to mesh, huh? Oh, I know very little about police work. I hope I'm not boring you. Anyway, it occurs to me, maybe I'd better take a trip up to Cragmount. I suppose going to asylums or any place else is just part of your job. Oh, sure. Uh, <coughs> did uh, I mention Cragmount was an asylum? Why, well, uh, you, uh, well, you must have, I mean... Yeah, I yeah, well, I'll run up there and I wouldn't be surprised if I get all the answers. What do you think? I think I'm going to. Uh, uh, what is it, Elaine? Well, it's so late, I thought... Oh, I can take a hint, Mrs. Warner. Don't bother showing me to the door. He seems like a very nice man. He... God, stop it. What? That stare. <laughs> if I didn't know you so well, I'd, I'd say you were going mad. <laughs> Go to bed, Elaine. All right, darling. Oh, Carl, look. L look at what? Through the window, the garden. Lieutenant Gregg didn't go away. He's down there. Get away from that window. Go to bed. I'm not going. But he looks as if he's waiting down there for something. For what, Carl? I knew what he was waiting for. I knew I mustn't go to sleep. Things happen when you sleep. Terrible things. But I hadn't slept well the night before. Not well at all. And there'd be the strain of the day. And it was night now, and dark, and still. Gargan? Gargan? Be out! Oh. Oh. Uh, I, I was right. I was right, only it wasn't Gargan. 
Oh. Such a lovely morning, Carl. Lovely. I looked for Lieutenant Gregg as soon as I got up. He wasn't in the garden anymore. He must have got tired. Gone home. Or back to headquarters. Wherever policemen go. Oh, dear. That's the Swenson's dog. He's got into our garden again. I'll have to get him out. Elaine, don't. Don't you pick up all the flowers looking for both. Elaine. Maybe. Maybe he won't be there. And I'll be Elaine, where are you? Oh, under the tree. What? Yes. What? Look, Lieutenant Gregg. His throat. Come inside. Oh, all right. The kitchen. Carl, where are you going? The kitchen. What are you doing? The drawer. Silverware. Yes. It's here. The, the carving knife. That's right. Carl, I thought you washed it last night. I guess you didn't. You'd be wrong. I did wash it last night. But the stains are still there. The brown stains. These are fresh ones, Elaine. Get out of my way. But... I've got to go to the bird room. Carl, please don't go away from me. holding the carving knife in my hand. Started to put it down and then I... I held on to it anyway. It would take taking the covers off the cages awkward, but uh, I held on to it anyway. And the birds were still. They remained still unless I took the covers off. Elaine. Carl, you must tell me what's wrong. Don't. Don't come any closer. But... Elaine, please, not any closer. You, you've got that knife in your hand. Yes. The one with the brown stain. Oh, Carl. Shh, don't say anything. Carl, the night before last... Elaine, don't ask questions. That's dangerous. You were out of the no. house last night when Lieutenant Gregg was I was killed. asleep. You have the knife, Carl. Yes. Give it to me. No. Please, Carl. No, stay where you are. All right. You may keep the knife. Because, look, Carl. A revolver? Yes. Lieutenant Gregg's revolver. Elaine, give that to me. Oh, no. I took it from Lieutenant Gregg last night. After he stopped crying. They always cry when you... Elaine. Didn't like it the way you've been looking at me, Carl. You were thinking that maybe you'd have to send me back. To Craigmont. I wasn't. You were, Carl. I know you were. After Chester Brule died. Elaine. Stop where you are. All right, but... Keep your hands away from the birdcage. Don't pull off the cover. <laughs> oh. oh, Carl, I've hurt you. Uh, uh, never mind. But I didn't want to. Are you going to cry like the others? It was my fault loved you too well. Oh, I... I really killed those others. Not you, my darling. That's a very silly thing to say. And I'll become quite angry. I... I am quite angry! <laughs> Carl? You silly? You pulled the covers off the cage. Carl? Carl, I'm speaking to you. Those birds, I don't like them. I... Carl? Oh, poor Carl. He's dead. I loved him, and now he's dead. But anyway, he didn't cry. He didn't cry. And so sweet. The story of a couple of lovebirds who, instead of billing and cooing, went in for killing and shooting. 
Of course, it was all little Elaine's idea. All Carl did was cover up. Well, friends, it's time once again to close that creaking door. Until next week at the same time, when we'll be back with a little hunk of horror. <laughs> You'll be sure to listen, won't you? Until next week, then. Good night. Pleasant dreams. Marshall. For nearly a hundred years, the strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde has been thought of as a tale of horror, which of course it is, but it is also an intriguing mystery. For example, take the matter of Dr. Jekyll's curious will and the scene that took place one foggy London afternoon in the office of Jekyll's attorney, Jeffrey Utterson. No, Jekyll. I will not be a party to the making of such a will. You are my solicitor. Yes, and my friend. Now, if you will not do it as my lawyer, do it. I beg of you as my friend. Everything you possess to go to this Edward Hyde in the event of your death or... <laughs> or even your disappearance? Yes. Well, then you must tell me. I demand that you tell me. Who is Edward Hyde? Well, Jekyll, who is he? Utterson. I wish to heaven on you. Our mystery drama, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, was especially adapted from the classic by Robert Louis Stevenson for the Mystery Theater by George Lothar and stars Kevin McCarthy. Come with me now, back through the years to London, England, in 1896. It is late of a pleasant spring evening, and we find ourselves strolling in Cavendish Square, along with Geoffrey Utterson and his friend, Dr. Mortimer Lanyon. I must say I've enjoyed our walk, Utterson. We'll soon be at my place. Will you come in? Oh, thanks, Lanyon, but I think not... I've got a good deal of work to get through before I go to bed. <laughs> I needed a break, though, a breath of air, which is why I came for this walk with you. And... Good heavens. Mm -hmm. That man coming toward us. Oh, strange-looking fellow, isn't he? Oh, his face in the light of the street lamp. Is... That's the most evil face I've ever and he, he's coming straight at us. He, he's going to knock one of us down if we don't... Oh, I... oh. You fool, you knocked my friend down. You, hold on there. Hold on there, I say. Let go. No, Let go. not on your life. Let go. You not only knocked my friend down, you walked straight over him. Sorry. Let me go. Who are you? Are you crazy? Are you out of your mind? You walked on my friend as if as if he were part of the paper. I said I'm sorry. Now that's not enough. By no means enough. Who, who is this man? Lanyon, uh, are you all right? Uh, I'm not sure. You walked on me. Stomped right over me. Who the devil are you? I warn you, the two of you. Uh, let me go. Oh, just... Let me go. Uh, I say or I'll kill you both. Look out. He's bringing that heavy walking stick and he... Kill you both. Oh, no, don't. Uh, uh, you struck me. No one strikes Edward Hyde and lives. No. He'll kill us both with that walking stick. Run at us and run. Come back. Come back here and I'll kill you. Stop. Stop. I can't go on. My my heart. Oh, my it. It's, it's pounding like a trip hammer. Oh, good Lord, Hutchison. I've never had such an experience of this kind in my life. Are you all right? 
You took a blow from that walking stick. And... Hardison, what is it? The name. The name he used. Did you hear it? Yes, but... Oh, what was it? Oh, I think I know, but I want to be sure. Hyde, he said, Edward Hyde. That's what I thought. Well, what of it? Well, the way you looked at... Do you know the man? Does the n n man mean something to you? No, 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 no. I don't know the man. But the name. Oh, yes, the name means something to me. What? Well, what? I... And I'm not sure I can tell you, Lanyon. I... I'm not sure I have the right as a lawyer to do so. On the other hand, I... Yes? Well, you are my oldest friend, and... Your daughter Beatrice is engaged to Dr. Jekyll, isn't she? Yes, yes, they're to be married in September. Then, and perhaps I should tell you that... No, no, it would serve no purpose. Why, Mr. Utterson? Oh, good good evening, Poole. I, I know it's late, but is uh, Dr. Jekyll's home? Oh, to you, sir, at any hour, I'm sure. Um, come in, sir. The doctor is at work in his laboratory. If you'll wait here a moment, sir. Oh, yes, thank you, Poole. Excuse me, Dr. Jekyll. What? Damn it, Poole, I told you I was not to be disturbed. Well, I, I know, sir, but... But... But what? Mr. Utterson is calling, sir. Utterson? At this hour? Well, oh, all right. Show him in. Uh, this way, Mr. Utterson, please. I get oh. Well, Utterson, this is a late hour visit. Jekyll, I'll come straight to the point. Dr. Lanyon and I were out walking in Cavendish Square less than an hour ago when we noticed a strange man, a, a sort of, mm -hmm. I don't know, dwarf-like creature with, with, I assure you, a face that, well, it was so vile, so evil, it brought the sweat out on my brow. Well, well. Well, he, this, this man, he, mm -hmm. he walked straight into Lanyon, knocked him down, and then walked right over him. I ran after him, an argument ensued, and then, mm -hmm. well, he threatened to kill both Lanyon and me with his walking stick. He went into a rage I can only describe as bestial, swinging the walking stick at us, and, and, and what? Well, I don't think he meant to give his name. In fact, he refused to give it when I asked for it. But in his rage, he forgot himself, and he used his name. Edward Hyde. What of that? Six months ago, you insisted that I destroy your old will and make out a new one. Leaving everything to a certain Edward Hyde, right? Oh, oh, oh I see. Now, I told you then, as I tell you now, I considered the terms of the will most curious. Indeed, decidedly strange. And as I told you then, and I tell you now, I see nothing strange in wanting to leave my money to a certain beneficiary in the event of my death. Or your disappearance. That's what I find strange. That's what worries me. Even more now in the light of what happened tonight. Jekyll, I ask you once again, who is Edward Hyde? Do you mean the Edward Hyde I've bequeathed my estate to, or the Edward Hyde you ran into tonight? They are one and the same. And there's certainly more than one Edward Hyde in all of London. Oh, yes, I'm quite sure but only one Edward Hyde who might have been carrying this. My walking stick? The walking stick I gave you several years ago on your birthday. I'd know it anywhere. Hmm. Jekyll, are you in trouble? Huh? What do you mean, trouble? What about this Hyde? Does he, does he have something on you? Is he, is he blackmailing you? That's a ridiculous thought. Then what is it? How can you, Dr. Henry Jekyll, one of the most honorable and respected physicians in London, have any association whatever with a with a, a terrible person like this Hyde? 
Why have you made over your estate to him, especially when you are to marry Beatrice Lanyon? And why, why, why that stipulation in the event of your disappearance? Jekyll, I beg you, tell me what it means. I cannot. Uh, I cannot. But as your Dear friend, I... You are the friend you say you are. Oh, and you are, Utterson. You are. And then do me the favor of never mentioning Edward Hyde again. Well, if this is your last word on the subject, Jekyll... It is. Very well, then. Good night. Oh, Paul. Yes, Mr. Utterson, sir. I'd, um... I'd like to ask you something. Oh, anything, sir. Who is Edward Hyde? Oh, God help me, sir. I wish I knew. We all of us in this house, everyone of Dr. Jekyll's servants, wish we knew. All right, tell me about him, this Hyde. Dr. Jekyll was away on, on a house call, I think. The front door bell rang and I answered it and... And there stood the... Oh, a frightful creature, Mr. Utterson, frightful. I've met Mr. Hyde. I know... He said he wanted to see Dr. Jekyll. I started to say that Dr. Jekyll was not at home, but he pushed right past me in the rudest way, sir, and went straight into Dr. Jekyll's laboratory. Yes, yes, I quite understand. Go on. Well, it... Later on, I, I was in the kitchen when the bell rang from the laboratory. I went into the laboratory and there, to my complete surprise, was Dr. Jekyll. To your surprise? Why, yes. You see, sir, he'd forgotten his keys and I was so surprised that he'd somehow got back into the house. Well, well did, did you ask him how? Oh, I did, sir, yes. But he ignored the question. Never mind that, he said. I, I want to give you certain instructions concerning Mr. Edward Hyde. He then said that Mr. Hyde was to be admitted any time he called. See. Tell me, Paul, what is Mr. Hyde's manner toward Dr. Jekyll? I mean, when they're together, how does Mr. Hyde act toward Dr. Jekyll? Or... Dr. Jekyll toward this Mr. Hyde. Well, they're never together, sir. That's puzzling, very puzzling, to say the least. Oh, Mr. Utterson, sir. All of us here are convinced that our master is in dire trouble. If you could help the good doctor... Yes, Paul. Yes, I certainly shall. If I can. <laughs> no idea you'd come into the music room. How long have you been there? Only a few moments. When you become Mrs. Henry Jekyll, I shall insist that you play for me every night after dinner. It shall be my wifely pleasure <laughs> and duty, <laughs> kind sir. <laughs> Henry, uh, yeah. I'm sorry, but oh, Beatrice, I want you so. And I want you, but but until we're married, Henry, oh, I... Must we wait until September? It's such a long time. Oh, Father. Oh, uh, Sorry, I didn't know you were here, Henry. How are you? How are you, Dr. Lanyon? Utterson tells me you had a rather bad experience yeah. tonight. Yes, yes, but I'm quite recovered, thank mm -hmm. you. Still a few bruises where that fearsome creature stomped on me, but <laughs> otherwise all right. Um, there's something I've been meaning to ask you, Henry. Yes? Ah, uh, but later... I don't want to interrupt you two lovebirds. Oh, Father. <laughs> well, I shall be in my study. Drop in before you go. Of course. Well, now, Henry. Where were we? Oh, yes. Mm. The wedding. No, now, look, dearest. We can't possibly change the date now. Mm, what if I insist? I don't think I understand. I say, what if I insist? But, Henry, you... You wouldn't. It would be so unlike you. It is so unlike you even to be talking this way. You've always gone along with my wish. I have wishes, too. And rights, Beatrice, I have rights. Well, really, Henry, really, you... You have no rights, as you say, until we marry. Mm -hmm. It troubles me you should even say such a thing. 
in fact, Henry... Uh... Yes? In fact, what? Henry, I've been meaning to talk to you about this, and I keep putting it off because I... Well, I... I feel a bit awkward, but... Well, to be honest with mm. you, my darling, you're not the same man that I became engaged to. Now, that's a silly remark. Well, the way you've acted the last few times we've been together, there's something different about you, Henry. I don't know what it is. I can't put my finger on it, but you, you've changed somehow mm. in some subtle way. Changed. Huh? Why, even your face. What about my face? Well, Henry, you don't have to smile. What about it? My face. You're hurting me, Henry. Please don't... Uh, really? Sorry. <sighs> sorry isn't enough. More and more you keep manhandling me, and then you say you're sorry. What's come over you? What changed you in the past few weeks? What did you mean about my face? Oh, darling. Oh, it's only that... I suppose you're working too hard or something of the sort, but there are lines in your face that I've never seen before. Lines of mm. tiredness, I guess. Yes, yes, that, that would be it. Shadows under your eyes. Mm. Why, even now they look darker, deeper. Oh, my darling, I, I didn't notice before, but I do now. I think that you neglected to shave today. I, I must go. Go. You've mm. only been here mm. a few minutes. A months. patient, patient. Remember, patient. Promise oh. to visit. I'll drop in again tomorrow. Oh, was that Henry who just left? Yes, Father. But he said he'd drop by the study to see me before he went. Yes, I... I know he did, but... Well, Beatrice, what's happened? I don't know. For a moment, I'd have sworn that... Henry was changing before my eyes. A tale of horror, yes, but also, as I said, a mystery. At least it was to Mr. Utterson, Dr. Langan, and his lovely daughter, Beatrice. A mystery that was to turn to tragic horror before they learned the truth about Dr. Henry Jekyll. I shall return shortly with Act Two. goes without saying that to tamper with natural law will lead to an unnatural end. Mr. Utterson, Dr. Lanyon, Poole, and the servants in Dr. Jekyll's household have begun to suspect that Jekyll is hiding some awful secret from them. A secret that involves a man known as Edward Hyde. Even Beatrice Lanyon, Dr. Jekyll's fiancée, has begun to wonder at the change she senses in him. It may even be that the London police are beginning to wonder. Come in. Inspector Wolf of Scotland Yard to see you, Dr. Jekyll. Oh? Uh, show him in, Poole. Yes. Uh, this way, Inspector. Oh, thank you. Dr. Jekyll? Yes? Leave us, Poole. Inspector Wolf of Scotland Yard, is it? Yes. Mm -hmm. Please take a chair, Inspector. Well, thank you. Well, now, Inspector... What can I do for you? Hey, well, I'm not sure you can do anything at all, Doctor, but, um... Are you aware that in the past six weeks there's been a rash of murders in London? Extremely mm -hmm. brutal murders, Doctor. Mm -hmm. Each victim has been bludgeoned to death. Why do you come to me? Well, on more than one occasion, the murderer has been seen while committing these terrible attacks of violence. Not clearly seen, since the murderers have always been done at night and in, in dark streets, you know. Mm -hmm. But there have been glimpses of them, and putting them together, the Yard has come up with what you might call a, a composite picture of the man. I still don't see. I just don't understand why you've come to me about this. Well, you will in a moment, Doctor. The man, the murderer, appears to be a short, malformed, dwarfish creature who, even though his face has never been clearly seen, gives a strong impression of, of, of evil. Doctor... A particularly brutal murder took place last night in Montague Street. Dr. Danvers Carew was bludgeoned to death. Carew? 
Member of Parliament? Aye, the same. He was beaten to death with a walking stick. And the murderer was the dwarf-like creature that I mentioned. Mm -hmm. The person who saw the murder take place followed the murderer afterwards, do you see? Keeping at a safe distance, you may be sure. Mm -hmm. And, well, that's why I'm here. Why precisely? The murderer was seen to enter this house. Oh, oh. You must be... Well, I was about to say you must be joking. But, of course, you're serious. You, uh... You don't happen to be acquainted with a Mr. Hyde, do you? A Mr. Edward Hyde? Uh, well, yes, yes. But he's not an occupant of this house. Uh, he doesn't live here? No. Does he visit? Well, on occasion, on occasion, yes. But I, uh, I haven't seen him now in, uh, oh, months, I should say. Uh-huh. Hmm? Friend of yours, is he? No, no, no. Patient, patient. He suffers from a nervous disorder. Comes to see me whenever he's in need of medication. We'll thank you for your time. Oh, good day. Good day, Inspector. Damn. Sorry to have kept you waiting, fool. Oh, not at all, Mr. Utterson. What can I do for you? Mr. Utterson, I'm worried, fearfully worried, about Dr. Jekyll. Oh? You remember, sir, we were talking a long time back, near two months, I should think, about Mr. Hyde. And you asked me if I'd ever seen Dr. Jekyll and him, Hyde, together. Yes, there's something like that, yes, and you said you never had. Well, they are together now, sir. Not that they mightn't have been together before, but I, I know for certain that they are now. There are fights... Yes, fights going on in that laboratory between the doctor and, oh, that terrible man, Mr. Hyde. Oh, his fight? No, 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 sir. Arguments. I hear Dr. Jekyll moan and groan and cry out, no, no, leave me be, leave me be. Oh, Mr. Utterson, sir, I, I'm so afraid for Dr. Jekyll, so afraid. Yes, well, you're saying that comes as no surprise, Pooh. The truth is, I've known he was in some kind of trouble since he... Well, since he changed his will months ago in favor of Edward Hyde. In favor of Edward Hyde? Oh, yes. He's left him everything in the event of his death. But most puzzling, in the event of his disappearance as well. Oh, sir, sir, I don't understand it. Nor do I. And to be honest with you, I've... I've given up trying to understand it. Then I must do what must be done. What do you mean? For the first time in my life, Mr. Utterson, I shall disobey Dr. Jekyll's orders. For his sake, I shall see to it that Mr. Hyde never enters Dr. Jekyll's house again. <laughs> You hear me, Paul? Let me in! Never, Mr. Hyde! Never! Go away and stay away! Damn you! You stole my key, so it was you. It must have been you, and now you bar me from the house. And you'll stay barred as long as I'm here! Fool! I warn you. All the way! Uh, you'll not enter this house! Ah, uh, you... you... Fool! Fool! Listen to me, Poole. I'm ashamed. I'm in trouble, Poole. I need Dr. Jekyll's help. He's not at home. Let me come in and wait for him, Poole. I am in desperate trouble. Then stay in it and be damned to you. Father, what is it? I've never seen you so upset. Well, read this. My dear Dr. Lanyon, as you value my friendship and my life, Please go to this very night to my house. Father, this is a note from Henry. What yes. Ned, you needn't read any further. He asks me, begs me, to go to his home, enter his laboratory, and procure certain chemicals and powders, giving very explicit directions as to where I should find them. When the message was delivered an hour or so ago, I have just returned from following Henry's instructions. 
As you see, the message directs that I am to give these materials to whoever calls for them. But what does it all mean? Well, you are Henry's fiance. You are close to him, closer than anyone else. Is obviously in some sort of difficulty. And if you know what it is, I charge you for his sake as well as your own. Tell me what it is. But if I knew, I'd tell you. I... But yes, he is in grave difficulty. But whatever it may be, he keeps to himself. And what would it have to do with chemicals and powders and elixirs? Oh, Father, I don't know. No. Lamb has retired. I'll answer the door. Oh, you retire as well, my dear. No, Father, I want to stand... Do as I say, my child. Go to your room. I have a feeling that I'd best tend to this alone. I'll go now. Very well, Father. How damnably long does it take you to answer the door? Let me in. Let me in quickly. You took your own sweet time, man. I... Where are the materials you were told to get? In my study. Come. Let us get them. Come, come, come. Where are they? Where are they? Right there on my desk. Oh, yes, you did well. Uh, all seems to be here. Believe me. You misunderstood. I didn't say shut the door. I said leave me. I didn't misunderstand, Mr. Hyde. You know me. From the newspaper reports of your murders and the general description of you, all, all of London knows you now, I should think. Believe me, go out and close the door and don't return until I'm gone. Not until you tell me what connection you have with my friend and my daughter's betrothed, Dr. Henry Jekyll. I tell you, if you value your sanity, leave me. I will know the answer to who you are and what connection you have with Jekyll, or you will not leave this room. Fool, Hyde. You fool. The police are hot on my trail. I killed the man. No, so I'm not surprised. I went to Jekyll's house, but his blithering servant refused to let me in. That's why I sent that message to you. You? Well, it was signed by Dr. Jekyll. You don't understand. And I intend to understand, or you will not leave this room, this house. Ah! Back off, back off, I say. Yes, as you see, I'm prepared for you. This gun is loaded, Mr. Hyde, and I shall use it if need be. You leave me no choice if the police find me here. Well, they will not find me. The potion is quickly prepared. The potion? Once again, leave me. No! Then damn you, witness what you shall witness. You're as big a fool as Jekyll. You're given the chance to leave well enough alone, but no. You must know the answer. Well, you shall know it. Your friend Dr. Jekyll had a theory. A theory he talked about so endlessly, so compulsively, that he bored everyone within the sound of his voice. You know the theory, do you not? Yes, I was one of the bored listeners. Yes, I know. Mm. But each of us contains within himself not one spirit, but two. A good spirit, an evil spirit. What else? There was more. Jekyll also believed that a way might be found, yes, via a potion that would release that other spirit, the evil side of us, the side we all try to keep under control. Exactly, and you all laughed, you... The mercury! Where's the mercury? You didn't break... You did, yes, yes. There, here it is. Thank God. Yes, yes, you all laughed. You said it couldn't be done. And even if it could be done, you all said it would be madness to try it. You were right in one respect. It was indeed madness. You, if I follow you, you are saying that Jekyll, that Jekyll carried out the experiment? He did. And it was successful? Successful? For me, yes, for me. For him, tragic. Well, you see, Dr. Lanyon, I am in control now, whereas before Dr. Jekyll controlled me, I now control Dr. Jekyll. What? In God's name, are you saying? You shall see. Yes, in a moment. You shall see. There. Potion is ready. Before I drink it, I offer you one more chance to leave. No. Well, in that case, Lanyon, God help you. Oh, you... Oh, you... 
bank that. Why do you think I mixed it? But it contained mercury, quicksilver, and other. Mr. Hyde, what? Oh, oh, my God, what's happening? You're changing before my eyes. You're getting taller. The hair and uh, head changing color. Uh, Good Lord. What are you uh, going through? You're, you're becoming a different man. Uh, a different being. Uh, help and help you. Uh, you uh, you've uh, become, uh, before my eyes, you've become Henry Chickle. Yes. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, and just in time, the police heard your door, Dr. Lanyon. Let them in. I have nothing to fear for the moment. And so, before the shocked eyes of Dr. Lanyon, Dr. Jekyll's secret is revealed. Edward Hyde and Dr. Jekyll are one and the same man. Questions arise. What did Hyde mean by saying he is now in control of Jekyll? What did Jekyll mean when he said he has nothing to fear for the moment? We shall see when I return shortly with Act Three. The Scotland Yard Police, in pursuit of the murderous Mr. Hyde, arrive at Dr. Lanyon's house in Cavendish Square, just as Hyde is transformed into the noted and respected physician, Dr. Jekyll. Now, as the police urgently ring the bell of the front door... Dr. Lanyon, you must answer the door. I... I can't get up from this chair, Jekyll. My, my heart, I feel weak, faint. And then I suppose I must let them in. Beatrice, how long have you been outside this door? Long enough, Henry. You... no. Oh, heaven help you, Henry. Yes, I know. That's the police at the door. You'll not give me away. Dr. Jekyll. Inspector Wolf, isn't it? Yes, but what... Uh, one moment. Sergeant, face your men so every entrance and exit is guarded. Now, uh, if I may come in, Dr. Jekyll. Certainly. My dear... This is Inspector Wolf of Scotland Yard. My fiancée, Miss Beatrice Lanyon, Inspector. How do you do? Oh, no, a thousand apologies, ma'am, but we're looking for a murderer. A certain Edward Hyde. And what makes you think you'll find him here? A description of him was given to every handsome cab driver in London. One of them saw him enter this house little more than half an hour ago and notified the yard. Well, you've obviously made a mistake. This is the home of Dr. Lanyon. I am his daughter. We are not acquainted with anyone named Hyde. Uh, uh, I beg your pardon, Dr. Jekyll. You said something? No. 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 Miss Lanyon, I should like your permission to search the premises. Well, I'm afraid that's impossible. Oh, Inspector. I don't think you quite understand. If our information is correct, Edward Hyde is in this house, and he's a dangerous man, Miss Lanyon. A murderer. I'm sorry. No. Good night, Inspector. Inspector, I said good night. Is your father at home? Yes. Then I must ask to see him. If you will not give us permission to search the house, perhaps he will. I'm sorry, Inspector, but my I father... I insist, madam. Inspector, there is no Edward Hyde in this house any more than there was an Edward Hyde in mine when you called there. Mm. Very well. I won't pursue this matter further tonight, Miss Lanyon. But Dr. Jekyll... I think we should have another talk, you and I, about your Mr. Hyde. He's not my Mr. Hyde, Inspector. He's a patient I haven't seen in a long time. Should he pay me another professional visit, I shall certainly notify you. And now, sir, good night. Good night. Henry. Uh, oh, Henry, what terrible thing have you done? My darling. Oh, my dearest, I... I'm trapped by my own folly. Your father warned me a long time ago to give up my experiments. If only I had heeded his advice. Well, heed it now. Yeah, it's impossible. It's too late. Why too late? I've lost control over Hyde. He controls me. 
Over these past months, he's grown stronger and I weaker. I never know how or when the transformation... Oh, horrible transformation will take place. Heaven help me, Beatrice. I have become Hyde's slave. But it's not too late. We can't let it be. Father could help you, Henry. I'm sure he can. Come, come. We'll ask his advice. He'll know what to do. Perhaps you're right. Yes. Let's... Let's see what he has to say. Father... The police have gone, and Henry's in fearful trouble, as you know, and he wants to... Father? Dr. Lanyon. Father, what is it? Why do you just sit there staring? Oh, my God. Oh, Henry. Yes. He's dead. (laughs) What he saw tonight was too much for his weak heart. Edward Hyde murdered him. (laughs) Heaven forgive me. I murdered him. Jekyll, we can leave now, I think. No, I I would like to stay a little longer, Mr. Utterson. No, child, they'll start to fill in the grave shortly. There's no need to put yourself through that. Come along now, I insist. Oh, very well. (coughs) Beatrice, if you would care to dismiss your carriage and let me take you home in mine. Oh, thank you, Mr. Utterson, but I... I'd like to be alone. You you understand. Yes, of course. I'll go with Beatrice. Oh, no, thank you, Henry. No, I, I really do wish to be by myself for a time. I... I see. I'll call on you then tomorrow. If I am able... Uh, no, uh, I, I shall be busy tomorrow. There's so much to do winding up Father's affairs. Perhaps if I'll I... I'll get in touch with I... you, Henry. Uh, good day. Uh, good day, Mr. Utterson. Good day, Beatrice. Jekyll, uh, join me in my carriage. I I want to talk to you. My own carriage is waiting. Send it along. I must talk with you. As you wish. You may go along, Johnson. I'm riding with Mr. Utterson. After you, Jekyll. Well, what is it? I, uh... I want to talk to you about your will. Oh, what now, Utterson? Oh, need to ask. You read the newspapers. You know this man, Edward Hyde, is a monster, a murderer sought by the police. God knows what your connection with him may be, what hold he has on you. And, and you needn't say he hasn't. He, he must have. Why else would a man of your reputation, a celebrated and respected physician, leave all his worldly possessions to such a, a, a human horror? They're my possessions. I have the right to do with them as I wish. And I, the right as your solicitor, to refuse to let you do You can't stop me. Well, perhaps I can. How? In what way? I'm not sure. I'll have to seek advice on this. But it may very well be, Jekyll, on grounds of protecting you from yourself that I can have you declared incompetent to handle your affairs. Incompetent? I incompetent? How dare you say such a thing to me? How dare you even think such a thing? Jack, let go of my arm. My my will is my will. Edward Hyde is to inherit everything, everything in the event of my death or my disappearance. What is the matter with you? Take your hand off. Good Lord, your your hand. Jack, you your hand. It's it's covered Uh, with long hair. uh, the fingernails are becoming... Hey, you claws. meddling little pips, me. face, it's changing. Of course it's changing, you interfering muddlehead. Drew me out of my inheritance, would you? Prevent me from inheriting you. Jekyll's wealth? You! Uh, you! Oh, my uh, God! You're Hyde! Yes. You are Edward Hyde! Yes, Edward Hyde. Edward Hyde. Murderer. Murderer. Edward Hyde. Monster, according to you. Yes, but how, how, how could he? Uh, no, 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 you're, you're, you're die. strangling me. You're, no. Die. Uh, die, 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 die. Henry, Henry, it's, it's Beatrice, let me in. Henry, oh, do you hear me? Open this door. No, Henry, no, I've come to help you. No. Let me in. Oh, Beatrice. 
Oh, Henry. It's the end. Where? It's the end, Beatrice. The end. The potion doesn't work anymore. It's useless. Hyde takes over whenever he pleases. Oh, dear Lord. Mm. There must be something we can... What is this gun? I meant to take my life and this horror once and for all. But he won't let me. I have only to pick up the gun and he returns. I no longer have any will of my own. He possesses me, owns me, like a demon. Ah, ah. What is it? Oh, get out of here, Beatrice. Leave me at once. You're, you're uh, changing. You're becoming high. <coughs> Luna, let go of me. Let me. go of you <coughs> when I've wanted you. <coughs> Man for you. Lusted for you, my lovely creature, all these months, huh? Don't, don't kiss me, please. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Kiss you and fondle you and caress you and... Uh, yeah. You're stronger than I thought. My, my beautiful Beatrice. Good, good, very good. That makes the support worth what? Stay away. Come to me. From you. Stay away from you who were made for love. Would you deny a man a pleasure? Ah! I'd say you're very, very quick. Strong, too. Strong and quick. And desirable. Stop trying to elude me. You can't. You know, you can't. You are strong, but I am stronger. You are quick, but I am quicker. And oh, you are a beauty. Ah, ah. And I a beast, eh? <laughs> Beauty and the beast, eh? Beauty and the beast. Put that down. No. Huh? You could stop Henry Jekyll from using this gun. But you can't stop me. Get away from that door. Let me out of here. Oh, no. Stay back or I'll shoot. <laughs> Go ahead, shoot. I didn't think you could. It isn't in you to kill. Even such a thing as me. No. No. Oh, dear uh -huh. God, help me. Just give me the gun, my dear, and then once you're in my arm... No! No! Ah, don't struggle. Please. It'll do you no good. Oh, give me the gun. Give me... Ah. Miss Lanyon! Oh, good heavens! Miss Lanyon! Miss Lanyon! The gun went off and killed Mr. Hyde. Hyde? But on the floor, that's Dr. Jekyll. What? See for yourself. Oh, yes. I see. But if the gun killed Mr. Hyde, how? Don't ask any questions now, Poole. Not now. Just go and fetch the police. As a baffled and distraught pool rushes out into the storm to find a policeman, Beatrice Lanyon gazes down at the body of Dr. Henry Jekyll. Or is it Edward Hyde? I'll be back shortly. like to know that the adaptation of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde I've just brought you comes closer to Stevenson's original than any other I know. I think you'll agree it was as much a mystery as a tale of horror. Our cast included Kevin McCarthy, Marion Seldes, Ian Martin, and Court Benson. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.
Autolite and its 98,000 dealers bring you Mr. Herbert Marshall in tonight's presentation of Suspense. Tonight, Autolite presents a story based on fact and written by a master of suspense, an adaptation of the 19th century Bourne murder case called The Dead Alive. The author, Wilkie Collins. Our star, Mr. Herbert Marshall. Hey, Wilcox, how you hitting them, kiddo? Hello, Stan. How's our bouncing, bantam, and brainy baseball manager? Feeling like a home run, Harlow. Purring along like a set of those auto light spark plugs of yours. Yeah, couldn't understand you better, Stan. Those ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs are designed for the smoothest and most economical performance money can buy. Wouldn't use any other hollow. They're real major league. Thank you, Stan. Friends, if your car isn't giving you the performance it should, why not have your spark plugs checked by your nearest Autolite spark plug dealer? He's equipped to give you expert cleaning and adjustment. And if those spark plugs are worn or need replacing, he'll install a set of famous ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs, either standard or resistor type. To quickly locate your Autolite spark plug dealer, phone Western Union by number and ask for operator 25. And remember, from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite presents The Dead Alive, starring Mr. Herbert Marshall, hoping once again to keep you in suspense. How did the doctor put it to me back there in London? Your disease, Mr. Lefranc, is overwork. Your cure is rest. Your alternative is death. Nice choice of words there, but not to be ignored. For any excitement stirred sudden unbearable pains in my head. The trip was restful, though the prospect of visiting a country just five years beyond a civil war was a little disturbing. The long-standing invitation of my mother's distant relative appeared to hold a promise of friendship and hospitality. The very thing for a nerve-ridden English barrister. I boarded a railroad car at Boston, which deposited me at Morwick Station. The countryside viewed from the station was as flat, as monotonous as any that the earth can show. If to be cured meant, in my case, to be dull, I picked the very place for the purpose. Mr. Philip Lefranc. Oh, 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 yes, of course. You must be Cousin Silas. That's right. I didn't mean to startle you. No. I was fascinated by this uh, very interesting countryside of yours. <laughs> Let's start off on an honest footing. This view is uninspired, Philip. But it's good farmland. That's most important. Is this your luggage? No, just these bags. Here, I'll take the big one. That's all right. You carry the two small bags. Oh, but your, your hand... That bandage, it must be painful. It's just a scratch. He couldn't hurt me. <laughs> uh, the carriage is this way. Our ride to Meadowcroft Farm passed for the most part in silence. And silence seemed most appropriate as we drove through a grove of stunted, twisted trees. On the road ahead, a short, wiry little man walked towards the house. He glanced over his shoulder, then casually angled to let us pass. But something went wrong with our horse, for he swerved towards the man. Watch out! Hey! You nearly killed that man. Next time he'll move out of the way faster. But you led the horse directly at him. No matter. That man was John Jago, my overseer. Not a very nice man, Philip. Not nice at all. Then why do you keep him? Unfortunately, father left a controlling interest in this estate to my sister. And Letty feels that Jago can run things better than I can. That's still no reason. You might have killed the man. In which case, I would have given him the sort of burial I'd give my dog. Not my favorite dog, mind you. A gray house, like a huge toad, squatted massively at the end of the road. Three barking hounds chased our carriage up to the front porch. My cousin sent them scampering as we dismounted. A melancholy, middle-aged woman without visible attraction of any sort waited for us in the hallway. Cousin Philip, I trust the Lord sent you an easy voyage. A delightful voyage, Cousin Letty. It's very good of you to have me. 
thank my father, rest his soul. We shall do our best to honor the invitation he extended to your branch of the family. Silas, did you pass Mr. Jago on your way up? Yes, I passed him. You might have been good enough to offer him a lift. <laughs> I did, after a fashion. This way, Philip. I'll show it to you to, to your room. Supper is at eight, Cousin Philip. We start exactly on the hour. Silas left me in a clean, almost sterile room. To pass the time, I made a game of searching for some dust. It was depressing not to find any. I paced, I worried, read, and generally tried to keep the gloom of the house from sinking into my bones. It was useless. By eight o'clock, I was morosely trying to decide whether to go down to dinner or to repack and leave. My stomach made the decision for me. I walked out of my room and into the loveliest creature I had ever seen. Oh! I'm sorry. Oh, no, my fault. I shouldn't run down hallways. Of course, you're Philip. Of course. But they told me nothing about you. <laughs> well, I don't think they're quite sure of how to classify me. I'm Naomi Colebrook. Uh, we'd better go downstairs. We'll miss dinner. Are you visiting to Miss Colebrook? Oh, no, I've been here over six months now. I'm a vague sort of relative. Letty and Silas took me in after my parents passed away. Oh, that was very good of them. Yes, it was. But I... I am glad to have someone else here now. Is anything wrong? Well, uh, there are tensions in this house. You may feel them. I already have. Something most unpleasant about it all. Oh, please don't let it drive you away. I... I have to talk to somebody. You see, I... Naomi, where are you? We're coming, Silas. We'll talk later. Dinner started off as a quiet affair. Naomi, Silas, Letty and myself were there, of course. The fifth person was John Jago, the fellow we'd almost run down. He acknowledged the introduction to me, then lapsed into silence. The only time I saw any animation on his face was when he glanced at Naomi. Silas noticed it, too. You find Miss Naomi's face interesting, Mr. Jago. I... I beg your pardon. Silas, please, don't start in again. It's offensive for the help to be staring at you like that. Your imagination is being overworked again, Silas. Dear Letty, you're so fond of Mr. Jago. Isn't there one small pang of jealousy at his interest to in Naomi? Silas! I'm sorry, Miss Letty. When your brother is in one of these moods, it's best that I retire. Good night. Good riddance. There was no need for that, Silas. You're too even-tempered, Naomi. Let's put it to our guest here. Philip, what did you think of that surly fellow's behavior? Why, I, I don't know. As to looking at Miss Naomi's face, I, it constantly attracts my own gaze. Oh. Does it? Yes. Does that make it necessary for me to leave the table? Oh, let's both go for a walk, Philip. I've had enough of this for one evening. But, Naomi... Let her be. Go, Cousin Philip. I wish to talk to my brother alone. The danger signal in my head, those flashes of pain, did not slacken until we, Naomi and I, were deep within the grove of trees that surrounded the house. The moon was full, its rays filtering through the dense overhead growth of twisted branches. We walked slowly towards a pale green glow that diffused the grey night ahead of us. What's wrong? Philip, your face is... It's, it's passing. It's pain. The doctor warned me to avoid excitement. Oh. Silas starts up with everyone. And he turns his anger upon poor Mr. Jago. Yes, they had a terrible fight the other day. Mr. Jago had to use a knife to defend himself. <laughs> he won't bother me. I'm not too sure. He was furious with you at dinner. I refuse to allow anybody to interfere with the pleasure I take from your company. But, uh... What's causing that green mist ahead? Oh, that's a natural lime kill. They say it's been burning for centuries. There's a hypnotic quality about this green pit. I can't take my eyes from it. It terrifies me. I keep imagining what would happen if... someone were to fall in there. Oh, they should put a fence about it. Philip. What? There, by the trees. Someone's watching us. Huh? Who's that? 
I, uh, I hope I'm not intruding. What do you want, Mr. Jago? I don't wish to disturb you or this gentleman, but I must speak to you, Miss Naomi, in private. This is hardly the manner to approach, eavesdropping from behind a tree. Oh, no, sir. I've just been walking through this grove and came upon you, but I must talk to this lady. We won't it hold until tomorrow? It would be a great kindness on your part, a very great kindness, if you'll let me speak before I rest tonight. Very well. We'll go back to the house. Not the house, miss. Why not? Uh, there are eyes and ears in the house, and footsteps so soft that no person can hear them. Then we'll speak here, where we can see all about us. Sir, if you don't mind. I don't want to leave you here, Naomi. Oh, I'll be quite all right, Philip. Mr. Jago will see me back to the house. You know best. Good night, then. Good night, and thank you. I slept but little that night. I wanted to leave. Get away from that wretched house. But the idea of leaving Naomi there all alone was unthinkable. With the dawn, I dressed and went down to the front porch. An angry sight met my eyes. Silence. Holding his walking stick like a bludgeon and waving at a jago. While the little overseer crouched before him like a snarling gamecock. The wicked blade of his knife flashing in the light. I stay back, I warn you. You warn me. I told you to stay away from her. She's not my style, Mr. Silas. You impudent beggar! Get back! I've set my mark on you once. I may do it a second time. I'll crush your skull! Stop that! Here, Silas, give me that cane. Let me go! I said, give it to me. You meddling fool. He's gotten away. Just as well. He handled that knife with some knowledge. You wouldn't have fared well in that fight. You think not. Be your cousin, Philip. May I have my stick now? If you must have it. Here. Thank you. Now, I'd like to walk through the grove. Unless you have some objection. So you insist on following him? We will finish this now, Jago and I. And this is a warning to you, cousin Philip. Leave Naomi alone, or you may have some of the same. <laughs> Neither of them had returned to the house by late afternoon. Naomi stayed in her room all day. Cousin Letty sat in her rocking chair and knitted, her eyes never leaving the front door as she waited fearfully. The ugly premonition of violent death hung about the rooms. Finally, approaching footsteps, and we watched to see who would enter. Silas. Where is Mr. Jago? <laughs> I believe we've seen the last of that one. Did you? You haven't brought your walking stick? No. But don't fear, Cousin Philip. I have another. Should you want to take a stroll through the grove? <laughs> Much later that night, I sat in my room, fully dressed, trying to read... The wildest thoughts were skipping, frantic through my mind. Was my cousin Silas a murderer? He had all but admitted it. And yet... Someone was walking through the hall. A light, almost stealthy footstep. I opened my door as a wide-robed, ghost-like figure descended the stairway. It was Letty. Her body rigid, staring blindly before her. It is dangerous to rouse a sleepwalker, so I followed. Out of the house, through the grove of trees, to the mouth of the lime kill. She stood there, trembling in the green light. As she took one further step towards the kill, I reached out and grabbed her shoulders. <coughs> no, it's me, it's Philip. <coughs> Let did you understand? <coughs> He's there. Mr. Jago is there in the kill. How do you know? He, he called to me. His voice, it came from there. That was a dream, Letty. You walked in your sleep. No dream. He's in there, I tell you. There's nothing we can do. Nobody could climb down into that pit to see. Over there, by the tree. A long pole with a mesh iron net. You'll see. Mr. Jago is in there. He told me so. 
And in the black of that night, I set about the macabre task of fishing the kill. Within the hour, I had brought up a partially burned walking stick, Jago's knife, and a small heap of charred bones. Autolite is bringing you Mr. Herbert Marshall in Wilkie Collins' The Dead Alive. Tonight's presentation in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Hey, Harlow, you know I signed a whole new team. Yeah? Stan, who are they? Why, a set of those Autolite resistor type spark plugs, of course. Ho, ho, ho. Then you're set for a winning season, Stan. Those Autolite resistor spark plugs are the greatest advance in spark plugs for automotive use in the past two and a half decades. Is that all? I thought they was the best in 25 years. <laughs> You're right, Stan. And that built-in Autolite resistor makes possible such advantages as double spark plug life, smoother engine performance, and quick starts. And the resistor spark plug is only one of a complete line of world-famous Autolite spark plugs, ignition engineered for every automotive use. That's a straight pitch, folks. So see your nearest Autolite spark plug dealer for a spark plug check soon. He services all makes of cars, and he has ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs, either standard or resistor type. To quickly learn his location, phone Western Union by number and ask for Operator 25. And remember, from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage Mr. Herbert Marshall in Elliot Lewis's production of The Dead Alive. A tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. On the parlor table were lying the walking stick, the knife, and the charred bones of John Jago. I'd roused Naomi and Silas, and now the four of us sat around the room, our eyes studiously avoiding the grisly pile before us. The light from the oil lamps failed to clear shadows from the dark corners of the parlor. And so we sat and waited for the silence to accuse. I didn't kill him! You have murder on your soul. Mr. Jago told me that, too. Oh, in your dream, I suppose. He never cared for you, Letty. Why do you carry on so about him? He was too shy to tell me. And now he never will. For you killed him. That is your stick, Silas. I stumbled near the kill. It fell in. And the knife and the bone, Silas. You killed him, Silas. And make the most of it. I'm going to bed. There's nothing more to be done tonight. We may as well all get some sleep. I don't think I'll ever sleep again. Oh, at least try, Naomi. Tomorrow we'll have to call in the magistrate. Aren't you coming, Letty? Oh, I'll stay here. With Mr. Jago. Letty, please. No. Leave her near me. Come. Oh, Philip, why did it happen? You probably know best of all. I know nothing. No? What did Jago say to you the other night in the garden? The police will want to know. We'd been talking. I don't recall about what. Suddenly, he, he seemed to go mad. Mad? In what way? He fell on his knees. He kissed my gown, my hand. He cried that he was in love with me. Poor fellow. I imagine you told him it was impossible. He wanted me to marry him. Of course it was impossible. Silas must have found it out. That could explain the why of this murder. Well, I can't stay here anymore. Nor can I. Tomorrow we'll move into town until the police clear us. And then... What then, Philip? Oh. Good Lord, what's that? Oh, don't leave me. Well, it's too late to catch whoever that was. Someone overheard us. Yes, someone. Here, get into your room, bolt your door, and don't open it for anyone. You hear? Oh, Philip, I'm so afraid. Truthfully, darling, so am I. If ever a house was accursed, this was it. 
with madness or worse, knocking from every crevice and corner. In my room, I locked the door and went to bed. Sleep did not come easily, but it came. I must have just dropped off when some inner sense warned me of a presence in the room. Something was gliding quietly towards the bed. I half opened my eyes and caught the dark shadow of movement and the momentary flash of metal. I rolled out of bed as a knife slashed into the mattress where I'd been lying. My assailant followed me, slashing, hacking at the pillow, the chair that I held before me. I tried to get out of the door. It was still bolted. I set the bolt and the shadow rushed, driving me back. In terror, I threw a lamp and hit someone. It was suddenly over. The knife wielder had gone. I fired a lamp, then stood, staring at the butcher knife that lay on the floor. My being revolted in fear and anger. I was sick. Sick of this house, of my cousins. Sick of waiting to be struck down in the dark. Get up, Silas. Mm -hmm. Who's there? Stop pretending that you're asleep. Philip, the devil's the matter with you? Naomi wouldn't have had you under any circumstances. What did you hope to gain by killing me? Killing you. If I wanted to kill you, cousin, I would face up to you like a man, not strike in the dark. Who else in this house would do a thing like that? What of Letty? Letty? It couldn't have been a woman. <laughs> Don't underestimate our New England women, Philip. They're strong as oxen. You better come along with me while I question her. You don't trust me. Exactly. Letty was still in the parlor, staring at the bones of her dead lover, sitting stoically in her chair. Something had changed her, though. There was an ecstatic look about her, and for the moment her face was almost pretty. Letty... Someone just tried to kill me. I know. How do you know? Mr. Jago told me you were going to die. She won't grasp the fact that John is dead. Oh, yes, I know he's dead. But now he's closer to me than ever. He comes to see me and talk to me. Did you go upstairs, Letty, to my room with a knife? Mr. Jago told me I was pretty. I... Asked him if I was. And he told me. He's dead now. But he's with me all the time. Well, Philip. Are you still quite positive it was I? Naomi! I ran up the stairs. Silas at my heels. A nagging, insane thought kept tugging at my brain. Letty, Silas and myself... We been together in the parlor, then who was it? What was it? What horror was attacking Naomi in her room? Naomi, open this door. It's me. Naomi. It's Philip. Na Naomi, are you all right? Stand back. I'm going to break it open. She's not here. The window's been smashed. There's nobody in the yard. Look, over through the grove, the branches swaying. Something's moving through there. That one again! But who? Or what? Silas, can your dogs track? Of course, they're hunting dogs. And bring them around and put them on the scent. Whatever that thing is, it has Naomi. The dogs picked up the scent and ran, baying into the tree grove. Silas and I, lantern spraying yellow light through the darkness, followed. Somewhere ahead, there was something. Man or monster. Without a mind. Suddenly at the lime kill, the dogs stopped howling. We saw Naomi lying by the edge of the pit. I knelt beside her, feeling the life beat feebly through her pulse. And then another feeling. The air parting behind me as something crept towards my back. Something poised to push me into the kill. I turned sharply and a shadow flew backwards, crossing to the opposite side of the pit. The green glow stippled around the form of a man. John Jago. Alive. Yes, very much so. 
So it would have been nice to have Mr. Silas hang for my murder. Your plans for me were very much more direct. I would kill for Miss Naomi, not just talk like Mr. Silas. You think she'd ever look to you? Someday, Mr. Silas, with you and your cousin dead. Oh, my, yes. And I would return, feigning loss of memory. It can't work out now, John. You best come along with us. Oh, take me, sirs. Come over here. I'll be glad to. Wait, Silas. He's too close to the pit. A slip and we'd all be in. Try, please. I'm a match for you both. Mr. Jago, I hear you. I'm coming, Mr. Jago. No, 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 no. Stay back, lady. I have no use for you anymore. You said I was pretty, Mr. Jago. You said that to me. Letty, don't go near him. Keep away, you stupid, ugly woman. No. You didn't say things like that in the lime kill. In the kill. Letty! Keep back. Keep back. Mr. Jago! Letty. 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 They're both gone. Poor devils. It was the next day in the carriage, riding back to town, near me, beside me, the sight of her lovely face driving away ugly thoughts of the night before. Is it all behind us now, Philip, all that hatred? It's finished, my darling. There's just you and I and our future together. A peaceful future. We'll have to watch your nerves. Nerves? Oh, my Lord. In the excitement, I forgot all, all about it. But the excitement might have killed you. Killed? It cured me. That doctor was wrong. My life was too dull. <laughs> then excitement is what you need. Yes. I've been thinking about our honeymoon. There's a wonderful old castle on the Rhine. They say it's haunted. Suspense, presented by Autolite. Tonight's star, Mr. Herbert Marshall. This is Harlow Wilcox again, speaking for Autolite, world's largest independent manufacturer of automotive electrical equipment. Autolite is proud to serve the greatest names in the industry. That's why during these early months of 1953, the Autolite family is again saluting the leading manufacturers who install Autolite products as original equipment. As a climax to this salute series, Autolite will present on both radio and television the Easter Parade of Stars Auto Show from New York's Waldorf Astoria Hotel. Just four weeks from tonight, we will bring you the exciting dramatization of the only round-the-world automobile race ever run. The program will star Van Johnson and will originate from the Grand Ballroom of the Waldorf, where the auto show will be in progress. That's Monday, April 6th. And, of course, you're invited to join us next week for our regular suspense program. Next week, a story about heroism as we document the attempt of three brave men to conquer the mountain. Our star, Mr. John Hodiak. That's next week on Suspense. Suspense is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with music composed by Lucian Morrowick and conducted by Lud Gluskin. The Dead Alive was adapted for suspense by Sam Rolfe from the story by Wilkie Collins. In tonight's story, Mary Jane Croft is heard as Naomi, Lamont Johnson as Silas, Jeanette Nolan as Letty, and Joseph Kearns as Mr. Jago. Herbert Marshall can currently be seen in the RKO production Angel Face. This is the CBS Radio Network. Welcome you through the creaking door into the inner sanctum. 
Come on in. <laughs> One prankish little fellow whom we shall call maniac, for lack of a stronger word, just set fire to the walls. He said a closed room made him feel confined. As a result, four other characters are slightly burned up now. <laughs> Tonight's Inner Sanctum Mystery, Corpse for Halloween, was written by John Robert and stars Larry Haynes in the role of Jimmy with Barry Kroger as Kavanaugh. And now, let's unhinge our minds a little. After all, what's a little insanity among friends? Hmm. Tonight's story dramatizes the fanatical hold of memory. The one scene, the one fragment that plays and replays over and over again in your mind. The one terror that's with you when you dine and when you walk and when you sleep. Sleep. Who can sleep? I'm here in the 35 cent flop, but I'm in the Burma jungle. Watching a scene that never gets stale, even though it's five years old. I can hear sounds travel across the brush. I pick them up as if I'm a receiving set. Animal sounds. And I see, as if my eyes are in the sky, I see two grim figures standing with their rifles aimed at a pair of jungle beasts. A tiger and its mate in a crouch, ready to jump. They fire point blank together as if by signal. <coughs> No good. They miss. The beasts roar and leap. I hear them scream out, Kavanaugh and Dr. Dolan. Just before they die. Five years. And you've been everywhere trying to forget. And you almost do forget. But it edges right back into your mind by itself. Like like when a guy suddenly sneaks up on you in the night. Do you have a match? What? Do you have a match? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. You uh, popped up on me so suddenly. You're a nervous man. Thank you. I have a parcel with me. For you. For me? What, are you kidding? No. I have a parcel for you. Here, take it. Uh, wait a minute. Hey, 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 wait! But he's gone. Just the way he came. As if he's... He's a chip off my sanity. As if there'd been nobody. But there is a package left with me. The mind doesn't dream up a package. A cardboard box. Heavy kind of. And tissue. Lots of tissue around. Something that... That had the feel of... A head. It is a head. The stuffed head of a jungle tiger... Its mouth fixed in a snarl that sends the blood hammering to my head. Doesn't make sense. No good figuring it out. Toss it into the river, box and all, and get away. Get among people. Yeah. Yeah, Rocco's. Go to Rocco's. Get the jukebox going and slip into a fog. Coffee, Rocco. Jimmy, I got something for you. For me, Rocco? The package. The guy come in before and leaves a package for you. See? For Jimmy Fox. Your name on it. My name? My name's Jimmy Scott. You know that. Scott, yes, but the man says your name is also Jimmy Fox. He says he knows. He knows? I took the package outside into the night, into an alleyway. Another cardboard box. Heavy. And, and tissue, lots of tissue around something that had the feel of a head. It was a head, but not a tiger's this time. It was a human skull. It shone with a hard white light where the moon touched it. And then it seemed to speak. Do you have a mask? What? <laughs> You're being an idiot. It isn't the skull talking to you, it's me. You? Where are you? I'm behind you. I, I don't see you. That's because you're afraid to. See me now? Yeah. 
A black suit and a face grinning at me like... Like a laughing mask. It is a laughing mask. Well, why are you wearing a mask? Why not? Tonight's Halloween. Huh. Halloween? Sure. Halloween. And not everybody plays jokes. Oh, gosh, I should have remembered it was Halloween. Can you identify the skull? Identify? Look, what kind of a gag are you trying to... <laughs> Suppose I give you an hour to identify the skull. It's eight now. Until nine o'clock then, Jimmy. Uh, wait. Hey, hey, wait. It was gone again. As if there'd been nobody. Just another big chip off my sanity. I really had to get away from myself now. I hit the back streets. And, and then somewhere a big neon sign across the tenement pulled me off the sidewalk. It read, The Tillery Street Boys Neighborhood Association. Halloween costume ball, public invited. A girl in a booth, masked like a witch, stopped me at the door. Mask, mister? Uh, m- m- mask. Oh, uh, sure, sure, give me one. Black, green, yellow, or purple? What's your favorite color? Uh, yellow. All right, here you are. Fifty cents. Hey, I... Oh. Oh, what? Just a description left with me. I'd almost forgotten. Uh, are you Jimmy Fox? Suppose I was, Jimmy Fox. What about it? This grocery bag was left here for you. A man told me to tell you. You forgot it somewhere. And he said that he'd meet you one place or another later. Here, take it. By the shape of it, I'd say you had a Halloween pumpkin inside. What if I told you there was a human skull inside that grocery bag? He'd meet me one place or another. He did. He was under a street lamp, waiting for me to happen along. <laughs> Hello, Jimmy. Have you dared to call the skull by name yet? Or must I? Look, that gag isn't paying off, Lister. All right, go ahead. You call it by name. Dolan. Boxer Dolan. Remember him? I, uh... I've knew the guy. He no doubt got me confused. Have I, Jimmy? You've changed your appearance cleverly, except for one thing disguise could never conceal. One thing? Your guilt. You wear it like a badge of shame. Oh, what am I guilty of? Murder. Two men left an encampment in the Burma jungle just before dawn. Two men. Boxer Dolan and Kavanaugh. The third man remained behind. He played sick, pretended to fever. The third man was you, Jimmy. Must I tell you the rest? Tell me the rest. Dolan and Kavanaugh carried rifles in the event of a jungle encounter. There was a jungle encounter, a tiger and its mate. An emergency, but an easy one to resolve for two expert hunters. Just one shot apiece, and there'd be two more dead tigers. Just one shot apiece. They had their one shot apiece, but the tigers didn't drop dead in their tracks. Instead, Boxer Dolan and Kavanaugh dropped. Ask me what happened, Jimmy. What happened? During the night, someone had emptied their rifle loads and substituted blank bullets. You did that, Jimmy. You engineered the murder of two men. You murdered your two partners in crime. Just one day's push from the Hindu temple you'd all teamed up to loot. They got within 24 hours of treasure, and then you murdered them. One more day to the temple, so why split three ways, huh? You know about the temple. But I never pushed on to that temple. No loot, no nothing. How about that? You lost your nerve. You just hadn't counted on losing your nerve. What are you, a detective? No. I'm your second victim. I'm Kavanaugh. Kavanaugh? The Kavanaugh was killed. Unfortunately for you, he wasn't. I'll show you what I had to survive. Feel my sleeve. Feel it. It's empty. Torn out of the socket. Now, the face behind this laughing gargoyle I wear. See the left profile. Uh, it isn't pretty, is it? The eye. The eye's gone, too. I spent five years finding you, Jimmy. I've waited a long time to let you see my face. You came after me to kill me? After you've had the same 24 hours you arranged that Dolan and I would have. What do you mean, the same 24 hours? Unarmed, in the jungle, and helpless. 
I'm going to hunt you for 24 hours in this jungle, the jungle of the city, with every beast of prey I can buy. I'm going to hunt you, Jimmy. And in the end, when I've wrung every suffering from you, I'm going to kill you. What do you mean? Every beast of prey you can buy. The denizens of the city jungle, the riffraff, the murderers, the men and women who buy and sell murder. I can afford them, Jimmy. See this, Ruby? Hey, is it real? And I have dozens, Jimmy, dozens. I didn't lose my nerve. It's ten o'clock. You can go now. Go and see if you can escape me and my pack. You're going through with this? Get along, Jimmy. Hurry. The beasts will be coming at you from the sewers and the cellars, ambushing you from the shadows into the dawn and through the day for 24 hours until ten tomorrow night. Or you win. You live. Hurry, Jimmy. See how painful death can be. That Kavanaugh is one fella I never want to uh, hunt me up. Mm -mm, no, sir. That guy slays for creeps. <laughs> 24 hours. Kavanaugh's got 24 hours to kill. And Jimmy has just enough time to die. <laughs> yes, you know, Jimmy might win out over Kavanaugh. Now that he's got an extra skull to go with the one he's stuck with. After all, two heads are better than one. <laughs> Let's live out the terror now, shall we? An animal game of murder for 24 hours. I was to be hunted down in a jungle where human beasts came at you from the sewers and cellars where killers in the hire of a homicidal lunatic lay in ambush. But I had to win. I had to save myself. I had to. Hide. The thing to do was to hide, fade into an alleyway and find a cellar and stay put for 24 hours. Just stay put. Go to the sickening reek of garbage cans until 10 tomorrow night. Was I alone? Movement. There was a whispering movement somewhere in the cellar. A faint rattle of ash cans as if... As if the wind was rattling them. Wind in an airtight cellar. Hello? Anybody there? No one else there. I've been imagining. But then something winged at me. Goring into my shoulder, sharp and deadly like a knife. <laughs> came to, bleeding from a shoulder gash. I got out of there and back into the streets, into a jungle of faces. It was Halloween night like I'd never seen it. Masks and costumes on kids of six and old crones of sixty. A crazy jungle of witches and snarling sea captains and lunatics. They couldn't all be in the hire of Kavanaugh. And then, where a fence was plastered with circus posters of jungle animals, a zany-looking guy was shooting from the hip of the poster while making menacing faces like a bad man. I caught a whiff of powder in the night air. The shot had burned into the poster. I crept up behind him. Taking a gun with my fist in my coat pocket, I rammed against his back. Get him up, pal. Oh, I, I can't. I'm not in a lot of Your gun. I want your gun. Hand it over. Oh, sure. Yeah. Now walk. Walk up the block and don't turn back to look. I had a gun now and the tables were turned. I was the hunter now. I drifted to the docks and took up a position with my back to the river. Thinking of suicide, Jimmy? Not anymore, Kevin, huh? You sound as if your morale had suddenly uh, improved. My morale's going great, Kavanaugh. Your animal hunt's about to boomerang. Blow right up in your face like this. Who's hunting who, Kavanaugh? Who's hunting who? Kavanaugh kept standing up. Three bullets point blank enough to blow his head off, but Kavanaugh kept standing up on hunt. <laughs> How does it feel to hunt game with blank cartridges like Boxer Dolan and I did once? Blank cartridges? 
But that crazy-looking guy I saw burn a hole in the circus poster. Only one bullet. The first one was real. Simple. Yeah, simple. I get it. Dead-Eyed Dick was another one of your beasts. Who's hunting who, Jimmy? Who's hunting who? Uh, Kavanaugh! Kavanaugh, wait! Kavanaugh, kill me! Get it over with and kill me now, will you? Kavanaugh, you gotta kill me! I had to get out of there. The subway. Get yeah, the subway. Fade into the subway. Get on a train and ride to the end of the line. Ride out of the channel. An empty station. No one in it. No. No someone. Two people. A dapper little guy buried behind a newspaper. And an old lady in ragged clothes carrying a pet half hidden under a coat. A pet that looked like a cat. She came up to me. Close. Like to ask me something. And... Uh. This side goes to Leffert's Avenue Station? Uh, Leffert's, I, I don't know. I'm a stranger here. Oh, oh, hush, Genevieve. Oh, Genevieve is hungry. That's not a cat. No, son. A cub. A tiger cub. A, a tiger cub? Would you like to stroke Genevieve? No, no, no. Don't run away, son. Genevieve won't hurt. I ran away with the old crone after me, hobbling in her skirts, and a little dapper guy behind the newspaper circling at me from the opposite direction, cornering me. I jumped to the tracks, my only out, and I ran. I ran it deep into the bowels of the subway, deep, very deep, with a little dapper guy after me, as if he meant business. I'm in the train. It had a Halloween look, too, bearing down on me, an iron face with banjo eyes. I ran against the wall and flattened out. The train flashed past, and the dapper little guy screamed. Kavanaugh was shy, one beast in this jungle. The little guy had been hit glancingly and hurled against the subway wall, pulverized. I got to him quickly and frisked him. I had a gun now. A gun with bullets that killed. I ran. I ran a half mile underground to another station and then back on the streets. Back in the animal game. It was three in the morning. A neon sign read Chillery Street Boys Neighborhood Association. Halloween costume party. People were straggling out. The fun was over. Uh, what? You remember me? Uh, no. I'm the witch who gave you a free mask and a grocery bag that you forgot somewhere. And and you're uh, Jimmy Fox. Jimmy Scott. I, I used to be Jimmy Fox. Sister, are you all right? Am I all right? I mean, are you just what you look? A, a sweet kid with brown eyes and a heart. Are you drunk? No, 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 beat. I'm dead beat. I, I've got a hole up somewhere. Get some shut eye. I've got to or I'll die. You're sick? Yeah, yeah, I'm sick, sick. If, if I could just sleep around the clock until 10 tomorrow night, if an angel came along and said, come home with me, I'll put you up. Come home with me, Jimmy. I'll put you up. I fell asleep on a sofa with a gun under my pillow and the girl on a chair watching me anxiously. I had a friend. I could drop off and live in dreamland until ten that night. At ten, I could wake up and live. Coming awake, I heard the alarm which said go off. The alarm stopped. And there was a sound. An animal sound. And then a claw scratching at me, tearing at my cheek. And I... I jumped up. The girl was gone. A guy was sitting watching me now. A skinny kid with a heavy shock of hair, not a day over 21. Oh, that's a lousy way to have to wake up from a sleep, pal. Lousy way? There was an animal clawing at me, my cheeks bleeding. Her Genevieve, she isn't housebroken. Still a little wild. You should have seen her dash for the kitchen when you let out a scream just now. Genevieve, who are you? You're Jimmy Fox, huh? Yeah. I got something for you. For me? Yeah, it was given to me to give to you. Here. A, a ruby. Hey, wait a minute, look. It's ten o'clock. I set the alarm for ten, and it's ten. Well, it's only a quarter of. That clock's always fifteen minutes ahead. Now the game's over. It's ten, and you can't cheat. I've, I've won, Kavanaugh. You can't go back on your promise, Kavanaugh. You can't. What are you trying to get over, pal? I don't. I've won. You can't cheat. I won't be tricked. A gun, pal. You're crazy. Hey, wait. Look. Oh. 
crazy. Then and I won't be tricked, Kavanaugh. I've won. I'm still on the sofa. My arms are rigid. And my legs rigid. Like something exploded inside me and paralyzed my nerves. I can just look and hear. She's in the room now. A girl with a sweet face and brown eyes. Only her eyes are red, swollen from crying. I hear her talking to a cop. He's taking down what she said. She was a stray. She was like a sick dog in the street. So I picked him up and brought him home. Yes, sir. Why did he kill your brother, Buddy? I don't know. I was taking a shower, and I heard him scream like a crazy man. I heard him talk all mixed up. But I was taking a shower, and I couldn't get here in time. There must be something you can tell me, Miss. Oh, officer, everything is all mixed up. At the Tillery Street costume ball, a man gave me a cat with tiger stripes, and he begged me to keep it for him for a while until he found a new home for it. He'd been evicted, he said. Yes. Well, then, in the all-night restaurant my brother works in, a man gave Buddy a ruby to give to Jimmy Fox. When he woke up, he told my brother the ruby belonged to Jimmy Fox. This piece of glass? Yes. That's uh, something off the Woolworth time counter. Uh, what else? That's all. Really, that's all. I watch and I hear. I see through Kavanaugh's trick. Get me crazy so I'll murder a stranger who called himself Buddy. The brother of a girl with brown eyes and a heart. Frame me so I'll just want to die. Through weeks of a murder trial and months in the death house and four minutes in the death chair. I kept listening to them talk. The girl and the cop. Okay. We'll have to get the rest from Jimmy Fox there. Yeah, look at him. He's paralyzed with fright. I wonder what kind of a crazy Halloween story he's going to try to palm off on us when we get him talking. Uh, uh, Captain Devereux speaking. Uh, McAvoy, send a police ambulance to 445 Tenite Street, apartment 3 rear. And McAvoy, see that a straitjacket's on that ambulance. <laughs> Quite a chase, hmm? It got so poor Jim didn't know whether he was coming or going. Nuts. <laughs> what got his goat most was the way he kept seeing animals everywhere. Very confusing to a guy on the lamb. Yeah, it got so he couldn't tell who's zoo. <laughs> Tomorrow? Oh, sure. I read this Halloween notice on a tree somewhere. Never hunt out of reason. <laughs> Deny pleasant dreams. Sanctum was heard in the United States over CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System, and has been rebroadcast for service men and women overseas. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education. <laughs> The Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California presents... Suspense! Tonight, Roma Wines bring you Miss Mildred Natwick and Mr. Don DeFore as stars of The Furnished Floor, a suspense play produced, edited, and directed for Roma Wines by William Spear. 
Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills, is presented for your enjoyment by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. Those excellent California wines that can add so much pleasantness to the way you live, to your happiness and entertaining guests, to your enjoyment of everyday meals. Yes, right now a glass full would be very pleasant as Roma Wines bring you a remarkable tale of suspense. And with the furnished floor, a new study written for suspense by Lucille Fletcher, the author of Sorry, Wrong Number and other distinguished radio plays, and with the performances of Don DeFore as Mr. Jennings and Mildred Natwick as Mrs. Hawkins, Roma Wines hope indeed to keep you in suspense. Sit down, rest yourself a minute, Ms. McIntyre, and take a cup of tea. I got some news for you. You'll never guess it in a hundred years. Do you remember that Mr. Jennings, you know, my nice tenant that moved away last year? The tall, thin fellow, the one with the pretty little wife, Mabel, who died so sudden last October. Oh, sure, you know him. Most devoted husband I ever seen. Always bringing her flowers and billing and cooing. He moved out upstairs about two weeks after she died. So heartbroken he was, sold every stick of furniture, got rid of the canary and the piano, and just skadooed. I expected any day to hear they'd fished him up out of the river, but no. This morning, while I'm cleaning down the stairs, who do you think should ring my bell? Hello, Mrs. Hawkins. Remember me? Why, it's Mr. Jennings. Mr. Jennings, you sure give me a turn. I never expected to see you around this neighborhood again. Well, here I am. How's the upstairs floor? (laughs) Just as you left it, Mr. Jennings. I haven't rented it to a soul. Well, I want to rent it again. What? You, Mr. Jennings? That's right. I'm setting up housekeeping again. Well, if that don't be... Getting married again, Mr. Jennings? In a way. Let's run up and take a look, shall we? Okay, if you say so. Only, won't it make you feel kind of blue to see the old place again? Blue? Why should it? Well, memories, you know. That's just what I want to find. Memories. Everything just as it was. Uh, I hope you've left it just the same, Mrs. Hawkins. No painting or new wallpaper? Uh, Not yet. Thought I'd fix it up to please the new tenant. Well, leave it just as it was. Please, for me. (sighs) Well, here's the keys. Maybe you'd like to go in and look around by yourself. No. Do come in, Mrs. Hawkins. You were always so very kind. More a friend than a landlady. Oh, how beautiful it looks, even bare. The sunshine always was so warm up here. And the trees. Why, I'd almost forgotten how close the trees were. And there's the marks our sofa made against the wall. And the square shapes of our pictures still on the wall. Mm. Well, it could stand a good cleaning, of course. Do you remember how Mabel used to sit here of an evening and sing? Now, the upright was over there, and over at the Maxfield Parish, and over near the bay window, above the ferns, the canary sat in his cage, and when she sang Swing Low, Sweet Chariot, he'd always sing with her. Oh, come now, Mr. Jennings. You'll be getting yourself all fretted up. Oh, no, no, I... I assure you, Mrs. Hawkins, it's very important. You see, I'm going to have it again, just as it was. Is that so? I've made a list, but in a year, so many details escape one. Like those ferns, for instance. Well, I'd almost forgotten how she loved ferns. Oh, yes, and there was something over in that corner. What was it? A rocker. Her mother's old rocker. It used to squeak over a loose board whenever anybody sat in it. You mean you're going to try and find all them things again, Mr. Jennings? Yes. But you sold all them to junk dealers. You gave them away. But you scattered them every which way when you broke up your home. I've already been looking. I've collected a lot of things. It isn't so hard. You see, our furniture wasn't very precious to anyone but us. Well, of course you know what you're doing, Mr. Jennings. It's none of my business, I suppose. Uh, will two months' rent be enough in advance, Mrs. Hawkins? I won't be moving in for another couple of weeks, but from time to time, I, I'd like to have things delivered. Well, two months will be just dandy. I'll make you a special bargain price, too. 
fancy and you don't want no redecorating. You're sure your lady friend won't want none neither, Mr. Jennings? I hardly think so. Well, I hope you'll both be very happy here. It's nice to have you back in the neighborhood. It's good to be home. McIntyre, what would you have done in my place? I admit it gave me a funny feeling, you know. You would think a man had more respect for the dead and her dead only less than a year than to bring a new wife plumb back to the same floor and the same furniture. And I say, what kind of a woman is she, too, to stand for that kind of nonsense? But, of course, it ain't really none of my business. And besides, two months' rent, two months' rent. Well, Mr. Jennings, what are you doing here this time of night? I'm moving in. Moving in? I intended coming much earlier, but I had so many last-minute things to do, like picking up Dickie and... Oh, now, don't tell me that's your old canary, Mr. Jennings. Yes, it's little Dickie. I found him in a pet shop on 3rd Avenue, in his old cage. He looks pretty chipper, doesn't he? Well, aren't you the one? I'd have thought he'd have died of lonesomeness ages ago. Did all my furniture and things get here, Mrs. Hawkins? Just about. They've been delivering off and on for the last week. You sure got everything back, Mr. Jennings? Well, pretty nearly everything. A couple of rugs are missing and our old kitchen table and... Oh, so I got the piano. I bought the old upright back from the Sunday school. Boy, I've been more than lucky. Uh... Miss Hawkins, you won't mind, will you, if I start moving some of it into place tonight? I'll be very quiet. Tonight? Well, it's pretty near midnight, Mr. Jennings. Yes, I know, but I'd have to work all day tomorrow and the next day. You see, there's so little time. Oh, you're expecting her soon? Very soon. Oh, well, if you don't get it done in time, I'll be glad to give you and her a hand when she gets here. Oh, no, no. It's got to be all ready before she comes. Otherwise, she won't come. You don't say, Mr. Jennings. So, if you don't mind, it'll only be for a few nights. And I won't move any of the heavy pieces after midnight. If you only knew what this means to me, Mrs. Hawkins, how I've waited for months. Is that so, Mr. Jennings? Well, I'm sure glad you found somebody to make a home for you again. And I hope she's the right girl for you and is going to make you happy. Oh, she will, all right. Of course, there are some people I know say a man ought to wait a couple of years, but, well, I was only saying yesterday, certain men are natural-born husbands, and homebodies, they need a home and a woman to look after them. Uh, yeah, yes, that's that's true. Well, good night, Mrs. Hawkins. I'll try not to disturb you. Good night, Mr. Jennings. Come in, Mrs. McIntyre. No, it's okay. He's at the office. He'll never know we come up. Yeah. Take a look around. Ain't it something? Everything fixed up down to the last knife and fork, just exactly as she had it. Don't it give you the creeps? Yep, that's the same canary singing in his cage, just like it used to. And look, Mrs. McIntyre, come here in the bedroom. He's even got her clothes hung up in the closet. Now, I'm asking you, Mrs. McIntyre, what do you think the second Mrs. Jennings is going to say to that? (whistles) Mr. Jennings? Oh, hello, Mrs. Hawkins. Well, I've been beside myself with worry, Mr. Jennings. Where you been all this time, if I may ask? Right here. Right here? What did you... Didn't you hear us come in? I've been to work all day, of course, but last night, a little after one. Oh, oh, perhaps you were sleeping. Us? You mean you and... Well, yes. She's come. You mean she's been upstairs all day? Certainly. But I haven't heard a sound. Well, probably she's sleeping. She, she was very tired. The trip was more exhausting than I dreamed. Well, you might have stopped by and told me on your way to work this morning, Mr. Jennings... Of course, it's none of my business, but 
I could have at least introduced myself to my own tenant and maybe even helped her out. Oh, it's all right. She doesn't want to see anybody just yet. Oh, no? Well, of course, I wouldn't intrude on your privacy for anything, Mr. Jennings, although I'm sure when the first Mrs. Jennings was alive, we were all friends here. Oh, no, no, it isn't that. It's only that in these first few days, everything is so new and strange. She's not quite herself. Okay, Mr. Jennings. You know best, but if you should want me, you just call down the dumb waiter and I'll be right up. Thanks, Mrs. Hawkins. Thank you. But on no account are we to be disturbed. On no account. Suspense, Roma Wines are bringing you as stars Mildred Natwick and Don DeFore in The Furnished Floor by Lucille Fletcher. Roma Wines' presentation tonight in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Between the acts of Suspense, this is Truman Bradley for Roma Wines. Happier days are here again. People are entertaining more and more, inviting friends over often, enjoying friendly visits in simple, sensible ways. One such way is to serve Roma California sherry. In the words of famed hostess Elsa Maxwell, I serve my guests Roma sherry. There is nothing so friendly, so heartwarming, as delicious, glorious, golden amber Roma sherry, rich in nutty, mellow taste goodness. Serve cool. When I invite friends in, I always serve Roma Sherry as first call for dinner. And Miss Maxwell might have added, Roma Sherry is most enjoyable later in the evening, too. In fact, any time. Roma Sherry, like all the famous Roma wines, reflects the heritage of carefully selected grapes, freshly gathered at flavor fullness from California's choicest vineyards, quickly but gently pressed. Then by a process as slow as time, brought to liquid perfection by Roma's ancient winemaking skill and bottled at Roma's famed wineries. Enjoy Roma wines regularly. They are always unvaryingly good. Remember, because of uniformly fine quality at reasonable cost, more Americans enjoy Roma than any other wine. R-O-M-A. Roma Wines. And now Roma Wines bring back to our Hollywood soundstage Don DeFore and Mildred Natwick in The Furnished Floor, a play well calculated to keep you in suspense. Now, don't get me wrong, Mrs. McIntyre. The last thing in the world I am is a busybody, but, well, you know, I don't go out much on account of my heart, and our two floors are kind of close. Downstairs in my dining room, you can hear most everything that goes on upstairs. Now, wouldn't you have thought there'd have been something last night, some talking or footsteps or dishes rattling? Well, I'm telling you, I sat there till midnight, and there wasn't a thing, nothing at all, except along, along about half past twelve... I hear the dumb waiter come rumbling down the shaft. Well, I just stole a peek, and there, going by, with his claws sticking up in the air, was that little yellow canary, dead. Good morning, Mrs. Hawkins. Good morning. And how's Mrs. Jennings today? Wonderful. Feeling a bit better now? Oh, yes. Of course, she's still very weak, but every day I'm sure will make her stronger. I have high hopes for her recovery. You had a doctor in to see her yet? Dr. Rubenstein, my doctor, is very good. No, I'm afraid a doctor wouldn't help her. (laughs) No, no. Mrs. 
Mrs. Jennings. Mrs. Jennings. It's Mrs. Hawkins. The lady downstairs. I heard you were sick, and so I got a little bit of lunch for you, Mrs. Jennings. It's just a little bowl of homemade chicken broth, but it's nice and rich. You sleeping, Mrs. Jennings? Okay, then I'll just slip in quietly with my own keys, if you don't mind, and leave it right beside your bed. Oh, that's funny. Oh, he must have bought a new kind of lock. He didn't say anything to me. Mrs. Jennings! Mrs. Jennings! Jennings? Oh. oh, good evening, Mrs. Hawkins. You got a minute, Mr. Jennings. I'd like to speak to you, if you don't mind. Well, uh, Mrs. Jennings is waiting for me upstairs. It's about Mrs. Jennings. She's still poorly, you say? Well, she is confined a good deal to her bed. Well, why don't you get someone in to look after her? I know a good woman. Mrs. McIntyre goes out nursing by the day. No. Oh, no. Well, I don't like it, Mr. Jennings, locking her up like that every morning so not a soul can get in. Suppose something happened. What could happen? What could happen? Anything could happen. A fire. Oh, oh that doesn't worry me. Or, or she could get worse and maybe even die. Oh, no. Everybody's got to go sometime, Mr. Jennings. I wouldn't take no chances. Yes, I know. But not her. Not her? Whatever do you mean, Mr. Jennings? Because she's immune. Immune? Against... She ain't got no contagious disease up there, has she? Oh, no, no, it's nothing like that. Oh, Mrs. Hawkins, please, please don't worry or be uneasy. It's worked out so beautifully. It's nothing that can do you any harm. And we're so happy, so wonderfully happy. Oh, oh Mr. Jennings, I'll, I'll be up in about one hour with the plumber. The plumber? I'm sorry to disturb you at supper time, but there's something gone wrong with the pipes, and we think it's upstairs in your floor. You can't come in. Mrs. Jennings will be sleeping. Plummer says it's the only time he can come. Unless he comes tomorrow afternoon while you're at the office. You want to leave me your key, Mr. Jennings? No, no, I can't. Well, he'll have to get in there sooner or later, Mr. Jennings. The water downstairs all black and discolored. It's out of the question tonight. I'll discuss it with you in the morning. Okay, Mr. Jennings. Well, now, Mrs. McIntyre, how would you feel? Your own house going to rack and ruin. You can't even do nothing about it. I ask you, what kind of a thing's he got up there that nobody can see? I tell you... Just sitting here in this silent house night after night gives me the creeps. And with my heart, what tis? Well, anyway, his two months' rent's up tomorrow. And I got my mind made up. I got my mind made up. Oh, oh, good evening, Mrs. Hawkins. Why, well, I didn't know you for a minute standing there in the dark. Well, I didn't want to miss you this time, Mr. Jennings. No? I got your money this morning for next month, stuck under the door. Oh, yes, yes. I, I had to leave early. I hope it was all right. No, it wasn't all right. I'm sorry, but the floor's been rented, Mr. Jennings. Rented? To a young serviceman and his wife from the fort. They took it sight unseen this morning. Oh, but you can't... They're living in a crowded room on 81st Street. It's very crowded. I told them I figured you could probably get most of your stuff out in a week. A week? I never told you I was going, Mrs. Hawkins. I'm sorry, Mr. Jennings. If, well, if it's a matter of a little more rent, I'll, I'll be glad to pay and sign a lease, any kind of a lease you want. It's not a matter of rent or a lease, Mr. Jennings. It's just I want my floor back, that's all. But, Mrs. Hawkins... I, I like neighborly people upstairs, Mr. Jennings. I'm home a lot. I like people I can trust. I don't want no mysteries in my house. New locks on the door so no one can get in and sneakings in and out at night. <sighs> Mrs. Hawkins, I, I swear to you it's all right. Perfectly all right. All this business about Mrs. Jennings, never a face at the window, never a footstep on the floor or a dish rag hung out on the line. Mrs. Jennings is ill. 
She's not like other people. Hmm. Oh, I tell you, I won't go. You've got to let me stay. Here's your rent back, Mr. Jennings. I, I haven't any place to go. This is my home. It's all I have. I stake care of everything on being here. Everything. There are other floors vacant in this neighborhood. No, no, no. It's got to be this one, this, this particular floor. Uh, Mrs. Hawkins, if I could buy the house, the whole house. Buy the house? Yes, yes, if it's for sale. Perhaps you've never thought of selling it, but I'd give you a good price. I'd scrape the money together somehow. This house ain't for sale. It happens to be my home, too, Mr. Jennings. Oh, I know, I know, but you're all alone now that Mr. Hawkins is... Oh, I'm... I mean, it's a heavy responsibility. A big house and all those stairs to keep clean and, and the repairs and all. Oh, Mrs. Hawkins, if you'd only reconsider, I, I'd do anything. No, it's too much for me. I don't understand it. Why can't she see me and talk to me? Why can't she invite me in for a cup of tea and explain? Because she... she can't. What's the matter with her that she can't? Is she so ugly or so beautiful or so crazy? Who... who is she, anyway? Uh, I can't tell you. Okay, Mr. Jennings. Then that's that. Mrs. Hawkins! Mrs. Hawkins! Yes? I'm here, Mr. Jennings, at the dumb waiter. Mrs. Hawkins! Yes, Mr. Jennings? What is it? I'm sending you down the key on the dumb waiter. She wants you to come up. She? Mrs. Jennings. Okay. Got it? Yes. She wants me to come up now, Mr. Jennings? That's right. Well, it's kind of late. If she ain't so well. That's all right. She's feeling much better tonight. She wants to talk to you about the floor. Before it's too late. Okay. I'll be right up. Okay, Mr. Jennings. I, uh, I'm here. Come in. You have the key. Oh. Okay. Well, where's your lights, Mr. Jennings? I can't see a thing. I'll light a candle in a moment. Mrs. Jennings prefers the dark. But you know this floor so well, Mrs. Hawkins. Come in. Well, where are you, Mr. Jennings? Right in here, in the parlor. Sitting on the sofa. Oh! oh. That's just the wind. There's always a little draft blowing in here. But won't you sit down, Mrs. Hawkins? Uh, no, thanks. I'm only going to stay a minute. Just long enough to meet Mrs. Jennings. Oh. But you've already met her. Already met her? Don't you remember? Five years ago. A rather chilly day. The rain was falling. She rang the bell to ask about the upstairs floor. And you invited her in for a cup of tea. I'm afraid you're mistaken. That was uh, the first Mrs. Jennings. That's what I mean. Oh. Oh, no, Mr. Jennings. Now do you understand, Mrs. Hawkins? Now do you know why we couldn't ever go away? We? But there couldn't... Well, the first Mrs. Jennings, it's... I know. You saw her coffin in this very room, didn't you, Mrs. Hawkins? You saw them take her away. 
I think you even followed out to that cold, dark cemetery. Well, but... That... But she couldn't stay away. She pleaded with me in my dreams to bring her back, and... I brought her back. Oh. Oh, no, Mr. Jennings. Don't say such things. If everything were the same as in the past, she said, we could have the past. If I furnished our old floor with the same things, she'd live here, too. Excuse me, Mr. Jennings. I'm afraid I got to... Oh, no, 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 don't go yet. There's nothing frightening about it. Would you be afraid to look at a forsythia bush that had been asleep all winter? Or a tulip? Or a tree? I... I ain't afraid, Mr. Jennings. I only... Listen. What? You don't hear it? In the bedroom? The rocking? No. Mabel. Mabel. No. Don't. Don't call her. I... I I hear it, Mr. Jennings. Oh, but she wants to meet you. She's always loved you so much. I... I really... I just as soon... Some other time, Mr. Jennings. The door's locked. It snapped shut behind you. Really, Mrs. Hawkins, don't go. She'll be in in a moment. There. There. She's coming down the hall. Now, let me out of this. Do you hear? Let me out. My heart won't stand. Oh, oh. Here she is. Uh, Where? Standing in the doorway. Smiling. Mm. Oh, my darling. Mm. My darling. I don't see... Nobody. Mrs. Hawkins. She's going to sing for you. Sing for me? This is the first night she's been able to. You remember the old song she used to sing of an evening? Uh, Swing low, sweet I don't, I don't want to hear it. Oh, please, please, Mrs. Hawkins. She's very timid. You'll frighten her. The dead can't come back. They'd never want to live on this earth again. And... Go on, Mabel, oh. dearest. Don't mind. You're looking very beautiful tonight, my darling. I like that dress. Do you remember when we bought it? On our first wedding oh, anniversary. Why don't they all come back then? Why couldn't my poor old John... Sit down, dearest. There. Now it seems like old times again. The flower in your hair. The canary singing in his cage. No, no it can't. I... Oh. Oh, 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 I told you. My heart. Oh, get a doctor, quick. Your voice. Your voice was always like a bird's to me. I'll never forget the first time I ever heard it. On an evening in spring at the Calvary Baptist Church. A doctor. Play, dearest, play. Go on, dearest. It's all right. Sing. Swing low, sweet chariot. Come and for to carry me home. Wines have brought you Mildred Natwick and Don DeFore as stars of The Furnished Floor. Tonight's study in Suspense. This is Truman Bradley for Roma Wines, the sponsor of Suspense. When... And here's a hint on how to make better cocktails. Make them with zestful, full-flavored Roma vermouth. The vermouth of almost a hundred rare herbs. Made and bottled in the heart of California's famous vineyards. Yet surprisingly low-priced. 
try Roma vermouth soon, won't you? Mildred and Atwick will soon be seen in the Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer production, Yolanda and the Thief. Don DeFore is currently being seen in the Hal Wallace production, You Came Along, a Paramount Picture. Next Thursday, you will hear Miss Myrna Loy, a star of Suspense, radio's outstanding theater thrill. Presented by Roma Wines, R-O-M-A. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Lipton Tea and Lipton Soup present Inner Sanctum Mysteries. Come on in, friends. Into the Inner Sanctum. This is really a lovely place. All kind of dark and cobwebby. But then the maid hasn't been around for some time. No, she was playing the numbers. Then her number came up. <laughs> Why, through these portals pass some of the nicest people in the world. True, they're rather boring, but after all, they are deadheads. <laughs> and I'll take a good old redhead deadhead any time. Why, Mr. Host, are you finally admitting that you like the ladies? Well, of course, Mary. Don't you know, some of my favorite ghosts are girls. But I do wish they weren't so vain. Why, I know one who has pleats in her shroud. Not only in the front, but in the back, too. Yes, just in case she should turn over in her grave. (laughs) Oh, dear. There you go talking nonsense again. I like talk that makes sense. Good common sense, like the things the tea experts say about Lipton tea. For instance, they say that Lipton's has a brisk flavor. And that's the truth, because Lipton's does taste fresh and tangy and and full-bodied, never wishy-washy. And then the experts say that that brisk flavor makes all the difference in the world when you're sitting down to a cup of tea. And, folks, that's absolutely right. That brisk flavor is the reason why Lipton's is such a comfort, why it actually makes good food taste better. Yes, folks, you just don't know how good tea can be till you've tried Lipton's. So buy a package of Lipton's and taste what you've been missing all this time. And talking of time, friends, may I take a few years of your life? Mm -hmm. All right. Get ready to hear a gory little story entitled Boomerang. It's an original radio play written by a couple of Australian bushmen named Michael Sklar and Richard Manoff. And stars Martin Gable in the role of John Keeler. So, hitch up your chair, switch off the lights, and look out. Ah! Help, help me. No one heard me. No one came. I lay there watching the blood ooze from the wound. My chest was on fire. The flesh where the bullet had entered was torn, shredded. And in my back there was a kind of numbness. I screamed, Ah! Help! Help! But no one answered. I was utterly alone, helpless, watching my life dripping drop by drop to the floor. Then the blackness closed in. When I regained consciousness, two uniformed patrolmen were bending over me, looking frightened and puzzled. Suicide, Riley? Either that or murder. Their voices seemed to come echoing over an aching void. I wanted to tell them how it had happened. I wanted to tell them about Bill Sloan and Helen and the airplane. I was frantic. I had to tell them. He's trying to say something, Riley. Poor guy. He can't talk. He's too far gone. I couldn't talk. I'd lost too much blood. 
My tongue was thick like cotton. My lips moved, but that was all. It was all shut up inside me. They would never know how it had happened. Riley, it looks to me like murder. Murder, yes, it was murder. And if only I could have spoken, I would have told them. About my nervous breakdown. About the sanitarium. That's where it began, back there in that plushy prison. I was locked up behind that big wall. And my wife and my partner, they had had the chance to discover each other. And then when I came out, the doctor said I was cured. Their false solicitude. And all the while, suspicion was building up inside me. I was already suspicious that day. I caught them by surprise. I'd come directly home from my regular visit to the psychiatrist instead of returning to the office. Bill was there in the living room with Helen. My partner and my wife laughing together. I closed the front door silently. The rugs muffled my footsteps. I entered the room suddenly, wanting to see their faces when they saw me. Oh, what, what, darling? Hello, Helen. Uh, John, how did you happen to come home in mid-afternoon? Why aren't you at the office? I was thinking of asking you that question. Bill made some flimsy excuse, but I caught the look of guilt on his face. He was a bachelor... Smooth with words. Successful with women. And I was beginning to believe he had succeeded with my wife. Oh, I had evidence. There was the time a few nights later. Helen and I were going up to bed. As we passed the umbrella stand at the foot of the stairs, I... noticed something. Helen. Hmm? Just a moment. This umbrella. It's Bill's. Oh, is it? Yes, it is. What's doing here? Well, he must have forgotten it when he was over the other day. Take it out of the office in the morning, will you, darling? I made no reply. We continued up the stairs and went to bed. I waited until Helen was asleep, then crept out of bed and down the stairs. There was the umbrella. I reached out my hand, afraid to touch it, but I had to. The umbrella was still wet. It had rained that afternoon. I said nothing about it the next morning. Oh, I was suspicious enough. But I told myself I had to be absolutely sure. And then, that next night, it happened. Helen went out after dinner, saying she had an appointment with her hairdresser. As the door closed behind her, I picked up the phone and dialed the number. Hello? Crescent Beauty Salon. Alberta, this is Mr. John Keeler. I'm calling for my wife to verify her appointment for this evening. Mrs. Keeler? But, monsieur, she has no appointment for this evening. Now, I was sure. Bill and Helen were together. I struggled to control my emotions. My head was whirling. I felt ill, weak. My heart was pounding in my chest. The room began to spin. First the floor lamp, then the chairs, finally the table whirling around my head. I needed air, air. I forced myself out of my feet, stumbled across the floor to the window and threw it open. The stars, too, were spinning, chasing each other in a mad race across the sky. I sucked the fresh air into my lungs and slowly the stars resumed their normal positions. I drew my head back into the room and then it struck me across the nostrils. Gas. The room was full of gas. Yes, I found one gas jet open in the kitchen stove. I fought against the logical conclusion, struggled against it all that night and into the next day. But I could no longer stand it by mid-afternoon. That open gas jet last night had been no accident. They were planning to have me put out of the way. Well, two could play at that game. I also could commit murder. I worked out a plan. First, the business trip to Buffalo that I'd been putting off for weeks. I could use that as my alibi. I called my secretary. Yes, Mr. Keeler. Miss Jackson, I've decided to go up to Buffalo tomorrow. Could you get me a drawing room on the five o'clock train? I'll call the railroad station right now, Mr. Keeler. A few minutes later, she called me back. I had the train reservation. So far, so good. I went to the bank, and from the bank to the airline terminal. For you, sir. I want a seat on the Rochester plane. 
The plane that leaves New York at 9.30 tomorrow night. 9.30. Hmm? What is the name, sir? Dunham. Roger Dunham. Well, you're a lucky man, Mr. Dunham. It's the last seat on the plane. Roger Dunham. That assumed name would prove my alibi. The details of my scheme were falling into place. I went home, and at dinner told Helen I was leaving for Buffalo tomorrow. Tomorrow? Must you go tomorrow, John? Can't it wait? I've been putting this trip off too long already. I'll leave straight from the office and come home the next afternoon. Well, you're being a little inconsiderate. I'll be all alone here overnight. Oh, come, Helen. You're not afraid of anything, are you? Afraid? No, but Well, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll ask Bill to come over and keep you company tomorrow night. How'll that be? Why, why, that'll be fine. Another cog in place. Another gear meshed. Now one last piece to move and the engine of my revenge would be complete. Yes, it was revenge now. Revenge for what those two had done to me. Buffalo, eh? It's a good idea, John. The way your trip could combine business with pleasure. Pleasure? Well, you've been rather tense lately. The change of the scene will do you worlds of good. I'm sure it will. How about Helen? Can you make it tonight? Tonight? Yes. Yes, uh, I'll be over after dinner. That day passed like a dream. With me, the sleepwalker in the center, going through all the motions correctly, but waiting for the evening. For I wasn't hunted now. Now I was the hunter. A little past four o'clock that afternoon, I left the office and took a cab to the station. I went directly to my drawing room... And as the train pulled out, I called for the porter. At midnight, sir? Just a glass of milk, porter. Warm milk. And don't bring it before midnight. Till then, I've got a lot of work to do, and I don't want to be disturbed. Just as you see, sir. I gave the porter an unnecessarily large tip to make sure he'd remember me. Now, when the train stopped to change engines at Harmon an hour later, it was raining. Thunderstorm. <laughs> I pulled my hat down over my eyes, raised my coat collar around my face, and became just another shadowy figure hurrying to get out of the rain. I crossed the platform unnoticed, and ten minutes later I was on a train going southbound, returning to New York. I picked up my car at the parking lot and drove out to my house on the cliff. Parking on a side road, I climbed up the hill on foot. By now the rain was coming down in sheets. Lightning split the sky and thunder crashed around me. I could see the light from my house perched at the edge of the cliff. Now Bill's car was parked on the driveway, pointed downhill. Light came from the living room. I crept through the shrubbery to a window. There they were, Bill and Helen. My partner and my wife sitting side by side on the divan. He drinking my whiskey, comfortable and warm, while I, the unwanted, was standing outside in the storm. How I hated him at that moment. Well, I went back to Bill's car, crept beneath it, and went to work. The sound of the storm covered the noise of my tools as I disconnected the brakes. And I was finished. And none too soon, for suddenly the front door opened, and Bill stood framed in the light of the doorway with Helen behind me. Bad night for it, but we'll never get another chance like this one, Helen. Well, all right, but come back quickly, Bill. I'm nervous. Oh, nothing to be nervous about. John is halfway to Buffalo by now. A perfect opportunity to go over our plans with Bates. All right, go ahead, then. But hurry. I'll have Bates back here in a jiffy. Bates. Bates. He was going to fetch Bates, undoubtedly a hired killer. I laughed inwardly as the car got started. I could see Helen watching it as it picked up speed on the steep downgrades. Something was wrong now, and she knew it. Bill, not the car! Too late, too late. The car was roaring downhill out of control, charging for the lip of the cliff. There was a crash and smash. Bill! Bill! Oh, poor Bill. I always say, protect me from my friends, and I'll take care of my enemies. That's a nice guy, too. Who would have thought he'd go falling for a cliff? But there you are. There's no accounting for tastes. There's no accounting for the people in this story, that's what. Such terrible people. Oh, oh Mary, wait till you meet Bates. He's a boy. He's really going to make our characters dance. 
Yeah, he's going to put him in a groove. Or do I mean grave? <laughs> you don't know what you mean. And it seems to me, Mr. Host, that life is complicated enough without your making it more so. Well, look at what I had to do yesterday. Clean the house, do the Monday wash, and cook three meals in the bargain. Yes, and you'd be surprised at the big help I got from Lipton tea. You see, when I had a moment to relax, I'd make myself a cup of Lipton's. Such an easy thing to do, and it did me a world of good. Mmm, that brisk flavor makes Lipton such a cheering, satisfying drink. It really perks you up. It's never wishy-washy. Of course, I know that lots of folks serve Lipton tea at mealtimes and serve it to their guests, too. But, friends, you really should try helping yourself through the day with a good hot cup of brisk-flavored Lipton tea. Yes, treat yourself to Lipton's when you've got a moment to relax. Well, don't relax yet. First, let's go back to that tiff on the cliff where John Keeler has just killed his business partner. I'm just itching to know what's going to happen to his wife. She's standing by the shattered fence, peering down the side of the cliff into the darkness. And John, he's creeping up behind her. Look out, Helen. He's dead, Helen. Oh. It's a sheer drop of 400 feet to the bottom. John! I thought... John, you said you were going to Buffalo. I am going to Buffalo, Helen, after I finish my business here. Well, well uh, Bill, the, the car just... It was just... a pity about the brakes. They must have come disconnected. Disconnected? Accidents will happen, Helen. John. John, you killed him. You and Bill thought you would pull the wool over my eyes. Well, I fooled you. Stay away from me. I'm going to throw you over the cliff. I'm going to send you to join your lover. You can't do that. Tomorrow they'll find your bodies. They'll think you were thrown clear of the car when it crashed. They'll call it an unfortunate accident. No, no, please, Careful, Helen, you're at the edge. There's nothing behind you. John, John, don't touch me. John! Goodbye, Helen. If I had any feeling at that moment, it was a feeling of satisfaction. I, the failure, had committed the perfect crime. My scheme was flawless. I walked down the hill to my car, changed my clothes, and drove to the airport. As Roger Dunham, I boarded the plane for Rochester at 9.30 that night. Just as I'd planned it, we arrived at that city well ahead of my train. I was waiting when the long line of sleeping cars pulled in at the Rochester station platform. I boarded the train. My drawing room was just as I had left it at Harmon. I sank down in a seat, removed my coat and shoes. I looked at my watch. It was midnight. Uh, come in. Uh, beg pardon, sir. It's midnight, sir. Oh, midnight? Really? Oh, thanks for bringing the milk. It's lukewarm, sir, just like you asked for it. Thank you, Porter. In Buffalo, I went to my usual hotel, checked in, went to sleep. Oddly enough, I slept well that night. A deep, dreamless sleep. In fact, I overslept. For when I wakened, it was broad daylight and the phone was ringing. I, uh... uh, I struggled out of bed, lifted a receiver. Uh, hello. This is the long-distance operator. I have a New York City call for Mr. John Keeler. This is Mr. Keeler speaking. One moment, please. Here's your party. Mr. Keeler? Yes? Uh, This is Miss Jackson. I've just arrived at the office... Mr. Keeler, I don't know how to tell you. The police... What about the police? They're here in the office. They want you to return at once. Miss Keeler, what's going on there? Mr. Sloan and your wife. Both of them are dead, Mr. Keeler. Dead? Mr. Sloan's car went off the cliff near your house last night. The accident was discovered this morning. Accident? You say it was an accident? It must have been an accident, Mr. Keeler. She thought it was an accident. Now, if only the police thought likewise. I told my secretary I'd take the first plane back to the city, and I hung up. A few hours later, I reached New York, hurried to my office. There's a detective waiting in your office, Mr. Keeler. A detective? He said he had to see you. A detective. This was the test. I pulled myself together and opened the door to my office. Mr. Keeler? Yes. 
I understand you're from police headquarters. Jerome is the name, sir. Assistant Inspector. How do you do, sir? We won't take up much of your time, Mr. Keeler. It's an open and shut case. How do you mean that? Well, stormy night, slippery road, bad breaks. Obviously an accident. I'm very sorry. I nodded at the detective. And all the while I was laughing inwardly. He sat there, the very symbol of the law, and offered me official sympathy. No question of clues, nothing overlooked, nothing to fear. Not now. I, the weakling, had committed the perfect crime. Yes, Miss Jackson? Mr. Keeler, there's a man out here to see you. Send him away. He won't go. He says you don't know him, but it's extremely important. What's his name? His name is Bates, Mr. Keeler. William Bates. Bates? The hired killer. I told my secretary I'd see him. I went into the outer office. Bates was sitting on one of the chairs with an open briefcase on his lap. He was a big man. Tough looking. I read the news in the morning paper, Mr. Keeler. Too bad. That was a tough break. Yes. Yes, it was. I didn't know if I should go after you now, but... Well, uh, after all, I'm a businessman. My time is money. I'm sure it is, but why tell me about it? You certainly don't expect me to pay you. Why not? They're your plans. My plans? Well, look at them. Here they are. Why, they've even got your name on them. I didn't know whether I could trust my ears. Whether I could believe my vision. Bates drew a roll of architectural drawings out of his briefcase... And shoved them at me. Look at them. There it is in your partner's handwriting. Plans for the new Keeler house. Who are you? I told you. My name is Bates. I'm a building contractor. Your partner and your wife insisted that the whole job had to be done in secret. In secret? They said something about you having just come out of a sanitarium. They wanted the whole thing to be a big surprise. My mind was reeling. The secret meetings that led me to suspect Bill and Helen... Those meetings were to go over the plans for a house. My house and Helen's. I had killed my best friend and my wife. Inspector Jerome, I want to confess. I killed them. I killed them. Killed them? Killed who? Don't look at me like that. You know who I'm talking about. My partner and my wife. I killed them last night. Now I'm ready to take my punishment. Well, calm down, Mr. Keeler. You've had a hard time. We realize this thing has been a great shock. What are you talking about? The Homicide Squad doesn't jump to hasty conclusions, Mr. Keeler. We've made a thorough checkup on your background. What's my background got to do with it? Well, we know you spent three months in a sanatorium recuperating from a nervous collapse. Now, on top of that, this unfortunate it accident. It wasn't an accident. I killed him. We checked every movement you made since you left the office yesterday. Then you must know. We know you took the five o'clock train to Buffalo. The porter on your pullman had no trouble recalling you. Why, well, he even told us how he brought you a glass of milk at midnight. You were a good 200 miles away from New York when the accident happened. The detective went away, shaking his head. <laughs> Sympathetically. My mind was in a turmoil. I had committed the perfect crime. And it had boomeranged. I went home. The house on the cliff was empty. Everywhere I looked, I saw Helen... Her photograph on my desk. Her red-tipped cigarette still in the ashtrays. Two half-empty cocktail glasses side by side on the living room table. There was desolation in the house. Emptiness. Loneliness. And it would be like this for the rest of my life. But there was one way out. I always kept a loaded gun in the desk. I took it out of the drawer and in my hand. Here was my punishment. This time I couldn't fail. I placed the gun against my chest and pulled the trigger. I fell by the desk and lay there where I am now. Staining the carpet with my blood. I was dying, and I was glad of it. And then I remembered the plane. The plane reservation to Rochester. I could tell the police when they came, and they could check that, and they would know that I was guilty. But they came too late. 
They bent over me. I tried to tell them. I tried. I tried. Riley, he's trying to say something. Yeah, cool guy. He's too far gone to talk. Now I'm lying here on the carpet, waiting to die, with my guilt locked up inside me. I can see a new figure among the police. A man in civilian dress with a small black bag in his hand. How long is it since this man was discovered in this condition, officer? About half an hour, Doc. He's in very bad shape. Will he live, Doc? Will he recover? Oh, yes. He may recover, but only partially. Partially? How do you mean, Doc? Notice his inability to move so much as a finger. Notice how only his lips move, trying to form words without being able to speak. The bullet must have injured his spinal cord. This man is paralyzed. Totally paralyzed. So now I know. I'm paralyzed. I'm not going to die. And yet I can see the policemen moving carefully about the room. And I hear them speaking softly as one speaks in the presence of the dead. So I've failed again. For the last time. Because I know my fate now. To live in this living death. Alone with my guilt. Forever. That is my punishment. John Keeler. Who would have thought his spinal cord could have tied him up in knots? Not so nice for John. Hmm? <laughs> he started out as a Keeler, tried to be a Keeler dealer, but got all wound up. <laughs> Mr. Host, let's forget about that awful story because there's something really important I'd like to talk about. The makers of Lipton Tea and Lipton Soup want me to remind all you folks of a debt that must be paid to our servicemen. A debt that can be paid in part by buying and continuing to buy victory bonds. You know, I think the best reason for buying bonds was given many, many years ago by one of the great statesmen of all time, by Abraham Lincoln, when he said, Let us strive to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle, and for his widow and his orphan to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. Yes, folks, that's just what we're helping to do when we invest in victory bonds. So keep on buying all that you can, won't you? And now, friends, for those of you who like morals with your drama, here's one for tonight. Never mix your partner's business with your pleasure. For if you do, he may consider it a pleasure to give you the business. <laughs> by the way, this month's Inner Sanctum mystery novel is Devil in the Bush by Matthew Head. Yes, and next week's Inner Sanctum story, directed by Hyman Brown, and brought to you by Lipton Tea and Lipton Soup, Next week's story is about a genius, a photographer who believes that death can be beautiful. So he only takes pictures of people who are in the throes of dying. It's enough to make your camera shutter. And naturally, he has to arrange his models, arrange to have them die. So next Tuesday, bring along the kiddies and we'll make it a nice family picture. <laughs> And now it's time to close the squeaking door. So, good night. Pleasant dreams. <laughs> Folks, cold weather and hot soup just seem to go together. And Lipton's noodle soup is the soup of the season. Yes, Lipton's is blessed with a fine 
chickeny flavor, and it has real fresh cooked goodness. Mmm, it tastes just like the chicken noodle soup you'd make right in your own kitchen. The only difference is that Lipton's takes almost no time at all to prepare. So if your family likes chickeny tasting soup that's brimming with tender golden egg noodles, then don't forget to ask for Lipton's noodle soup. Yes, friends, and don't forget to tune in next week for another Inner Sanctum Mystery. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Suspense. Tonight, Autolite and its 96,000 dealers present Mr. Gregory Peck in Nightmare, a suspense play produced and edited by William Spear. Friends, Autolite welcomes you to Suspense. And this is Harlow Wilcox urging you to do yourself and your car the great big bountiful favor of replacing old worn-out narrow gap spark plugs with a set of new wide gap Autolite resistor spark plugs. That's the biggest news I know. But I've also been told to tell you that Suspense is going to receive a great big important national honor tonight during our usual Between the Acts intermission. And say, when it comes to honors, you'll want to award your car a set of wide-gap Autolite resistor spark plugs. Your engine will idle smoother, give better performance on leaner gas mixtures, actually save gas. And if you want the real lowdown on how Autolite resistor spark plugs reduce television interference, see a copy of this week's Saturday Evening Post and turn to pages 8 and 9. See your Autolite spark plug dealer today. And remember, you're always right with Autolite. Oh, and remember, too, Suspense on Television returns to many stations throughout the nation Tuesday night, September 6th. And now, with Nightmare, and with the performance of Gregory Peck, Autolite hopes once again to keep you in... Suspense! They say every nightmare has a prelude, something that inspires it, something that happened or almost happened that your inmost mind seizes upon. It lives there in the back of your head and it multiplies itself and fattens on tiny fears until it's grown into a monstrous bloated horror. And then when it's full-sized with dread, it springs out at us from evil blackness at night when you're defenseless in sleep. The prelude to my nightmare occurred at six o'clock that evening... The 3rd of July. Since Elsa's illness, I'd been walking home from the station evenings instead of having her meet me. It's a pleasant six or seven blocks along Hartsdale Road and then up the hill to Ridgecrest. Just at the corner there, the kids play baseball. The signs say slow children and everything, but it's a nasty spot. And coming down the hill, a guy might... Look out! Look out! Hey, you, what's the matter with you? Don't you know that you can... I didn't see him, brother. They got no right to play him. Have you been drinking? Oh, me? No, because if you had, I'd pull you out of that car so fast and take you over to the police. all right, brother. Calm down. Nobody's hurt. Nobody's hurt. Just a little scared. I was still trembling when I got home. My head ached and I couldn't eat dinner. It wasn't something I could tell Elsa about. She wasn't ready yet to hear things like that. So I just sat there at the table, looking across at Stevie, half hearing his prattle about the new fishing rod and how many fish he'd catch on our outing tomorrow and some little story he'd learned in school about Thomas Jefferson and the first Fourth of July. And then pretty early, I took a pill and went to bed. It was the next afternoon, 
We were driving along, my wife, my boy, and myself. You know that winding road that leads up from Kingston to Falls Town in the trout country? A lot of hairpin turns and a few bad shoulders, but beautiful, beautiful scenery. And that's what we all needed after her nervous breakdown. A little slow around the turns, then. Why do you drive so fast? You're never driving too fast as long as you feel the car's under control. Bet it wasn't under control a minute ago. What a curve. Ben, the gas tank's almost empty. Why didn't you listen to me and fill up at the last station? There's always a reserve after the empty mark. <laughs> Bet we run out of gas. Well, it seems to me, youngster, that when I tell you that... What's wrong? Why are we stopping? Oh, uh, that's what I'd like to know. <laughs> you know, Dad, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. Out of gas. Oh, Ben. Will you ever learn? Well, everybody runs out of gas once in a while. Okay, well, it's a nice day for me to take a hike. But, Ben, is it all right to be parked like this? On the curb, so close to the road? Well, why not? Where's the traffic? Only adventurers like us know about this road. Well, goodbye, folks. Oh, goodbye, Mr. Know-it-all. Well, I'll go with you, Dad. Oh, no, you'll stay here. Rule of the woods. Always leave one man behind to protect the women. Oh, can I take out my rod? Can I practice how to cast? Sure. And you, lady, you wipe off that smile. <laughs> With my feet, this is a first-class tragedy. Well, it's a smart thing you did coming back this way. Nothing up ahead for five miles but the royal coachman. Uh, what do you mean? It's the name of a trout fly. <laughs> well, I know that. <laughs> it's the name of a roadhouse. Fancy name for a saloon. <laughs> Hang out for fishermen. Uh, they say. Oh? Oh, what do you say? Don't go there, crookedest looking bunch you ever seen. Crooks from the big town. You go to my nephew, Sammy's place in town. Sammy Crawford. Clean sheets, good beds, home cooking. <laughs> hey, good undertaker, too. Called yourself a mortician. <laughs> well, what do they need him for, the fish? Uh, alive or dead. He puts you to bed. <laughs> well, want anything else? How's your oil? Oh, uh, just the gas, thanks. Are we all straight? Yep. Yeah. Oh, 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 one dollar deposit on the can. Give it to my nephew, Sammy, and let him take the dollar off your bill. Oh, well, we may not see Sammy. We'd like to pitch camp tonight. Mm, got a place? No. Uh... Oh, that's bad. Gets dark mighty quick up this way. You sleep at Sammy's, mister. Better make a reservation. Trout season. Well, maybe you're right. You got a telephone in there? Sure have. Fifteen cents. Oh, this is going to be expensive fishing. Oh, what's nephew Sammy's number? It's right here on the wall, over the phone. Oh, say, look at that fellow coming down the pike there. Eighty miles. Bound for the roadhouse. Can't wait. Say, there are two dozen numbers over this phone. Uh, pick the biggest one, the one in red. Hey. Oh, look at him go, would you? Come on, you crazy fool, you. You're going to save five minutes if you have to kill five people to do it. Will you try to straighten out some of them bends up ahead? <laughs> you crazy fool. The pine trees were casting their last longest shadows across the road as I hiked back to the car. Well, we weren't going to get too much fishing done on the 4th of July. But we had to find some for Stevie. What a kid. Teasing his old man all the time. Then I came around that hairpin turn, and there was the car a few yards away. But no family. Uh, Elsa? Hey, Stevie! No family. Oh. <laughs> well, Stevie was asleep, and she didn't want to call out. That's right. The kid was tired. A lot of excitement for one day. I stepped on something. It's Stevie's trout rod. Lying in the middle of the road, these kids have no sense of responsibility. A split bamboo rod with silk winding and a balance that was so perfect. Well, I stepped up to the car. Elsa sat in the back seat looking at me. And in her lap, she held my boy. Dead. Elsa couldn't speak. She couldn't speak. She couldn't speak. I forced some brandy between her teeth and made her swallow it. Her hands were like ice. I wanted to rub them, but I 
couldn't pry them loose from the boy. No! No! I didn't see him. No! You want to make sure. I know. You want to make sure. Get away! Oh, get away! Elsa, how did it happen? I... His trout rod. Always his trout rod. He was standing at the edge there, casting. He wasn't on the road. He wasn't. And then there was a noise, a car coming up fast. You could tell. And before we could move, it came around the bend but, and it swerved. Uh, Elsa, the what? There was so much dust. So much dust and pebbles everywhere. Such a thick cloud of dust. And Stevie flying out of it. Elsa. Like a ball or a bird. Flying out of it. Uh, Elsa... Take some more brandy. It'll do you good. No! No, I don't want any. Get away. Elsa, you've got to take some more brandy. Elsa. That's how he looked. Standing in the road with the bottle in his hand. Who was standing in the road? The man. The man who killed us. He he came back? He got out of his car and he came over to where I lay in the road with Stevie. He had a bottle and he took a drink and he offered me a drink and he said he was sorry. And then he drove away. <laughs> He said he would die. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Elsa. Sorry. Elsa, Sorry. darling, Elsa, don't, don't, Elsa. Poor little Steve. Poor sweet little Steve. Poor, poor Steve. My boy. And then it began to grow in me. And then the hate began to grow. She couldn't remember his car or the clothes he wore, and I couldn't make her describe his face. But I knew that somehow I'd find him. He couldn't be very far off, not in this part of the country. I'd find him. And when I did, I'd kill him. Autolite is bringing you Mr. Gregory Peck in Nightmare. Tonight's production in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Friends, this does my Autolite heart good. It's my privilege to introduce Mr. Fred Dearborn, president of the National Safety Council who will present to Mr. Royce G. Martin, president of Autolite, the National Safety Council's annual award for, but you can't guess, an Autolite suspense program. Yes, suspense not only won the Alfred P. Sloan Award for Distinguished Public Service to Highway Safety, but another great honor for this same program will now be presented. Friends, Mr. Dearborn. Thank you, Harlow Wilcox. The National Safety Council wishes to thank you, Mr. Martin, and the Electric Autolite Company for bringing to your tremendous radio audience the year's outstanding highway safety program. James Cagney in this suspense show titled No Escape. It was a wonderful story presented to perfection by Mr. Cagney and his supporting cast. The judges unanimously selected it as the winner. So now, Mr. Martin, I have the pleasure of presenting to you this certificate of award. Thank you, Mr. Durbin. In promoting highway safety, and you can rest assured, it is a great pleasure to have suspense win this outstanding recommendation from the National Security Council. I speak for one and all of Autolite employees. I trust that tonight's show will make an equal contribution, especially at this time with a heavy travel over the Labor Day weekend. Thank you again, Mr. Dearborn. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage Gregory Peck in Nightmare, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Plunge the car back into darkness toward the roadhouse. The killer, the dirty, dirty killer. There was so much dust. 
dust and pebbles and Stevie flying out of it. Like a bird. Yes. Like a bird. Yes, Elsa. He got out of his car and he offered me a drink. He stood there and he said, you better take a drink. Oh, there's the royal coachman, that roadhouse. And he said he was sorry. We'll stop here and use the phone. There's a Sam Crawford in Falls Town. He runs some tourist house and a funeral chapel. I'll call him from here. Yes. Oh, see all the lights. Why are all the lights on? It's a roadhouse, Elsa. So many people going in. Why are they laughing? Well, they don't know how we feel, Elsa. They don't know about us. Is it all right to leave you here for a moment? I, I, I want to call. There he is. Would you like me to... Elsa. That's him. He killed us. Who? That's him. Who? The one, the one who hit Stevie? Where? There he is. Where? That one? The man standing in the doorway? How do you know? Can you see his face? He came over and he stood close and he said, You better take a drink. He was big and fat and his body filled the frame of the door. He ran a pudgy hand across his face. Now, he was drunk all right and he was trying to shake himself out of it. Well, he'd never drink again. He'd never drive again. Not after I got through with him. Elsa, sit back. Now, don't let anyone see you. He killed us. Yes, I know, I know. Now, wait here, Elsa. Wait here. Don't get out of the car. I watched him go inside. He walked across the lobby and disappeared in the bar. I went in after him. He was sitting there, his elbows on the bar and his head between his hands. I sat where I could watch him and still not be too close. Yeah, with soda. Before the bartender hardly let go, he had it down. And then his watery, bloodshot eyes looked about the room. His eyes caught mine. Bartender. He called to the bartender and then whispered something in his ear, looking at me, then pointing. The bartender walked over. What'll it be, Mac? Huh? Oh, uh, oh, nothing. Uh, really, I, I, I don't care for anything. Oh, it's on this gentleman. Have a drink, fella. It's on me. No, thanks. Can't drink alone, never could. Come on, now, have a drink. What'll it be? Can't insult the man, you gotta have a drink with him. Come on. Better take a drink with him, fella. Well, soda, just plain soda, but I'll pay for it myself. Just plain soda? Please, here's the money. What do you think you're doing? He don't want your money. Ain't that right? Your money's no good here. He kept breathing in my face and talking and ordering more drinks. And I kept thinking of Elsa in the car. The way her eyes changed when she saw him. The thing in her eyes when she looked at him. That fat man breathing down my neck and guzzling like nothing happened. I'll have it again the same way. Come on, fella. Drink up. Come on, you can't drink that stuff without something in it. Drink it. Hey, hey give him something in that no, soda. I don't want anything. He I... don't want anything. He don't want anything. No, I... I'll have it again the same way. Coming up. He kept looking at me, breathing at me. He had the face of such an ordinary man, only very beefy. Such an ordinary man. How could he do what he did and then run away? I wondered who he was, what kind of work he did. Did he have a family? Did he have a son of his own? Was he having all those drinks to try to forget? Well, I couldn't let him forget. How long was he going to sit there? A couple of more drinks and he finally got up. He threw a bill on the bar and started to go. Hey, you changed. Never mind the change. He waved a pudgy hand. Big shot, big tipper. Very generous, nice guy. Even offered Elsa a drink after he killed our boy. I followed him into the lobby. He went to the desk. 2.57. Good night, sir. All right. He started for the elevator. I hurried to the stairway. I, I, I ran up to the second floor. I waited off the stairway landing and watched the elevator door Good open. Night, wait a minute. Not so fast. Please. I said wait a minute. Don't shut that door. Not so fast. There's someone else ringing. I want to ask you a question. I have to go. People ringing. Can I ask you a question? Please step away from the door. You're blocking. Answer my question. Get away from the door, then I'll tell you. Sure. Now answer me. When are you going to... Smart, Alec. Think she's smart. He started down the hall, coming towards me. I stepped back into the stairway took a cigarette out of my packet, started to light it. He walked past, then he stopped. Oh, 
Hi. I didn't want to talk to him. Just wanted to do it and get it over with. I started toward him. We were alone. And then somebody was coming down the stairs. You wouldn't mind coming along. I don't like it. Even the service is lousy in the place. One elevator and you can die waiting. Uh, How's how's about a light? There's nothing here to do but fish. Well, before I could answer him, his fat, pudgy hand closed over mine and drew the lighted match to the cigarette in his mouth. He puffed loosely. His hand was damp and warm. I, I drew back. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. I'll see you around. I counted the doors as he passed on down the hall. One. Two. Three. The fifth door down. That was his room. I walked slowly down. I stood in front of his door. So now it would happen. Who is it? Who is it? Who is it? Oh. What do you want? What do you want? I I uh, I want to ask you something. May I... Oh, sure, sure. Come in, come in. He waddled over to the bed and sat down. Hey, you sit down. His watery, bloodshot eyes blinking at me. I didn't know how to begin or what to do. The blind rage was gone. Something happened to me. Now, suddenly, I, I didn't know what I was doing there. What do you want? I walked over to the window, fumbling for some foolish excuse. It was no use. I... I couldn't kill anybody. I couldn't do it. Ask you, what do you want? I looked out of the window. The light from the neon sign on the roof made everything look so lonely and dead. What's the matter with you? And there was my car in the driveway and Elsa sitting there. Her face, the thin outline of her face, so gray. Her, her mouth pressed tight in a straight, hard line. What do you want from me? She was holding my son, holding him tight, pressed close to her, holding him. My son. What do you want? Why did you kill my son? Huh? You drunken fool, why did you kill my son? You're crazy! You're crazy! Bloodshot eyes bulging from his head, frightened and guilty. Uh, he reached for the phone and then I was on him. Uh, why did you kill him? Uh, uh, you killed him! Uh, you killed him! Uh, you killed him! Uh, you... You killed him! Uh, you... Killed him! Operator... You kill him. Operator. 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 It was done. All done and over with. And now I felt better. Now it would be easier. There'd be a little less pain when they buried my son. Elsa, you all right? He's dead. I made sure of that. Now, let's get out of here. A twisted black top road unwound steadily under the headlights. But something had changed. It, it was no longer a road. It was a cloudy, misty jungle where everyone was old and haggard. And there were no children. And then we brought our boy into Falls Town. You don't mind a suggestion, Mr. Kane. You look pretty done in. And when we carried the boy out of the car, I had a look at your wife. Yes, I know. Uh, good thing you didn't stop at the Royal Coachman. Where? The Royal Coachman. That's a roadhouse. Halfway between here and my uncle's gas station. You didn't see it? Uh, no. Well, it's all lit up with neon. Like a regular Christmas tree. Troopers just phoned. There's a job for me. Somebody choked somebody to death. Lots of excitement. Oh, well, uh, who, who did it? Oh, they'll find him. She looks bad, your wife. We ought to get her right to bed. Yes. Elsa? Now I have no son. Well, this is Sam Crawford, Elsa. He's going to take care of Stevie. And we're going to sleep in his house tonight. I think we need some sleep, don't you? That's him. 
What do you mean? That's him. He did it. He did what? He killed my son. Elsa. I'm Sammy Crawford, ma'am. I run the local... He killed us. He killed us. Elsa. Elsa. Look at me. Are you all right, Elsa? I don't think she knows what she's saying. He came over. He stood there with a bottle. He said he was sorry. Elsa. Elsa, this is Sammy Crawford. He wasn't there. He was here, miles away. He killed us. I'll get Doc Sadler. What's the matter with you, Elsa? I know he didn't do it. He couldn't have. I was talking to him on the telephone when it happened from the gas station. Elsa, we know who did do it. We know. And he's dead. He said he was sorry. He said he was sorry. Elsa. Yes. Look across the street. Elsa, do you hear me? Look across the street. Yes. Do you see that man walking toward the street light? Can, can you see him? Answer me. Yes. Well, just look at him, Elsa. That's all. There. Now, now, he, now he's under the light. Well? That's him. No. That's him. No. That's him. He did it. Elsa. He did it. Elsa, that's a minister. He did it. You know it wasn't that's a minister. Him. You saw him. It wasn't him. Sam Crawford. He was talking to me that's on the him. telephone. That's him. No. That's him. No, Elsa. That's no. Him. No. That's no. Him. No. That's no. Him. No. 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 Oh. Ben! Oh. Ben, darling! Oh. Oh. Ben! Huh? Ben. What? What? Oh. Oh. Hi, Dad. Oh. Hi. Hello, Stevie. Hi. Darling, what on earth? You're dreaming something. <laughs> moaning and great racking. I, uh, <laughs> it was a nightmare. Oh, else it was. It was. <laughs> Dream you lost a job? Yes. Yes, that was it. How did you know? Because I know everything. Come on now. Up, out of bed. We've got a big day. Fourth of July comes but once a year. Garage doors open, Stevie? Boy, will we burn up the road. Stevie, wow. stop that talk. Why, darling. Oh, I'm sorry. You know, instead of going up by Falls Town and up there... We'll cut across just before Kingston and, and find our fishing over around Litchfield, huh? I feel like Connecticut today. Okay, Dad. I gotta go for my job. What did you dream about, darling? It was so awful. Me? <laughs> well, since you have to know, I had a horrible, jealous dream. I dreamt you didn't love me. <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, that was the wildest dream imaginable. Now, wasn't that a waste of time? Suspense, presented by Autolite. Tonight's star, Gregory Peck, in Nightmare. Mr. Peck, the subject of our show and your character portrayal won't do highway safety any harm this Labor Day weekend. Today's newspapers carried some dreadful predictions of the accidents and deaths likely to happen. Yes, I saw them. And if I may, I'd like to add a few words of my own on this subject of safety. The mic is yours, Greg. Well, this evening, the Electric Auto Light Company has been honored for its efforts on behalf of highway safety. You, too, can earn such an award. Of course, yours won't be quite the same. No bronze plaque or embossed certificates. And no one will pin any medals on you. Yours will be a greater, more personal reward. The deep-felt satisfaction that comes from knowing that you've taken care and not endangered your own life or the lives of others. So drive carefully, won't you? Today, tomorrow, always. Thank you. Yes, folks, drive carefully and drive happily, too, by switching now to new Wide Gap Autolite resistor spark plugs. They're ignition engineered to work as a perfect team with your car's complete electrical system. So for a smoother engine idle and long spark plug life, just remember, you're always right with Autolite. Next Thursday, for suspense, Ray Milland will be our star. The play is called Chicken Feed, and it's the story of a man whose life was worth, literally, a nickel. It is, as we say... A tale well calculated to keep you in... Suspense! Tonight's suspense play was produced and edited by William Spear and directed by Norman MacDonald. 
Appearing with Mr. Peck were Lorene Tuttle and Alan Reed. Music for Suspense is composed by Lucian Morawieck and conducted by Lud Bluskin. Nightmare was a radio play by Herb Meadows from a story by Samuel Bloss. Gregory Peck is currently being seen in MGM's The Great Sinner. Don't forget, next Thursday, same time, Autolite will present Suspense, starring Ray Milan. You can buy Autolite resistor spark plugs, Autolite stay-full batteries, Autolite electrical parts at your neighborhood Autolite dealers. Drive right. Switch to Autolite. Good night. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. And now, a tale well calculated to keep you in... Suspense. We live in an age of wonders. What was yesterday's impossibility is today's miracle and tomorrow's fact. So, perhaps our story today isn't just a story. We only say perhaps. But it might be worth asking yourself... Is it just a story? In a moment, act one of Heads You Lose, starring William Redfield as Steve Kimberly, and written especially for Suspense by Robert Arthur. The first portion of Suspense is brought to you by the makers of Alpine Cigarettes. What's it like to smoke an Alpine? Well, it's like many fresh, light-hearted things you enjoy. It's like the splash of an oar on a quiet lake. Like the sight of a flag rippling in the wind. The way the air suddenly cools during a summer rain. That's what it's like to smoke in Alpine. It's nothing at all like the sort of smoking you may be used to. Alpine gives you a fresh, high-spirited sort of smoke. A hearty, even exhilarating kind of taste. If this sounds good to you, try Alpine filter cigarettes. There's something more to smoking with an Alpine cigarette. It was a nice, chilly morning in October, and Rollo Collins and I were sitting in Rollo's office wondering where our next dollar was coming from. Rollo didn't look hungry since he weighs about 300 pounds and has the appearance of a dishonest cherub. But I knew he was. As for me, Steve Kimberly, I felt like a walking skeleton. Rollo and I were private detectives. Now, I won't try to whitewash us. Let me just say nobody ever actually proved anything against us. But we were, let's face it, a firm people came to in desperation with cases more reputable firms wouldn't handle. And when the intercom buzzed, Rollo and I jumped. Yes, my dear. A gentleman by the name of Harrison Ward to see you, Mr. Collins. Mr. Ward? That's right, sir. He's an attorney. Oh, by all means, show him right in. Yes, sir. Harrison Ward was a tall, thin guy with a tall, thin face. And as he closed the office door and looked at us, his Adam's apple jumped up and down nervously. My name is Ward, uh, Harrison Ward. I'm an attorney. I wish to engage you to find someone for me. Uh Uh-huh. Butter wouldn't have melted in Rollo's mouth as he waved Ward to a chair. You come to the right place, Mr. Ward. We find people. That's our business. Well, this is an unusual case. I want you to find... Well, his name is Joshua Franklin. Joshua Franklin? Surely you're not serious. Joshua Franklin's disappearance is one of the great mysteries of the century. Isn't he the Wall Street financier who walked out of his office one day with 100000 in cash? That's the man. Ah, and was never seen again? Precisely. Hmm. Not the slightest clue to his fate has ever been discovered. I told you it was an unusual case. But my dear Mr. Ward, according to my recollection, even when he vanished, Joshua Franklin was a dying man. Yes. Yes, that's true. His body was riddled with disease. Doctors gave him six months at the outside. It was such a pity. That brilliant financial mind, as keen as ever. 
The body that no miracle of science could keep going. In that case, Mr. Ward, no matter where he went, Joshua Franklin must have died at least six years ago. Oh, yes. Mm. Doesn't specialists assure me he cannot possibly still be alive. And yet you wish us to find him? My dear Mr. Ward, on occasion we do the impossible. But we cannot work miracles. What you need, Mr. Ward, is a spirit medium. Oh, please, gentlemen, I assure you, I've come to you in desperation. I know that Mr. Franklin must be dead, and yet... Yes? Please go on. Three weeks ago, Joshua Franklin spoke to me on the telephone. Oh, come on now. You can hardly expect us to believe that. Well, it couldn't have been anybody else. He identified himself by a secret code. Did you recognize his voice? Well, no, it, it, it did seem changed. But it may have been a bad connection. Mr. Ward... You're certain it was Joshua Franklin? I'd swear to it. The things he reminded me of. Well, no one else knew about them, living or dead. Oh, I'll bet, especially dead. Tell me, just why did Joshua Franklin phone you? He instructed me to sell 10,000 shares of universal mining stock, which he owned. Did he say why? Well, he promised to explain later. But he never called again. Probably St. Peter wouldn't let him slip out to use the telephone. Uh, Steve. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Ward, think carefully. Was it a long distance call? What else could it have been, Rollo? Very long distance. I think it was a local call. But with this new direct dialing, it's so hard to tell. Well, Mr. Ward, we are forced to believe that Joshua Franklin is still alive. In or near the city. We uh, will take the case. Our fee is $100 a day. Well, that's quite all right. In addition, we would expect to collect the reward originally offered. $100,000 if we find him alive. And 50000 if we find him dead. So, at last, we had a case. Finding a missing millionaire who had been dead seven years. Harrison Ward gave us a $500 advance and left. My own starting point was that mysterious phone call in the order to sell 10,000 shares of universal mining stock. I went to a stockbroker friend. He told me the unexpected sale had created a small panic in universal mining. Somebody usually makes money off such panics. My friend came up with a name. The name of an individual who had sold universal mining short just before the panic and made about $20,000. The man was an amateur, not an experienced Wall Street operator. I did some checking on the fellow and then reported back to Rollo Collins. You say his name is Green? Dawson Green? Mm-hmm. Don't place it, but somehow it's familiar. Professor Lawson Green, Ph.D., FRCS, and a lot of other initials. About ten years ago, he was a professor of neurosurgery at a big medical college. Hmm. You say he was? What happened? Well, he got mixed up in some kind of scandal, something to do with some rather radical experiments he was making, and he resigned. Since then, he's been living all alone out in the suburbs. And you think he made that telephone call and hoaxed our legal friend Harrison Ward? Oh, Rollo, I think he did. He's the only one who cashed in on the deal. Curious, Steve. Curious. I wonder where he got that confidential stuff he told Ward. Maybe he knew Joshua Franklin once. Anyway, I'm going to find out. Sit tight, Rollo, while I go out and have words with the mysterious Professor Green. <laughs> Professor Green's place turned out to be a big stone house set back in a grove of trees and surrounded by a heavy wire fence. Obviously, he liked solitude. I drove into the local village and asked some questions. It turned out the professor had bought the place seven years before and put in a lot of curious machinery. With him, he'd had a white-haired man he called his brother. Only the brother had never been seen again. Yeah, and just seven years earlier, Joshua Franklin had disappeared too. A connection? Oh, I'd have bet my life on it. So, I telephoned Professor Green. Hello, hello, what do you want? Um, is this Professor Green? Yes, yes, who are you? Why are you calling me? Uh, my name is Steve Kimberly. I'd like to talk to you about an old friend of yours, Joshua Franklin. About who? Whom is the correct usage, Professor? 
I don't know what you're talking about. Goodbye. I'm not so fast, Professor. I'm just a fellow who's interested in Joshua Franklin. I'm working alone, but if you insist, I can call in the cops. Police? Only, I hate crowds. Don't you? Very well. Come out to my house. I'll see you. You see? Sometimes the easy way is the best way. I drove back. The gate was open. I drove up to the front door. A little white-haired man with bright, nervous eyes and shaking fingers let me in. Well, come in, come in. Thank you, Professor. I'm glad you agreed to see me, uh, alone. I haven't any idea what you want. I agreed to see you just to stop this insufferable nuisance. Well, I'd hardly call one phone call insufferable. However, I'll get down to business. Where is Joshua Franklin? What became of him? I don't know. I never heard of Joshua Franklin. Now, young man, goodbye. No, 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 you're not getting rid of me that easily, Professor, so let's start over. Where is Joshua Franklin? What do you want? Why have you come here? I won't let you ruin my experiment. It's my whole life. And now you're trying to destroy what I've done. Take away everything that I've accomplished after I've given up my career. Everything to... to... <coughs> Oh, Professor, <laughs> Professor, easy, easy. You're going to blow your top here. Now, believe me, I'm not here to destroy anything. I'm here as a friend. I want to help you. What, what brought you here, anyway? That little transaction in universal mining stock. So that's it? Mm-hmm. I was afraid. But he told me to do it. He? You mean Joshua Franklin? Yes. I mean, Joshua Franklin. Ah, you've got him here in this house? You've kept him a prisoner all these years? No, I only saved his life. I'm the one who's been the prisoner. You saved his life? In, in spite of what the doctor said? I, well, man, why all the secrecy? You could have been famous. You'll see. Yes, I'll take you to Joshua Franklin himself. And then you'll understand. The little professor led me down a long corridor to a heavy metal door, and as we went, my brain was clicking like an adding machine. I was busy trying to figure out my next step when Green led me down a flight of stairs into a pitch black room. There was some kind of pump going. Here we are. Joshua Franklin is in this room. Huh? Well, turn on the light. No, no, not yet. I'll speak to him first. Now, don't be surprised if his voice is uh, odd. Mr. Franklin, I'm here. How are you this morning? I'm tired. Tired beyond human endurance. I know. But I'm working on the problem. Soon you'll be a new man again. Don't bother to lie to me. I know the truth. You must be patient. It takes time and money. You'll never succeed, never. I was a fool ever to think you could. I should have died as nature intended. Finish me now and let me have peace. Please, you must be patient. I'll return later. Now rest. Now you can no longer hear us. Unless you'll turn on the light. Hey, this is a laboratory. Nothing in here but apparatus. Where, where's Franklin? He's in here. He was speaking to us through this loudspeaker. Well, okay, then where is he? Over there, in the far corner. In the... Oh, now quit kidding. All I see is that pump, a lot of glass tubing with some red liquid bubbling through it. And on top, a black glass ball about 18 inches in diameter. To save Joshua Franklin... Desperate measures were necessary. What do you mean? He's inside that glass ball. What? The pump keeps him alive. Inside that glass ball? Well, you couldn't get a man in that thing. You could just about get his... Oh, no. Exactly, Mr. Kimberly. His head. I believed him. I had to believe him. We went back upstairs and talked. Green told me how he'd been experimenting with animals, gone too far, and got fired. 
than how Joshua Franklin had come to him. You see, he had heard an exaggerated account of my experiments. He offered me $100,000 to give him a new body. Put his head on a new body? Exactly. I told him I couldn't do it. He insisted. He was dying and he was frantic. So, I agreed. Knowing all the time you couldn't? Not then, no. But I hoped that someday I could. So, we came here and I performed the operation. I discarded the disease-ridden body. I placed the healthy head inside the glass where it's kept alive by a circulating nutrient fluid. I... Oh, but the details don't matter. All these years, I've struggled in secret, afraid that if the world knew, I'd be called a monster and put in jail. And now it's all for nothing, nothing. You found me out, you'll call the police. Now, Professor, Professor, take it easy. You've got it all wrong. I'm here to help you. Help me? How? Well, for one thing... I'm going to be your business manager. I don't understand. Now, look, you need assistance, a big laboratory with those you might succeed yet in learning how to join Franklin's head to another healthy body. Oh, yes. Yes, I could. I'm sure of it. Oh, but it would take so much money. That's just it. That's just it. That'll be my job. Now, downstairs in that lab, you have one of the smartest minds that ever operated on Wall Street. We'll use it to plot stock market operations that will net us millions. That universal mining deal was just penny ante stuff. Oh, but it won't work. He won't cooperate. Uh, that's all right. Let me argue with him. Maybe I'm more persuasive than you are. I'll talk to him now. Alone. <laughs> Professor finally agreed. He took me back down into his lab, switched on the apparatus, and left me alone. Mr. Franklin? Mr. Franklin? Can you hear me? Who's there? My name is Kimberly. Professor Green has called me in to help him with your case. It's too late. I have no hope. If you knew how tired I am, how terribly tired... Now, look, it's only a matter of money. With your help, we can get the money. I'm not interested. I refuse to help you. I try to avoid my destiny, and I've been punished for it. But I've suffered enough. In the name of heaven, shut off the pump and let me go. Now, Mr. Franklin, uh, listen, I don't want to do... Are you interested in money? Mm? <laughs> well, sure I am. Isn't everybody? If you want money, I'll pay you $200,000. That interest you? It interests me a whole lot. What do I have to do for it? Just one thing. Shut off the pump. Shut off the pump? Let me find peace at last. If you knew how unendurable it is to spend your life in utter blackness, thinking, thinking, always thinking, please, Mr. Kimberly, tell me that you agree. Uh-huh. Well, why not? Now, maybe you've guessed I hadn't any intention of going through with the deal. But I let him talk, and this is how he explained it to me. His lawyer, Ward, had the key to a safe deposit box, but didn't know what was in it. We arranged I was to phone Ward, put the phone in front of the speaker, and that way Franklin could talk to him like he had before. So I did it. I set everything up for Joshua Franklin's living head in its glass ball to talk to Harrison Ward. Ward was puzzled, but he agreed to give me the key when I arrived, and I hung up fast. Here, Mr. Franklin. It's all set. Now keep your word. Shut off the pump. Well, sure, Mr. Franklin, sure. Just as soon as I get the money out of the deposit you box. promise to stop the pump. And I will, I will. But I haven't got the money yet. As soon as I have it, I'll turn the pump off. Ah, thank you. And after all these years, I'll be able to have peace. You're not lying to me. You swear you will stop the pump and let me go? Sure, Mr. Franklin, I... Swear it. But of course, I had my fingers crossed when I said it. Shut off that pump and do myself out of a million dollars? 
not Mrs. Kimberly's little boy, Steve. Only something happened I hadn't figured on. The door burst open and Professor Green rushed in. I've been listening, but I won't let you do it. I won't. No, no, sh- Professor, listen to me. You're making a mistake. You can't you see. stop the pump. You can't let Franklin die. Professor, this listen. This is my whole life's work. I, look. I'll stop you. I'll kill you. <laughs> He shot at me and the shot went wild. I ducked and yelled at him. Professor, let me tell you something. I'll I kill you, pla- you hear? I'll kill you. The second shot went over my head and hit the glass ball which held all that remained alive of Joshua Franklin. I looked up and for just a second I saw the glass ball split open and fall towards me. Then the professor fired again. This time both bullets hit me somewhere in the chest or stomach and that was the last thing I knew as I dived into a pool of darkness a million miles deep. How long the darkness lasted, I don't know. A day, a week, a year... But at last, through the darkness that seemed to crush in on me like a ton of black velvet curtains, I heard Rollo's voice. Steve! Steve, can you hear me? Steve? I tried to open my eyes and found they were open, and it was still pitch dark. I moved my lips, and words came out. Rollo, I hear you. Oh, that's fine, Steve, that's fine. I was worried about you. Where am I? What happened? I remember Green shooting me, then... Uh, One question at a time, Steve. As for where you are, you're in Washington, D.C. In Washington? In a secret room down in the basement of a certain hospital, Steve, my friend. You can expect lots of company. Doctors, scientists. They'll all be here to ask you questions. Oh, you mean... About Green and how he kept Joshua Franklin's head alive. Uh, no, Steve. About you. You see, officially, you're dead. I'm dead? You had a very nice funeral in Lawnwood Cemetery. What are you talking about? Why does your voice sound so funny? Because you're hearing it through a special hookup. Uh, you see, Steve, when you didn't come back, I called on Professor Green. After he killed you, he cracked up completely. But uh, not before he'd done one thing. Not before he'd saved your life. The same way he saved Joshua Franklin. No. It's not true. I'm afraid it is. Listen. That's the pump that keeps you alive. The government is taking care of you now, Steve. You're a top secret hush hush project. But you should feel pretty good. You're immortal now. You're going to live forever in your little glass jar. <laughs> Suspense. You've been listening to Heads You Lose, starring William Redfield as Steve Kimberly, and written especially for Suspense by Robert Arthur. Suspense is produced and directed by Bruno Zerato Jr., music supervision by Ethel Huber. Featured in tonight's story were Raymond Edward Johnson as Joshua Franklin. Melville Roick as Professor Green, Santos Ortega as Rollo Collins, Kermit Murdoch as Harrison Ward, and Jimsy Summers as the secretary. Listen again next week when we return with Perchance to Dream, written by Bob Corcoran, another tale well calculated to keep you in... Suspense. Phil Rizzuto's Sports Time scores with the fans Monday through Saturday on the CBS radio network. Tea and Lipton Soup present Inner Sanctum Mysteries.
Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. This is your host. Welcome again through the squeaking door. Did you miss her? Hmm? You know, we haven't been around to haunt you these last eight weeks. Yes, that's right. Death takes a vacation. <laughs> Where have we been? Oh, we spent our vacation in a nice, cool place. Underground. Of course, we missed your smiling faces, but where we went, everybody grinned. Yes, they couldn't help it. They were grinning skulls. <laughs> Too bad you couldn't all come along. Good evening, Mr. Host. Well, hello, Mary Bennett. Say, Mary, on my vacation, I met someone who had something very nice to say about Lipton tea. Yes, it was a ghost. And he said the flavor of Lipton's was out of this world. <laughs> I suppose you think that's a real testimonial. But of course, no other product has ever been endorsed by a ghost. Well, I can tell you that Lipton's isn't looking for such compliments. What pleases them is the fact that more real people drink Lipton tea than any other brand. So, get acquainted with Lipton's real soon, won't you folks? Yes, and if you'd like to get acquainted with murder real soon, then listen to Dead Man's Deal. It's an original radio play by that chill master, Emil Tepperman. And our star tonight is Larry Haynes, who plays the role of Joe Lester. It all happened to Joe Lester, who's really a small-time gambler and who had no business in that big-time game with Barney Flood and Dan Kilmer and Nick Zapparetti and the others. But it's, uh, it's really Lester's story. So oh, here he is to tell it to you. I guess it was the biggest poker game I ever took a hand in. Okay. It was in Barney Flood's room, number 327, the Brandon Hotel. They were all big shots. I had to play a careful game. I only had about $3,000, and if I didn't nurse it, a single deal could wipe me out. What's the matter, Lester? Playing kind of tight, Alan Joe. Whatever, Barney. Man's entitled to play his own game, isn't he? Sure, sure. Maybe you don't belong in this one. And he'd guts for this game. You tell him, Dan. Maybe Lester doesn't know what guts are, buddy. Now, listen, you. Don't try to get tough, Lester. It wouldn't be healthy. <laughs> Lester saw at me, Dan. Saw because I took his girl away from him. How didn't you, Lester? Suppose we leave Louise out of this, Bernie. If she prefers you, that's okay with me. <laughs> that's mighty big of you, Lester. Come on, Dan. That's why I hated Barney Flood. Yeah. He'd taken Louise away from me. And Louise was the only thing in the world I loved. And what was worse, Barney Flood and his man Dan Kilmer were laughing at me because they knew I didn't have the guts to do anything about it. But then it came. The hand I'd been waiting for. Dan Kilmer was dealing. Barney Flood opened blind. I opened for a thousand. I dropped. That's me. The others all dropped out. But when I picked up my five cards, I found I had... Three aces. This was the way I'd wanted it. Just Barney Flood and me. And me with a strong hand before the buy. Now I'd show him who had guts. I counted out $2,000 in $100 bills and shoved them out on the table. I see you, Barney. And raise your 1000 Oh. So our little Lester's waking up. Okay, I see the raise. Just the two of us, hmm? How many cards, Barney? One. Right. And how many do you want, Big Shot? Uh, I'll take two. There you are. My hands were a little clammy as I picked them up. I looked at the cards. And suddenly I felt as if I'd inherited the whole universe. I had bought an extra ace. I held four aces. Well, Big Shot... I bought something here. I think it's the winning hand. I'm going to bet the works. Here. All the cash I have with me. Ninety grand. Ninety grand? I felt the sweat on my hands as I watched him push the money out on the table. Ninety grand he was betting. And I had him beat with my four races. But I couldn't see his bet. All I had was about a thousand dollars. Come on, big shot. What are you waiting for? You know, I haven't got that much money. And you shouldn't be playing in this game, Tin Horn. You're taking advantage of me, Barney. You're trying to show me up. 
You know I have to drop out even with a better hand. Oh, so you think you have a better hand, eh? Make the bed inside my limit and you'll see. All right, Lester. We'll see what kind of a gambler you really are. Here. I'll withdraw this 90 grand bet. I'll make another kind of bet. A bet you can see. If you have the guts. Well, what kind of bet? I'll bet my life against your life. The man who loses this deal agrees to commit suicide. For a full minute after Barney Flood made his proposition, the room was so quiet you could hear a pin drop. Barney Flood and I sat facing each other across the table, our clothes cards in our hands. These were the biggest stakes men had ever played for. A life against a life. The other players were stunned and frightened by it. They wanted no part of it. One by one, they made lame excuses and faded from the room. Only Dan Kilmer was left with Barney and me. Look, Barney, why should you risk your life against this punk's life? This is the way it's going to be, Dan. Lester hates me. Don't you, Lester? Yes, Barney. I hate you. You see, Dan, he hates me because deep down inside of him... He knows he isn't as good as I am. All right. This is the showdown. One of us walks out of this room alive. The loser stays here with a bullet in his brain. Is that okay with you, Lester? Yeah. Yeah, sure, it's okay with me, but I don't want Dan in the room. This is just between you and me. Let him go out before we uncover our cards. All right. Well, listen, Bob. You heard him, Dan, just the two of us. Uh, okay. Leave your gun here on the table, Dan. I don't like... Do as I say. Okay. Thanks. Now go down to the lobby and wait. So long. I'll be waiting in the lobby. Okay, Lester. There's no backing out now. We'll open our hands. The loser picks up that gun and blows his brains out. This was the minute I'd been waiting for. My lips were dry. I wet them with my tongue. Now, at last, I had Barney flood exactly where I wanted him. Okay, Barney. Read them and weep. How do you like these? One ace, two aces, three aces, four aces. How do you like them, Barney? Four aces, huh? I kept my eyes on Barney. I wanted to milk the last drop of satisfaction out of that moment. But he was a born gambler. His face didn't show a thing. He sighed. And slowly he began to turn over his own cards. Three of hearts. Four of hearts. Five of hearts. Six of hearts. Seven of hearts. A straight flush. Hello, Lester. Straight flush beats four of a kind. You, you only bought one card. That's right. I went in with three, four, five, and six of hearts. I bought the seven of hearts. A, a straight flush, eh? I, I, I can't believe it. I've, I've lost. Yes, Lester. You've lost. You've lost your life. And a gambler always pays up. There's the gun, Lester. Go ahead. A gambler always pays up. I curled my finger around the trigger. I stood up and leaned across the table. I pointed the gun at Barney Flood and I shot him in the head. Now I had to work fast and carefully. I had it all figured out. When I shot Barney, I leaned over the table so the barrel of the gun was close to his head. There were powder burns on his temple around the wound. I wiped my fingerprints off the gun and pressed Barney's hand around the barrel. Next, I turned my attention to the card table. This was important. I left my four aces intact where I laid them out. But I changed Barney's hand slightly. I removed the seven of hearts, replaced it in the deck, and riffled through it I found the seven of diamonds. I substituted this for the seven of hearts. And now Barney's hand was no longer a straight flush... It was an ordinary straight. And my four races were better. Somehow it looked as if I had won the game. I was ready. 
picked up the phone and asked the operator to connect me with the police. Hello? Police headquarters? This is Joe Lester. I'm in room 327 at the Brandon Hotel. Bernie Flood has just committed suicide. It looks as if Lester has carefully set the stage for foul play. He has to be careful if he wants people to believe that Barney has committed suicide. Because that's the last thing in the world a man would do. <laughs> How about it, Mary? What side are you betting on? I'll give you odds that Lester isn't caught. Why, you know very well that I don't bet. Oh, come on, Mary. I'll tell you what. I'll bet you my Sunday shroud against a package of Lipton tea. Oh, my gracious, I never know what you're going to say next. But I still don't believe in gambling. And, folks, if you feel the same way about it, then I know you'll like Lipton tea, because you can always be sure of its flavor. That's why I always say that you don't know how good tea can be till you know how good Lipton's is. And now, let's go back to Joe Lester. Let's see if his airtight scheme to make Barney Flood's murder look like suicide goes over with the police. Yes, and let's hope it's not so airtight that it leaves him dangling in air at the end of a hangman's noose. At headquarters, all the players told the same story. How Barney Flood had proposed a suicide bet and how they'd all cleared out. Inspector Larkin dismissed them all leaving only Dan Kilmer and myself in the office with him and the stenographer. Now, you, Kilmer. Yes, Inspector. You a Barney Flood's right-hand man? Well, you know I have a private detective's license. Barney paid me to be his bodyguard. You worked for Barney a long time? That's right. Lester says you left your gun on the table. Is that right? That's right. Then I went out. Okay, Lester. It's your story from here. What happened after Kilmer went out? Well... Barney and I uncovered our hands. He had a small straight, but I had four aces. You saw the cards lying there on the table? Yeah, I saw them. What happened then? Well, uh, Barney said, uh, well, I guess I lose. He picked up the gun. I tried to stop him, but he said a gambler always pays up. Then he put the gun to his head to pull the trigger before I could stop him. Hmm. How do you think of that story, Kilmer? I think he lies. Makes you think so? I can't say. Ah, yeah, that's no evidence. Looks like suicide. I'm afraid there's no charge told, John Lester. I wish there was. Hey, you mean I, I'm free to go? Yeah, sure. Go on. Get out. Dan Kilmer gave me a dirty look. But I only grinned at him. I got up and went to the door. Everything was going my way. I was rid of Barney Flood. I'd committed the perfect murder. And now I was free to go to Louise. Funny. Mm. What's awful funny, Louise? How Barney killed himself. Here's your drink. Oh, thanks. There's nothing funny about it. He lost and he paid off. Yeah, I know, but somehow I can't imagine Barney losing a hand like that. Now, listen, Louise, you stop thinking about Barney. He's dead, seeing I'm alive, and I'm not letting any other man have you. Is that plain? Yes, darling, it's plain. Come here, baby. Uh... That's better. Oh. You know, I'm crazy about you. You, you seem to have changed. You, you seem so strong. Yeah, you bet. From now on, nothing stops me. Uh, you know what? We're getting married tomorrow. We won't wait. I'd better answer the phone. I'll let it ring. No, you better let me answer it. Oh, well, okay, go ahead. But make it snappy, will you? I will, darling. Hello? Yes, this is Plaza 87790. I watched her at the phone. And she was more beautiful than anything I'd ever known. That was the happiest I'll ever be. That one short moment while I watched her at the phone. And then it was over. Yes? Yes, he's here, but... Who is this? What are you talking about? No. No, it can't be, please. Please, I... Her voice trailed off into a sob and she hung up. She looked as if all her life had been drained out of her body by that phone call. 
Louise. Who was that? Who was that on the phone? What did he say? He... He said, remind you about the... About the seven of hearts. He said, you know what he meant. Seven of hearts. The card I'd substituted in Barney Flood's hand. But no one could know about the seven of hearts. Barney was the only one. And he was dead. Who gave you that message, Louise? Who was that on the phone? He... He didn't give his name, but I recognized the voice. Louise, for heaven's sakes, tell me who it was. I... I, I can't believe it, but I... I'd swear it was Barney Flood. And then the phone rang again. It's the phone again. He's calling back. I'll answer it. Push Louise off the side. Slowly, I walked toward the ringing phone. Almost in a daze. I picked it up. I think I must have been expecting it. Because I wasn't surprised when I heard that voice. I only felt numb. Hello, Lester. I'm waiting for you. Outside the house. Across the street. Won't you come out and talk to me? About the seven of hearts. Seven of hearts. He, he wanted to talk to me about the seven of hearts. And he was waiting outside. But who? I dropped the phone and went to the window. Pulled back the blind and peered out. At first, at first I saw nothing. And then... And then I spotted him. A shadowy figure standing in a doorway across the street with his hat brim pulled low over his face. And just then a car swept down the street. Its headlights illuminated the doorway and I got a quick look at the face. There was blood dripping from under the hat brim. I'll never remember how I managed to get out of Louise's apartment. Not the front way. I didn't go, dare go out into the street with that shadowy figure waiting out there. I stumbled blindly down the back stairs, flight after flight, almost tripping, skinning my hands on the banisters, bruising my elbows, but I didn't care. I wanted to get away, away from there. Taxi, mister? Huh? Uh, what? Taxi, mister. Taxi. A taxi. Yeah, 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 sure. Get going. Quick. Sure, but where to? Where to? I didn't care. Anywhere. Anywhere, as long as it was away from here. Home. Home, that was the place. I'd go home and shut myself up and not answer the phone. 17 Glidden Road. Quick. Right. I heaved a sigh of relief as we pulled away. Out of pure instinct, I suppose, I looked out the rear window. Suddenly the blood began to pound in my head like a thunderous avalanche. Because back there at the corner was that same shadowy figure. Getting into another cab. Pointing after my taxi. Faster. Faster, driver. You gotta go faster. Hey, what's wrong, mister? Look, that cab behind us. Twenty dollars if you lose it. What cab? That one, you fool. A cab behind us. Hey, one of us must be nuts. And maybe you had a couple too many. There isn't any cab behind us. I turned around and looked again. My driver was right. The street was empty as far back as I could see. Here you are, mister. 17 Glidden Road. I got out of the cab. I saw that the driver was looking at me as if he thought I was drunk or crazy. My shirt was wet with perspiration. My head began to throb and everything swam before my eyes. Then a voice began to whisper in my ear like a terrible refrain. Seven of hearts. Seven of hearts. Seven of I hearts. Moved weakly against the taxi Seven cab. Seven of hearts. That's wrong. I looked down the street. Seven there it was. Hearts. Seven that of hearts. Same shadowy figure with a hat and pulled low over the bloody face. Seven of hearts. Walking Seven toward of hearts. me. Seven of Slowly. hearts. Seven toward of me. hearts. Seven of faster. hearts. Coming toward me fast. Hearts. And the refrain Seven ringing in my hearts. ears. I couldn't Seven stand it. I flung myself into Seven the cab. I wanted safety. Seven of hearts. Drive the police. That's Seven of hearts. Police had 
headquarters, I burst into Inspector Larkin's office. He was in there talking to Dan Kilmer. What's the idea of barging in here, Lester? I've got, got to talk to you, Inspector. Hey, what's wrong, big shot? You look all broken Don't up. Don't keep out of this, Dan. I've come to see the Inspector. What do you want? I, I want protection. you got, you got to protect me. Protect against whom? Against Bonnie Flood. He's come back. It's a gag. No, 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 it's no gag. That guy's gone nuts. No, I tell you, Barney Flood's come back. At first, I, th- I thought it was a phony. But now I'm sure it's Barney Flood. How do you know it's Barney Flood? Because... I stopped short. I'd almost said too much. I couldn't tell him about the seven of hearts. I couldn't tell him why I was sure it couldn't be anybody else but Barney Flood. Get out of here, Lester. I've got no time to wait. But you've got to assign an officer to protect me. I'm... I'm afraid to go home. Look, Lester, I think you're going nuts the way Dan says. If I sign an officer to you, everybody would say I was going nuts, too. Signing a cop to protect a man against a uh, ghost. But I insist. Get out! Look, Dan, will you help me? What? Oh, me? What? You're not working now, are you? Uh, no, I lost my job when Barney died. Well, look, how about a job? Working for me. Protecting me, huh? Against a ghost? Against Barney Flood's ghost? Well, what do you care as long as I pay you? Okay, Lester. You've hired me. Good. Come on, then. Come home with me. I, w- I want you to sit up with me all night, huh? Dan Kilmer came home with me. And we sat up, whiling the time away, playing two-handed poker. My dear Lester. <laughs> yeah. Y- yeah, sure. <laughs> So you're really scared, huh, Lester? Don't laugh at me, Dan. You, you'd be scared, too, if, you, if you'd seen what I saw. You mean, uh, like the guy with the blood on his face? How'd you know about that? And the telephone call about the seven of hearts? The seven of... <laughs> now, I figured that stuff would sort of, uh, get you on edge. What do you mean? I mean that I'm the one that planted that man outside Louise's apartment. That was me on the telephone. You? Sure. That cab driver was my man, too. I had him planted out in back of Louise's house. He was waiting for you to come out the back way. You see, Lester, I had you figured right. Every move. You... You did all that? What was the idea? <laughs> I wanted to get you right here. Like this. Afraid of your own shadow. What? What for? Pick him up. <laughs> picked up the cards. I stared at them. It was four aces. The same hand I'd held with Barney Flood. How would you like to make a little bet on your hand, Lester? Against mine. Say, uh... Your life against my life, hmm? What do you mean? Don't you get it yet? Here, I'll turn my cards over for you. See? Three of hearts. Four of hearts. Five of hearts. Six of hearts. And the seven of hearts. You see, Lester, my hand does have the seven of hearts in it. So did Barney Floods. Before you took it out. Uh, how, do, how do you know about the seven of hearts? For a long time, Dan Kilmer didn't say anything. He just sat there, looking at me. Then he got up. He took out his gun. Laid it on the table. Then he went to the door. How did I know about the seven of hearts? You see, Lester, I dealt the other hand, too. Barney Flood was right. A gambler must always pay up. The gun is ready on the table. And now, I'm ready too. He's in a very grave situation now. Yeah, so grave he needs the help of an undertaker. 
But he was only a beginner in crime. He might have done better if he hadn't come to such an untimely end. Well, I've got no sympathy to waste on him. He shouldn't have gotten into that poker game in the first place. Oh, I don't know. I never forget the time I played strip poker with a bunch of ghosts. Say, was I lucky that day. Yes, you should have seen those ghosts shedding their ectoplasm. <laughs> I declare, I don't know why you're always talking about ghosts. Oh, they're such lucky guys. They always keep cool. Even in the summer, the least little breeze goes right through them. Well, I'd rather be a human being. Real honest folks have a good way of keeping cool, too. They just make themselves a refreshing pitcher of Lipton's iced tea. Yes, there's nothing like Lipton's to perk you up on a hot day. I guess it's that famous brisk flavor that makes all the difference. It's so rich and lively. Whether you drink it iced or hot, there's nothing that can beat Lipton's. The tea with the brisk flavor. <laughs> And now a word of advice. You can't afford to gamble with death because the loser never gets a chance to stage a comeback. And what's more, friends, if all the corpses on this program were laid end to end, they'd be a lot more comfortable. <laughs> oh, by the way, this month's Inner Sanctum Mystery novel is Puzzle for Wantons by Patrick Quentin. Yes, and next week's Inner Sanctum story, directed by Hyman Brown, and brought to you by Lipton Tea and Lipton Soup. Next week's story is going to blow the tubes in your radio. It's about a beautiful woman who marries a dead man. Now there's an unusual romance. And this graveyard Romeo has second sight and always knows who's going to be murdered next. Well, of course he's got second sight. He lost his first sight when he died. See? <laughs> Now it's time to close the squeaking door until next Tuesday. So, good night. Pleasant dreams. <laughs> Folks, even with a cold meal, most of us have a craving for one hot dish. So, folks, don't forget Lipton's noodle soup. And don't forget to tune in next Tuesday night for another Inner Sanctum Mystery. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Tea and Lipton Soup present Inner Sanctum Mysteries. Good evening, gentle friends of the Inner Sanctum. Welcome through the creaking door for another soothing half hour of sweetness and light. <laughs> oh, I've learned a new trick. Would one of you like to step up here and be sawed in half? What? No volunteer? Well, maybe you're right. The first part, the sawing in half, that's easy. But the second part, the uh, putting together again, I'm still not very good at that. <laughs> Mr. Host, how can you joke about such things? Are you trying to get our listeners in a mood for enjoying themselves? That's it, Mary. Well, jokes like that certainly won't put people in a good mood. Here's a much better way to do it. Just serve folks a piping hot cup of Lipton tea, and they'll be in a good mood in a minute. For Lipton's is the password to pleasure. It's tea at its delicious best. Thanks to Lipton's brisk flavor. Brisk, you know, is the tea expert's own word for the fresh, lively, full-bodied flavor of Lipton tea. Unlike ordinary dull-tasting teas, Lipton's is never flat. It's always spirited and satisfying. Try it real soon and get the extra enjoyment of Lipton's wonderful brisk flavor. <laughs>
What does a man think of when there's murder in the air? The close presence of death. Does it have matter and substance? Does it generate unseen light waves that touch a man's subconscious? Or unheard sound waves that speak to him when he sleeps? Well, let's listen to I Walk in the Night, written by Emil Tepperman. With Larry Haynes in the role of Peter Lang to tell you this story himself. I don't know if it was the ringing of the doorbell that awoke me. Dragged me back to consciousness out of a deep, heavy sleep. I felt groggy. As if I'd been drugged. My eyes were so heavy. So hard to keep open. That infernal ringing. I stumbled out into the hall. Myrna's room. My wife. There opposite mine. I knew the door would be locked. We'd quarreled last night while the Judsons were visiting from the house next door. Myrna had made a scene. She went to her room and locked herself in. Please. Please wake up in there. As I stumbled down the hall of the front door, I recognized Phil Judson's voice. Phil and Henrietta lived in the house next door, just across the lawn. Please! Please! All right. All right, I'm coming. Just a minute. Okay. I got this open. There. Oh, thank heaven you woke up, Pete. I thought you'd never hear me. What's wrong, Phil? What's that poker for? Henrietta saw a prowler come out of this house. A prowler? What's the matter with you, Pete? You look groggy. Wake up. I, I don't know. I feel as if I'd been doped. Uh, what's this about Prowler? Henrietta saw him climbing out of Myrna's window. She yelled to me, and I grabbed the poker and came running out. The poker? What, what, what's what? the matter with you? Didn't you hear me? A man was in Myrna's room just now. But, great Scott. Myrna's alone in there. Come on. Myrna. Myrna, you all right? Open the door. She doesn't answer. Phil, are you sure the prowler came out of this room? Yes, they ran around the house and got away. Uh, look, Pete, uh, have you got a key to this door? Oh, it's bolted on the inside. Well, we've got to break it down. Come on, put your shoulder to it. <laughs> Once more now. <laughs> well, where's the light switch? Oh, here. Here, I've got it. Better not come in, Pete. Oh, let me in. I've got to see. <laughs> Take it easy, Pete. Oh, burn it. Strangled. Strangled to death. Oh, burn it. Look at the black and blue marks on his throat. This chain on her neck. It's broken. It was her locket. The one I gave her last Christmas. Killer must have taken it with him. And see here, her fingernails. There's bits of skin under them. She must have struggled and scratched the killer's face or hands. Why, Phil? Why should anyone want to kill her? Then began the long torture of the investigation. Detectives swarming over the house. Men in derby hats examining the body of my wife. Measuring the room, searching for fingerprints. And finally, more men who came and carried her away forever. Through it all, Phil and Henrietta sat with me, trying to give what comfort they could. Oh, Peter, dear, please talk to us. I can't stand seeing you sit there with your head in your hands. It won't bring Myrna back to life. Henrietta's right, Pete. You've got to get a hold of yourself. I know. I know, but... I can't stop thinking about it. Those marks in the throat, the torn chain, the locket torn. Look here, Pete, there's something we have to talk about. Now, get that dazed look off your face and listen to me for a minute. Yes, yes, Phil. There's a police inspector in Myrna's room right now. O'Brien is his name. He'll be coming in soon to question you. Now, you'd better not tell him about the quarrel you had with Myrna last night. I don't get you. It would look bad for you. For me? Oh, what, what do you mean? Phil, you, you don't think that I... 
Suddenly, I caught my breath. My right hand in my bathrobe pocket had touched something cold. Phil and Henrietta both stared at me. Peter, what's wrong? Phil. Phil, look what I found in my pocket. What is it? Look. A locket. It, it's Bernice's locket. The one that was torn from her throat. Phil. Phil, how could this get in my pocket? Here, give me that, quick. But Phil... Give it to me. Perez, it's Marla's locket, all right. You recognize it, Henrietta? Yes. What are you going to do with it, Phil? Get rid of it, quick. Out this open window. Well, if the police find it out there, they'll think the killer dropped it. Phil, it was in my pocket. What, what are you looking at, Phil? Your hand, Pete. What? Your left hand. <laughs> I looked down at my left hand. There on my wrist were three long gashes where the skin had been scraped. As if by the fingernails of a woman fighting for her life. Phil. Do, do you think I could have killed her? Nonsense. I don't believe it. You could never do a thing like that, Pete. Couldn't I? How can you be sure? How can I be sure? Peter, please... Don't talk like that. You're, you're making yourself out some terrible monster, but you aren't. Phil and I know you... You can't be like that. I don't know. Maybe I got up in my sleep and, and killed Myrna without ever knowing it consciously. After all, I, I did have that quarrel with her last night. Nice cut it, Pete. Here comes O'Brien, the detective. I hope I'm not intruding. Oh, no, no. It's, it's all right, Inspector. Come in, O'Brien. Mr. Lang is very upset. The shot. Yes, I understand. Believe me, Mr. Lang, you have my deepest sympathy. I wouldn't bother you at all at a time like this, but there's... Inspector O'Brien was a pink-cheeked, cherub-faced, chubby little man. But his eyes were cold and blue and restless. They kept jumping from Phil to Henrietta to me as he fired his questions at us. Mr. Lang, uh, one more thing. Uh, I understand you had a small party here last night? Oh, no. No, it, it wasn't a party. Just Phil and Henrietta and, and, and Ted Hale. Ted Hale? Yes, Myrna's cousin. Oh, I see. Uh, this Ted Hale, a cousin of your wife, she said. Pardon me, Inspector. Yes, Mr. Johnson. Peter is too easygoing and good-natured to tell you about Ted Hale. But as Peter's attorney, it's my duty to give you certain information. Oh, go ahead. Myrna, Mrs. Lang, owned considerable property in her own right. Recently, I drew a will at her request. In it, she leaves a sizable sum to... Ted Hale. Oh? Oh, I, I... I just thought of something. Well, what is it, Henry? Well, Peter was so groggy when he woke up. That's right. He looked as if he'd been drugged. Well, don't you remember last night? Ted Hale went in the kitchen to mix the last round of drinks. Oh, Henrietta, that's ridiculous. On the contrary, it's quite important. Now, uh, tell me, this Ted Hale, what does he do for a living? Why, he works for me in my brokerage office. Uh -huh. To please murder, I gave him a job as my confidential secretary. Hmm. Uh, I suppose you tell me where Mr. Ted Hale lives. I think I'll have a talk with him. Now, all you have to do, Pete, is sit tight. Let O'Brien follow up his lead. But Phil, I can't let him arrest Ted Hale. He didn't kill Myrna. I did. I must have. The locket. He scratches. It, it's not fair to Ted. As your attorney, I won't let you strap yourself in the electric chair. You go back to your room and get some sleep. Uh, Henrietta, do you mind going back to our house by yourself? Of course not. I'm going to sleep right here in the living room on this couch in case Peter needs me tonight. On my bed in the dark, I kept seeing a thousand pictures. Myrna, her face modeled with strangulation. Phil, always so sure of himself. Henrietta, worried and frightened. And O'Brien, his face grim and his blue eyes cold, going off to question Ted Hale. I must have been close to dozing off when I heard the doorbell faintly, as if in a dream. Tossed about in bed for a moment or two. And then I heard the voices in the living room. Phil's, 
cold and harsh. It was someone else's, loud and angry and frightened. I got out of bed and opened the door. I went down the hall to the living room. I had to know who was in there arguing with Phil. It was Ted Hale. Ted, what are you doing here? Phil phoned me. He told me about Myrna. I called him up, told him O'Brien would be coming for him. I suggested he come over here and talk it over with me. Pete, don't let them arrest me. You gotta help me. Me? Help you? You know I didn't kill Myrna. Well, I'm not sure. Pete. What? I was here last night, you know, when you had that fight with Myrna. What do you mean? If I'm arrested, it says I had a motive, but what about you, Pete? You were always quarreling with Myrna. Now, look here, Ted, if you're threatening me... I only want you to help me, Pete. Don't let them arrest me. Hide me. Hide me out till this blows over or till they get the real killer. I think Ted is right, Pete. We should help him. But where? I'll handle it. You have a dark room fixed up in the cellar, haven't you? Yes. We'll stick a cot in there and let Ted hole up for a day or two. Nobody will think of looking for him in this house. Poor Peter. Seems to be in a daze half the time. Yes, his trouble is that when he's awake, he's half asleep, and when he's asleep, he's half awake. <laughs> it's no wonder he can't sleep well. He seems to be such an honest person, he can't lie easy. Hmm? You know, it's too bad he doesn't go over and stay at Phil's house, Mr. Host. Phil and Henrietta seem the kind of people who do everything to make him comfortable. Well, I just hope they know something about hospitality, Mary. Oh, I'm sure they do. Why, everybody knows that the proper way to treat guests is to serve them something delicious. For example, when guests drop in at my house, the first thing I do is put on the tea kettle. And almost before they have their wraps off, I have my best tea service out, and I'm serving them some of my fragrant, fresh-made cake and a cup of heartwarming Lipton tea. For no matter what time of day or night guests arrive, there's nothing like wonderful Lipton tea to make them relax and feel at home. Yes, Lipton's brisk flavor is so lively and, and full-bodied and satisfying, it just naturally hits the spot with everybody. In fact, I always say, whenever you want to serve your friends or your family a grand, refreshing drink, make it tea. And make it tea at its delicious best. Lipton tea. Now, let's get back to our sleepwalker. There's no telling what he might have done while we were talking about tea. Now, let's see. Where were we? Peter and Phil were going to hide Ted Hale in the cellar. Now, listen to me carefully, Peter. If Ted Hale is arrested and talks, O'Brien will learn about the quarrel you had with Myrna last night. He'll start digging into things that won't look so good for you. No, Phil, wait. And I know you're trying to help me, but if I did it... If, if I did kill Myrna, then there's no use trying to protect me. It isn't right. I'm a dangerous man. Fiddlesticks. But you can't brush it off like that. Do... Do you know what it means to lie awake in the night... wondering whether you've killed your own wife? Wondering whom I'll kill next? Cut that out. We've got business to attend to. Now, here's my plan. We'll let Ted stay here tomorrow. And then tomorrow night... I'll smuggle him out of the country. Get him passage on a freighter to South America, maybe. You think he'll go? Sure, he'll go. He's scared stiff. But we'll need money. Lots of money. Now, how much have you got in the safe at the office? Oh, about 10000 in cash, but there's a batch of negotiable bonds. They'll do. I'll go down to the office the first thing in the morning and get them out of the safe. Uh, you had the combination? Yes, you gave it to me when you gave me your power of attorney, remember? Oh, yes. Now, don't you worry about a thing. Oh, um, here... Take this powder. Hmm? It's just one of the bromides that Henrietta uses. It'll help you get to sleep. By tomorrow morning, everything will be fixed up. Fine. It was almost dawn when Phil left. And it must have been hours later, close to noontime, when I felt myself being roughly shaken out of a heavy, troubled sleep. Oh, Pete, Pete. Wake up. Uh, what? Hey, wake up. Come on, snap out of it. What? Oh. Phil. Gosh, I, I feel groggy. What, what was in that powder you gave me? Never mind the powder. Get your eyes open. 
Got something to tell you. So what's wrong? What happened? Listen to me carefully, Pete. I went down to the office before business hours this morning and opened the safe to get the money out. Yes? The safe is empty. Empty? The securities are gone. Well, it can't be. Who else had the combination besides you and me? Only Ted Hale. Oh? Do, do you think that... I'll bet you a dollar to a donut he's gone. Come on, let's check. <laughs> Look, Pete. There's a light in the dark room. You must have got up early and beat me to it, to the safe. Ted. Ted, you in there? <laughs> Always the optimist, huh? Come on, open it up. Ted. Good heavens. Ted Hale hadn't gone anywhere. He was lying there on a cut. His head was a bloody pulp. It had been bashed in while he slept. With a long-handled cold shovel which lay there alongside the cut. Great Scott. He's been murdered. We stood there in a narrow dark room, Phil and I, and we looked at each other. There was a strange gleam in Phil's eyes. I tried to read the meaning of that gleam, but he averted his eyes too quickly. He dropped his gaze to my hands. I saw what he was looking at. My hands were black and grimy with coal dust. And on the briny, coal blackened handle of the shovel, it was a fresh set of fingerprints. Phil, did I kill him? Did I kill him in my sleep? The same as Myrna? Phil, I can't stand it being a murderer. I'm going to give myself up. You'll do nothing of the kind. If you did it, Pete, you're not responsible. But you do think I did it? And Myrna, too? I, I don't know. I don't know what to say. <laughs> Just think, Phil. Maybe, maybe tonight I might kill you or Henrietta. There's no telling what I might do. Robbers. No, no, Phil. It's hard to believe, but there's the proof. I'm a murderer. I'm dangerous. There's only one thing to do. I won't let you do it. What else is left? Come on. I'm going to help you hide Ted's body. How much further, Phil? Oh, there it is. There's the bridge up ahead. Okay. Here, help me with it. We had the body of Ted Hale in a sack with a pair of hundred-pound dumbbells to weight it down. <laughs> Myrna's funeral took place the next morning. And I had to endure the condolences of friends and business associates. But Phil and Henrietta stood by me all through it. It'll be over soon, Peter. Then you can rest. Keep your chin up. I'll get rid of the stragglers. Look. Look who just came in. Where? Oh, Inspector O'Brien, what does he want, Phil? Take it easy, take it easy. Let me do the talking. I uh, came to pay my respects, Mr. Lang. Oh, well, thank you, Inspector. No trace of Ted Hale, is there, Inspector? I'm afraid not, Mr. Judson. We're combing the city for him, but I'm afraid he's got clean away. You see, uh... It was marvelous to see how calmly Phil could talk to O'Brien about Ted Hale. Knowing all the time just where the body was. Under that bridge. I glanced at Henrietta. She was watching Phil, too. Uh, you know, uh... Know what I think, Mr. Judson? I think Ted Hay will never be caught. I have a very funny feeling that he's dead. Later that afternoon, I took a taxi cab and I went down to police headquarters and asked to see Inspector O'Brien. Oh, glad to see you, Mr. Lang. You're looking a little better this afternoon. I <laughs> feel better, Inspector. I, I feel better because I've come to an important decision. Oh, yeah? Inspector, I've decided to tell you something that'll startle you. <laughs> That's pretty hard to startle an old hand in my business. Go ahead, I'm listening. All right. Inspector, 
Ted Hale didn't kill Myrna. I killed her. That is, I think I killed her. You think you killed her, don't you know? It sounds crazy, doesn't it? But I assure you, I'm perfectly safe. Uh, just a second now. You either killed her or you didn't kill her. If you kill somebody, you know it. No, not in this case, Inspector. You see, I, I think I did it in my sleep. Both times. Myrna and Ted Hale, too. Uh, hold on now. I'll get someone to take notes. I suppose you start from the beginning. I told him the whole story. A fill had awakened me. And we found Myrna strangled. The groggy drug feeling I'd had. How Ted Hale had tried to blackmail me. And how Phil had awakened me once more and we'd gone down to the cellar. And found Ted with his head bashed in. I talked for a solid hour. I'm glad you came to see me, Mr. Lang. Glad you've told me all this. You must have had a hard time reaching the decision to come here. Yes. Yes, it was hard, Inspector. Mm -hmm. Phil wanted me to go away. It would have been so easy to go away and let him take care of things. But I, I'd never be able to sleep for fear I'd kill someone else. Well, you needn't worry, Mr. Lang. There won't be any more killings. Not if I'm safely in jail. You're not going to jail. You're going home. What? In those notes the stenographer has taken, Mr. Lang, I have almost enough material to convict the real murder. I need just one more thing. Now, I... You go home and wait. Don't worry. You, you mean I, I, did, I didn't kill Myrna and Ted? Now, you just go along home and take it easy. I'm back at home now. It's two hours since I left O'Brien's office and I've taken the time to write down this full account. Just as I gave it to the stenographer. As I write now, I can look across the lawn to Phil Judson's house. Five minutes ago, I saw Inspector O'Brien and two detectives go in there. The front door is opening now. I can see them coming out. O'Brien first, then the two detectives. With Phil between them. They've got handcuffs on Phil. And here comes Henrietta. She's running across the lawn, coming here. Peter! Peter! Coming, Henrietta. Peter, they've taken Phil away. Yes, I saw it off from the window. Oh, darling. Everything went right, exactly as we planned oh, it. Oh, baby, baby. Hold me tight, Peter. Hold <laughs> tight. We can be together now, forever and ever. I'd have killed a dozen learners for you, baby. I know. And you were clever, Peter. So clever. And the hardest part was getting Phil to cooperate. <laughs> but I knew he'd do anything for a friend. What a fool he is. He stepped right in and took over. <laughs> you should have seen O'Brien when I told him the story. I could tell exactly what he was thinking. Here's a poor, innocent sap whose best friend is framing him. Giving him drugs and then making him think he commits murder. <laughs> oh, Peter. <laughs> as soon as he's convicted, I'll be free. And we can go away together. All right. Huh? But you'll have to cancel that trip. Both of you. Oh, Brian. You... You heard what we said? Sure did, every word. <laughs> Remember at my office, Mr. Lang, when I told you I only needed one more thing to clinch the case against the murderer? Well, this was it. I faked the arrest of Mr. Judson. And then I sneaked back to see what you'd do about it. <laughs> you did plenty. Well, Pete certainly ruined a perfect crime by talking too much, which all goes to show that it's not wise to kill and tell. Mercy. <laughs> People do go out of their way to get themselves into trouble, don't they, Mr. Host? I'm really surprised at Henrietta, though. For being a partner in crime, Mary. No, for not being a partner to her husband. Oh. Most women, you know, take great pride in looking out for their husband's happiness. Mm -hmm. You mean like mending the bullet holes in their shirts? Oh, Mr. <laughs> Host, there are lots of better ways than that to keep a husband happy. For example, when your husband comes home from work, give him the refreshment of a brimming cup of piping hot Lipton tea. 
Lipton tea makes a wonderfully pleasing drink at mealtime or any time. Because Lipton's is such a grand tea. So deliciously different, more flavorful and full-bodied. If you've been forgetting to get it, why not jot down Lipton's on tomorrow's grocery list now? Remember, Lipton tea always meets with favor. Because Lipton tea gives you brisk flavor. <laughs> And now, friends, a parting word of advice. If you ever wake up and think that you've murdered someone in your sleep, don't go to the police. Now, just take another powder, brother, and go back to sleep. <laughs> oh, by the way, this month's Inner Sanctum mystery novel is The Innocent Mrs. Duff by Elizabeth Sanksy Holding. And next week, the makers of Lipton Tea and Lipton Soup will bring you another Inner Sanctum mystery directed by Hyman Brown and called... Accident. Does the wind whistling in your ears frighten you folks? Oh, now don't be scared. Because when you're pushed down an empty elevator shaft and you hit the bottom, nothing ever can frighten you again. It's just an accident. And you'll learn all the mystery of it if you're listening to Inner Sanctum next week. <laughs> Until then... Good night. Pleasant dreams. Mm -hmm. <laughs> For a wonderful soup, be sure to try Lipton's Noodle Soup. And tune in next week for another Inner Sanctum Mystery. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is your host to welcome you through the creaking door into the inner sanctum. Uh, that music you hear is a new little thing dedicated to us. A little number called, Baby, It's Cold Inside. <laughs> Tonight's Inner Sanctum Mystery, Image of Death, was written by Ed Adamson and Bob Sloan, and stars Barry Kroger in the role of Victor, with Gene Allen as Kitty. Before we begin, let me warn you, any similarity between the characters in tonight's tale and those in your nightmares is purely intentional. Okay, friends. Hang on to your nervous systems. The man stands in the dim-lit room, looking down at the motionless body on the floor. His large hands with the whipcord muscles are in startling contrast to his thin, sensitive face. For another moment, he stands there, staring vacantly. Then he walks to the telephone, dials the number, and waits. <laughs> I want to report a murder. You'll find the body at 14 Crown Street. Wait a minute, hold on, that's so fast. I'll be here, waiting for Who's you. Who's calling? Who are you? Me? Right. I'm a man who's been dead five years. The police are on the way now. I sit here and I wait. And I think back over the five years. Back to the night that I, Victor Corday, died. I was in my studio working on the statue. There's a strange emotion that only a sculptor can feel. The exhilaration of taking senseless stone and imbuing it with life and meaning. I was so overwhelmed with the feeling that night, 
I lost complete track of time and place. I had no idea my wife had come into the studio and was standing behind me. Hey, Dad. What? Well, Evelyn, what are you doing up this time of night? I couldn't sleep. I was thinking. The money again? You know, we're almost down to rock bottom. Well, darling, I told you not to worry about it. I'm not worried anymore. The statue will be finished in a month or two. And we then it... won't have to wait until it's finished. What? It'll be so easy, so sure. What are you talking about? Your sister, Clara. What's she got to do with it? Her insurance is made out to you, and Clara is a helpless, incurable invalid. Evelyn, I don't understand. How many times has she begged for death since the accident? How many times has she asked us to help her out of her misery? Oh, no, Evelyn, stop I've it. got it all planned. No one would ever find out. Stop it. Kill my sister? Make myself a murderer? She won't feel a thing. It'll be simple and quick. I won't listen to you anymore. You'll do it, Victor. Whether you want to or not. Evelyn, get away from that statue. This will make you do as I say. Evelyn! Destroy. All months of work. Destroyed. Now, there'll be nothing coming in, Victor. You... Now you'll have to do exactly as I... You... Victor! Victor! How oh, could you do a thing like that? How? Oh. It... Let go! Peter! Ah. Ah. Evelyn was limp in my arms. When I let go, she slumped to the floor. I stood over her, wondering what had happened. When I saw the ribbon of blood at my feet. And then... The bloody wall hook against which I'd accidentally pushed her. I touched her. I spoke to her. But she was motionless and silent and dead. And that was the night that I died too. I didn't mean to kill Evelyn, but I knew no one would believe me. So I ran away. Changed my name to Victor Carr. And I buried myself for five years. I became a gravestone cutter. I used these hands of mine for carving monuments to the dead. And for five years I hid, going nowhere, meeting no one. And then she came along. It was late one afternoon. I was in my shop near the cemetery, finishing work on a black marble headstone. Hello. What? Victor? I said hello. Who? Who are you? Oh, now, don't tell me you don't remember me. How do you know my name? I know a lot about you. I've been watching you for a long time. Watching me? Why? We could be friends, Victor. You need a friend. Will you please tell me who you are? Kitty Regan. You can just call me Kitty. I'm a waitress in a restaurant where you eat once in a while. Wouldn't you like me for a friend? What do you want, really? Oh, you shouldn't be afraid of me. I have no reason to be afraid of anybody. Oh, yes, you have. I can tell. I've watched you. When you're out of this shop, you're always looking around. Like you were running away or waiting for somebody to catch you. You don't know what you're talking about. And you're always alone. Be afraid to make friends. But you don't have to be afraid of me, Victor. Not as long as you give me the money. Why should I give you money? You don't have to. I can go to the police. I can always go to the police. And that's the way it began with Kitty. She couldn't have known what I'd done. She might have thought it was robbery or something like that, but she couldn't have known... It was murder. She drained me of every penny I made. But strangely enough, I didn't mind. I actually started to look forward to her visits. And then one day I realized why. Kitty Regan was cheap and low and evil. But I'd fallen in love with her. <laughs> well, well, 
How do you like that? <laughs> oh, he says he's in love with me. <laughs> Don't laugh, Kitty. Please, I, I want to marry you. Marry me? Well, that's a riot. A crummy character like you. Where's my money? Kitty. It hasn't been a very good week. I, I only had one job. Well, whatever it is, hand it over. Kitty. I want to show you how I feel about you. You already showed me. No. This will make you really understand. I'm going to make you a figurine in ivory. It will be very valuable. Oh, so you think you can make something that's worth a lot of money? You, a gravestone cutter. I have talent in these hands of mine. Great talent as a sculptor. Oh, sure, sure. You're a regular Michelangelo. Come on, hand the money over. All right. But I'm going to prove it, Kitty. I'm going to prove that I'm somebody you'd be proud to love. I realized the danger in making that ivory figurine for Kitty. It would have my stamp on it. But then, Kitty couldn't possibly know its real value. I only did it to prove to her that I was something better than a gravestone cutter. And a week after I'd given her the ivory figurine, I went to her apartment. Two half-packed valises were on the studio couch. What's the matter, Victor? What are you looking at? Those bags, Kitty. Where are you going? Oh, oh, that. I'm moving away from here. This crummy room is getting on my nerves. You're running away from me. Where'd you get that idea Kitty, from? don't ever run away. Because I'll follow you wherever you go. I'm not running away. Just landed a new apartment on the other side of town in the Linda Park section. Linda Park. You've got to have money to live over there. So I have the money. Where'd you get it? It's none of your business. Let me finish packing. Kitty. Huh? The figurine I made for you. It's not on the table. What? Where is it? No, look, Victor, don't get excited. Where I... is it? What have you done with it? I, um... I sold it. What? I sold it. What's so awful about that? You sold it? You sold my gift to you? I needed more money. You haven't been doing so well lately, and I figured the ivory was worth something. You shouldn't have done that. The man who bought it said the carving was pretty good. Oh. You really got talent, Victor. You can become an important guy. Kitty, I don't care about that. I just want you. Oh. All right, Victor, then. Then you can have me. You mean that? You really mean that? Well, sure. Just as long as you do what I say. How many of those figurines can you make a month? Oh, no, I can't do that. Sure, sure you can, baby. You'll do it for me. Now, won't you? Kitty, you don't realize what it may mean. There may be death in it for both of us. <laughs> You're a screwy sort of a guy, but... Do you know something? I'm beginning to like you. Are you? Really? Mm-hmm. You never kissed me, did you? I never kissed you. Well, come here. You'll do what I want, baby, won't you? Oh, Kitty, I'll do anything for you. I knew I shouldn't have done as she asked. But the will to live isn't always as strong as the will to love. I worked day and night until my hands became raw from the mallet and chisel and stone. As time went on, the chances for my own personal safety became less and less. I was working in my shop one night when my dead past came to life. Well, at last we meet, Mr. Carlin. He was George Adrian, an art dealer from the West Coast, whom I dealt with years ago. Adrian looked at me, a sly, secret smile on his lips. So, uh, that's... The name you use now, Carlin. Awfully close to Corday, isn't it? I don't know what you're talking about. Corday, I consider it an honor to renew our acquaintance. Now, see here, I never saw you before in my life. Oh, stop it, you're just wasting time. You needn't be afraid. 
I'm not going to expose you. The fact that you murdered your wife is no affair of mine. Undoubtedly, she deserved it. How did you find me, Adrian? Oh, it was quite by accident. A young woman named uh, Kitty Regan sold me an ivory figurine of yours. And then some more work of yours later. All of it had the unmistakable stamp of Victor Corday on it. And what do you want? Frankly, I'm one to take advantage of a situation. Then it's money. Exactly. All right. How much? Quite a sum. It's uh, much more than you're able to give me at present. Now, uh, being two reasonable men, I'm, uh, I'm sure we can work out installments. Adrian had my life in his hands. I had only one defense against him. Uh, this, uh, this latest piece of yours should bring you a very good price. He stepped closer to examine the statue. My fingers tightened around the gouge in my hand. Five hundred dollars should be a reasonable amount for the first installment, don't you think? I stepped in behind him and pulled the gouge oh, deep into his throat. <laughs> carried Adrian's body to the cemetery near my shop and buried it in a freshly dug grave. But I had no peace of mind. In a few days, death began to close in on me again. An art critic from a Chicago paper wanted to do an article on me and I couldn't refuse. Kitty kept egging him on and he insisted on seeing every bit of my work, including the tombstones I'd made for the dead. The night we went to the cemetery... A heavy rain was falling. I, I shook with fear as we stopped at the grave where Adrian's body lay, just a few inches underneath the surface. And the rain kept pouring down, washing the dirt away. Well, this is an interesting piece, Mr. Carlin. Uh, it's not really one of my important works, Mr. Rogers. Shall we go on? Oh, you mustn't be so modest. This sculpture would be worth a great deal to a gallery. Well, it's a pity that it remains here unseen. Oh, Victor, maybe the owner would sell it back. No, Kitty. I wouldn't think of asking such a thing. I still have other pieces we can sell. Let's go back to the shop. Tell it. What are you looking at, Mr. Rogers? The face on this figure. It's uncanny. What do you mean? Well, it's so much like the face of a figure I saw in Los Angeles some years ago. It was done by a man named uh, Corday. You ever hear of it? Yes, I, I've heard of it. Your work is very much like his, especially the face on this figure. <laughs> but the face you see there is Kitty's. Oh. Yeah, but still, it might pass for the model Corday always used, his wife, Evelyn. You, um, you have a great future, Mr. Khan. Thank you. Now, shall we go? Uh, Victor, can I speak to you for a minute? Why, Kitty, oh, well, oh, don't mind me. I'll uh, walk ahead of this. What is it, Kitty? Why would you lie to him? That's not my face. I never posed for you. I know that. There's some other woman, isn't there? No. There is. Now that you're making money, you'll spend it on another woman. That other sculptor's wife, Evelyn. You and she are... Don't Evelyn Corday is dead. Dead? How do you know? Because her... Because her husband killed her. You see what Rogers meant yesterday? See what a great sculptor I really am, Skitty? Could be that Rogers is dead wrong about you. He knows. Rogers is an expert. Expert in my eye. He isn't even an art critic. What? He's a phony. What are you talking about? Rogers. He doesn't work for Chicago paper. That's just a gag. He doesn't... Kitty, how do you know? Oh, I have ways of finding things out. How do you know? Oh, let go of me, Victor. What's this the matter with... This is important to me. How did you find out? All right, I'll tell you. <laughs> Called up the paper he said he worked for. Yes? I got something invested in this thing, too, you know. And, and? They never heard of him. There's no reason for you to get all hot about it. Don't you understand, Kitty? If he isn't an art critic, why is he posing as one? Well, I don't know. Well, I do know. Only I've got to make sure. Well, what difference does it make? It's probably just an agent trying to get a line on your work. An agent for whom? The police? What? I never thought of that. Victor, I know you've been hiding for some reason. 
Huh? You're in some kind of trouble. What kind? Let me alone. I've got to think. Kitty. Yeah? Go back to your apartment. Stay there until I call. Why? What are you going to do? That's none of your business. You just stay there and wait. I may need you later on. I went to the hotel where Rogers was staying and climbed down the fire escape to his window. I opened the window carefully and went into the room. I could hear the water running in the shower. I quickly found out what I wanted to know. The identification was in his pocket. Frank Rogers, Los Angeles Police Department. Suddenly the door to the bath opened and Rogers was standing there in a robe. What are you doing here, Carlin? I knocked, Mr. Rogers, but you didn't answer, so I just came on in. Oh, I guess I couldn't hear you from the shower. I uh, thought I'd locked the door. No, the door was open. It's funny, I was sure I'd locked it. Well, however, it doesn't make any difference. You're here, and that's the important thing. Isn't it? Corday. <laughs> Thanks for coming over and saving me the trouble. It's good you didn't try to run away. I'd have uh, gotten you anyway. You're quite wrong, Rogers. I have you. I found this gun in your pocket. Put it down, Corday. You haven't a chance. A shot at this time of the night will bring everybody in the hotel here. Thank you for warning me. Killing me won't help you. I uh, sent my report to headquarters. It'll be just a matter of time before they catch up with you. Maybe you're right. Sure, I... Corday... I've already killed one man with this gouge. Put that down, Corday. Stay where you are. I'll have to do this quietly, Rogers. You warned me. Corday, don't. I left the hotel. A few blocks away, I went into a drugstore and called Kitty. She didn't answer. I went to her apartment. She wasn't home. I waited in the park across the street. I waited and waited. And finally she came home. And with her, was, there was another man. I wanted to kill them both right then and there. But I was too stunned. I wandered around for hours. And then the thought came to me. I went back to my shop and worked. For the rest of the night I worked in a blind rage. And then this morning, Kitty came to see me. Victor. Yes, Kitty. Victor, have you seen the morning paper? No. I've been busy. Roger's been murdered. Has he? He was killed in his hotel room last night. I was right, Kitty. Rogers was from the police. You did it, didn't you, Victor? <sighs> there. Stone's finished. Answer me. You did it, didn't you? Yes. I killed him. Why? I had to. But you won't tell on me, will you? What makes you think I won't? Because I'm too valuable to you. I can give you the things you always wanted. A lot of good you are to me now. You're a murderer. We could run away. We could hide. They could never find us. Not on your life. I'm not running away with you from now on. I'm running from you. I only came here to say goodbye. Yes. I had an idea that's why you came. There's somebody else, isn't there? No. You don't have to lie to me. I saw you with him last night. What? I was outside your house last night when he brought you home. All right, so there is someone else. You're no good to me anymore. No. Kitty. What do you want? Just one more thing. I'll make it snappy. I have a gift for you, Kitty. Parting gift that will stay with you long after I'm gone. Gift? What kind of a gift? A figure in black marble. This one? Yes. I worked all night on it. I think it's the most beautiful figure I ever made. It... It's a tombstone. Mm-hmm. See here? Your name engraved? And there's a date. Yes. Today's date. Yes, Kitty. Today. The date of your death. No! You mustn't be afraid to die. Victor, Just one wait. thrust of this gouge and it'll be all over. No, Victor, wait. Listen to me. I, I won't leave you. I won't ever leave but you. But you don't love me. I do. I do. I'll prove it to you. I'll go with you. I'll run away any place you're you want. You're saying that because you're afraid to die. No. 
No, it's because I want to be near you. No, kidding. Make you put your arms around no, me. Put your arms around me. I'll show you how much I care. You're just saying. No. No, I prove it. Hold me tight. Isn't this nice, Victor, isn't it? It's wonderful, Kitty. No. Kiss me, you. See, I mean it. Kitty. Kiss me, Victor. <sighs> at 14 Crown Street. Now, wait a minute. Hold on. That's a fan. I'll be here, waiting for you. Who's calling? Who are you? Me? I... I'm a man who's been dead five years. <laughs> and that finishes our sculptor's Model story. Kitty should have known better. Fool around with a guy who works in Marvel and you're liable to end up stone dead. Well, that's what happens to you when you can't keep your chisel out of other people's heads. Well, friends, as we say here in the inner sanctum, it's all over but the screaming. Now... It's all over. <laughs> for service men and women overseas. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education. Good evening, friends. This is your host again to welcome you through the creaking door into the inner sanctum. Come in. Come on in. I want you to meet Ambrose, our man-shy ghost. The other night in a graveyard, he bumped into a human and was so frightened he turned flesh-colored. Yes, poor Ambrose. He's got a bad case of ants in his fantasies. He's so upset he's just a ghost of his former... Ghost. <laughs> Was a time when we held high hope for Ambrose. Oh, yes, at abnormal you, he was cited by his classmates as the personality most likely to split. <laughs> and now, let's visit Murder Mansion. For over a hundred years, the old house has stood on the cliff weathering the relentless ocean winds that have battered at its gray shingles. Now, in the living room, the real estate agent and the new buyer are completing the arrangements of sale. Only uh, one thing bothers me, Mr. Griffin. That uh, graveyard just outside the window there. Are you sure nothing can be done about it? Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Burley. You know the conditions set down in the deed. The Crandall family burial ground must remain on the property untampered with. Hmm. Well, those Crandalls must have been a morbid family. Having themselves buried right next to the house they lived in. Yes, they were peculiar. <laughs> I guess they figured it was a way of keeping the family together. <laughs> you shouldn't laugh, Mr. Griffin. What? What? 
Well, what are you doing here? I hope I'm not too late. Uh, this is the gentleman who's planning to buy the house? Mr. Burley's already bought it. Oh, I'm sorry. Hey, look. What is this, Griffin? Who is this woman? I'm Emily Robbins. Uh, Mr. Burley, please, you must sell this house immediately to me. Sell it? That's ridiculous. I just bought it. Mr. Griffin never should have allowed you to. Now, see here, Mrs. Robbins. Well, just a minute, Griffin. I want to hear what she has to say. Well, all right, but you can see she... She isn't exactly accountable. You're bad, Mr. Griffin. You promised to sell the house to me. But you couldn't wait until I had the money, could you? I'm in the real estate business, not charity. Uh, Mrs. Robbins, I still want to hear why Griffin shouldn't have sold me this house. Because, Mr. Burley, a house isn't just a thing made of wood and stone and mortar. It, it's almost a living, breathing creature. It accepts and rejects people just the way we do. I was born a Crandall, and only a Crandall may live here. Anybody but a Crandall would be an enemy within its walls. You'd never spend a happy moment here. Oh, you see, Mr. Burley, I told you, she doesn't make sense. Please, Mr. Burley, for your own sake, sell it. Ah. Oh, you can't frighten me into a quick sale. No, I know I'll buy when I see it. My wife and I will be living here within a few days. I'm sorry, Mr. Burley, but I don't think you will. I don't think you will ever live here. Helen! Oh, Helen! Mr. Burley? Yes, Ada. Where's Mrs. Burley? I want to tell her I got that house at my price. Oh, sir, you'd better go upstairs. The doctor's still there. Doctor? What's the matter? Oh, Mr. Burley. What is it, Ada? What is it? Your wife is... Is dead. What? She seemed so well after lunch. She was upstairs napping, and when she didn't come down at a usual time, I went up. I tried to wake her. But... Helen, dead? Oh. Oh, no, it can't be. It just can't be. I tried to get you everywhere. But she hadn't been sick. There's no reason she should die. Dr. Hirschman said the same thing. He said that... Oh. Hello? Is Mr. Burley there, please? Well, Mr. Burley can't come to the phone right now. He... Oh, it's... it's all right, Ada. I'll take it. Yes, sir. Hello? Mr. Burley, this is Mrs. Robin. Miss... I called to ask you if you've changed your mind about selling me the house. Can I bring you something, Mr. Burley? No, Ada, thank you. Sir, I know it's none of my business, but... Maybe you shouldn't have come to live in this house. Maybe you should have sold it to Mrs. Robbins. I had to come here. I have to prove to myself that a house can have no evil influence over life and death. Of course it can't. And yet, according to the doctor, my wife passed away almost at the very moment I... I bought this house. I... I'm so confused, I don't know what to think. I'm not one to butt in, but you are letting the house have an effect on you. Well, you haven't moved from that window all evening. I'm just trying to fathom things out. You've been standing there staring out at that graveyard. I'm all right. Now, let me alone. Yes, sir. Good night, Mr. Bailey. Good night. Hey, that... What is it, sir? That graveyard out there. When the lightning flashed just then, I saw it. Saw so what? There was a new headstone among the old ones. A brand new headstone. Mr. Griffin, how long ago was the last Crandall buried in the graveyard out there? The last one? Let's see. Oh, yes, it was uh, Vincent Crandall. He died 20 years ago. 20 years? Then his headstone would have been a little worn by this time. Well, sure it would, but what are you... Then uh... what is the meaning of the new headstone? New? Come to the window. I'll show you. Oh, now, Mr. Burley... There's a brand new headstone out there, over a fresh grave. Oh, but that's impossible. I saw it first when the lightning flashed. Well, you must be imagining things. Then sit for yourself. Here, take this flashlight. Shine it out there on the graves and sit for yourself. All right. Well? Mr. Burley, maybe you better see a doctor. Doctor? They're all old headstones out there. 
The new one is only in your mind. Give me that flashlight. Oh, Mr. Griffin, what... You've been under a terrible oh. strain. Your wife's sudden death and all. I... I don't know. What made me think I saw a new headstone out there? I... I want to sell this house. By the way. Well, you know, it takes a little time to arrange a sale. Well, what about that Robbins woman? She'll buy it. She's been bothering me all along to sell it to her. Hey, but Mrs. Robbins can't pay you a decent price. Well, I don't care. I'll take anything she offers. I want you to get in touch with her. All right, Mr. Burley. I'll call her in the morning. No, no. I can't wait until then. I want this house sold tonight. <laughs> Mr. Griffin, why Mr. Burley had to bring me out here this time of the night? Well, he's made up his mind to sell. He wants to close the deal tonight. You don't want me to have this house, do you? Look, Mrs. Robbins, I don't care who gets it just as long as it's at a decent price. So you can get a higher commission. You're a very selfish man, Mr. Griffin. Uh, not in business for love. Your wife did well to leave you. She was as crazy as you are. Why doesn't he answer the door? What's taking him so long? Oh, mercy! What was that? Someone's screaming. Came from... Say, the garage. There's a light in there. Come on. Whoever screamed must be in that garage. Well, we'll soon find out. But maybe it isn't safe for us to go in there. Well, that's a chance I'm going to have to take. What? Ada! Mr. Cliff. Well, that was you who screamed, huh? Mr. Cliff. Yes. Why? What happened? Mr. Burley. What is it, Ada? What about Mr. Burley? He's dead. What? He left the house an hour ago. I looked out of the window and noticed that the garage here was lit. I came out and I found him slumped over in the car, dead. How dreadful. Oh, this place is filled with carbon monoxide films. It wouldn't have happened. None of it. If he hadn't bought the house... Now, look, Mrs. Robbins, this is no time for that superstitious nonsense of yours. She's right, Mr. Griffin. It is nonsense. What do you mean, Ada? Here. Look. On the back seat of the car. Good Lord. A new headstone. <laughs> Anybody want to buy a house? The Crandall place is a real buy. All you have to give for it is your life. <laughs> Too bad about our friend Mr. Burley, huh? Thought he was getting a bargain basement, but instead he's ended up in a basement he didn't bargain for. Yes, he should have taken old Lady Robin's advice, which in a phrase was, one man's menage is another man's more. <laughs> well, now, let's get back to our mystical manner. A week has passed since Burley's death, and the real estate agent, Mr. Griffin, has found a new buyer. Uh, here's your check, Mr. Griffin. Oh, thank you, Mr. Wagner. I consider this house a real buy. Well, you're the only person who's had any interest in it since Mr. Burley died. The place has gotten a bad name. Most people are superstitious, I guess. Wouldn't live here if you paid them. Oh, uh, superstition never bothered me. Uh, Mr. Griffin. Yes? Uh, what are you looking at that way? There's a graveyard out there. I... I don't understand. Understand? What are you trying to say? There were always ten graves out there, I'm sure. But now there's a letter. I'm sorry, Mrs. Robbins, but nothing you say can persuade me to sell. Please, Mr. Wagner, for your own sake, don't be stubborn. It may cost you your life. You know what happened to Mr. Burley and his wife? Well, I've always prided myself on being a jink breaker. Oh, be sensible. That's a very silly reason to, to live here. Maybe I have another reason, too. What do you mean? Charles Burley was a very close friend of mine. Oh, I, I didn't know that. 
I told it to Mr. Griffin. Now I'm telling you. I knew Burley like a brother. Everything about him. Mrs. Robbins, he wasn't the type to commit suicide. Oh, but he didn't commit suicide. Oh, you seem to know a lot about it. I do. Then maybe you can tell me who killed him. I can. Who? This house is the killer. Now, look. Oh, it is, Mr. Wagner. I know. You don't believe me, do you? Of course not. But soon you'll find out that I'm telling the truth. That sounds like a threat. No, no, Mr. Wagner. I'm not threatening you. I'm just trying to help. I- I- I'm just giving you a... A chance to live. One more chance to sell me this house. At my price. And if I refuse? If you don't sell it to me now, but then uh, I'll buy it after your death. I see. Well, Mrs. Robbins, there's nothing more we can talk about. I'm sure you know your way out. Good afternoon. Good day, Mr. Wagner. Hello, Mrs. Robbins. Oh, what, what, Ada, what are you doing here? Oh, didn't you know? I'm Mr. Wagner's new maid. Hello. Mr. Griffin? Yes? Well, come over here to the Crandall house right away. Mr. Wagner wants to see you. Why, who, who is this? It's very important, Mr. Griffin. Come as quickly as you can. Yes, but who is this? Hello. 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 Oh, Number, please. Operator, get me main 6539 and hurry. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, sir, but that line is disconnected. Disconnected? What? Well, that's impossible. I just spoke to someone at that number. Try them again. I'm sorry, sir, but I checked. There is no way I can get you the number. <laughs> Come in, Mr. Griffin. Well, Mrs. Robbins, what are you doing here at the Crandall house? I was waiting for you, Mr. Griffin. I don't understand. Come in, please. I was the one who called you on the phone to come out here. I didn't say who I was because and I didn't want to mention names. But I tried to get the phone here right after you hung up. The operator said the line was disconnected. It is. The wire has been cut. I walked down the road to the mobile gas station to call you to come out here. Mrs. Robbins, just what is this all about anyway? Why are you here and where is Ada and Mr. Wagner? Ada's left. She's gone away. For good. What? On the hall table over there, a note from Ada to Mr. Wagner, explaining why she left. And what about Mr. Wagner himself? Where is he? In the dining room. Oh, no. wait, wait, please, don't go in there yet. He... He's dead. Mr. Wagner dead? When I came in, he was slumped over the table. When you came in, huh? Well, the way you say that, Mr. Griffin, you, you make it sound like you think I killed poor Mr. Wagner. Well, what should I think? Oh, I wouldn't do a thing like that. Then suppose you tell me exactly what you're doing out here tonight. Well, it's like this, Mr. Griffin. I was home in bed, but I couldn't sleep. A strange feeling kept running through me that I should come out here and and try to convince Mr. Wagner that he should sell the house before another day passed. Oh, a feeling. uh... You can believe me. Oh, sure. When I arrived out here, the door was open and... And everything is just as you see it. What about the police? I didn't call them. Why not? Because I wanted to speak to you first. Speak to me with a murdered man in the next room? It wasn't murder. It was just the will of this house. And I want this house. You'd do anything to get it, wouldn't you? Yes. Anything. Even murder? Yes. Mrs. Robbins, I'm driving down the road to make a phone call to the police. Mr. Griffin! Mr. Griffin, wait! 
Well, Ada, what are you doing here? I was watching you and Mrs. Robbins through the window. Mr. Wagner is dead. I know. But how could you? You left the house this morning. I saw his body slumped over the table. You think the same as I do, don't you? Well, what do you mean by that? You suspect Mrs. Robbins, too. In a way. But I also suspect you, Ada. Me? But I can't exactly figure out what your game is. Game? I have no game. And why did you leave a note saying you were going away? What note? There's no use lying. I saw it myself on the hall table. But, but you must be mistaken. Today is my day off. I left the house early this morning. I didn't write a note. Well, if you are telling the truth... I am, I am. Then I know who did write that note. You wait right here for me. I'll be back in ten minutes. Keep your eye on the house. Where are you going? The phone inside is disconnected. I'm going down the road to call the police. I'll go with you. Why? I, I'd rather not stay here alone. Mrs. Robbins doesn't know you're out here. You're safe. But just the same, I'd feel better if I went with you. I'm not taking you with me. You act as if you're afraid of me. Maybe I am. But why? Why? Because when Mrs. Burley died, you were in the house. The same with Mr. Burley. And now, Mr. Wagner. You were there when every victim died, Ada. I won't let you in this car with me. You, you called the police, Mr. Griffin? Yes, they're on the way out now. By the way, what are you doing here in this kitchen? Oh, I was just walking through the rooms, recalling the happy moments I spent here when, when I was young. Are you sure that's the only reason? Well, yes. I thought maybe Ada had something to do with it. Ada? You know very well she's left. You saw her note. Ada didn't write that note. What? I talked to her outside this house 15 minutes ago. She was to wait out there for me until I got back. She wasn't there. What's happened to her? I didn't see Ada, but... But wait. What is it? About five minutes ago, I... I thought I heard something move down the cellar. The cellar? Yes, but then I... I thought it was just my imagination. Hold on a minute. What's the matter? Just now. I heard it, too. Something or someone is down there. Come on. We're going down into the cellar to look around. Mr. Griffin, look. Look, it's, it's lit down there in the cellar. Yes. Go on. You're going first so I can keep my eye on you. Mr. Griffin. What is it? The hole in the floor here. Huh? Well, one of the stone flooring slabs has been removed. There's an old well down there. I remember it was sealed up when I was a little girl. Yes. And I can see the slab was freshly removed. I wonder why. Mr. Griffin. What now? Be behind you, in the shadows. Look, there's a woman's body. It's Ada. She's dead. Yes, I know. Why, you say it as if you were sure we would find her this way. I was sure. You see, Mrs. Robbins, I killed her. I didn't have quite enough time to dispose of her body in the old well here. I heard you moving about upstairs in the kitchen. But why did you kill her, Mr. Griffin? Because she insisted on living in this house like the others. Then it wasn't this house. It wasn't because they weren't Crandall's. Of course not, but your idiotic superstition about this place helped my plan. Mrs. Burley's sudden, peculiar death was a lucky coincidence for me. It gave me the idea for the others. I needed a series of deaths to completely destroy the value of this place. So no one would ever live in it. But why? On several occasions you mentioned my wife, Mrs. Robbins. You see, you were wrong about her, as everybody else was wrong... She didn't run away from me. She would have, but I killed her. And her body is down at the bottom of that well. Just as Ada's will be. And just as yours will be. But the police are coming. They'll find you out. You foolish old woman. Do you think I really called them? 
Now, Mrs. Robbins. No, no, please don't come near me. You wanted to stay in this house. Now you will forever. No, no. You're going to get the thing you wanted most. Oh. You're, you're not going to kill her, too. Ada. Yes, Ada. No. no, it can't be. You're dead. Not yet. Not completely. I've just enough no. life left. No, it my leg. Don't... Let me go. Let me go. The well. I'm falling there. Let's go. Oh. Ada. Oh. Ada. You thought it was nonsense. Didn't you, Mr. Griffin? But it was this house that kept her alive long enough to protect me. My house, Mr. Griffin. Well, as they say, all's well that ends in a well. Say, folks, what about that Griffin character? Just goes to show how a property agent can sink to such a an unreal estate. Hmm? Yes, sir, that's what I call tripping over your own plot. Now, Mrs. Robbins will never be lonely. No, when things get dull, she can always step outside the house and dig up a relative or two. <laughs> Lipton Tea and Lipton Soup present Inner Sanctum Mysteries. Starring Boris Karloff. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. This is your host. Welcome again through the squeaking door to another session of mystery, murder, and madness. Oh, excuse me if I don't get up, but I'm all worn out. Yes, I've had a hectic few days with an old friend who just blew into town. He's one of those earnest souls who insists on doing everything for himself. Consultations with the monument makers, the grave diggers, fittings of the coffin maker. Yes, quite a busy body. But then we only die once, you know. <laughs> oh, these friends of yours, they're such unhappy people. They never seem to enjoy life. Never seem interested in any of the quiet, peaceful, good things of life. For instance, what's the use of telling one of your spooky characters about Lipton tea? They wouldn't like it. But other people enjoy that brisk Lipton flavor. They settle back in an easy chair and say to themselves, Mmm, Lipton certainly has a rich, hearty flavor. Never the least bit wishy-washy. No siree. But would a ghost appreciate Lipton's? Indeed, he would not. And it's lucky Lipton's is made for real, live folks who like good things. Or else it wouldn't be the world's largest selling brand of tea. Mary, you've been very hard on my friends. Very. And they won't like it. But then most live folks don't enjoy being scared to death. And that's just what's going to happen to you tonight. Our story is called The Corridor of Doom. It's an original radio play written by Robert Newman. And our star tonight is the man who gives even me the shakes. The famous star of stage, screen, and radio, Boris Karloff. Have you thought about death lately? Not the fact that it's inevitable, that it must come to all of us someday, but rather how it will come. Do you think of it as a sleep and a waking, of a sudden transition from one state of being to another, or to a state of non-being? John Clay was one of those people who never thought about it at all, until he found himself walking down that dim and endless passage which... But suppose we let Boris Karloff in the role of John Clay tell you about it himself. If your blood pressure will take it, put out the lights 
and come on a little trip down the corridor of doom. When I woke up, I had no idea of where I was or how I'd gotten there. I was lying on a hard white bed in a clean white room. There was a dull pain in my abdomen. Touching it tentatively, I felt a bandage. So that was it. An operation. But for what? And where was I? At that moment, the door opened. And she came in. Good afternoon. Or is it evening? Whichever you prefer. It doesn't matter. My name's Clay. John Clay. Yes. And yours? You can call me Nada. Exactly. Where am I? In what hospital? It has no name. What? But that's ridiculous. I'd like to speak to Dr. Rogers. If you'll get him for me, please. There is no Dr. Rogers. At least, not here. Then who operated on me? And for what? Listen... I'm not a well man. I have a very bad heart. Will you get someone who can talk to me? If you wish. I'll call Dr. Stone. A chill crept through my bones. It wasn't cold. It was fear. Unreasoning and abysmal fear. The door opened again. And there stood a heavy-set man, his hair flecked with grey. And with him, my son-in-law, Alex Bartlett. Alec, I can't tell you how glad I am to see you. Hello, Father. But why are you standing out there? Why don't you come in? Oh, no. No, I... I shouldn't advise it, Mr. Clay. And why not? And why... Oh, was it you who operated on me? Yes. I'm Dr. Stone. Why wasn't Dr. Rogers called in? He's taken care of me for years. There wasn't time. It happened during the night. Acute appendicitis. And even as it was... Even as it was? What? And why are you dressed that way, Alec? All in black. Well, it's customary. After all, you are my father-in-law. Of course I am, but... Now, look, Alec. You've got to stop being so mysterious. You know about my heart, what any sudden shock will do. I don't think you need worry about that anymore, Mr. Clay. And as far as the mystery is concerned, this initial period of adjustment is always a little difficult. Difficult? Do you realize what it's like lying here helpless, completely isolated, as if I were all alone in the world? Or isn't there someone I can talk to? Some of the other patients? Not just yet. When the time comes, you'll meet them. But... Look, Doctor, I can't stand much more of this. I can't. If I don't find someone who really cares about me, who'll treat me like a normal human being... My dog. How about my dog? What do you think, Doctor? Yes, that's possible. We'll see what we can do, Mr. Clay. Come along, Bartlett. Goodbye, Father. You... You'll be back, won't you, Alec? I don't know. I'll try, but it's difficult. Very difficult. Then, then don't go, Alec. Don't leave me here all alone. Come back. Come back. I waited and watched, watched and waited. Then the door opened and there was the doctor again. There was a small, thin-faced man with him this time, wearing the white coat of an orderly and carrying a black box with a handle. My dog. You brought my dog. All right, Martin. Give it to him. Yes, sir. Hey, oh, yes, sir. thank heaven. Now, at least. Come on, Carrie. Come on, boy. Get up. Wake up. Why, what's the matter? Carrie. He... He's not asleep. He's dead. You wanted him, Mr. Clay. But... But why didn't you tell me? When did he die? How? How old was he? Eleven and a half. Maybe twelve. Pretty old for a dog. That's probably why he could come. What do you mean? 
What are you trying to do to me? Don't you realize I'm a sick man? Easy, easy, Mr. I Gray. won't take it easy. I won't stay here another minute. I'm leaving right now. Sorry, but I don't think we can permit it. No? Oh, well, we'll see about that. You're getting yourself all upset for no reason, Mr. Clay. Making it very difficult for the rest of us. Martin, yes, yes, you'd better let me have some of that, that bottle there. About 10 cc's. The uh, red medicine? Yes. I... I don't want any medicine. I, I won't take it. Now, please, Mr. Clay. I won't, I tell you. No, I, I don't want the... I... <sighs> it, oh, it's awful. Salty. It... It tastes like... Yes. But I think you'll find that it will make things much easier for you. Very much easier. You're... You're doping me up. That's what you're doing. Putting me to sleep. You... I think that when I wake up, I'll, I'll forget about everything. Yes, Mr. Clay. You'll forget about everything. Everything. I was somewhere deep down under the earth. It was a passageway, stone flagged and with stone walls and I was walking slowly down it in my bare feet. I could feel the chill of the cold stones through the thick layer of dust. The passageway stretched ahead of me endlessly. And suddenly, I noticed that there were doors set into the walls on either side, closed doors. And on each door there was a name. Abel, Abercrombie. Abington. Where was I? What was this place? What was behind those awful, ominously closed doors? Something seemed to be drawing me on, on down the terrible passageway. Addison, Agar, Alan. I could feel the cold creeping up my legs, higher and higher, my heart pounding faster and faster. And suddenly I knew. Knew where I was and where I was going. Knew what was waiting for me there ahead of me down the passage. No, exerting all my will, I turned, trying to go back. With a roaring in my ears, I was falling through the darkness. Falling, falling. When I opened my eyes, I was in that cold, white room again, clutching the blankets with trembling hands. How do you feel now, Mr. Clay? You cried out, sir, as if... A dream. The most awful, horrible nightmare I ever had. A dream? The doctor will be very interested. Would you care to tell me all about it? Oh, I don't even want to think about it. It was about your former life? For... Former life? Oh, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that. I meant... Here, where are you going? Get my clothes to get out of here. I won't stay but here. But you can't minute. go. You can't, Martin. Help me. Please, oh, let go. Let me. Let go. Don't you, oh, don't you realize that if I do stay here, if I dream that dream again? Listen. I was in a passageway. An endless, eternal passageway like a corridor of doom. It stretched on and on to infinity with doors, closed doors on either side. And on each one of the doors in alphabetical order, there was a name. The name of all those who had died since the beginning of time. I was walking down that corridor on my bare feet and... Why? Why are you looking at me that way? You mustn't talk about that. You mustn't, do you hear? But, but you asked me... You didn't dream that dream. You couldn't have. And you've got to get it out of your mind. We, we'll help you. We'll give you a massage. That should make you relax. The alcohol, Martin, right over there. A massage? You think that'll help? If it doesn't, we'll call Dr. Stone. Try something else. Martin. I see. Now what? What are you staring at? Your... Your feet. Mm, on the soles. Dust. Thick, gray dust. <gasps> dust. Like the dust in the passage. The corridor of doom. And that means... It wasn't a dream. It means... I was really there. Dirty feet on those nice, clean sheets. No wonder our friend the nurse seemed so upset. 
Or was that the reason? Maybe she was just disappointed that he still hadn't told her about his operation. Yes, that always has them in stitches. Great big stitches. Like the ones they take in a shroud. Mr. Host, I'm afraid I just can't believe this story. I can't believe that it really happened. Is that so, Mary? Do you think Mr. Clay got that gray dust in his feet because he has feet of clay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> there you go again. Always looking on the discouraging side of things. I really do believe I'd rather talk to cheerful folk, like those nice young men and women who sang that new Lipton tea song when I was at the studio. Sing a song of Lipton's. Yes, that's the way people ought to feel about tea. Because, you know, when you're feeling discouraged or tired, there's nothing quite like that brisk flavor of Lipton tea to perk you up. Yes, brisk means that Lipton's is never wishy-washy. No, no, no siree, as they say in the song. So when you've had a busy afternoon, or maybe when friends drop in for a little talk, pour yourself a cup of cheer with brisk-flavored Lipton tea. It's got a special flavor that always tastes like home. And it always tastes like more, too. Well, now I think it's about time to take another little walk. Yes, down the corridor of doom. Will our star, Boris Karloff. And by the way... Don't be concerned about getting too tired, because you'll only have to walk one way. That's the nice part of a trip like that. You don't have to worry about coming back. <laughs> I lay there, staring down at my feet. No, it had not been a dream. For there, on my feet, was the thick, heavy dust from the corridor of doom. I had been there. Walking down its awful silence, not in my mind, but in the flesh. My heart clenched like an icy fist that I threw the blankets aside, started to get up. Mr. Clay, what are you doing? Where are you going? Let me go. But you can't get up. You can't leave. Oh, no, let me go. Martin, quick, say... help me. Please, Mr. Oh, Clay. Oh, for heaven's sake, let me go. Don't you realize what this means? If it wasn't a dream, and if I stay here, go down to that horrible place We've again... We've got to make him quiet down. Some more of that medicine, Martin. Oh. Another 10 cc. Right. Oh, oh no, no more of that. It's here, Mr. Clay. You must take it. You must. It will make you sleep. Sleep so soundly that you won't be able to go down there again. No, but... All right. Give it to me. Here. You stay here, Martin. I'll go get Dr. Stone and tell him. Better, Mr. Clay? I don't know. Color. Dark red. Taste. It's like... Yes, I know. And he makes me sleepy. My eyes get heavy and... Have you been here for a long time, Martin? No, not long. What... What is it like... outside of this room? It's... strange. Like no place else. And the other patients? What are they like? They're strange, too. Listen, Martin... I'm a rich man. You're the only friend I've got here. You, you've got to help me. Whether you're rich or poor doesn't matter. As for helping you, that's what I'm here for. You've got to stay here. Watch me. Every minute. My heart. I don't think it'll stand much more. My first sensation was one of cold, numbing cold, creeping up my limbs. I reached for the blankets, couldn't find them. Then I opened my eyes, and I was there again, back there in that awful endless passage, that corridor of doom. The same stone wall, stone floor, covered with a thick layer of dust. The same doors with a name on each one on both sides of me. But now... Now I was up to the bees. That one there, Baba, next with Babbitt and then Backer. I tried to cry out, but I couldn't utter a sound. I tried to stop, check myself. My muscles didn't respond. Slowly, heavily, I continued walking on down that endless passage. Past Badger, Baffin, Bagley, past the bees and towards the sea. Towards a door. With my name on it. My heart pulsed, pounding with terror. My breath rasped in my throat. Convulsively, I tried 
clutched at the walls, forced myself completely around. Then, as if I were fighting against a roaring gale, I drove myself back. One step I took, two, three, and I stumbled. I was falling again, falling through darkness, complete, absolute, unending. Even before I opened my eyes, I knew where I was. Back in my room, the sheets crumpled in my sweating hands. I lay there for a moment. I knew that this was my last chance. I slipped out of bed, tiptoed to the door of the room, opened it a crack and peered out a hospital corridor. And sitting at a desk halfway down at the nurse, could I slip past her? Then on a table next to the door, I saw the telephone. The telephone! Now I could get help. Would someone who would save me, take me out of this place? Picking it up quietly, I dialed my daughter's number, Alec Bartlett's wife. Hello? Jane? Oh, thank heaven. Hello? Jane, it's your father. Listen, you've got to help me. You've got to come and get me. I'm at the hospital. Alec Hello? knows where. Hello, is anyone? Yes, can't you hear me? Didn't you hear what I said? It's your father and... Jane, Jane! Hung up. I heard her, but she couldn't hear me. Something wrong with the phone, her phone. I've got to get hold of somebody, somebody, but who? Dr. Rogers? Oh, might be out. And if they come in while I'm phoning... Oh, I know, of course. Hello, police. This is John Clay of Riverside Road. I'm at a hospital. I don't know where. Hello? Can't you hear me, officer? For heaven's sake, listen. It's a matter of life and death. John Clay at a hospital. My son-in-law, Alec Bartlett, can tell you where. Hello? Officer, officer, listen. Don't hang up. Don't. Oh, officer, officer, hello. Anything the matter, Mr. Clay? Huh? Dr. Stone, uh, your telephone is... There's something wrong with it. No, Mr. Clay. There's nothing wrong. Not with the telephone. But, but I tried to make two calls. Two different numbers and... I know. And you should have known. Nurse, all of them. Should have known what? Why couldn't they hear me when I could hear them? Why? Yes, Dr. Stone? Will you put Mr. Clay back into bed? No. I'm awfully sorry, sir. I only went out for a minute. No. Come on, Mr. Clay. No, no, please. leave me alone. Please, Mr. let Clay, go. Please. No, no, you're struggling. You know that, don't you? <gasps> yes. I know. Doctor, I won't have to go back down there again, will I? Down to the corridor? That's not up to me. All right, nurse. I think we're ready for another dose. The final one. Yes, doctor. No, doctor. No, not that red medicine. Not again. I'm sorry, but you've had a lot of time. All the time we can give you. All right, Mr. Clay. No, I won't Here. take it. You know what it means, Doctor. If I go back down there again to the corridor, it'll be to the letter C. To the place where my name is. If he won't take it by himself, perhaps you'd better help her, Martin. Yes, sir. No, Here. no, no, I Wait. won't. <laughs> again, I knew where I was before I opened my eyes. I could feel the dust under my bare feet and through the dust the biting chill of the cold stones. I was there, back in the corridor, walking down its silent length past the blank, closed doors. But the names on the doors, now they were all C's. Cabot, Cadden, Cahoon. On I walked, the beating of my heart, the pounding of my pulse loud in my ears. On down the passage, no longer even trying to fight against what I knew was a bit. On past Cameron, Chelsea, Chiswick, and then, suddenly... Terribly, one door. A door with my name on it, gaping, waiting for me. I tried to stop to turn, but my legs carried me forward. I was but two doors away. I could see into it now, see that it contained nothing. Absolutely nothing, not even a coffin. Just stone walls and a flat stone stab. I was turning... 
time to step over the threshold. I made a last convulsive effort. Merciful heavens, help me. All right, Martin. Pick him up. Yes, sir. Is it all over? Hello, Bartlett. In at the death, eh? I'll see if there's any pulse, of course, but... I should think it is all over. It is, Stone, but not the way you think. What? Clay! He, he's not dead. No thanks to you. All right, get him up, both of you. Here, Mr. Clay, let me help you. It's all right, Martin. I'll be fine from now on. But how... Don't look so surprised, Alec. Mr. Martin is a detective. I hired him some time ago. <laughs> you see, I had a feeling that something was wrong when that railing broke accidentally, and I took that bad fall. So I decided I should investigate. You can't prove it. You can't prove anything. The first results of Martin's investigation showed me what bad financial shape you were in. And it was then that I realized that you had actually been trying to murder me to get hold of my money. So I faked that story of having a very bad heart. You, you mean it? I thought it would give you the idea of trying something more subtle and less dangerous. And it certainly did. But you still can't prove anything, not a thing. No, don't you worry about that. Don't forget. Come back here, Bartlett. You'll never have a chance to prove it. Come back, Bartlett. Ah! Oh, you shot him, killed him. Well, I, I couldn't have. I, I fired up in the air to get him to stop. Come on. But I, I don't understand it. Uh, there's not a mark on him. But he is dead. He was the one who had the bad heart. That's what gave me the idea of pretend. Good heavens, look. At what? This hallway was supposed to be the corridor of doom. When I reached the door with my name on it, I was supposed to die. Look. Look at the name on that door there. The one right next to him. Bartlett. His name. So what? Nothing, Martin. Nothing at all. Where do you think old Dr. Stone got the idea for that little alphabetical graveyard? That's right, for me. Huh? You don't believe me? Then come on home with me tonight and I'll show you the one in the cellar of my house. What's more, I'll show you a door and a neat stone slab with your name on it. Nonsense, Mr. Host. Mr. Clay just explained that the whole thing was a hoax. And I'm not going to sit here and hear you say otherwise. Well, then don't sit. Stand up and we'll take a walk, Mary Bennett. Yes, back to your name. Back to the bees. Baker Bartlett Bennett. <laughs> you don't scare me. Yeah? Well, how would you like it if we went to the L's and found a door marked Lipton? Oh, why, well, that's fine. Inside, we'd find a wonderful, friendly beverage, Lipton's, the tea with the brisk flavor, the tea that's welcome at all hours of the day. Yes, the largest selling brand of tea in the whole world, Lipton tea. <laughs> And now a word of advice. If you should wake up tonight with a sudden chill, find yourself walking barefoot down a dusty stone corridor with doors on both sides of it, don't get excited. Just insist on a doom with a view. <laughs> by the way, this month's Inner Sanctum Mystery Novel is The Whistling Legs by Roman McDougall. Yes, in next week's Inner Sanctum story, directed by Hyman Brown... And brought to you by Lipton Tea and Lipton Soup. Next week's story is about women. Yes, two women who like to be treated rough. Choke them to death, shoot them, murder them. They love you for it. And who do you think is going to be their boyfriend? Hmm? <laughs> That's right. Boris Karloff. Boris Karloff will be with us again next week. Because who else could love such women? So, oh, if you're in a tender mood, tune in next Tuesday. Until then, good night. Pleasant dreams. Folks, 
it's wonderful how quick and easy cooking can be these days. I guess some of you remember when it used to take half a day to make a pot of chicken noodle soup. But now we have Lipton's noodle soup mix. You might say Lipton's takes no time at all to prepare, and yet it has a, a fresh cooked chickeny taste, a real old-fashioned homemade flavor. Yes, and it's brimful of tender golden egg noodles. Lipton's is grand for quick meals, and it's also a perfect beginning for the most elaborate dinner. So don't forget to serve Lipton's noodle soup. And don't forget to tune in next Tuesday night for another Inner Sanctum Mystery. <laughs> This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Lipton Soup present Inner Sanctum Mysteries. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. Here's your host at the creaking door. <laughs> Through these portals pass the world's most horrified people. <laughs> oh, what's the matter? Did my happy medium startle you? Sorry, I keep him around to get in the right spirit, you know. <laughs> oh, by the way, if you feel a cold, thin sliver of steel across your neck in the next half hour, sit perfectly still. Someone's got an edge on you. <laughs> Gracious, Mr. Host, I'm afraid I'd have to move fast. Oh, no, Mary, you must sit still. You wouldn't want to lose your head. Well, I'll remember your advice, Mr. Host. But right now, I have some advice for our Lipton listeners. You know, a teapot can't talk. But if it could, I think it would tell you the same thing that I do about making tea. I think it would probably say, the most delicious tea is the tea with the most flavor. And I'll bet it would cast its vote, as so many folks do, for Lipton tea. Because Lipton's has that grand, brisk flavor. The flavor that's so different from other teas. The flavor that fills your cup with pleasure. You'll taste a world of tangy, full-bodied goodness in Lipton's. It's tea at its tastiest. So make that next pot of tea you brew at your house Lipton tea. And now here's a little tale of horror that speaks for itself. The Edge of Death. Written by Frederick Matho and starring Larry Haynes in the role of Ralph. We're going to tell you of a night Satan played a game of murder along a deserted strip of Manhattan's waterfront. For his sport, he chose two friends. For his victim, a woman. And the weapon he suggested, he had long ago placed in the hands of another murderer. The weapon was a long, slender, graceful rapier which first drew blood at the hand of Rasputin, the mad monk of Russia. Denton! Denton, O'Brien! Open up! Denton! Ralph! Ralph Vitkin! Well, come on in, man. What's the matter with you? You're soaked. No hat, no coat. Denton, you're my best friend, my only friend. You've got to help me. Well, I just got back from Chicago. I was going to drop over to your shop a little later. You, you got back too late. You could have helped me. No, it, it, it's too late. Well, what's the matter, Ralph? What have you done? Well, what's that in the package? Why, it's the antique sword I gave you when you were married. Ralph! Naked steel always looks different. Coated with blood. Ralph, you fool! You didn't... Yes. I just pierced a woman's heart with that rapier. About 15 minutes ago. Warned you about your temper ever since we were kids. You almost killed me once, do you remember? You warned me about my hobby, too. You said I had a psych... A psych... Psychosis. That's what we psychiatrists call it. 
your unnatural love of steel blades, your worship of ancient weapons and tempered steel, it... Well, it's off balance. There's nothing in the world more beautiful than a piece of true hand-forged steel. It's an art as old as man. Yes, I know. We've been over all that before, but... Now you're a murderer. And I want to know everything that happened. It's too late, then. I only maybe, came... Maybe I can dig something out of you that might help your defense. Now, Ralph, close your eyes. Close your eyes and let your mind wander. Tell me the first image you get. Tell me every detail, no matter what. I see the wedding. Here at your house. The guests have left. Ingrid is blonde and beautiful in white satin. She's standing beside me. And you come toward me with a pen. Denton, oh, it was so good of you to make such a beautiful wedding for us. You are the best, best man ever. Oh, no, no, no. Maybe, maybe, maybe the best, second best man ever. <laughs> Ralph was best today. Well, you gave me some stiff competition, then. I, I've got another wedding present for you, Ralph. Mm -hmm. I waited till now to bring it out because I... I, I didn't think the others would understand. Here, open it. Well, it, it, it's, well, do, you, do you like it, Ralph? Is it a good one? This is a good one. Well, it's the most beautiful rapier I've ever seen. Well, the balance and, and the lines. Magnificent steel. Look, look, Ingrid. Isn't it wonderful? It will be the very nicest sword in your collection, darling. As well as your last. His last? Oh, yes, yes, then. I promised Ingrid no more auctions. <laughs> and he'll keep his promise this time. I'm going to change, darling. Won't take me long. All right, darling, hurry. You really like that blade, don't you, Ralph? Like it. It's beautiful. Where did you find it? Well, I saw it yesterday in a small, junky antique shop in the village. little Russian fellow runs it. Oh, did he tell you anything about the blade? I mean, where he got it? No, but he said it was Russian. He said the hilt was uh, black lacquer on rosewood and... The steel was superior. Wow, he said something there. He mumbled on about wanting to get rid of it before the full moon, something about it being an evil thing. He claimed it once belonged to Rasputin, the mad monk of Russia. Say, I wonder if it did. I doubt it. Anyhow, he finished by saying that whoever owned it would have evil luck and failing to get rid of it before the full moon would die by violence. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it back to him if you like, Ralph. No, no, not on your life, then. But uh, don't mention that nonsense to Ingrid, will you? I remember all that myself, Ralph. I left for Chicago that night. Now, what's the next thing that comes to your mind as important? Well, about three weeks ago, I was working on some knives in the shop... Ingrid had left. I was alone. The shop door opened and... She was there. She? Who, Rob? Stasha. She was beautiful. Tall. White as marble. Dressed in black. And... Beautiful. I beg your pardon. What did you say? Oh, I, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> You said beautiful. There's no cause to be embarrassed. I have heard this said before. Um, well, what can I, I do for you, Miss... Miss... Kossoff. Stasia Kossoff. You own something that I would like to buy. Well, what is it? A rapier. A Russian rapier. I saw it in your window as I passed. It's not for sale. Oh, Really? Are you sure? I will pay you well. Say, a hundred dollars. Sorry. Very well. Perhaps you might change your mind. Hmm? Here. Here is my card. Come and see me if you do. Well, thanks, but, but I... <laughs> Shall we say... Before the next full moon, Ralph. <laughs> Ralph, if it 
weren't for that bloodstained rape on the table, I'd say you were lying. How could this woman know your name or anything about the legend of the rapier? I know how. Well, what happened then, Ralph? I've handled steel all my life. I've forged it, pounded it, tempered it, ground it to razor edge, and I've never cut myself. After Stasha left, I put the rapier to the stone. And as I worked, I, I kept seeing her eyes in the forge fire. Glinting with evil beauty. Kept hearing her voice. Ralph, shall we say before the full moon? Hmm? I turned suddenly to see if she was there. And I tripped. The rapier fell and I fell against the upturned point. Ah! Go! Oh. Oh. Ralph! Ralph, what's happened? Ralph! I'm all right. Pull it out. Straight out. Oh, no. No, I can't do that. All right, I'll do it then. I'll... Oh, Ralph, your arm is all blood. Oh, it's not bad. It just passed with the flesh called out to burn. Oh, those stupid knives. Why don't you get rid of them? While Ingrid phoned, it crept over me the deadening certainty that my fate was tied to Stasha Kossoff's. That death was lunging at us with Rasputin's rapier. And I was unarmed. I told Ingrid about the woman... I told her about Stasia's offer of $100 for the blade. I shouldn't have. And to turn down $100 for it? Ralph, that's the limit. Ingrid, I can't expect everyone to understand some things about my character, but I do expect you to try. I think I do understand, Ralph. I think you didn't want to sell that thing because you want that woman to come back. That was your first quarrel, Ralph? Yes. There were lots more... Things got worse. We quarreled a lot. It, it wasn't Ingrid's fault. I was changing. I kept thinking of Stasia. Her eyes mocked me. I tore up a card in anger, but I'd memorized the address. It was an old Dutch mansion on Littner Street. I had to see her again. There was a light in the house. And oddly enough, the front door was open a bit. I rang a long time, but no one answered. I obeyed an impulse and walked in. There was a coal fire going in the high ceiling living room. It cast dancing shadows on a life-sized oil painting above. A cold hand gripped my heart when I saw that painting. It was the painting of a man in a monk's habit. And his gnarled hand rested on the hilt of a jeweled rapier of exquisite beauty. Yes, the man in the picture is long dead. But his mad spirit is in this room. It laughs from within you, Rolf Wittkum. It has seized your body. Stasia. <laughs> If I were Ralph, I wouldn't be seen dead with somebody else's spirit. You can't tell what will happen to a man when uh, the spirit moves him. Goodness, <laughs> Mr. Host. That sword has certainly brought Ralph bad luck. Yes, Mary. It got him in trouble right up to the hilt. And we're only halfway through the story. Oh, yes, there's still a lot more excitement to look forward to. And I think looking forward to things is so much fun. For instance, imagine you're brewing up a pot of Lipton tea. Well, you know there's enjoy enjoyment ahead just as soon as that water starts bubbling in the tea kettle. The very sound of it is warm and cheerful and friendly, like Lipton's itself. And then when you lift that cup to your lips, oh, there's such a deep-down satisfaction in Lipton's brisk flavor because it's so mellow and satisfying, brimming with lively, full-bodied goodness. Yes, all those little promises of enjoyment are completely fulfilled in your first delicious sip of brisk-flavored Lipton tea. Well, you certainly have a point there, Mary. But now, back to Ralph Wittgen as he tells his friend the events leading to the murder he has committed tonight. He's telling of his first visit to the strange house of Stasia Kassoff. So the Kassoff woman convinced you that the spirit or the ghost of Rasputin had taken possession of your body. And you fell for it. Oh, I fought against believing it, Tenton. But it did explain so many of the strange promptings that have been stirring me all up inside. Did she say anything more about it? No. I turned to face her. 
She was a smiling column of white beauty, sheathed in black satin. Miss Kossoff, how is Stasia. it? Stasia. Call me Stasia. How is it you know my name? What, what do you know about the rapier? Does it matter? You have changed your mind, perhaps, about selling me your rapier? Hmm? No, I... I came to ask you about it. Oh, you came because you are confused. We will discuss it. But first, let us have some tea. Yes? I examined the room while she was out of it. On the wall across from the fireplace were five oil paintings. All of them portraits of men. At first I thought the light was playing tricks. It wasn't. Each face was painted with closed eyes. Each was a study in sleep. Or death. You like my painting? Come and sit down. We'll have tea and talk. Who are those men you painted, Stasia? The five men you see in those paintings. Each own the rapier you now possess. Good Lord. Then they're... Dead. Uh, and the dates on the paintings? Ah, uh, those are the dates on which they died, Rolf. Each on a day of the full moon. Each kept the rapier beyond the time he should have. More tea? Stasia's eyes were eager and wide. My ears began to ring. I recall setting the cup down. I remember Stasia's voice a long way off. Russian tea strong, my friend. And so are Russian legends. <laughs> this is all so fantastic, Ralph. Are you sure it wasn't something you... something you dreamed? Something I dreamed? No, she drugged me. It was no dream. Those portraits were no dream. The painting of Rasputin was no dream. They were there when I woke. Stasia was gone. The fire was on. My head ached. There was an easel near the lamp. It hadn't been there before. I shuffled toward it. It was a fresh painting on the easel. I stared at the face before me. Its eyes were closed in sleep. The face was mine. There was a date painted in them. It was January 15th. What? Yes, yes, that's tonight. I couldn't find Stasia, so I dashed out of the house, cursing like a madman. It was four in the morning when I reached home. Ingrid was waiting for me. She was crying. <laughs> Where have you been? Why? What difference does it make? You, you've been to see that Kossoff woman. Yes, yes, I've been to see that Kossoff woman. Oh. I had to. I'm losing my mind, Ingrid. Something's trying to kill me. That woman knows about it. She knows how and when it'll happen. And the funny thing is, I don't care anymore. I don't care. Rolf, where are you going? Back to the shop. Back to that cursed rapier. The shop, I tried to reason the thing out. I was toying with the rapier. It was a tiny green speck on the black hilt. Idly, I picked at it with my thumbnail, and a chip of lacquer snapped off. The hilt was supposed to be wood. But here, here was what looked like a large emerald. My heart pounding, I chipped and picked at the lacquer until bit by bit I uncovered the most dazzling and richly wrought collection of jewels I'd ever seen. Set in solid gold were pearls, rubies, emeralds, and a magnificent star sapphire. This was the bejeweled blade that Rasputin held in his hand in Stasia's painting. This was Rasputin's rapier. I returned to Stasia's house. Like the first night, the door was ajar. Like the first night, I walked in. I walked into the living room. I looked about. 
Nothing had changed. Nothing, that is, except that mine was the sixth painting, now hung beside the others. And the art... Easel already had a fresh canvas. Stasha was already painting a new portrait. The face was indistinct. But the date was clear. One lunar month from tonight. I gave up and walked home with the rapier under my arm. It was drizzling and foggy along the waterfront. And I was sick inside. I kept hearing Stasha's voice locked in my brain. Tonight is the last night you may own the rapier, Rolf. But there is a way out. A way out? How? There's no way out as long as either of us lives. There is a way out, Rolf. Kill her and come to me. Tonight is the night of the full moon, Rolf. If I own the rapier, you will be safe. Kill her, Rolf. Kill her and come to me. Somebody's following me. A woman. I could hear her high heels on the cobblestones. I just passed that little blind alley. You know, the one about a block away from my shop. I decided to trick her. I stopped short. I spun around and caught sight of a woman in black as she darted into the alley. It was Stasha. And there was no exit from that alley. I tiptoed to the entrance and leaped into its shadows. All I could see was a large empty carton against the far wall. She had to be behind that. I gripped the jeweled handle of the rapier until it burned my hand. Only one searing thought in my tired mind. Stasha must die. I took a deep breath and drew the needle-pointed steel back, aimed at where I judged a heart to be, and thrust... <laughs> body slumped forward. I lit a match to see her face. But it... It wasn't Stasha Karasov I had killed. It was... Ingrid. My wife. Ingrid. It worked, Stasia. It worked. My plan worked. Ralph reacted just as I planned it. You mean he did it? Killed her? A psychological masterpiece. He told me the whole story at my office ten minutes ago. He killed her thinking it was you. Well, now that she is gone, you are happy. You will love me and forget her then. Oh, perfect, perfect. She, she picked that stupid fool instead of me. Now she's dead and he'll die too. Oh, Denton, I am so glad. I would do anything for you. Everything went like clockwork. This rapier I found in your attic, the, the legend I made up, the phony paintings of former owners, your flirtation, yes. perfect, perfect. <laughs> the perfect murder, I've done it. Did my acting please you, Denton? Oh, you were magnificent, but... There's only one weakness to my plan, Stasia. What is it? When Ralph is picked up, there must be no way for anyone to find out that you and I know each other, Stasia. Oh, I know, and no one will know, darling. But Ralph's fingerprints are still on this rapier. He'll be electrocuted for one murder. Might as well be for two. Denton! No! I love you! I'm Denton. sorry, Stasia! I love you. I will wait for you. Very neat stroke, then. Rolf! I heard everything you said, Denton. But I didn't have to, I knew. No, don't move. The gun is faster than a rapier. How did you know, Ralph? Something I said tonight? No. No, something I saw. Stasia loved you. The painting I saw on her easel tonight, the one I told you she'd begun, was your portrait. The only way I knew was because 
as an artist. She was conscious of the scar on your forehead. She painted that in first. The scar you gave me as a kid. Oh, you've a lot more brains than I gave you credit for, but at least we'll burn together. Sorry, Denton, I'll have to decline that honor. Oh, Ralph, am I too late? Ingrid! Ingrid, no, you're... You're dead. Ralph! Everything you told me at my house tonight was a lie. No, Denton. Your plan almost worked. I told you the truth. Except... Except for the part about murdering Ingrid. You... You should have studied psychiatry, Ralph. I did, Denton. I had a good teacher. You. Are we going home soon, darling? Uh Uh-huh. You seem so far away, Ralph. Is anything wrong? No. No. I've been thinking about Denton. Odd the way things turned out. He made up that story about the rapier and its belonging to Rasputin and its owners dying on the night of the full moon. You don't believe it, do you? No. But what he thought was a cheap blade turns out to be a priceless treasure. It matches the one Rasputin held in his hand in the painting. That was coincidence, darling. Come on, now put your work away. Let's go home. It's late. Mm-hmm. Such a beautiful night, Rolf. Let's walk home. All right. You know... You know that painting Stasia started of Denton? The one that gave us plot away? Yes. It had a date on it. I wonder what ghostly hand guided her brush as she wrote that date. Why? The date she wrote was today's. But there's a full moon. And tonight was the night Denton was electrocuted. <laughs> well, wouldn't you say that's a story which gets down to fine points? Hmm? Happy ending, too. Yes, you get a ghost-to-ghost hookup between Stasia and Denton... Ralph and Ingrid get an Exhibit A worth a few bucks and go back to the old grind. (laughs) Well, I'm glad Denton's plot didn't work. Yes, Mary, but if it had, Ralph would have had a plot of his own, you know, in a cemetery. After all, that's one of the best-selling plots I know of. (laughs) Nonsense, Mr. Host. If you think that's the kind of thought we want to leave our Lipton listeners with, you're quite wrong. Here's a much better thought for folks to carry away with them. Tomorrow... When you visit the grocers, get a package of Lipton tea. Buy it, try it, and see if you don't agree that Lipton's brisk flavor gives you extra enjoyment. Oh, yes, there's a great treat in store for you when you first taste Lipton's full-bodied, zestful goodness. Ask your grocer for a package of Lipton tea tomorrow. And now, friends... In case you're wondering, we do have a moral for tonight's story. It's short and sharp. Knife can be beautiful. If you keep your temper and look out for people with an axe to grind, they may be trying to get ahead of you. (laughs) Oh, by the way, this month's Inner Sanctum mystery novel is The Pavilion by Hilda Lawrence. And next week, the makers of Lipton Tea and Lipton Soup bring you another grisly inner sanctum tale directed by Hyman Brown and titled The Confession. And now, if you'll excuse me, I have an appointment with Stasia and Denton. Yes, they've got the concession for hand-forged hinges where it's hotter than the hinges of... Hmm? <laughs> Until next Tuesday, then. Good night. Pleasant dreams? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Got tomorrow's meal on your mind? Well, how about letting me make a suggestion? 
Now, here's a real menu masterpiece that the whole family will love. It's Lipton's Noodle Soup, a grand soup chock full of wonderful fresh cooked chickeny goodness. Lipton's Noodle Soup is prepared with ease, ready to please in just a few quick minutes. It's economical, too. It costs less and makes lots more than canned soups. So ask your grocer for Lipton's Noodle Soup Mix. And don't forget to tune in next Tuesday night for another Inner Sanctum Mystery. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Sanctum Mysteries. Good evening, friends of the creaking door. This is your host to welcome you into the inner sanctum. Come in. Into a gay little world of homicidal maniacs, vampires, ghosts, Werewolves and assorted forms of sudden death. <laughs> Friends, if you ever walk through a cemetery at midnight and see a girl whose hair is on fire and who's carrying her head under her arm, you know what to tell her, don't you? Well, just say, uh, keep a cool head on your shoulder, sir, and run like crazy. <laughs> All right, fellow ghoul. You know what's going to happen now, don't you? Hmm? <laughs> That's right. You're going to scream your little heads off. And love it. Ready? Good. And let's hear our star, Agnes Moorhead, in the role of Claudia, tell us the story in her own words. <laughs> At exactly midnight, I saw him for the first time. My headlights picked him up and he hailed me along a lonely stretch of road near my home. I wouldn't have stopped, but the storm was so fierce I felt sorry for him. I drew up to the side of the road. Thank you. Going far? No, not far. Where to? I'll let you know. Oh! What's that? Where? There, on the side. Tombstone. Oh, there's a cemetery where I picked you up. Yes. Birchlawn. He said nothing for a few minutes. In the reflection of the dashboard light, I saw his face for the first time. Sunken eyes, hollow cheeks, mouth set in a queer grin. A skull barely covered with a thin layer of milk-white flesh. At the start, I realized he was staring at me. I've seen you before. I don't think we've met. I know you. Are you sure? Yes. I'd never forget someone so beautiful. Really? You're Claudia Dale. Why, yes. You're married to Howard Dale. Yes, that's right, but I don't seem to place you. No, you wouldn't. I know quite a lot about you. Do you really? Your first husband was Willard Banks. How do you know that? He died eight years ago. A suicide. Who are you? You don't know me. Be careful. You're speeding. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize. You're trembling. How do you know so much about I me? just know. Really? I suppose you have second sight or some such rubbish. It's not rubbish. Well, then tell me where I'm coming from. Pittsfield. You guess. Went there to visit a sick friend, Martha Wallstone. You couldn't get that. Would you care to know more of yourself? No, I... I don't find your little trick particularly amusing. Besides, what else do you think you can tell me about myself? Your future? <laughs> no. Your present husband. 
is dead. <gasps> Murdered. Oh, you lie. You'll find his body on the floor near the piano of your living room when you get home. There are two bullets in his head. You get out of here. You get out of this car. You hear me? Get out. All right. It happens that this is where I wanted to go. Good night. And thank you, Mrs. Dale. He vanished in the shadows on the side of the road. And then I noticed something white and shining queerly at the spot where he disappeared. I looked closely. It was another tombstone in another cemetery. <laughs> I raced madly for home, fighting the hysteria that seized me. The nightlight was burning in the living room. Nothing he had said could be true. Howard would take me in his arms and kiss me when I stepped into the house. Somehow I managed to get my key in the lock. I ran into the living room. Don't move. Who is it? I'm right behind you. I've got a gun. A gun? Get away from the body. Who are you? Turn around. You! You murdered him! Keep quiet. Don't tell me anything. Sit down. Don't touch me. I said Please. sit down. No, help. Help. I'm sorry I had to slap you, but you were losing control. You don't have to scream for the police. Here's my badge. You? you... Detective Sergeant Quinn, homicide. Oh. oh, I thought you were... Yes, I know. Oh. Yeah, drink this. Who is he? My husband. You sure? Positive. When was he killed? About 20 hours ago. Four yesterday morning. How do you know? One of the bullets went wild, hit that clock on the mantel. Where were you yesterday morning? Pittsfield. I stayed with a sick friend, Martha Wallstone. Look at these things. I took them out of his pocket. Are they all his? Yes. Where's the snake ring? There were no rings. But he had one. It was quite valuable. He was never without it. I gave it to him. All right, now look. Oh, and did he uh, wear it on the third finger of his left hand? Yes, yes. Yes, there's a mark, but no ring. When did you come here? I drove in behind you. You left the front door open. I... I think I know who killed him. Who? A man I met on the road coming here... He knew my husband had been murdered. He did? He even said his body would be near the piano. When did you see this guy? Or oh, it's 20 minutes ago. I picked him up on the road. Where? At Birch Lawn Cemetery. What's his name? Oh, I, I, I don't know, but he he looked like a, a, a human cadaver, like a man who's dead. I never... You don't believe me. Why did you kill your husband? What? What? What are you saying? You heard me. Why, I told you I was in Pittsfield. Why did you go there? Martha was ill. Were you there at four yesterday morning? Of course I Don't was. lie. Will you stop shouting at me? I told you who killed him. What are you trying to do to me? Isn't it enough to come home and find Howard like that without you... Oh, his heaven's name, leave me alone. Just leave me alone. <laughs> Another scotch, lady? No. No, thanks. Here. Keep the change. I'm leaving. Sit down, Mrs. Dale. Don't go yet. You? Yes. Won't you please sit down? Yes. Are they making it difficult? Oh, it's a nightmare. Who are you? I'll tell you later. Why'd you come here? To talk to you. I knew I'd find you here. Oh, yes. Yes, you knew. You're not so skeptical now. No. What did you want to tell me? That you're the most beautiful woman I've ever seen. That I love you. I've loved you since I first saw you seven years ago when you came here to live with your husband. Is that why? Why I killed him? Is that what you were going to say? Yes. I'm not an ordinary man, Mrs. Dale, but I'm not a fool. On this card, you'll find my name, address, and telephone number. 
Do you really believe I'd phone you? Oh, yes. There'll come a time when you'll want love. Good night, Mrs. Dale. Good night. Hello, operator. Get me police headquarters. Hurry, please. Yes? That's him, Detective Quinn. That's Garth Dragman. Thank you, Mrs. Dale. Would you mind coming down to headquarters, Mr. Dragman? Not at all. Did she tell you I murdered her husband? Yes. As I thought she would. I didn't sleep a wink that night. Twice I got out of bed and drove to police headquarters. The lights were blazing in Quinn's office, but I didn't go in. The third time, I couldn't bear waiting. I went in. Oh, Mrs. Dale. Well? I'm glad you stopped by. We checked everything Dragman said. Seems he was in the same bar and grill where you met him tonight when your husband was killed. Well, what about the things he said to me in the car? How could he know about the murder before you or, or I? I don't know. Perhaps he does have second sight. He's an odd-looking fellow, isn't he? But you can't arrest a man for murder because of that. He's criminally insane. I know he is. My dear Mrs. He Dale, is. I... I know. Oh, what's the use? I had loved Howard. I was determined to find the man who murdered him. I went to Garth Dragman's home. I was about to ring the doorbell when... Don't ring, Mrs. Dale. The door is open. Come in. You... You were expecting me? Yes. I was expecting you. Do you still think I killed your husband? I don't know what to think anymore. Do you want me to find the person who murdered him? Yes. More than anything in the world. I have strange gifts, Mrs. Dale. I'll find your murderer for you. On one condition. What's that? That you marry me. I felt my body turn to ice. I knew I was talking to a madman. I was sure I was talking to the man who had murdered my husband. Or maybe you think that Claudia doesn't have the courage to trap this homicidal Romeo. Well, we'll let our star Agnes Moorhead on the role of Claudia tell you. Go ahead, Claudia. Shock him into the shakes. Two weeks later, I married Garth Dragman. He was the strangest man I ever knew. He would disappear for days at a time and then suddenly turn up without warning. He had all the money he wanted, yet I never knew where it came from. There was a closet in his room which was always kept locked and bolted. I knew from the way he acted about it that the closet contained the answer to all the things I wanted to know about him. One night, while he was away, I obtained tools and tried to force the lock. Good evening, Claudia. <gasps> you didn't expect me back, did you? No, I... I knew you'd try to open that closet someday. Why do you keep it locked? So that no one but me could know what's in there. Not even me? You in particular. But, Doc... <laughs> oh. Oh. You... You won't attempt to open it again, will you, Claudia? No. Forgive me for striking you. But I'm not quite myself tonight. I, I sometimes do things I regret when these moods come upon me. Yes, of course. But something few people know, but a person who has extraordinary powers carries an extraordinary burden. You mean your gift of prophecy? Yes, yes. I, I, I didn't care to mention it. It seems to upset you so. It doesn't frighten me any longer. Did you read in the newspaper about a woman's body being found in the river? She'd been murdered. Yes, it was in this evening's paper. They don't know who she is. I can tell you who she is. 
Josephine Ford. A stupid girl, Claudia. I could have told you three days ago that she'd be murdered. How do you know these things? Oh, because I see them in a sort of vision. But just now, just now I'm seeing another vision. It's a house 346 Harbor Street down near the waterfront. A young woman lies in bed reading. She's very attractive. In an hour, she'll be dead. And when the police come, they'll find her body decapitated. God. While you were gone, Martha Wallstone telephoned. She's ill again. She asked me to come up immediately. Well, why didn't you go? Well, I was waiting for you to get home before I left. You want to leave immediately? If you don't mind, it's really an emergency. It took only a few minutes to get to the waterfront. I found the house at 346 Harvard Street. I went in. The lamp in the bedroom was burning. I looked at the bed. I fainted. All right, Mrs. Dale. You think you can sit up now? Oh, Detective Quinn. Yes. I hardly expected to find you here. Oh, I... I came because Garth Dragman predicted this would happen. Now, Mrs. Dale... You still don't believe me. You're a strange woman, all right. You accuse this man of killing your husband, and then you marry him. Now I suppose you're going to accuse him of this murder, too. Yes, this, and heaven only knows how many others. Mrs. Dale, don't you realize that you haven't got a single piece of evidence to back up your contention? Well, I'll get the evidence tonight. Will you let me have a gun? No. Well... Will you be near my house? I'll need protection. Now, after what all... What must I do to convince you what he is? I've risked my own life, and I'm willing to risk it again. He's a monster! Are you going to wait until he murders me before you believe what I say? All right. I'll give it a try. I'll come back to your house with you. If you want me for an emergency, smash the window pane. We drove back together. I dropped Detective Quinn on the corner. The house seemed deserted when I came in. I wasn't taking any chances. I went to the kitchen, got a knife, hid it in the folds of the long sleeved gown I was wearing. I went into Garth's room. He wasn't there, but the closet door was open. What I saw in there nearly made me ill. Clothes. Garth's clothes. Some of them bloodstained. I forced myself to examine them. Then I found something that made my heart beat faster. A little jewelry case. I'll take that, Claudia. <gasps> Give me that jewelry case, please. No, no, don't take it. I kill... God! I get away from that window, Claudia. Do as I tell you. Oh, no, don't. Don't shoot, God. You were so anxious to see what's in that closet. <laughs> well, now you have. Sit down. What are you going to do? Tell me who killed your husband. You? No. You. You're insane. I've written out a confession for you to sign. What will happen if I don't sign it? I credited you with more imagination. Would you like to hear us? Yes. Yes, read it, please. Sit over here, away from that window. Yes. I, Claudia Dale, murdered my first husband, <sighs> Willard Banks, for his insurance by administering poison. My first husband? Yes, Claudia. I mean to make this document strong enough to send you to your death if I wish. I've got all the details here. Just how you murdered your first husband and how you killed your second. Shall... Shall I go on? No! You know it's a lie! Will you sign it? Of course not! Just what is your game anyway? If you want to kill me, why don't you shoot? You've been very successful before. There's no reason why you shouldn't succeed again. Go on! Go on! Shoot! You put me in a very difficult position, Claudia. You see, you have found out certain things about me, things that would cost me my life. I should prefer to see you live, because I love you, but I shouldn't hesitate to murder you. You love me? Yes. Yet you haven't taken me in your arms once since I've known you. The right time hasn't arrived. And what do you consider the right time? When I feel that you understand me. When I feel that you who murdered two men would understand my deep and strange desires. You really believe I'm a murderer? 
Yes. That's why I love you. Then the time is now. The time? To take me in your arms. Claudia. He still held the gun. It wasn't more than two inches from me. I turned my lips up to him. I twisted my body to get out of the range of his revolver. When I felt his lips touch mine, I slowly let the knife slip into my hand. Slowly, caressingly, I drew my hand up toward his neck. Then I plunged the blade in. I realize that you as the district attorney must know all the facts. And there they are. Thank you. There are a few points in the story that interest me particularly. First, the confession that he asked you to sign. What about it? The confession says that you were not in Pittsfield at 4 a.m. when your husband was killed. That you gave your friend Martha Wallstone a sleeping pill, drove down here, shot your husband... Drove back to Pittsfield, turned Miss Wallstone's bedside clock to 4.15 and wakened her. Then you gave her some medicine to impress the time on her. She thought it was 4.15 and went back to sleep. Well, God was very clever at things like this. He had the extraordinary brilliance of the insane. Just one question. Was that the way that you murdered Howard Dale? Ah! murdered him. The ring proved He it. never had the ring. You put it in the jewelry box. I can't believe what you say. God was a homicidal maniac. He predicted the death of the people he murdered. Mrs. Dragman, don't you know yet? Know what? Garth Dragman was a detective working out of my office. That's how he knew about those deaths. He was put on the case because we suspected you of murdering your first husband as well as your second. A detective? Yes. And you are going to die for killing him. It's extremely daring and clever of you to murder him. That you never would have gotten away with it if he hadn't kissed you. He kissed you because he fell in love with you. The poor fool. Well, friend. That just goes to prove you should never pick up hitchhikers who come out of cemeteries at night. <laughs> I'll bet you've guessed the moral for our story. Well, uh-huh. but it's taken from a famous quotation that Harry the Hangman uttered during a nightmare. Quote, Never steal the rings of people you murder on account of that's robbery. <laughs> well, friends, it's time once again to close that creaking door. Until next week at the same time, when we'll be back with a little hunk of horror. <laughs> You'll be sure to listen, won't you? Until next week, then. Good night. Pleasant dreams. come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Lipton 
Banshee and Lipton Soup present Inner Sanctum Mysteries, starring Boris Karloff. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. This is your host to welcome you through the squeaking door into the land of ghosts, vampires, and other gay, hilarious people. Friends, are you looking for an apartment? Well, we have just the place for you. It's sturdily built, completely of marble, with cold running water every time it rains. You don't have to worry about the landlord putting you out. The lease is forever. All you have to do to get this little love nest is call your undertaker and get yourself a little bit dead. <laughs> Mr. Host, I assure you, no one is the least bit interested in your offer. But, Mary, just think. Once you're dead, you can appear on Inner Sanctum. You know, we always have a ghost in our story, someone whose voice comes back from the grave and gives advice to our characters. Yeah, sometimes I think our theme song should be, My Mummy Done Told Me. <laughs> Why, that's very funny. <laughs> and I'll make room for the creepiest voice you ever heard. The curdling kid himself, the star of stage, screen, and radio, Boris Karloff. Tonight's story is called The Wailing Wall. It's an original radio play by Milton Lewis. And you'll hear Boris Karloff in the role of Gabriel Hornell. All set, friends. And turn out the lights, curdle close to the fire, and listen. Night. And on the waterfront of downtown Manhattan, the fog creeps in like a crawling cloud. Tucked in between the towering skyscrapers, there's an old rundown mansion. An anachronism. A freak among the streamlined giants. It's the Hornell home. And tonight, leaping tongues of flame from behind the black shutters. Yes, it's Johnny. Is there anybody in that old dump? It's an old guy lives there, don't it? Gabriel Hornell. I hope he had sense enough to get out. That place is like a tinderbox. Yeah, I'm pretty well gone. Percy, get that horse. Hey, there is someone in there. Get the action. Come on. I'm right behind you. Watch. Get out of the way. Help! Hurry, will you? I knocked it off. All right, come on in. You see anyone in there? No. We can't stay. Hey, there he is. Oh, the crazy cootie didn't even have sense enough to get out. Here, grab a short. Yeah. No, don't hold me. We're just taking you out. I don't want to go out. He ain't asking you what you want. Come on, Johnny. Before this joint collapses. Oh, take me out. I can't leave the house. Hornell, I hope you're feeling... Mr. Hornell? Mr. Hornell? <gasps> the head nurse. And hurry. Hello? Hello, this is Nurse Hopkins on the 18th floor. Gabriel Hornell is not in his room. The window is open from the bottom. But there's a letter. I know, but I'm sure he's not alive. Oh, the, the letter? Yes, I'll, I'll read it to you. Uh... To whom it may concern. By the time, By the time you, you read, read this, this, I shall, I shall be, dead. be dead. There can be no mistake this time. Death holds no fear, no terror any greater than what I've endured in life. For the past 40 years, I've searched for freedom. I hope now I've found it. Even now, as I write, I can hear her voice calling to me as she did that night years ago. I'd prepared everything while she was in bed. Just the last few minute little details had to be completed. Gabriel! Gabriel, do you hear me? What do you want? What are you doing down there? I'm... I'm fixing something. Well, why don't you come up? I don't want to be alone here. I can't bear to be alone. Come up, Gabriel. What's the matter with you? Why don't you answer me? Oh, you're just doing it for spite. I know you are. Stop that hammering, Gabriel. You know I can't bear that noise. Now stop it, please. Gabriel, will you stop that noise? Oh. 
You came down. Well, of course I came down. Did you expect me to lie there while all this racket was going on? Now, you know I'm a sick woman, Gabriel. What are you doing there anyhow? You can see. Well, yes, I can see, but it doesn't make any sense to me. Oh, you've made a huge gaping hole in the wall. Now, what on earth did you want to do a thing like that for? You'll find out soon enough. And and what are all those things? Stonemason's tools, cement, plaster. Well, I never dreamed you knew how to use them. Oh, I'm going back to bed. No, Agnes. No? No. Gabriel, that rope in your hands. Yes. I've thought carefully about this rope, Agnes. It's the most merciful way. It leaves a little trace since there's no blood. Gabriel! You won't make it difficult, will you, Agnes? Murder! It's the only way. No, Gabriel! We couldn't go on like this. Your imaginary illnesses, your constant nagging. I I have to be free of them, Agnes. But murder! This is best for both of us. No, Gabriel. Send me away. Do anything you want. You can get a divorce. A divorce there, see? That would solve everything. You could have your freedom. Stand there, Agnes. Just as you are. I know. That other woman, Dorothy Carter, that actress. That's why you're doing this. Oh, you thought I didn't know about that, Gabriel. Well, I do. Yes, I do. No. No, let go of me. That rope. Help me, somebody. It will be done in a minute. Done? Oh, you'll never be free of me. As long as you live. yellow eyes. The cat saw me take her body to the tomb I'd made in the wall. The cat saw me place her there and carefully seal it up. I work quickly, skillfully, with infinite care. First the bricks, one on top of the other, then the plaster. Then the wallpaper to match the rest of the room. That wasn't very difficult. In a short time, it was done. I was free. All I had to do now was to go to the police and report her missing. It was even simpler than I'd thought. I put on the coat. I was about to open the front door when I heard it for the first time. I thought it must be my imagination. I listened carefully. I rushed to the wall, put my ear to it. What I heard made icy perspiration ooze out of every pore of my body. The wail was coming from the wall. It was like the insane shriek of some creature of another world. Was she alive in there? She couldn't be. She was dead. I knew she was dead. Yet I heard a voice wailing. I could swear it was her voice. I couldn't go out as I'd planned. What if someone else should hear it? Would they go to the wall? Investigate? The doorbell. Oh, it couldn't be at this hour. It it couldn't be, but... But it was. Who? Oh, I... I had to risk everything and answer it. I'm sorry to disturb you, Mr. Hornell. It was Patrolman Cleary. He was the officer on the beat. He was blue with cold. I was passing by and I saw the lights on. I peeked in the window. You... You looked in? Yes. Since you were still up, I thought I'd ring. It's a bit of cold out tonight and I'd like to warm these old bones for a minute... Oh, oh, yes. Yes, of course, Cleary. Don't stand there in the door, man. Come in. Come in. Thank you. I see you got your coat on, Mr. O'Neill. Just got in? Only only a few moments ago. As a matter of fact, I, I was going to see you. See me? Why, yes. It's it's about my wife. Hi, something wrong? I I hope not. I was out all evening. When I got home, she was gone. It's not like her, Miss Donnell. No, it it isn't. Was she alone all evening? Yes, I, at least I think she was. You know, she hasn't been feeling very well lately, and I... Why, oh, I, I hate to think it possible, but but she may have destroyed herself. Mrs. Donnell? No, she wasn't the sort... Oh, she was ill, terribly ill. I tried to keep it secret until she recovered... But the doctors knew. Insane? Yes. Don't you see? The river. I'd better get back to the precinct and report this. You'd better come with me. 
The missing Persons Bureau will... Hey, Mr. O'Neill. Yes? You must be mistaken. Isn't that her? That... That isn't a woman. Of course it is. It's coming from that room there. Why, well, sure, it's your wife. I know her voice and she sounds like she's in pain. But it can't be. There's no one in that room. Well, she must have come in the back way. Come, I'll show you. No, don't go in. Huh? Nothing. No. There. You can see for yourself there's no one here. No one. Could have sworn your wife was in this room. How'd you like to live in a house with wailing walls? Well, one thing you have to admit, things aren't so very dead in the Hornell Mansion. Or are they? Well, all I can say is I'm glad I don't have to live in that house with that awful wailing. Why, Mary, there's a wailing, whistling kind of noise in your house, too. The first time I heard it, I was so scared, I shivered in my shroud. What? Oh, you're talking about my whistling tea kettle. Oh, goodness, there's nothing scary about that. Now, if you'd only try Lipton tea with its wonderful brisk flavor, that whistle would sound as cheery to you as birds whistling in the morning. All right, friends, we've given you a chance to warm your blood, and now we fondly hope to turn it to ice again with the help of our star, Boris Karloff. Oh, let's hear the second act of Inner Sanctum. We continue with the strange letter left by Gabriel Hornell. Fieri watched in silent fascination as the cat screamed and leaped against the wall. Would he notice the new wallpaper in the dim light? Suddenly, the policeman turned to me. Yes, I... I guess that noise is only the wind. Strange how like a wailing woman it can sound, isn't it? Yes. Well, I'll be leaving now. I guess it'll be all right for you to stay here. I'll make a report at headquarters about your wife. It's very good of you, Cleary. If she turns up, you let us know? Yes, I, I'll let you know. Good night, Mr. O'Neill. Good night. He left. I locked the door and came back to the room. The room where my wife was entombed. Was she still alive inside the hollow of that wall? I listened all that night. The wailing rose to a high, insane shriek. And then, towards morning, it began to grow weaker, as though she were losing strength. And it, it seemed to die. The cat crept away. There was a merciful silence in the house. She was dead. She had to be by now. I sank down onto the sofa into a feverish sleep. Somewhere a bell was tolling, calling the mourners to the grave. Suddenly I sat bolt upright, shaking, trembling. Oh, I'd been dreaming. The front doorbell was ringing. It was night again. How long had I slept? The house was silent. Oh, there was nothing to fear now. I ran to the door, opened it. Hi, kiddo. D Dorothy. Well, are you going to keep me out here in the cold? No, no. Come in. Come in. I, I haven't been... haven't been feeling well, Dorothy. Is that why you forgot our date tonight? I, I must have overslept. What time is it? Ten o'clock. Ten? I, I must have slept clear through the day. Well? Aren't you glad to see me? Glad? Why, well, yes, it's... Uh, it's a delightful surprise. Oh, that's more like you. Come here, kiddo. You've got the blues, but Dorothy will wipe them away. Give us a kiss. What? What's that? Just... Just the wind. Oh, no, it can't be the wind. This is a very old house, Dorothy. You sometimes hear strange noises. Oh, I've never heard anything like that before. It sounds human. Was she still alive? Even after 24 hours? Suddenly I realized that the doorbell was ringing again. There was a large pair of wooden sliding 
panel doors between the room that we were in and the vestibule that led to the street. I wasn't going to take any more chances. There's someone at the door, Gabe. Yes. You wait here, Dorothy. What are you doing? Closing these doors. Why? I'd advise you not to ask too many questions. Evening, Mr. O'Neill. Officer Cleary. Who are those men with you? Hey, I've got something to show you, Mr. O'Neill. You'd better brace yourself. It's not going to be pleasant. All right, bring it in, boys. You can put it over there. What? What is it? It's a body. A woman. Just fished out of the river right near here. She can't be dead more than 24 hours. My wife? Hard to say. You see, the body got caught in the propeller of a boat. It's not easy to recognize it. Unless it was examined by someone who knew her very well. Like yourself, of course. Uh, let me see it. Take away the burlap. Look, Miss Darnell. <gasps> I know. It's pretty bad. Is... Is it your wife? Agnes? Yes. Yes, of course. It's... It's her. You sure now? Yes, I, I'm sure. Positive. All right, boys. Take it away. You can stay here, Mr. Arnett. I'll take care of everything down at headquarters. Good night. Good night, Cleary. Luck, fate, whatever it is that seemed to control men's lives was playing directly into my hands. They'd never investigate now. The nightmare was over. This time I was really free. Suddenly, the panel door opened. Dorothy was standing there. A curious smile on her lips. I heard everything, kiddo. You did? So you were married. No longer, Dorothy. My wife died. Suicide. So I heard. Now everything will be quite all right and we can get married in a few weeks. We'll have money, lots of money. She left you plenty, eh? She was very wealthy. What's the matter? Nothing. Nothing? <laughs> I see what happens to your face when you hear that wail. Did you kill her? What are you talking about? Did you murder her? You heard what he said. She was found in the river. You can fool a dumb copper, but you can't fool Dorothy. That wail. It's queer. Awfully queer. Look at what that cat's doing, will you? Jumping up on that wall like it's gone crazy. Yes, there's something about that wall. That's what the cat's trying to tell me. Something about the wall. You better stay away from there, Dorothy. I'm going to find out yeah, something. Yeah, put that I book end down. Not till I'm done with it, kiddo. What are you doing there? I'm going to break through that wall. You crazy fool, stop it. No! Here! Give me that thing. You're too late, Gabe. I've broken a hole through and I'm going to look. <gasps> now you've seen. Yes. Is it the hand? The hand of a woman. It's... It's her. Your wife. Yes, Dorothy. You murdered her. Yes. Well, ain't you the kid? What are you going to do about it? What do you think? I want money. Lots of... That rope. Yes. This rope. <sighs> it leaves no telltale traces. Oh, no, no, kid. D -d -d Didn't you get it? It was all a joke. No, d don't come any closer. Don't scream, Dorothy. It won't do you any good. Gabe, listen to me. I, I don't want a cent. Not, not one penny. I love you. I love you, I tell you. I, I, I'll keep your secret. I'll do anything you want. Anything. That, that rope. Take it away from my neck. Don't give in the name of heaven. Don't, don't raise the... She was dead. I took her body, put it in an old trunk in the storeroom of the cellar. I had to think of some plan, some way to get rid of those bodies. In my confusion, there was only one thing that I was certain of. I must never leave the house, not even for a minute. I never did. At nights, I would sit there, listening. Then it would come, the wail in the wall. 
I knew that after a week she couldn't be alive. What made the whale? Plans? <laughs> I thought of a thousand plans, but all of them would mean that I had to leave the house, and if I left, someone would hear the whale and find out, just as Dorothy did. Fire. Yes, fire. That would do it. The idea danced like a flame in my mind. But no, no. They discovered charred bones of the skeletons among the wreckage. No, it... It wouldn't be worth it. The only way I could be safe was to stay there in the house. I stayed. I, who had risked everything for freedom. Doorbell tinkled. I opened it. Mr. Hornell? Yes? I'm Mr. Crawford from the bank. May I come in? Just in here, in the vestibule. We've written to you a dozen times, but you've never replied. What do you want? Well, Mr. Hornell, you may not realize it, but you've overdrawn your account. The money your wife left is gone. Gone? So short a time? So short? Why, she died 40 years ago. 40? It seems only yesterday. We've been investigating. Even the grocer who used to supply your food no longer will extend you credit. Oh, what do you want with me? I'm not starving. If you'd see your face, you'd realize that you are, Mr. Hornell. Now, if you'll only be reasonable, we can see to it that you get $250,000. A, a quarter of a million? How? By selling this house, it's become very valuable. No. no. You get out of here. Get out. But, Mr. Hornell... Get out! Very well. He was right. I was starving. That night, when I heard the wailing begin again, I came to a decision. I, I had spent 40 years in the house. More punishment than criminals receive who've committed even worse crimes than mine. I'd take a chance. I opened the wall I'd sealed up 40 years ago. She, she was still there. But the wailing continued. Why? Why? I looked into the tomb I made for her, and then I saw it. I saw this thing that had ruined my life. It was a tiny hole in the outside wall that I'd made when I first broke it open. The wind rushed through and made that horrible wail. What was the use? I took a match out of my pocket. I said it's flame to the curtains. In a moment, the place would be an inferno. But I decided to stay. I wanted to perish with the house. In death, at least I'd be free. But even then, freedom was denied me. <laughs> they rescued me. Brought me to this hospital. I had the nurse make inquiries from the police. She told me. No, there was nothing unusual found among the ashes. Everything was burned to a fine powder. If... If I had only set fire to the house 40 years ago. But no matter. The window is open. And it's 18 stories to the ground. I will soon be free. Meow! <laughs> Everybody's dead but the cat. And we overlooked him because we couldn't find him. Of course, I'm sorry... But that wall made such an unpleasant noise, such a tuneless wailing. We tried to teach it to whistle the new Lipton Tea jingle, but we didn't have time, eh, Mary? <laughs> <laughs> now, you just stop teasing me, because I'm not going to talk about the Lipton jingle, no. No, and I'm not going to talk about Lipton Tea, either. Instead, the Lipton people want me to remind you folks about something important. I mean the Victory Loan Drive. You know, friends, we've been buying bonds for many years now. 
But this drive is in some ways the most important. Because if a job is worth doing, then it's worth finishing. The bonds you buy now won't buy weapons. No, this time the money will help bring our boys home. It will also help take care of our wounded soldiers, provide them with the finest medical care in the world. And, friends, we can certainly do no less. And the victory bonds you buy now will help launch our veterans into a safe and secure post-war world, the kind of world they've been fighting for. Yes, you're helping others and yourself, too, every time you buy a victory bond. So buy all you can, won't you? All right, friends. Until we meet at some haunted house, here's a parting thought. Don't seal your wife in a wall. That won't keep her quiet. <laughs> oh, by the way, this month's Inner Sanctum mystery novel is Devil in the Bush by Matthew Head. Yes, and next week's Inner Sanctum story, directed by Hyman Brown, and brought to you by Lipton Tea and Lipton Soup. Next week's story is about a man who gets hunches. His hunches are about death. He's sure he's going to be killed. Not by poison or fire or strangling. Nothing simple like that. No, our character has a nice, interesting death waiting for him. Oh, if you'd like to be in at the death, drop in next Tuesday. <laughs> and now it's time to close the squeaking door, so... Good night. Pleasant dreams. <laughs> Folks, the colder it gets, the more we all enjoy a good hot plate of soup. And for soup with a fresh, home-cooked taste, you can't beat Lipton's noodle soup. Yes, Lipton's is blessed with a real chickeny flavor, and it's just swimming with tender golden egg noodles. But listen, Lipton noodle soup takes almost no time at all to prepare. And Lipton's is economical, too. Costs less and makes lots more than canned soups. So don't forget to try Lipton's noodle soup. And don't forget to tune in next Tuesday night for another Inner Sanctum Mystery. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Now, the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California presents... Suspense. Tonight, Roma Wines bring you Short Order, a suspense play produced, edited, and directed for Roma Wines by William Spear. Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills, is presented for your enjoyment by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A. Roma Wines, those excellent California wines that can add so much pleasantness to the way you live, to your happiness in entertaining guests, to your enjoyment of everyday meals. Yes, right now a glass full would be very pleasant, as Roma Wines bring you Short Order, a remarkable tale of suspense. Thank you very much. Come back. Ah. <clears throat> Bailey's Diner. Oh, this is Mr. Bailey speaking. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, you're just a little late on that. Well, I hired a fry cook day before yesterday. I'm sorry, I forgot to tell the newspaper to stop running that ad until this morning. I got a good man. No, no, one man's all I need. Just got a small place here. <laughs> That's all right. Goodbye. <laughs> you see that, Johnson? You better keep on your toes. <laughs> oh, Plenty Mr. of people Bailey. after your job. If you're not careful, you know, something might... <laughs> well, what's the matter? Don't you want to take my money? What? Oh, sure. Yes. Yes, of course, sir. 75 out of 1. 5, 1. Thank you. Okay. Hey, Johnson. 
Johnson, good Lord, did you see that man's face? Yeah, you're telling me. It's enough to haunt your dreams. Kind of made you nervous, didn't he, Mr. Bailey? Well, after all, it's kind of a shock to look up and see you. Yeah, I, I noticed you hung kind of close to that gun you keep under the gas register. Oh, did I? Automatic reflex, I guess. Oh, the poor guy, I ought to be ashamed. Probably got that way in an explosion accident or something, you know? Yeah, it looks like a plastic surgery job. Only some doctor like Frankenstein must have done the surgery. Yeah. Well, here you are. Enjoy this. Oh, thank you. Come back. Yeah. Huh. Yes, sir. He liked your cooking, too, Johnson. Two deluxe sandwiches, two coffees. You know, that's not bad. <laughs> right. <laughs> Seems to me business has been picking up ever since you started working here. Just thought you'd like to know. Thanks a lot. <laughs> You like this work, Johnson? Yeah, it'll do. The hours kind of get me sometimes, and when the rush hour starts in half an hour, I can't pretend I'll be liking it. But it's all right. Sure. Well, someday you'll have a place of your own. Be your own boss. Never get anywhere working for someone else, you know. Well, I'm doing okay now, Mr. Bailey. Yeah. You'll never go hungry for lack of a job. You're too good a cook. But your own business. Now, you take me. I'm doing well, even if I do say so. People come here to eat. All right, I see that they get them. <laughs> yeah, it makes you feel pretty good having your own place. Makes the saving and scraping seem sort of worthwhile. You seem to get the business. Well, of course, you got a terrific location. Well, this place has a name that means something. At least I think it has. As a matter of fact, there was a man in here trying to buy it just last week. That's so? That's right. Real estate agent. Name was Sloan. Had a customer. Well, who's this customer? Oh, I don't know. Well, I told him I didn't want to sell. Oh, here, how about opening that refrigerator door for me, will you? Okay. Thanks. No, I'm not going to sell. Couldn't afford to. I'm not in a position to retire. The way things are, it'd be too hard to start up somewhere else. Uh-oh, well, here we go again. Good evening. Evening? Uh, yes, sir. What'll it be? Uh, special, I reckon. Right. Coffee. Oh, Hi. good evening, sir. <laughs> Is it still chilly out? Oh, yeah, a little. Thought some of your chili would warm me up. <laughs> get it? <laughs> I get it, yeah. Chili, oh, yeah. coming up. Oh. <laughs> Bailey's place. Oh, Virginia, what's the... Uh... What? What? All the windows? Well, who could possibly... Well, where were you? Well, now, why would anyone want... Oh, no, no, none of those kids that do a thing like that. They're nice kids. Yeah, hoodlums, I guess. Well, I, d I don't know what you can do. Got no witnesses or anything. You sure it was rocks, huh? Well, I guess there's nothing you can do. Well, I, I wish I could too, but I, I gotta stay here. All right, dear, yes, uh, all right, goodbye. Bad news, Mr. Bailey? darndest thing. Uh, hoodlums or something. It just broke every window in my house. I, I don't know what to hey, think. Hey, hey, Bailey. Is this a new kind of bread you got here? Better than usual. Oh, you like it? Yeah. Well, it costs a little more. Oh, good e Good evening. Hello? Good Lord. Yes. Uh, yes, sir. What'll it be? Hamburger and coffee. Right. How do you have the hamburger? Well done. Cream in the coffee? No. Black. Yeah, right. Hey. Hey, Bailey, come here a minute. Oh, yes, uh, uh, pardon me, will you, please? Hey. Did you see the face on that fella that came in a minute ago? Yes, I did. It's pretty bad, isn't it? Bad? I'll say. Boy, I can stand a lot of things, but that gets me. Well, I've left half my meal on my plate. I was enjoying myself until that came in and sat over there. Then I didn't want anything more. Oh, that's too bad. Oh, look, don't pay, don't No, 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 it's not your fault. Maybe mine. Gee, how do you suppose he got that way? Oh, a burn, perhaps, or maybe some other kind of accident. I, I, I wouldn't know. Oh, boy, that's the worst I ever saw. Yeah, it's too bad, whatever happened. Sure. Well, yeah, too bad. Yes, it is. Ketchup. Okay, here you are. What? This little paper cup, where's the bottle? Uh, I'm sorry, but ketchup's hard to get. That's all we can serve anybody. Oh, profiteers. Will there be anything more? No. Okay. Your check and pay at the desk. Thank you. Hey, Mr. Bailey. Yes, Johnson. How's your luck? Oh, sometimes good, sometimes bad. Why? The way I figure, somebody around here is sure gonna need plenty of luck. Why? I don't know. I just got a feeling. If that isn't bad luck for somebody sitting back there at the counter, I'll eat this grill here. 
and I never saw a recipe for making a steel grill tender. We better order some more pork tomorrow, Mr. Bailey. We're running low, are we, Johnson? Yeah, a little. If they keep hitting our barbecues the way they have so far this evening, I'm sure we'll be needing it. All right, I'll make a note of it. Yeah, lucky we got any unspoiled meat left after that guy was in here twice yesterday. I thought the milk had sour. Bingo. Just like that when he looked at it. Yeah, but it didn't. Ah, Johnson, you shouldn't talk like that. He can't help it. You know he can't. We should feel sorry for him, not joke about it like that. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, sure, you gotta have sympathy for a guy like that. Just the same, I hate to look at it. Oh, uh, I guess we'll have to look at it some more. I think he's coming up to the door now. Uh... uh... Uh, good evening. Hello. Yes, sir. Uh, what'll it be? Hamburger and coffee. Make the coffee black. Uh, right. Make that hamburger well done. Okay. Oh, good evening. Evening. Yes, sir. What for you? Why, uh, I'll have, uh... Holy... How's that? Huh? Nothing. Nothing at all. I, in fact, I, I, I don't think I want anything. I just remembered uh, an appointment. Uh, uh, just forget it. Oh, what do you know? Uh, your hamburger, mister, and your coffee. Ketchup, please. Okay. Still no bottle? No bottle. Sorry. Here. You go buy an extra bottle. Put it back on the shelf just for me. You gonna eat here some more? Yeah. I like this place. Go on, take that and see that you get some good ketchup, too. Oh, it ain't that, mister. It ain't the money. You can't buy the stuff when they don't stock it. Well, uh, you better ask Mr. Bailey. Uh, uh, Mr. Bailey! Oh, yes, Johnson? Oh, uh, you tell him. I just gave your man some money to buy a bottle of ketchup. But he doesn't want to take it. Well, you see, sir, it's not that we can't afford to buy ketchup. No, indeed, we want to please the customer. Something a lot of people seem to have forgotten how to do nowadays, but... <laughs> Ketchup's very hard to get just now, and we have to ask our customers to bear with us. You uh, you keep your money. I like plenty of ketchup. Nothing like ketchup, I always say. Well, there ought to be enough in that paper cup. Won't uh, that do you? Well, not quite. Any chance of a refill? I'm afraid that's all we can allow. Gentleman says he's going to eat here regular. Wh what? I said that... Oh, just a moment. Good evening. Hello there. Could I do something for you? Well, I sort of thought I... I... Oh... No, no thanks. No, no. Huh. Well, we hadn't finished our discussion. Yeah. As I was saying, Mr. Bailey, it... It looks like we got ourselves a regular customer. Three evenings now that he's been eating here, Johnson. And I wish you'd take a look at the figures. Take last night. Ordinarily, there'd be ten to twenty dollars worth of business just between six to six thirty alone. From six to ten, how much? One dollar and thirty-five cents. Yeah, I know. Some of them won't even order. Some of them take a few bites and quit. At least it's not the food. We can be thankful for that. Hey, tell me, Johnson, how can you stand it over there in front of him all the time? Oh, mostly I keep looking someplace else. That's why I took down the mirror. For a while, I thought I'd just work along and not look at him. But I couldn't help looking in the mirror every now and then. So I think maybe the customers could stand it better without the glass, too. If they get to the sitting down stage. Yeah, if they do. Well, anyway, I took it down. It might help if you didn't get up every now and then and walk over to the door to look out. People can't help seeing him then. Yeah. It takes them a long time to eat, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Hey. Say, I've got an idea. Uh, what's that? Look, when he comes in... Uh-oh. Uh, <laughs> uh, evening. Hello? Uh, yes, sir? The usual. Right. Oh, uh, by the way, Mr., uh, uh, uh what, what's your name? Yeah, <clears throat> well, uh, as I was saying, neighbor, we, uh, we make a practice here for our special customers. Not just anybody, mind you, but for our special customers of, uh, of sending meals out. 
Uh, now, I was thinking since you've become one of our regular customers that perhaps you'd appreciate it if I'd send your evening meal over to you every day at your, at your room. <laughs> How does that strike you? No. Thanks. Rather eat here. But uh, we don't have any comfortable chairs. There's no jukebox, no radio. That's okay. Don't miss him anyway. That's not very comfortable. A lot of food odor in the air. You know, sometimes I get sick of it myself. I like it. Not too many people around. Nice place. Suits me. Oh, then you're not interested. That's the idea. Hamburger and coffee. How about... Yeah, the ketchup. Here it is. Good. Nothing like ketchup, I always say. By the way... Yeah? Look for me about noon tomorrow. I think I'll be taking lunch with you from now on. Every day. For suspense, Roma Wines are bringing you a cast of Hollywood's outstanding radio actors in short order by John F. Souter. Roma Wines' presentation tonight in radio's outstanding theater of thrills... Suspense! Between the acts of suspense, this is Ted Myers for Roma Wines. Elsa Maxwell is an acknowledged expert on the niceties of dining and entertaining. Recently, she said, Gracious little touches can do so much to make meals more enjoyable. Dine by subdued light. If possible, adjust radio or phonograph for soft, mellow music. And as the crowning touch, serve well-chilled Roma California Sauterne. A most excellent idea from Miss Maxwell. Good Roma Sauterne is pale gold, delightful in bouquet, and even more important, exquisite in taste. Created in the Roma tradition, Roma Sauterne is always unvaryingly good. The goodness of luscious grapes selected at peak of flavor richness in sunny California's choicest vineyards, carefully pressed, then unhurriedly guided to perfection by the ancient wine skill of Roma's famed wineries. Good Roma wines are always delicious, yet cost only pennies a glass. Remember, because of uniformly fine quality at reasonable cost, more Americans enjoy Roma than any other wine. R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. And now, Roma Wines bring back to our Hollywood soundstage Joseph Kearns as Bailey, Conrad Binion as his assistant Johnson, and Gerald Moore as The Stranger, in short order. A play well calculated to keep you in... Suspense! Johnson, I'm at my wit's end. What are we going to do? I don't know. I, I got no more ideas. Two weeks now, and we're losing money every day. I could cook it so he wouldn't want to eat it. Well, you've tried that, haven't you? Yeah, twice. And it didn't work. Yeah, that's right. Well, I don't know what we're going to... Oh, just a minute, Johnson. Okay. I'll check on the bunch of things. All right. Hello, Bailey's place. Oh, yeah. Yeah, dear. Huh? Oh, no. Well, you must have misplaced it, honey. Every place? Well, how much was in it? Oh, no. Well, what are we going to do for the rest of the week? But I can't, honey. I really can't. Why, about three bucks or something? I, I don't know. Well, I, I don't... You know, it's, it's just dropped off during the last week. Oh, no, no, he's fine. Now, don't say that, honey. There's nothing the matter with Johnson. And I'm not going to get a new cook. What? Well, I haven't told you, but... Well, why don't you cut down on a few things once in a while? Oh, Johnson, is there any aspirin back there? Yeah, you want the bottle? Yeah, my head's splitting. Uh, here it is. Oh, thanks. Here he is. Hey, now look, I got an idea. You back me up? Well, what is it? Well, I'll try it, and if you don't like it, don't say nothing. Hello? Like I say, Mr. Bailey, this kid was a pretty game fighter. He didn't have a thing but a hard left. Mind if well, I butt in? I'd like to eat. Uh, you bring your lunch with you? What's that? If you brought your lunch, okay, lay it on the counter and eat it. 
It'd be funny, Johnson. Bring me the usual. I got other things to do. What other things? I don't see any other customers. You want me to call the boss? Look, mister, I don't like you, see? I'm tired of seeing you around. You go someplace else and eat. We'll see about that. Hey, Bailey. Uh, yes, sir, what can I do for you? This moron you call a cook says he won't serve me. Yes? Well, do something about it. What do you want me to do? Tell him to serve me. Or else have him fired. Well, Johnson's a good cook. Good cooks are scarce nowadays. What is this? Are you standing up for him? I just told you. Good cooks are hard to get. What about customers? Well, it's too bad, but it, I it... see. Well, look, both of you. I came in here to get something to eat. And we're going to get it. If I have to sit here all night. Suit yourself. Yes. Oh, I'll get it. Bailey's place. Yes, yes, dear. I am... Be- what? Wrecked. Where? Were you in it? Were you hurt? Oh, in front of the house. Oh, I don't know what's happening, Virginia. It just seems every time... Well, I, of course, I'm glad you were in the house. When... Well, how bad was it? Almost a complete wreck. Well, could they find out anything from the driver of the other car? I... Did he have any insurance? Oh, well, they... Never do, do they? What? No, I'm all right, dear. I'm just almost out of my mind is all. It's getting so I'm afraid to answer the phone. Well, we'll just have to do without a car, that's all. Oh, I'm I'm sorry, dear. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I'll talk to you later. Bye. Mr. Bailey. Yes? Well, what's the matter, Mr. Bailey? Bad news? Oh, wrecked my car right in front of my own house. Had no insurance, of course. No money to pay for. Oh, that's tough. Yes, sir, that's tough. Him, him, look at yeah, him. Still sitting there, waiting. I'll have to think of something. So now I can't seem to think at all. Yeah, I'm stopped too. Boy, you sure get the luck, don't you? Well, what's the matter? I never used to have luck like this. Just, just lately. Just, just since he started coming in here. Yeah, could be. Looked like bad news right from the start to me. And there he sits. If we could get him out of here once and for all. Hey, wait a minute. You go to the door and see if Ryan's inside. If he is, call him in, will you? All right, I wouldn't. Oh, okay. Right outside. Oh, Ryan, uh, would you come here a minute? Okay. Oh, Mr. Bailey wants to see you. Well, what can I do for you, Mr. Bailey? See that man sitting at the counter, Ryan? Mm-hmm. I want him either arrested or thrown out of here. I don't care which. That's so? Giving you trouble, is he? Hey, you. You talking to me? Nobody else. Come here. What do you want? Ah, uh, Mr. Bailey, what's the charge? Well, he, uh, um, making a nuisance of himself. What's this? All I do is come in here to eat. And I'm making a nuisance of myself. I don't get it. Look at him, Ryan. I am. Not very pretty, is he? Officer, the law doesn't give you the right to criticize a man's face. I'm, I'm sorry, mister. Hello, Mr. Bailey. Every day he comes in here, two or three times. I can't get anybody else to come near the place while he's here. He stays and stays. He drives all, most of my business away. I have to eat? Same as anybody else? You do anything bad? Get tough? Insult people? Disturb well, the peace? no. All I do is come in and eat. Look, we reserve the right to refuse service to any customer. Well, I don't know now, Mr. Bailey. That's all very well, but technically speaking... What do you mean? He means that even if you don't like it, you can't run me out if I run mine my own business. He means you can't run me out if I ask you to serve me. Well, how, how about that? Well... And if I ask for something to eat and offer you money for it, you've got to sell it to Oh, me. no, I don't. Oh, no, you'd better. Or I'll have you in court before you know it. Afraid he's right about that, Mr. Bailey. Oh, well, all right. Sorry I can't help you, Mr. Bailey. Is there anything else? Oh, no. no. I'll be getting on, then. Good night. Well, how about it? All right, all right, all right. Go sit down. Johnson, get him whatever he wants. Okay. I'm I'm not going to answer it. I'm not. I'm... Mr. Bailey, the phone, you, you busted I it. don't care. Mr. Bailey, put my gun down. What are you going to do? You see. Now, look here, you. I can be pushed just so far. Now, either you get out of this place and don't come back, or as sure as I'm standing here, I'm going to pull this trigger. Go away. I'm hungry. Did you hear what I said? I hear you. Now, go now, away. Now, I'm going to count three. One. Go away. Two. Three. Coffee. Black. I I can't believe it. I shot you point blank. 
Good Lord! Don't uh, forget the ketchup, uh, you. Uh, oh, no! Well, you got the lay of the place now, Mr. Tanner. You figure on making any changes? No, no, Bailey had a good thing here. That'll leave it just the way it was. We'll hold the trade easier if we do. How did he seem when the deal was closed? I can't say. I let the lawyers handle everything. He took a beating on the deal, or I don't know you. No, not too much. I figure he recovered about 70% of his investment. He was lucky. I felt sorry for him. You didn't talk to him at all, huh? No, no, no. Didn't even see him. You think he'd know you even without the makeup? Maybe. No use taking any chances, huh? Lucky I changed the bullets in that gun for blanks, or you'd be a dead pigeon. Yeah. Yeah, I'm glad I foresaw that possibility. You might say I saved your life, huh? You might. Don't worry, Johnson. You'll be taken care of. I'm not worrying. I never had reason to yet, have I? No. But just for your information, Johnson, we haven't committed any crime. We didn't take this place away from Bailey by force. We didn't swindle him. I paid money right on the line for it. Just remember that. Oh, I will. Uh, customer. What? Why, it's Mr. Bailey. Oh, oh, come right in. Hello, Johnson. C come on, have a seat. Uh, oh, by the way, you know Mr. Tanner, don't you? Uh, he bought the place. Oh, I never met him. Glad to know you. A pleasure, Mr. Bailey. Well, you know, there's something uh, familiar about you. Maybe I did meet you someplace. I was in once or twice. Looked the place over before I had Sloan talk to you. Oh, that's it. Uh -huh. Well, how are you making out? Uh, just getting started. I'm sort of breaking Mr. Tanner in, you might say. Hope you had better luck than I did. I was doing fine until, uh, until this man started coming in. Johnson knows the man, I mean. Bad-looking person. If he ever comes back, you just better close up and go home. That's so. Yes, that's right. He... Well, it's a wonder I have any mind left. Tell the truth, I'm not even sure I do. Uh, Mr. Bailey, would you let me fix you something while you're in here? Huh? Oh, no, thanks. I'm not hungry. Ah, uh, we got some good steak. Oh, no, thanks, Johnson. Not even steak now. Okay, you're the boss. Boss? <laughs> no, not anymore. But, uh, I would like to step behind the counter one last time just to <laughs> just sort of look around. Do you, uh, you mind, Mr. Tanner? Oh, come ahead. Thanks. Well, you... Haven't uh, changed anything, I see. Not a thing. We intend to operate the same way you did. I think it'll pay. Thanks for the compliment. But I hope you don't draw my luck. Uh, how about some coffee, Mr. Bailey? You look tired. Coffee? Well, that sounds like a good idea. I don't mind if I do. Uh, yours is cream and sugar, right? No, no, thanks. Black this time. Mm. Say, this coffee is hot. Yeah, I... I forgot to cut the burner back, and the whole tank full is plenty hot. I'll have to let it cool. It's too hot for me. Well, just one last look. Things I won't be seeing for a while, I guess. Buns, butter pats, coffee cream. You know, it's funny how you miss things like these. Mustard, ketchup. Ketchup? Where did you get all this ketchup, Johnson? Why, I... Uh, I ordered those. Ordered them? Well, so did I, but I never even got a look at a bottle of ketchup. <laughs> you're lucky. All in knowing how, I guess. Yeah, I guess you're right. I rather like it myself, you know. Nothing like ketchup, I always say. What? Well, what was that? I... I said I'm rather fond of ketchup. Fond of ketchup? Ketchup? I think I know who you are now, Tanner. I think I know who you are. That, that face. Sure, that face. Makeup, wasn't it? That face. And Johnson had to be in on it with you, too, didn't he? Johnson helped you, didn't he, Tanner? He fixed the gun, didn't he? Well, didn't he, Tanner? Now, Bailey, wait a minute. I can explain. Now, you admit it. I'm telling the truth. Isn't that so, Tanner? Isn't that hey, so? Bailey. Hey, Bailey, stop. Hold him off, Mr. Tanner. I'll get a clock. Police, riot. Help. Police. Help. Cops. Help. Police. Help. Help. Police. Help. Help. Police. Coffee. You always take it black. Ah! Quick, quick. Mr. Tanner. Oh, good Lord, the coffee. His face. And then what is this? Oh, it's all right, Ryan. There's nothing wrong, Ryan. Nothing really wrong. That's not his real face, Ryan. He likes it that way. Don't let him fool you. <laughs> what else do you want? Oh, yes, ketchup. Plenty of ketchup. Nothing like ketchup, I always say. Nothing like ketchup.
Roma Wines have brought you Short Order with Joseph Kearns, Conrad Binion, and Gerald Moore as stars of tonight's study in Suspense. Suspense is produced, edited, and directed by William Spear. This is Ted Myers with a word for Roma Wines, the sponsor of Suspense. During the warm weather, nothing tastes quite so good as a tall, frosty Roma wine and soda. And as Elsa Maxwell recently remarked, serving Roma wine and soda is smart 1945 style hospitality. You'll find this delightful ice drink as refreshing as it is delicious. Yes, and Roma wine and soda is so easy to prepare. Half fill tall glasses with Roma, California Burgundy, or Sauterne. Add ice cubes and a bit of sugar. And for a decorative touch, garnish with cherries or fruit. And for a delightful aperitif, sip delicious Roma sweet vermouth, well chilled. Zestful, full-flavored Roma vermouth, both sweet and dry, is blended and developed with all the traditional winemaking skill of Roma wineries. Is made and bottled in the heart of California's famous vineyards, yet surprisingly low-priced. Try Roma vermouth soon, won't you? Next Thursday, you will hear Dane Clark as star of... Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills. Presented by Roma Wines, R-O-M-A. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Suspense. And the producer of radio's outstanding theater of thrills, the master of mystery and adventure, William N. Robeson. It is relatively easy to tell a tale of terror and suspense against an exotic faraway background. India, say, with its dacoits and fakirs. Or China, with its death of a thousand exquisite tortures. Or Paris, with its apache sleeping under the bridges. Since few of us have ever been there, the author, who probably hasn't been there either, can speak freely. But it is an infinitely more difficult task to take the everyday environment with which we are all familiar and tell against it a tale of terror that could happen to any one of us. Such a task has been brilliantly accomplished by Arthur Zagoras in the story of suspense you are about to hear. Listen. Listen then as Skip Holmeyer stars in Subway Stop, which begins in exactly one minute. What are some of the symbols for heroism? One outstanding example is a cross of bronze with the design of a four-bladed propeller superimposed. In the background is a chased square. This is the Distinguished Flying Cross, authorized by Act of Congress in July 1926, and the only identical medal awarded under similar conditions by both the Army and Navy departments. This coveted decoration is suspended from a plain straight link attached to a blue ribbon with vertical white stripes on each side and a narrow center stripe of red bordered with white. It is awarded for heroism or extraordinary achievement while participating in aerial flight. Among the famous men receiving this outstanding symbol have been Captain Charles A. Lindbergh and Admiral Richard E. Byrd. The Distinguished Flying Cross is a proud award bestowed by a grateful nation on those dedicated men and women who serve gallantly and with extra measure. It is a goal worth attaining and a prize worth cherishing. And now, Subway Stop, starring Skip Homeyer, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. The 
party, if you could call it that, was strictly stag. Just a bunch of guys I'd gone to college with. Everybody in old clothes wearing a weekend stubble. Sort of a bull session with booze. And even though we all had to go to work the next morning, it was past three o'clock when we broke up. Mike and John walked me down the empty street to the subway station. The city's strange in the middle of the night. Strange and unreal. It seemed to belong to the tipsy three of us. Its streets empty, save for a couple of characters standing at the corner. The stoplights blinking in automated precision, controlling the traffic that wasn't there. Hold it. Hold it, you guys. What? What's the matter? Hey, what's happened to the elevated? It's missing. Somebody's stolen it. Yeah? Yeah. All right, who stole the owl? Come on, own up. Who stole it? Hey, didn't you guys hear? The owl's gone on the ground. What, are they ashamed of it? <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Oh, the poor old owl. Oh. Hey, how do I get my train? I dig a hole. You do? Yeah. Where? Right here, next to this lamppost. Move aside, Sonny. Hey, watch who you're pushing, fatso. Sorry, I didn't mean to push you, pimples. Wise guy, huh? Tell him, Gooba. I'll tell him, Din. You better get on your way, Sonny, before I turn you in. There's a curfew against you teenagers who's been out this late. You boys better go on home. Who asked you, Pops? Yeah. You punks better blow. Well, you keep out of this banana nose. Who are you? Call! Oh. Oh, get up, get up. I can drop you again. Yeah, take, take it easy, John. Don't you see the little boys are... Tired of playing with the big boys? You're gonna take that, Gooba? Shut up, Din. Let's go. <laughs> Kids, <laughs> they like to act tough, but they're not really. You know, I was the same way. Well, what makes you think you've changed? <laughs> yeah, right. I guess I haven't changed. I'm just an older teenager, that's all. Uh-oh. Hmm? Hey, look what's heading right for us. Good. Tonight ain't our night. Hey, any of you fellas care to help a guy out? You hit the wrong guys. Yeah, we're flat, too. We were going to ask you for a dime. Please. Go on, beat it. Please. You heard my father scram. Anything would help, a nickel, a dime. How much wine can you buy for a dime? I ain't going to spend it on wine, honest. Come off it. Take off. Now, stop picking on a mic. Here, here, maybe I got some change. See, I got 62 cents left after that last poker hand. I need 15 cents for the subway. And 15 for the bus, that leaves 32 cents. Oh, 32 cents help you? Thanks, mister, thanks. And God bless you. One of those winos hit you every second in this neighborhood. The neighborhood's changed and it's going downhill. Is this where I catch my train? Yep, downstairs. Okay, I better take off. You come over my place on Tuesday, right? Sure, Johnny. Well, listen, th thanks for the party. I had a great time. Okay, we'll see you too. Yeah, Ooh. Hey, you stairs keep still. Oh, the subway's coming. I better hurry. Let me have a token. How many? One. Oh, just a second. I can't find my money. How many? I told you. There, please. Here you are. Hey, hold it! Hey, hold it! Oh, nuts. Hey, lady, thanks a lot. You're welcome. Maybe it was the stale smell of the subway or the excitement of the near fight. Maybe it was all I'd had to drink. The men's room was located at the dimly lit far end of the platform. I ran to it. Afterwards, I felt better. I was washing the bad taste out of my mouth when the door opened. I turned, and there were the two teenagers. Hold it, Pops. Hey, get away from the door. Just step back, Pops. You ain't going nowhere. Well, wh what do you want? Are you listening to the little man, Din? I'm listening. Don't sound so tough, does he? He ain't got the big boys around. And he needs the big boys. Don't you, Pops? He needs them. Because he's a small one, ain't you, little Pops? Yeah. 
little pot. He's a small one. Real small. Like as not, I could break him up myself. Easy. Like as not, you could too, huh, Din? Easy. Look, I'm not asking for trouble, but if you guys want it... You're gonna give me a hard time, Pops? Get him, Goob. I'll get him. <laughs> I've been choked, huh, Pops? <laughs> See this, Pops? Right here, under your eyeball. That's right. That's a knife. Use it, Gooba. Cut him up a little. Look at him, Din. Oh, Pops is a sweating and a sweating. Go, man, go. Yeah, man, yeah. Look out, Gooba. <laughs> oh, oh, you hit me, will you? Get his arm, Din. For cripes sake, get his arm. Yeah. <laughs> there, there, there. Now, now. Once upon a time, Pops, there was this little boy, and he oh. didn't like his Pops. Oh. Because his Pops spoke bad like. Oh. An old goober didn't like that. Oh, come on, Din, come on, get in. No, 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 man, don't use your feet. That ain't kosher. Use your knee. In a moment, we continue with the second act of Suspense. Another visit with Joe and Daphne Forsythe. Hey, honey, I'm home. Daphne. Drop dead. Uh-oh, what's the matter, honey? Don't you speak to me, you, you Don Juan. Don Juan? Daphne, I'm no Don Juan. No hobble espanol. Very funny, ha, ha, ha. Well, it was no prize winner, but... No. Neither are you, you, you Lothario. I've often wondered, what's a Lothario? I don't know, but that's what the wives on TV always call their husbands. I guess it applies. Do you want me to go out and come in again? As far as I'm concerned, you can go for a long walk, preferably on a short pier. Well, oh, come on, Daphne, what's wrong? Your good friend Harry called, and he spilled the beans. Which beans? He said, quote, tell Joe he was right about those blondes. They're great, unquote. Blondes? That's what he said. <laughs> well? He didn't say blondes. He said bonds. Savings bonds. What? Sure. I buy them on the payroll savings plan. And I told Harry he ought to do it, too. Savings bonds have a guaranteed interest that pays back $4 for every three, which is a pretty good investment. That's a pretty good story, too. It's true, so help me. That's why Harry's so happy. Savings bonds are great. Well, maybe you're right. You wouldn't really fool around with blondes, would you? You're too faithful and sweet and kind and... Fast talking. And now, starring Skip Holmeyer, act two of Subway Stop. It was quiet for a long time. I knew I was lying on the floor of the men's room in the subway. I couldn't remember why or how I got there. And far off, as if in a well, I heard a voice. Mm -hmm. Look at what we got here. Mm -hmm. huh. What's huh. the matter, son? <laughs> Help. Oh, what's wrong? You had <laughs> too much. Oh, it's too bad. Let's just look for your wallet, eh? See if we find out where you live, son. Hmm. No money. Now, that's not so good, son. Now, here, let's just turn you over. No! No, no, no. Let's see. See, nothing in that pocket. Hmm. Cigarette lighter. Yeah, hmm. Cigarettes. Half back. Oh, you smoke too much, son. I'll just keep these. Now, let's see what's in the other pocket. No! Now, what's the message, son? I ain't going to hurt you. Let's see. Hmm, 15 cents. I'm kind of disappointed in you, boy, but... Well, that watch might make up for it. Now, let's see it. Do you mind if I take it off here? Hey, good. Thank you. Oh, here comes my train, son, but before I leave, a piece of advice for you. Don't drink. It ain't good for you, son. Help! Help! It was a long time before I came to. I was awakened by the stench of the room and the cold stab of the floor. 
I had to get up. I had to get out of that room. Somehow I pulled myself up and staggered to the door. I opened it. As I did, I could feel sharp, shooting pains cut across my abdomen. I couldn't breathe. Each breath was like a jab, a cutting jab in the ribs. I realized I was badly hurt. I should keep still. I knew if I stayed in that room, I'd die. The platform was empty, completely empty. I leaned against the wall, waiting for someone to help me. I heard the subway train coming. People would be getting off. They'd help. Slowly pulled myself toward the center of the platform. Help. Mr. Help me. Huh? M Mr. Please. I ain't got any money. Go on, beat it. Mr. Go on, beat it for it. Call a cop. No. No. What do you mean, no? No, don't grab me. I'm hurt. Huh? Yeah, yeah, well, you better take care of yourself. Look, I, I gotta go. Sorry, buddy. I, I gotta get home. I supported myself against the cold tile wall. I made my way to the cashier's cage. She couldn't see me because the windows were dusty and clouded with grime. I tried to shout, but I couldn't. I tapped on the window. I tapped for a long time before she noticed me. Huh? What do you want? Help. I can't hear a word you're saying. Come over here by the turnstile. Help, please. Oh, it's you again. What are you bothering me for? Please, help Ah, me. pick up your mumbling. I... <laughs> Too drunk to answer, huh? Look, mister, if you don't want nothing, don't block the way. Did you hear me? Get out of the way. Yes, ma'am. How many? Two, please. Oh, please help me. Hey, what's the matter with him? Drunk. Looks funny hanging over the turnstile like that. How to call a cop, I guess. Say, look at the blood at his leg. Yeah, he fell down probably. You sure? He looks hurt. I wouldn't go near him. <laughs> I'm used to his kind. You should see the place I work in. I'll bet. Hey, mister. Hey, you heard? Uh, I... Hey, he don't sound good. Maybe you should call a cop. I don't want no trouble. As long as he don't make trouble for me, I won't make no trouble for him. Yeah, but don't you understand? This guy's hurt bad. Nothing ever happens to those kind of guys. Oh, here comes my train. Maybe you should call a doctor, lady. What, for that bum? Don't be silly. Hmm. Can't find any wallet, no identification. I told you, just a bum. Yeah. Well, sure, you might call a doctor or something. Oh, Watch it, buddy. Oh, well, don't look, I gotta go. Away. Watch yourself, mister. Help. Block me, the exit, brother. I need help. We all do, brother. We all do. No, no, you Step don't. Step aside, understand. brother. I'm hurt. Dying. Wages of sin is death, brother. The wages of sin is death. Remember that, brother. Hey, mister, you better beat it. You can't hang around here all night. You hear me? Give me two tokens. Yeah. Go right through, honey. Yeah. Oh, we just missed it, Jim. We are always just missing trains. There'll be another one along in a minute. Well, what's he staring at? Hmm? Who? Him, that bum. Hey, what are you staring at? Oh, he's just a uh, drunk, honey. Well, I don't like him staring. Okay, buddy. You heard the lady. Oh. Hey, what's the matter? Oh, he's sure carrying the mail. Yeah, he's looking at us, but he don't see us. Hey, watch. Watch it, buddy. Watch it. You're, you're slipping. Let me help you. Hey. Hey, you're hurt, aren't you? Honey, I, I'd better go get some help. Come on, Jimmy. We don't want any trouble. But, honey, this guy's hurt. He's hurt bad. I know that. I, I just just can't leave him here. Look, Jimmy, he's probably a crook or something. Him? Oh, come on. Be sensible. I am. And I want you to be sensible. You bother with him, you're going to have to bother with cops, courts maybe, and the newspapers. Newspapers? You think so? Sure. Uh, supposing that guy dies, it's sure to get in the paper that you found him, you and me. I don't want my name in the paper, do you? Oh, but honey, he's hurt. Do you want your name in the paper? Well, 
No, I... I... Darling, it wouldn't look too good, would it? Supposing your wife read about it, huh? Now look, Jim. He's a bum. You gonna throw everything away for a bum? Oh, I, I, I don't know. Oh, our train's coming. He'll be all right. But this guy... Come on. Look, buddy, I'm... I'm, I'm sorry. Oh, he can't hear you? Come on. Oh, I hate to leave him like this. What's the matter with you? Was he your brother or something? You don't even know the guy. Don't buy trouble, Jim. Um, maybe you're right. Come on, darling. Come on. You understand, Mac? Don't you? Help. Help. In a moment, we continue with the third act of Suspense. We have, together, ample capacity in freedom to defend freedom. This is NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. The strategic land area covered by the North Atlantic Treaty is vast and is divided into three major commands in accord with geography and political factors. European, Atlantic Ocean, and Channel Commands. Combined, these cover a land and water mass stretching virtually from the North Pole to the Tropic of Cancer, from the coastal waters of North America to those of Europe and Africa. The United States of America is a part of NATO. You should be aware of and alert to the programs and objectives of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. And now, starring Skip Holmeyer, Act Three of Subway Stop. Pushed through the gate, made it to the stairs. I held onto the railing and pulled myself up. One step. Two. Three. Four steps. Couldn't go any further, the pain was too great. I sat down. I looked up at the street. It was morning now and the sun was streaming into the subway. The day was awakening, people would be going to work. The sun was warm, very warm. I sat there looking at the clouds, the sky, the sun. After a while, I closed my eyes. I could hear people coming down the steps. Oh, brother, he's got a beaut. <laughs> Where do they find the money? <laughs> Look at him. Boy, <laughs> he's sleeping peaceful like a baby. Oh, for the life of a bum, huh? <laughs> Look at his mouth. <laughs> wide open. <laughs> People of the city going to work, laughing. Ignoring me, leaving me to die. I didn't mind any longer. I should have cursed them, shouted out, but I didn't. I couldn't. I felt sorry for them. And then I heard a slow shuffle of feet coming down the steps, coming toward me. I could smell the stench of old wine and beer. I felt rough, calloused hands rub across my cheek. Finally, I heard a voice. Remember me, mister? You gave me money last night. You was the only one who did. What's the matter, mister? You hurt? Yes. You stay there. I'm going to call an ambulance. You stay right there. I heard him move away. And then, after a few minutes, he came back and sat beside me. He lifted my head and cradled it in his arms. I knew that it was going to be all right. I wanted to thank him. Don't try and talk, mister. You don't have to say anything. Thanks. You don't got to thank me. I got to thank you. You gave me the money. I used your dime for the phone call. Hey, you two, get out of the way. You bums are always cluttering up the steps. Mister, my friend and me ain't bums. He's sick and I'm helping him. Yeah, I ought to call a cop. You, mister. You're the bum.
Suspense, in which Mr. Skip Homeyer starred in William N. Robeson's production of Subway Stop by Arthur Zagoras. Supporting Mr. Homeyer in Subway Stop were Shirley Mitchell, Virginia Gregg, Barney Phillips, Bill Quinn, Joe DeSantis, Tommy Cook, Jackie Kelk, and Norm Alden. Listen. Listen again next week when we return with Zero Hour, Ray Bradbury's fearful tale of the day the children and Martians took over the earth, starring the amazing child star Evelyn Rudy. Another tale well calculated to keep you in... Suspense. United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. and its 96,000 dealers present Suspense. Tonight, Autolite brings you The Crowd, a suspense play starring Mr. Dana Andrews. All right, stand back. Keep moving. You got other places to go. Go to them. Somebody die, somebody yeah, yeah, now you know, so keep moving. Oh, hey, Lieutenant. Hey, Lieutenant, I, I didn't see you. I didn't mean to poke you in the tummy with my billy. What happened, officer? Yeah, uh, Lieutenant, the way it happened, I, uh... Well, officer, we got a right to know what it's all about. What's going on up there? I can't see. Get somebody to hoist you up on their shoulders, citizen, then you'll see. Well, sometimes I don't understand this kind of thing, Lieutenant. A couple of minutes ago, this was an empty street. Now this crowd... You still haven't told me what happened. Uh, well, I was directing traffic up the street. A woman screamed, and I thought it was just... Well, you know. But no, it was this guy laying on the sidewalk with a knife in him. Dead. Murdered. The people running around him, this crowd. Is he dead? Let me look. Let me look. Get out of my way. I want to see. I want to see. Dead, huh? Dead. In just a moment, Mr. Dana Andrews in the first act of The Crowd. Hi, a hap? New suit? Yeah, Wilcox, you like it? Love it. Reminds me of Autolite Ignition Engineered Spark Plugs. Custom made and a perfect fit for your car. Yeah, it's real hand tailoring, too. You said it. Autolite Engineers tailor spark plugs just as they tailor the complete ignition system used as original factory equipment on many leading makes of America's finest cars. That's why Ignition Engineered Autolite Spark Plugs are world famous for quality and dependability. How to give me a lot of wear. Thousands of miles. Why, when you replace worn-out spark plugs with Ignition Engineered Autolite Spark Plugs, you get smoother performance, quick starts, gas savings. Hey, Wilcox, everybody knows about Autolite Spark Plugs. How about my full suit? Ignition Engineered Autolite Spark Plugs will suit your car in every season, Hap. So, friends, see your friendly Autolite spark plug dealer and have him replace worn-out spark plugs with world-famous ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs. Whether you choose the resistor type or the standard type, you can be sure money can't buy better spark plugs. Because you're always right 
with Autolite. And now, with the crowd and the performance of Mr. Dana Andrews, Autolite hopes once again to keep you in suspense. The call had come in from the police call box 12 minutes before. Had come to headquarters, been transferred to me, Johnny Stilano, because I'm a lieutenant, New York police. Things like this are my job. It had taken me maybe five minutes to get there, and already the crowd was there. The crowd. A ring of shifting, compressing, changing faces looking down at the dead man, watching the shape of death in his face. Stand back! Stand back! Officer? Well, Lieutenant. Have you gone through this man's pocket? Do you know who he is? Uh, no, sir. I haven't had time. I'll do it. Uh, here comes the ambulance, Lieutenant. All right, you people. Why don't you move on? Give them room. Give them room. Hi, Johnny. Hello, Doc. You through them? Uh-huh. All right, boy. Let them through. Come on through. Out of the way, you. Here and there, on the fringes of the crowd, a man detached himself from it, bit his lip and left. Even the spectacle of death can't compete with the time clock. Get back to work and tell your friends about it. Then the sound of death fading away. And then the crowd, too. And in a little while, the only thing left of it was an unconvinced passerby who looked over his shoulder at the spot and hurried on. Then the leavings of the crowd. A dead man, identified from a worn leather wallet as Edgar Dale, West 32nd Street. Name and address. Go there. Dig into a life that was done. Ask why. At Edgar Dale's rooming house, a woman opened the door only halfway, touched her cotton wrap around high on her throat, shook her head to most of my questions. Edgar Dale had no family, lived alone. And a shrug to... What friends? He worked, that's all. At the Becker Sign Painting Company on First Avenue. Maybe there, mister. I went. Something I can do for you? I'm a police officer, Johnny Stellano. Oh, oh, how do you do? My name is Becker, Elliot Becker. A man worked for you... Edgar Dale? Edgar Dale. I I just put the phone down on the police a minute ago. They called, told me what happened. Then you know why I'm here. I believe so. You'll want to know all about Edgar. I'll help all I can. Tell me about him. Edgar... Edgar was like anybody. Looked like anybody. Talked like anybody. Kept to himself, he did his job. A, a man who sat in the supply room and back and read science fiction magazines when he didn't go outside to have lunch. What else? I don't know. You can only judge a solitary man by the things he did to give you that impression. He listened to jokes but never told one. He clipped pictures of movie stars in bathing suits and pasted them over his workbench, crossword puzzles, contests the newspapers ran, those things. Friends? Girlfriends? I don't know, Mr. Stellano. I've wondered sometimes who might enjoy Edgar as a friend, but I don't know. Where was he killed? Two blocks from here. This morning. I I saw the people running. I I couldn't get away. That's too bad. How was he killed, Lieutenant? What did he look like? Hello, Johnny. Been waiting for you. What's up, Reardon? Give me your phone calls. Five altogether. From whom? I don't know. I tried to wheedle it out of him, but the man just wouldn't say. He said he'd keep trying, though. He has to talk to you personally. What else? Uh, This envelope came addressed to your special delivery. It's marked personal. Open it. It says personal. Open it. Hmm. 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 What is it? A picture, Johnny. A clip from this afternoon's extra in the news. I saw it there myself. A picture of the man who was stabbed to death on the street with the crowd around him. I see it. Now look what's written under it, Johnny. Yeah. I did well, didn't I, police? Next time it will be even better. Johnny Solano speaking. Oh, I, I finally got you in, Lieutenant. I read in the papers you were assigned to the case. Uh, the man found dead on the sidewalk. Yes. I, uh, just called to ask you if you got the clipping I sent you. The one of the dead man lying on the street. I, I sent it special. Oh? 
Uh, I just got in. I haven't had a chance to look at the mail. Will you hold on just a minute while I check? Reardon, trace this call quick. Right, Johnny. I, uh... Oh, yes, I have it here. The words written underneath. Did you write them? Oh, yes. And I meant them. Every word. There will be a next time, Lieutenant. There will be another murder. I, I believe you. I won't be so foolish as to think you're some kind of a crank. I can see you're a very intelligent man. It was very clever how you committed the murder. Broad daylight on the street. Oh, the next one will be even more spectacular. Far more. Well, tell me about it. (laughs) Oh, there's no need. There'll be a crowd. You'll read about it. I'll send you a picture. Reardon. I got it, Johnny. Gilbert Shoe Repair. It's right around the corner from here. I got the blotter on my desk. Gilbert Shoe Repair. Gilbert. Hey, Gilbert. Huh? Turn off that machine. I want to talk to you. Huh? Turn off that machine. Oh, sure, Johnny. <laughs> Huh? Oh, he wants your shoes, Johnny. <laughs> he ain't been in here so long, I was going to put him in the window with a for sale under him. Now, I don't want to talk to you about shoes. Not about shoes? There's something else we can talk about? About a man. He just made a phone call from here. What man? Well, listen to me, Gilbert. Just a couple of minutes ago, a man came in here. I don't know what man. He made a phone call. You're from here? You use my phone? Yeah, maybe he did. All right, so he did. You don't understand, do you? This man was a murderer. Two minutes ago, he was in here using your phone. Oh, so what am I supposed to do about it? I'm a shoemaker. But look out through the window, Johnny. See all those people? Every now and then, one of them breaks off, comes in, wants his shoes fixed, wants to use the phone. Yep. Oh, yeah. A few minutes ago, one of them did come in. And he asked to use my phone. Well, I didn't notice anything about it. I never noticed anything about any of them. They're all alike. Some are men, some are women. This one was a man. Turn back into the street again and into the swarm of the crowd. Into the wash of anonymous faces, the blob. And somewhere in it, a murderer. Then back into the office. Sit down again. Stare at Reardon again. Reardon stares back. And then, get up. Walk to the window. Stare at the crowd. Phone's ringing, Johnny. Uh Uh-huh. John Estillano speaking. You don't run so fast, Lieutenant. You know, you know, you almost knocked me down when you ran across the street into that shoemaker's shop. Really? I'm close by, Lieutenant. In the payphone on the subway, 34th Street. Run fast, Lieutenant. Hello? Hello? Never mind, Reardon. Him again? Him again. He even told me where he was. So I'd go there and close my eyes and point a finger at the five o'clock subway crowd and say, You, you're a killer. I almost knock him down. I talk to him. We chat on the phone. Uh, I can give you a category for this murderer. These phone calls, the boasting of his killing. I'm not a doctor and I know he's crazy. Sure, sure, sure you do, Reardon. I don't know where to start. Where do I start, Reardon? I... Take it easy, John. A lonely little man is stabbed to death on a street in New York City. For all I know, this killer is standing right beside me, looking down at the dead man. The killer sends me a picture. The killer calls me on the phone. The killer tells me he's in a subway at 34th Street Station. The killer... Lieutenant. Yeah? Call box report just came in. man was pushed in front of a subway at 34th Street Station. <laughs> The pattern repeated itself, but with variation now. The body of a man, broken, crushed, without form, like a child's drawing of death, lay on a beer of railroad ties of glistening steel rails. Over him, the shroud of a subway car. And deep in the cavern, the lament of hurtling steel, the crowd. The crowd watching on the platform. No variation here. Same crowd that gathers and watches at all death's public performances. The crowd. Let me look, let me look. Get out of my way, I want to see. Dead, huh? 
Autolite is bringing you Mr. Dana Andrews in The Crowd, tonight's production in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Say, Wilcox, you have a good tailor. Sure, Sam is a suit stitcher supreme now. He never makes the pants too long since his car worries stopped. Well, what was his trouble? Why, Sam's sedan used a tank of gas just to get out of the garage. That's ridiculous. <laughs> That's what I said. I told him to stop blowing his top and have his spark plugs checked by his friendly Autolite spark plug dealer. Did he do it? Yep. Now this pleased pantaloon producer is getting a real run for his money. He replaced the spark plugs that were not functioning properly with ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs. And now he gets smoother performance, quick starts, gas savings. I'll bet he thanked you, Wilcox. He did, Hap, he did. And he couldn't have bought better spark plugs for his car than ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs. So, friends, see your friendly Autolite spark plug dealer and have him replace worn-out spark plugs with ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs. Whether you choose the resistor type or the standard type, you'll know why you're always right with Autolite. And now Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage Mr. Dana Andrews in Elliot Lewis's production of The Crowd, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Push him away for you. One side here. One side out of the way. Police, out of the way. I guess we'll have to go through the car, Johnny, and out through the end to get to him. Yeah, come on. Hey, is there a Stellano here? A Lieutenant Johnny Stellano? Wait, Reardon. Yeah. Stellano! Somebody on a uh, phone booth here wants a Lieutenant Stellano. Lieutenant Stellano on a phone. He's wanted. Sure he's wanted. By the draft board. <laughs> Yeah, I'm here. Don't hang up. I'm here. What's the matter, Lieutenant? <laughs> You're out of uniform. <laughs> Former PFC presents you with a phone. Johnny Stolano speaking. Oh. Oh, I'm glad they reached you, Lieutenant. You see, there was another dead man. Crowd much better than the first. Much, don't you think? <laughs> Much better, the man said. Much better. How good does death have to be? This time, the murderer had chosen to push a man under a subway train. The crowd seemed to like this one better, too. They stayed longer after we got the body out from under the train. Leg work. Questions. The dead man? Adam Treppel, the Bronx. Inquiries. He's married, three children, and is the supermarket. More inquiry. No motive for his murder. No one wanted him dead. Everybody said so. Johnny, I brought you a thermos of coffee. Thanks. Uh, and this envelope just came for you. Special delivery? Marked personal? Mm-hmm. Give it to me. Like the last time? Like the last time. Newspaper picture. This is a triple under the subway train. With the crowd around. Uh huh. Look at him. And look at this one. The first one I got when Edgar Dale was stabbed. The crowd. Why do people always hang around other people's hurt? I'll pour you some coffee. You want coffee, John? Yeah, yeah. Here. Here you are, Johnny. Johnny? What? Huh? This man standing here in the picture, right up front of the crowd, around Edgar Dale. This man here. Not very clear. So? The other picture, the one on the subway. This man, also in the front row of the crowd. Also not very clear. So? Look at him, will you? I'm looking. 
Hey. The same man, Reardon. The same man in both pictures. I won't say no. Me neither. Because it's the same. It could have been a coincidence. It could have just happened that way. One chance in 50,000, in 100,000, 1,000, 1,000. But it could have happened. One man, a part of a crowd, having his picture taken as a spectator of violent death on a crowded street in a subway. One man pushing his way to the front of the crowd to have his picture taken just because it happened to him twice in the same day. By some sly smile of fortune, it was arranged for two people to die just where he happened to be. Just where there was a man with a camera to take a picture, too. A picture that would give him a name in his neighborhood, make people look up to him. Don't tell me how it was. He was there, twice. Then there was the other chance, that he was the murderer. That's the one a policeman had to put his money on. He could do that by talking to a man he knew in a newspaper office, a man in charge of the morgue, a man named Marty Powell. You slumming, Lieutenant? Don't you ever open a window in here, Marty? Who wants fresh air? Fresh air is for the birds. If you don't like it here, go away. Still sour, huh, Marty? You come from out there. Anything happen to it out there just before you came in? No. I didn't think so. When it does, when it dries up and blows away out there, I might sweeten up. If I feel like it. What can I do for you, Lieutenant? I want to look at some pictures. Don't we all? Pictures where people were killed, where... Look, Lieutenant, I got files and files of those to the ceiling, see? Be more explicit. How were they killed? Accident? War? By a wife? A jealous lover? Suicide? Stop me any time you like. I tire easy. Unloaded revolver? Well, it's hard to explain, Marty, but, uh... Pictures like these... Local. Let me see. Mm Mm-hmm. Pictures like unsolved murders, huh, Lieutenant? Where the killing was violent. Too violent for you boys to solve. I'll get some for you. Hard to explain. How far back, Lieutenant? Two, three years, maybe. Mm. I was afraid of that. Here you are. I made a selection for you. The most artistic, the most captivating. Several of these won prizes. We are very proud of this one, for example. To your taste? Mm Mm-mm. Let's see some more. This one. Hold that one out, Marty. Not the one with the guy who fell out of the window or the other one? The window. Now let's see some more. been here for two hours, Lieutenant. I told you, I tire easy. More. Okay. That one. I'll take these, these two. Goodbye, Marty. You ready on that projector, Reardon? Uh-huh. Yeah, I'll pull the screen down. Okay, turn out the lights. That's how the first one. This is a picture of a man pulled out of the river. He was shot. This this picture was taken in December 1948. Notice the crowd. Notice this spectator. The one in the front row, not wearing a hat. Let's have number two. A picture of a man who was pushed or fell out of a window from a ten-story building. June this year. Again. Notice the crowd. And the man in the right-hand corner of the crowd being pushed back by a policeman. Now run the slides of the ones we had made from the newspaper clipping. The crowd around Edgar Dale. Notice that man up front, on the end. Okay. The crowd around Adam Treppel. Notice the fourth man down in the front row. What do you think, Reardon? They're all the same man. You sure? The same man. It took an hour for the newspapers to hit the streets with a front-page picture of a man wanted for murder. A man in the crowd who, for two or three years, had quietly committed murder. Four killings, to our knowledge. Now we knew what he looked like, what went on inside his mind. He liked to kill. He liked to stand with the crowd over his kill. With the crowd, liked to see death up close. That man is my husband. Where's your husband now? He's in bed. He pretends he's an invalid. He's been lying there for five years, but I know he sneaks out at night when I'm asleep. 
He's been waiting on him hand and foot for five years, and I know he's only pretending. We checked it. The man was an invalid, paralyzed. Then? I'm the man. I'm the man you want. I did all those killings. This picture of you we have, you don't look the same. You've changed. That's right. I've changed. I change all the time. Don't you think that's clever of me? Yes, it is. Will you wait here a moment? Well, Reardon. Yeah, what is it, Johnny? There's a man in my office. Take him to the psycho ward for observation. <laughs> Johnny Stellano speaking. Please, can you come here quickly? Who is this? I'm Mrs. Jane Shirley. I, I have a rooming house at 1216 East 38th. Well, what is it you want, Mrs. Shirley? The man whose picture's in the paper. The man you're looking for. He has a room in my house. Is he there now? No, but I expect him home any minute. Please, will you come quickly? Right away. <laughs> His name is Charles Turner, Mr. Solano. At least that's what he told me it was. He's been living here for the past seven years. I don't know much more about him than that. He comes and he goes. Take me to his room, Mrs. Shirley. Yeah, right down the hall. Yeah, I'll turn on the light. This is his room. These pictures on the wall. A man in a subway... On a street corner, a man who fell out of a building. Yes, they all belong to Mr. Turner. He hung them on the wall. I never asked him. What'll happen now? Do you have a room near the front of the house? My room. We'll wait for Mr. Turner there. Don't worry about a thing. I'll get it. Johnny? Who are you looking at me like that for? I told you to wait in the squad car. Well, a call just come through. A guy's holding our killer. What? Yeah, a greasy spoon lunchroom down the corner. Now, Mr. Turner always eats right down the corner. The guy who runs the joint phoned in that our man is eating the supper there right now. Let's go. Hey, there's a crowd. That's funny. The street was deserted less than a minute ago. Let's go. All right, let us through here. Police officers, let us through. Oh, oh, oh. What happened oh. to you? You, you police? That's right. I own this place. He saw me making the phone call. Ran out. I ran after him. He had a knife. And uh, uh, he's dead, Reardon. Huh? Johnny, he's not. He just fainted. I said he's dead. Will one of you people in the crowd go in this store and call an ambulance? This man's dead. Let me through. Let me through. Hey, Reardon. That's him, Johnny. This man. Is he dead? What happened to him? Anybody know what happened? Would you like to see him, Mister? Would you like to see him up close? Why? Why? I. The photographers will be here in a few minutes. Why don't you stick around and have your picture taken, Mr. Turner? Well, you're wrong. My name is not Turner. I just wanted to know whether the man was dead. That's all. I I want to get out of here. Come back here, Turner. One side. Let's... Come back here. Johnny. Yep. Let's go, Reardon. Dead. Johnny, look at him. Look at him. Yeah. Here comes the crowd. Is he dead? Get out of my way. I want to see. I want to see. Get out of the way. I want to see. Did he really die? Huh? I want to see him. Suspense, presented by Autolite. 
Tonight's star, Dana Andrews. Say, Wilcox, your tailor has a lot of satisfied customers, huh? Yes, Hap, but nowhere near the hundreds of thousands Autolite satisfies each year because Autolite makes over 400 products for cars, trucks, planes, and boats in its 28 plants from coast to coast. These include complete electrical systems used as original equipment on many of America's finest cars. Generators, coils, distributors, voltage regulators, wire and cable, starting motors, and electric windshield wipers. All engineered to work together perfectly as part of the Autolite team. All engineered to give you unexcelled Autolite service. Don't accept electrical parts supposed to be as good. Ask for and insist on Autolite original factory parts at your neighborhood service station, car dealer, garage, or repair shop. Remember, you're always right with Autolite. Next week on Suspense, Mr. Joseph Cotton as star of Fly By Night. And in the weeks to come, you will hear such famous stars as Miriam Hopkins, Milton Berle, and Howard Duff, all appearing in tales well calculated to keep you in Suspense. Tonight's Suspense play was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with music composed by Lucian Morawieck and conducted by Lud Gluskin. Parts of this program were transcribed. The Crowd by Ray Bradbury was adapted for suspense by Morton Fine and David Friedkin. Dana Andrews appeared through the courtesy of Samuel Goldwyn. He may currently be seen in the Goldwyn production, Edge of Doom. And remember next week on Suspense, Mr. Joseph Cotton in Fly by Night. Buy world famous Autolite resistor or standard spark plugs, Autolite stayful batteries, Autolite electrical parts at your neighborhood Autolite dealers. Switch to Autolite. Good night. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. In just a moment, suspense. Starring Agnes Moorhead. Hi, Hap. Hello, Ann. How are things? Couldn't be better. Except walking 12 blocks to your service station just isn't for me. You got my new spark plugs in? Just finished putting those brand new Autolite resistor spark plugs in your car. Guess she takes a big load off your arches, eh, Hap? <laughs> sure does. My feet have the pep, but not the pickup. <laughs> what are you listening to tonight? Well, oh, it's Thursday, Hap. I'm listening to the Autolite Suspense Show. Never miss it. Well, here's where I rest my weary bones and listen to Agnes Moorhead. Hey, Hap, here comes Frank Martin, the Autolite salesman, to join us. Hello, Frank. Hi, Ed. Meet Hap Horton. Autolite spark plugs, batteries, and ignition systems. <laughs> the the lifeline of your car. <laughs> well, thanks, Mr. Horton, for the assist. And wait until I give you the real lowdown on those brand new Autolite resistor spark plugs Ed just put in your car. Say they... Say it later, Frank. Here comes Agnes Moorhead. Suspense. Autolite and its 60,000 dealers and service stations bring you radio's outstanding theater of thrills. Starring tonight, Miss Agnes Moorhead in a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Today, everybody's switching to Autolite, and tonight, Autolite takes pleasure in presenting... Anton Leder's production of the famous short story, The Yellow Wallpaper, starring Agnes Moorhead. I've never seen a worse wallpaper in my life. All those strangled heads and bulbous eyes and fungus growth seemed to shriek with derision. When we came to this house, the minute I saw it, I made up my mind secretly to start writing again in spite of them. But I don't dare let John know I'm keeping this journal. It's difficult being married to a doctor. John's an excellent doctor, I'm sure, but he's so inconsistent about me. He says I'm not really sick, that I'm only a little run down from caring for the baby, that I have a temporary nervous depression, yet he prescribes phosphates or phosphites, I don't know which, and tonics and exercise. And he absolutely forbids me to work until I'm well again. He hates for me to write a word. But writing is such a relief to my mind. I can write down things, tell things here that... No, John says I'm not to brood about those things. 
I confess they make me feel bad, so I'll only write about the house. I saw it for the first time today. It's the most beautiful place. John rented it for the summer, and we drove up today, a perfect June morning. The bay and the white sails and people already in swimming, and then the shaded lane and the riotous old-fashioned flowers and the gnarly trees and the house. The house standing alone in the summer stillness. I could never tell John, but you know, the house spoke to me. It was only because he rattled on so that I couldn't hear what reminded he... Reminded me of those English places you read about. Gardeners, cottages and everything, and had only 200 a month. Hedges and walls and gates that lock, and there's a ghostliness. Remember, I rented it just for you, darling. And you're going to let Jenny do all the work while you live like, uh, well, like a prince. You like it, darling? Well, speak up. Yes, John. Yes, it's lovely, but it's strange, as though it might be haunted. <laughs> darling, you've got that look on your face again. That dopey look. Well, Jean is home, has a station wagon, and if I know my dear sister, she's already turned the place inside out and cleaned it top to bottom. John, is it haunted, do you think? What, the house? Uh-huh. At 200 a month? Well, that's asking too much of fate. Come on, how about... You always laugh at anything you can't touch or see or put down in figures. There is something strange about the house, I feel If it. you weren't always imagining... I'm not things. imagining... One reason I don't get well is that you don't believe me. You don't even believe I'm sick. You tell my friends and relatives. I, I've heard you. I've heard you that there's nothing wrong with there me. There is nothing wrong you with see you. You see what I'm saying? Oh, again? I'm sorry. But please don't cry. Now, come along. <laughs> Let's go inside. And so I came into this house in tears. It was wrong. It was all wrong. Maybe the house saw me crying or this room... I got so unreasonably angry with John. I shouldn't, I know. He's so careful and loving, and I repay him so badly. I should control myself, at least in front of him. But it makes me so tired not to show what I feel. Jenny met us at the door. Naturally, she saw I'd been crying, but she took pains to ignore it. Well, hello, you two. You're early. You must have started at the crack of dawn. How was the trip? Made it in less than two hours. They're like his peas in a pod, Jenny and John. Both efficient and kind. And how did you bear up, Pet? Oh, very well, thank you, Jenny. Well, just both kind and both somehow cruel. But I don't really think that. Well, you're just in time for lunch. I bought a flounder down at the wharf and cooked it with capers and cream. Sound good? Wonderful, Jenny. May I see the house first? The whole grand tour? Oh, Pet, the flounder will cook to death. Well, at least my room. Our room. <laughs> All right, if you insist. But if that fish is spoiled, don't blame me. Why would I blame her? Whose room is this, Jenny? Yours? Uh-huh, it's small, but it's near the door and the telephone. Oh, John, John, oh. look. What? Let's take this one for you and me. I love those roses over the window. I've already put your things upstairs, pet. Well, this has a little porch and such pretty old-fashioned chintz hangs. Let's take this. Well, you'll love the room upstairs, darling. And you can see there's no room in here for two beds. And I won't hear of being in separate rooms. I'm going to make you rest and take your tonic. John and I have talked it all over. And the room at the top of the house has so many windows. And you know, darling, you must absorb lots of fresh air. Get your appetite back. They smother me with concern. They crush me with kindness. Come along. <laughs> There's a good girl. <sighs> All right, you know what's best. A and you're going to like that nursery. It gets loads of sunshine. up the steep, narrow stairs, two stories up to the very top of the house. There's a gate at the top that locks. I wonder why. And beyond the gate is the nursery room, this room. It is big and airy, nearly a whole floor with windows that look every way. They say it was a nursery, but what was it really? Open them all, Jenny. Wide. All right. Well, darling? Why are the windows barred? Uh, for the little children. Otherwise, it wouldn't be safe. Oh, yeah. I suppose. Children climb around so, don't they? <laughs> what are the, those rings and things in the walls? Oh, I expect they made it into a gymnasium when the children got older. Uh, a sort of playground. Oh, they must have hated the wallpaper. <laughs> well, they were rough on it, that's for sure. The way they've stripped it off in patches. I don't blame them. It's hideous. Oh, who wants to look at the wallpaper with this view? My, you can see the whole bay. It's a revolting color. It's unclean. Such a strange, sickish yellow there where the sun's faded it. I never saw worse paper oh, in my don't life. don't dramatize it, darling. 
You must be hungry, and I know you're tired. I'm not tired. Why do you both act this way? I say the wallpaper's ugly, and you look at each other. Your eyes shuttle back and forth, and suddenly you both act as though I'd lost my... Darling, that was something we weren't going to say. Be a good girl, pet. We don't act anyway. We just don't want you to worry. We want you to be well. It's true, that's all they want. John laughs at me, of course, but one expects that in marriage. And he says I have foolish fancies and he sometimes can talk them away, but not this time. No matter what he says, it's a smoldering, sulfurous, unclean, it's hideous wallpaper. No wonder the children scratched at it and stripped it down. No wonder they gouged the plaster with their little fingernails. No wonder they hate it. I hate it myself. And somehow, I feel it hates me. Suspense, Autolite is bringing you Miss Agnes Moorhead in the yellow wallpaper. Autolite's presentation of radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Say, Ed, isn't she terrific? Yes, sir, Agnes Moorhead is always terrific. She sure is. Say... Car sure sounds good. I couldn't resist stepping on the starter. Yeah, these new Autolite resistor spark plugs sure make this a contented car. Yep, and you got the first set in town. Well, right now you can get Autolite resistor spark plugs almost anywhere in the United States. It's sensational. Why, no other spark plug will give and maintain such performance. Ooh, sounds like a good sales story. Uh, where did the name Resistor come from, Mr. Martin? Autolite worked with leading car and truck manufacturers, and they ignition engineered a 10,000 ohm resistor right into the Autolite spark plug. That permits a wider spark gap setting and maintains it far longer than any other spark plugs. Mm -hmm. Actually, Mr. Horton, when you replace your narrow gap spark plugs with a set of wide gap Autolite resistor spark plugs, you can tell the difference in your car. That's right from the book, I'll bet, eh, Mr. Martin? <laughs> well, I guess so, but here's the simple lowdown. As a result of the wide gap in the resistor spark plug, your engine idles smoother. You have better luck with lean gas mixtures and save gas. And within established limits, you reduce spark plug interference with radio and television reception. Yes, and today you can get the resistor spark plug from almost any of Autolite's 60,000 dealers. That's the biggest spark plug news in years. And now Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage Miss Agnes Moorhead as star in... The Yellow Wallpaper, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. We've been here two weeks and I haven't felt like riding again since that first day. I'm sitting by the window now up in this frightful nursery room. There's nothing to stop my riding as much as I please. John is away all day and sometimes even at night if he has a serious case. I'm glad my case is not serious. But these nervous troubles can be depressing all the same. I cry at nothing and cry most of the time. John doesn't know how much I suffer. He knows there's no reason to suffer and that satisfies him. I suppose John was never nervous in his life. He laughs at me so about this wallpaper. <laughs> <laughs> no, I won't let you have your way, you silly goose. If we'd taken the room downstairs, you'd be seeing faces in the chin straight. Not faces. Look at that spot, John. Th and that one over there. Yes, I see. It's a repeating pattern. It's a broken neck with two bulging eyes staring at me upside <laughs> down. <laughs> and to me, it's a climbing ivy or some kind of a vine. Take your choice. Could be anything. Besides, I can't repaper a room just for a three months rental. Well, then let's move downstairs. Take me away from her. Don't you see, John? It hates me. I wish I'd get well faster. Just use your will and your good sense, darling. I'm afraid. But you're so much better. When I married you, I meant to be such a help, but I'm only a burden. You are a help to me. <laughs> you're my comfort. I can't even be with my baby. It makes me so nervous. Will I ever be well enough to see him again? Of course you'll be well, <laughs> if you try. Then I'll try, I promise. 
From now on, I won't look at the wallpaper, and I'll stop seeing things out of the windows. Out the windows? Oh, I see people walking up and down the paths and in the arbors. I know it's silly, and it's only in certain lights when I look at the wallpaper from the bed that I see... See what? No, nothing. Nothing. No, you're right. There's nothing except a pattern. <laughs> front pattern and an under pattern in a different shade of yellow. It dwells in my mind so. I lie on that great immovable bed. It's nailed down, I believe, and follow that pattern about by the hour. And then where it isn't faded and when the sun is just so, I see a strange, faint, formless sort of figure lurking, waiting behind that front design. I don't know why I should write like this day after day. I don't want to. I don't feel able. And I know John would think it absurd, but I must express what I feel and think in some way. It's such a relief. There are things in that wallpaper that nobody knows about but me. You know, there's a woman stooping down and creeping about behind that pattern. Last night it was moonlight, and the moon shines in all around just as the sun does. John was asleep, and I hated to waken him, so I, I kept still and watched the moonlight on the wall till I felt creepy. The woman behind the paper began to shake the pattern as if she wanted to get out. I got up softly and went and felt the paper to see if it did move. It moved. It moved, I'm sure of it. And the poor woman cried out as though her voice came a long way over water. awake. What is it, darling? Why are you up? Well, you shouldn't go walking around like that. You'll catch cold. The moonlight woke me. Uh, you are cold. You're shivering. John, I'm not really getting better. Won't you take me away? Our lease will be up in three weeks, darling. I, I don't see how we can leave before then. Of course, if you were in any danger, I would, but you really are better, dear, whether you see it or not. I'm a doctor, and I know. Oh, my appetite may be better in the evening when you're here, but it's worse in the morning when you're gone. Why, you're gaining flesh and color. I don't weigh a bit more, not even as much. Well, bless your little heart. You shall be as sick as you please. But let's go to sleep, huh? And talk about it in the morning. You won't go away? How can I, dear? And why should I, since you're better? Better in body, perhaps, but Darling, in my health. For my sake and your sake and for the sake of our child, I beg you not to let that idea enter your head. Not for an instant. Can't you trust me as a doctor when I tell you it's a, a false and foolish idea? Answer me, darling. Don't you trust me? Yes, of course I trust you, only... What? Oh, I'm sleepy. Let's go to sleep. But I didn't sleep. I lay there for hours trying to decide if the front pattern and the back pattern moved together or separately. At night, in the moonlight, the front pattern becomes bars. And the woman behind it shakes the bars. Yes, she shakes the bars as she creeps around. <laughs> I lie down ever so much now. John says it's good for me and to sleep all I can. But you see, I don't sleep. And that cultivates deceit, for I don't tell him I'm awake. Oh, no. Fact is, I'm getting a little afraid of John. He seems very odd sometimes, and it strikes me that perhaps it's the yellow wallpaper. I like this room now. And life is much more exciting than it used to be. I have something more to expect, to look forward to to watch. And I really do eat better and I'm quieter than I was. John is pleased to see me improve. <laughs> you see? You're flourishing like a weed in spite of your wallpaper. Yeah. <laughs> in spite of the wallpaper. 
in spite of it, because of it. But I had no intention of telling him that. He might want to take me away, and I don't want to leave now until I found out. There's one week more, and I think that will be enough. There's a funny mark on the wall low down near the mop board. A streak that runs around the room, goes behind every piece of furniture except the bed. A long, straight, even smudge as if it had been rubbed over and over and over. How was it done? Who did it? What did they do? Round and round. Round and round. Round. It makes me dizzy. I've really discovered something at last. There are a great many women behind the pattern, and sometimes only one, and she creeps around fast, and her creeping shakes the pattern. She's trying to climb through and can't because the pattern strangles everything. But she does get out in the daytime, I know because I've seen her. When a car comes, she hides in the blackberry vines. I don't blame her, I'd hide too. I always lock the door when I creep by daylight. There are only two days left to tear this paper off and let the woman out in the room. And John's beginning to take notice. I don't like the look in his eyes or the way he talks with Jenny about me. I overheard them. She isn't sleeping nights, Jenny. She's quiet, but I know she's awake. Well, it's a little wonder she sleeps the whole blessed day. Yeah. Maybe I ought to call in another doctor. No, it's just stubbornness, John. She's determined to prove you're wrong. <laughs> I suppose you're right. Oh, I'm sure she'll improve. Oh, darling. Well, hello, pet. How you creep about? Well, that's a funny thing to say, Jenny. It isn't I who creeps. Jenny says you stay in your room too much. You don't take your exercise. You tell me to rest, and then you tell me to take exercise. I can't do both. Well, I'm... As though I can't see through them. Tomorrow's our last day here. We'll talk about exercise when I get you back to town. I'll have to rouse you out of bed pretty early, pet. You know, some of that furniture up there belongs downstairs, and the movers will be here at nine. Maybe, uh, maybe you'll sleep upstairs tonight, Jenny. Uh, so you won't be alone, darling. You won't be here tonight, John? Well, not until tomorrow evening. Uh, there's a difficult case. If you're going to feel lonesome... Oh, no, I... Jenny, I'll rest better alone, I'm sure of it. Thank you all the same. That was clever of me. The sly thing. I won't be alone a bit. As soon as the moon shone in, the poor thing behind the paper began to crawl and shake the pattern. I ran to her. I pulled, and she shook. I shook, and she pulled. In my morning, we'd peeled off yards and yards of yellow wallpaper, a strip about as high as my head and half around the room. When Jenny came up in the morning, she looked at the wall in amazement. You know why I did it, Jenny? Just to spite the vicious thing. Why are you so surprised? Oh, I, I, I'm not. <laughs> Why, I wouldn't mind doing it myself. But you mustn't tire yourself, Pet. She wouldn't mind doing it. Why don't you come downstairs and lie down? How she betrayed herself, that Jenny. She wouldn't mind doing it. But I'm here and no person touches this paper but me. Not alive. I've locked the door and thrown the key down into the front path. I don't want anybody to come in till John comes. I want to surprise him. And I've got a rope up here. Even Jenny doesn't know that. If the woman gets out from behind the pattern and tries to run away, I can tie her securely to one of the rings in the wall. How the pattern moves like wallowing seaweeds. Oh, it'll strangle her unless I help. Wait, 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 I'll help you. I'll peel off the paper all I can. Wait, wait, be patient. You, you, you push. You push it out, Paul. Oh, it, it sticks horribly to the plaster. I can get it off with my teeth. Oh, oh, it hurts. But I'm getting it. I'm getting it. 
Und, und das, das war noch immer mal. I'm getting it. I'm the, I don't know if more. I don't know if more. I don't know if more. I wonder if they all came out of the wallpaper as I did. I think they did. But I have you securely tied by my rope now. You'll never get away. But I don't want to get away. It's so pleasant to be out in this great room to creep about as I please. It's so pleasant. But I suppose I'll, I'll have to get back behind the pattern when night comes. That will be hard to do. Well, it's, it's better than going outside. I won't go outside, even if Jenny asks me to. For outside, I have to creep on the ground where everything is green instead of yellow. And here, I can creep smoothly on the floor. Listen. Listen, she's coming now. Darling. Darling, open the door. You hear me? Open the door. Oh, I, it's John at the door. Open the door, darling. Open it, please, dear. Oh, he does pound and shout. It's no use, Dr. John. You can't open it. Open it, do you hear me, dear? Open it. Jenny, bring me the axe. Oh, no, he'll break down that beautiful door. John, dear, the key's down in front of the house under a plantain leaf. Please, my darling, it's please. It's down by the front door, John. Open the door for heaven's sake, open I can't, it. I can't. The key's downstairs, John. It's under a plantain leaf by the front steps. It's under a plantain leaf, John. Go and see. Go and see. You, you'll find it if you look. You'll find it. You... There. There. He's gone to look. The wallpaper has stopped laughing. The evil thing. Now I can creep slowly, smoothly on the floor. Round and round. Round and round and round. My shoulder just fits into that long smudge on the wall so I can't lose my way. Oh, oh, he's coming back. He's running on the stairs. How astonished he'll be. Darling. Oh, my dear. My dear, what is it? What's happened? I've got out at last, John. Out? Out yes, from... out in spite of you and Jenny. I pulled down the paper. I, sh I shook the pattern and pushed and pulled it down. He it stuck horribly. Uh, but he'll never, he'll never put me back. He'll never put me back. And I, you're, you're so pale, John. Why do you close your eyes? You watch. Watch how swiftly I creep around in this lovely yellow room. Fainted? I, now why should that man have fainted? But he did. And right across my path by the wall, so that I have to creep over him every time. Round and round and round and round. Thank you, Agnes Moorhead, for a magnificent performance. Miss Moorhead will be back in just a moment. Oh, what a show. That Agnes Moorhead's really some actress. Well, I guess I better head for home and mother in. Okay. Oh, say, Mr. Martin, can you give me those simple words of yours again? My boy Billy pesters me with slogans. You bet, Mr. Horton. When you replace your narrow gap spark plugs with a set of wide gap auto light resistor spark plugs, you can tell the difference in your car. 
For example, your engine idles smoother, you have better luck with leaner gas mixtures and save gas. And within established limits, you reduce spark plug interference with radio and television reception. So, switch to Autolite, because... Autolite means resistor spark plugs. Ignition engineered spark plugs. Autolite means batteries. Stay full batteries. Autolite means ignition system. The lifeline of your car. And now here again is Miss Agnes Moorhead. It's always a great pleasure for me to appear on Suspense. I've thoroughly enjoyed this appearance this evening. And next week when I turn listener again... I'll join the rest of you to welcome Mr. Charles Lawton's return to these microphones in a role written especially for him. Next week, then, An Honest Man, starring Charles Lawton, on... Suspense. Agnes Moorhead may soon be seen in the Warner Brothers production, Johnny Belinda. Tonight's suspense play was adapted for radio by Sylvia Richards from an original story by Charlotte Perkins Gilman. Music was composed by Lucian Morrowick and conducted by Lud Gluskin. The entire production was under the direction of Anton M. Leader. Next Thursday, same time, you will hear Mr. Charles Lawton in An Honest Man. This is the Autolite Suspense Show saying good night. Switch to Autolite. This is CBS, where 99 million people gather every week, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Soup present Inner Sanctum Mysteries. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. This is your host to welcome you in through the squeaking door. We're having a party tonight for two of my favorite corpses. I call them Romeo and Juliet. They're newly dead, you know. <laughs> yes, yeah, she's the daughter of a famous society murderer, and he's the pride of the East Side Morgue. Oh, they're so happy together in their mausoleum built for two. And you should see the bridal casket. Shame it... on you, Mr. Host, making fun of such a tragedy. But, Mary, it was a touching ceremony. Of course, I stood up for the groom. Naturally, the poor fellow couldn't stand up for himself. <laughs> oh, please. It's an occasion for tears, not for laughter. That's right, Mary. Why, when the bride appeared wearing her grandmother's shroud, everyone had to be cheered up with Lipton tea. Oh, that's enough. I will not have Lipton's mentioned at a time like that. Lipton tea is for people who know how to enjoy life. These are the folks who really appreciate Lipton's famous brisk flavor. Yes, that word, brisk. B-R-I-S-K makes a big difference when you're sitting down to a cup of hot tea. Brisk means that Lipton tea tastes fresh and full-bodied, never flat or wishy-washy. I wish you'd try Lipton's, folks, even if you're not a regular tea drinker, because you just don't know how good tea can be till you know how good Lipton's is. Well, Mary, let's tee off into tonight's story. Hmm? It's called The Shadow of Death. And it's an original radio play by that boogie-woogie man, Robert Sloan. Yes, and our star tonight is Richard Widmark, who plays the role of Howard. All set? Then turn off the lights and let in the shadow of death. On a lonely dirt road that borders the village cemetery, a single car slows to a stop and parks in the moonless night. Inside it, a man leans back in his seat and reaches for the hand of the girl he loves. Howard. Yes, dear? Why did you stop here? The cemetery's right over there. Oh, I didn't notice. 
You drove here last night, too. Did I? Yes. <laughs> well, you're not frightened, are you? Tonight I am. You've been so strange, so far away. I, I feel as if I hardly know you. Darling, you mustn't feel that way. What's the matter, Howard? There's something on your mind. I'm going away, Marie. Oh, no. And I'm not coming back. Howard, why? Well, I don't really know if I can explain it. It seems so incredible, and and yet I know it must be true. What? Something I've discovered about myself. Something strange and frightening, Marie. Wherever I go, I seem to cast a shadow. A shadow of death. I... I don't understand. No, I didn't either at first. I thought it was just a strange coincidence. But it isn't. It's me. I bring death wherever I go. Oh, Howard, you don't really believe that. Well, how can I believe anything else? Haven't you noticed what happens to every living thing I have around me? No. I can't keep a pet of any kind, a cat or a dog. Even a plant dies when I have it in the house. Oh, darling, that's just your imagination. You've been working too hard. You need a rest. No, I'm going away, Marie. I don't want any harm to come to you. No, please. Nothing's going to happen to me. This is just... What's the matter? Well, nothing. I... I was just looking at the flowers in my corsage. Good heavens. They're dead. You don't believe me either, do you, Doctor? Well, let's not put it on that basis, Howard. After all, I've been trained to look for the physical causes of death, not the supernatural. Then what do you think I should do? Frankly, I'd like you to spend a few weeks away from these surroundings. Go up to the sanitarium I told you about. They'll take good care of you up there. All right, Doctor. I'll make arrangements to go tomorrow. But I know it won't do any good. You'll be surprised, Howard. Two or three weeks from now, you look back on this as a... Yes? That's strange. Those goldfish in my aquarium. They're all dead. <laughs> Tell me the truth, Howard. Are you comfortable here in the sanitarium? They, they don't believe me. They don't believe that people die when I dream about them. People die? Yes, you... didn't you know that? Every time I have a dream about someone, it, it's a sign of death. And the next morning when I wake up, I look in the obituary column and I see the name of the person I dreamt about. Well, Howard, what have they done to you here? Nothing, only they don't believe me. The, the, the dreams, I mean. I had to prove it to them this morning. And it made me feel very bad. What made you feel bad? The dream I had last night. I killed a man, Marie. What? I killed him in my dream. Oh. He was a good friend of mine, too. He lived right across the hall. Oh, Howard, please. You've got to get hold of yourself. But I'm afraid, Marie. I don't want to dream anymore. Oh, darling, I can't bear to see you this way. What way? I'll get you out of here. I promise, Howard. I'll get you out of here today. <laughs> Marie, there isn't a chance of getting him out. You may have to stay in this institution for months. Oh, no. Dr. Gerard, can't you see what's happening to him? He's losing his mind. Well, I know he's taking a turn for the worse. That's all the more reason for keeping him here. It might be dangerous to discharge him now. Then why don't you do something to help him? We're doing everything we can. It's not easy. He persists in thinking he has this strange power of death. Nobody is able to convince him he's wrong. What about the man across the hall? Howard said they were good friends. That's another thing. They were good friends. But unfortunately, that man died this morning. Come in. Ah, good morning, Howard. How do you feel today? Oh, much better, doctor, much better. No bad spells last night? No curious moods? No, I feel fine. Almost well enough to go home. Let me look at your eyes. You will let me go home again, won't you, Doctor? Yes, Art, of course, of course. You, uh, haven't had any of those dreams lately, have you? No, no, not for a long time. 
Are you sure? Well, I... Uh, I did have one last night. You dreamt that someone was dead? Yes, I did. But 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 I, I, I know it's not true. It can't be true. Whom did you dream about? Marie? No, doctor. I dreamt about you. That's why I know I'm wrong. You're alive, doctor. Don't you understand? You've proven it to easy, me. Easy, easy now, Harlan. Tell me about your dream. Well, I, I dreamt I was going home. And all the people I'd killed in my dreams were alive again. Yes, go on. Well, somehow or other... I could see my house from this window, and everything was just as it was a long time ago. The flowers were growing, the dog was in the yard. The one that was run over? Yes, everything was well again, and I was well, too. That's why I wanted to go home. But you and Marie's mother didn't want me to. She was in the dream, Marie's mother? Yes, I, I don't know how she happened to be there, but she was. That's all right, Harry. Go on. Well, I started to leave, Doctor, but she held me back. She held my arms like this. And then you jumped up to ring the bell for help. But before you reached it, I was on top of you like this. Oh, I had my fingers around your throat. Oh, and I was squeezing it so hard. I could feel your windpipe bending back oh, until you couldn't breathe anymore. Oh, God. Let go. That's what you said last night. Oh, my God. Uh, you ordered me to let go. I uh, uh, help on until your face turned as blue as it is now. It was almost black before I let you go. But first, first I made sure you were dead. And then I dropped the body. You see, Doctor, my dreams do come true. <laughs> well, have you had any good dreams lately? How it has. And you know, his dreams don't need interpretation. No, they need cremation. <laughs> Say, it's a lucky thing that guy works on the night shift. It'd be awful if he had daydreams, too. <laughs> Good gracious, yes. His dreams not only walk, they commit murder. <laughs> Mary, I was about to say that. Please leave the jokes to me. How would you like it if I talked about tea? Hmm? Well, for goodness sake, I listened to the story, too. And I must say, I'm glad I'm not his, um, dream girl. <laughs> that does it. Friends, let me tell you about Lipton tea. All right, you win. But it's only because I have something important to say about Lipton's. Folks, did you know that Lipton's is the largest selling brand in the whole world? Yes, and the reason for that is Lipton's well-known brisk flavor. You know, that word brisk is the tea expert's word for tangy, full-bodied tea, for Lipton tea. Ah, uh, Lipton's is always fresh and spirited, never flat or, or wishy-washy. That's why lots of people drink it not just at mealtimes, but whenever they're taking it easy for a minute during the day. So, folks, try Lipton's and get acquainted with that brisk flavor. Well, let's get back to our dream man and find out what he does in his waking moments. When we left him last, he had just done a little manual work on Dr. Gerard's windpipe. And now, as the good doctor lies comfortably on the sanitarium floor, Howard is in the process of going through his pocket. Well, I'll have to have the keys to your car, doctor. I'll need them to get back home. I hope you won't mind if I hide you under this bed. It may take them a little bit longer to find the body if I do. Yes, who is it? Dr. Frisbee, Howard. May I come in? Well... Yes. Yes, I, I'll open the door. What is it, Doctor? Well, I was looking for Dr. Gerard. I thought he was in here. Oh, yes, yes, he, he was a moment ago. I, I, I think he went down the hall. Uh, no, I just came from there. I guess he went back to his office. Oh, yes, I guess he did. How are you making out, Howard? Fine, fine, Doctor, fine, fine. You seem a little nervous. Your hands are shaking. Oh, well, I... You see, you've dropped your key. I'll get them. It's all right, Howard. I wasn't going to take them away from you. 
But I am wondering how you happen to have any keys in your possession. Well, they're, uh, they're, they're not really mine. Uh, whose are they, Dr. Gerard's? Uh, yes, yes, he, he left them here. I, I mean... You he... mean uh, you stole them from him? No. Oh, come, Howard. You can't expect me to believe Dr. Gerard would give you any keys. Now, you'd better let me have them so I can give them back. But I, I Let me have them, Howard. Thank you. You won't tell him I took them, will you? No, Howard, I won't tell. But uh, please don't take them again. I'll go anyway. I'll get out onto the road and I'll get a hit. Yes, sir, I'll get away. I've got to speak to Marie. Going down, mister? I guess not. I guess I'm... Oh, oh, here comes another one. Hey, stop! Give me a ride, will you? Give me a ride, please, mister? Oh, he's stopping. Hey, hey, wait for me, will you, mister? I'm coming. I'll be right there. Oh, gee, thanks, mister. You going into town? Yes, Howard. But you're not. Dr. Frisbee. Yes, I've been watching you ever since you took those keys. I thought you'd try something like this. Well, I... I had to, doctor. I understand. You better get in the car, Howard, so we can talk this thing over. All right. You know, it's silly to run away from our place up there. If you really want to go home, all you have to do is ask. I did ask. When? This morning. Oh, wait a minute. Don't start the car. Why not? There's a truck coming. In back. Where? Oh, Howard, let go of me, Howard. I've got to have this car, Doctor. When I finished with it... I'll return it to you. Hello? Hello, Mrs. Walker. Who's this? Howard. You remember me, don't you? Howard, where are you? In a telephone booth around the corner. You're not in the sanitarium? No, I've been discharged. Dr. Gerard said I could go. You mean... You're well again? Yes, I'm completely cured. Oh. Oh, I see. You don't sound very happy about it, Mother. Where's Marie? She's, uh, she's out on a date. When will she be back? Well, I, I don't know, Howard. She, she didn't say. I've got to see her again, Mrs. Walker. I've got to see her once more before I die. Before you die? Yes, I haven't much longer to live. Now, where is she? Well, I... Uh... I think she said she was going to movies. You're lying. I'm not, Howard. I, I, I just can't be sure. But if you go to the theater, you, you might find her there. You don't want me to see her, do you? Uh, no, not until I've spoken to Dr. Gerard. Why? Don't you believe me? Don't you believe I'm well again? No, Dr. Gerard... Never mind what he said. Mrs. Walker, you mustn't dislike me. I'm very fond of you. You... You are, Howard? Yes. I've been thinking a lot about you lately. While I was in the sanitarium. Last night, I even had a dream about you. Keep bringing that number, operator. I... I've got to locate Dr. Gerard. Why the hurry, Mrs. Walker? Howard, how did you get in here? Through the back door. Put that phone down, please. But I... Put it down, I said. Yes, yes. You lied to me about Marie being at the movies, Mrs. Walker. I, I didn't mean to, Howard. I, I told you I wasn't sure she was there. Where is she? This time I've got to know. Howard, how dare you? Get your hands off me. I'm not in a gentle mood, Mrs. Walker. I'm fighting against time. Yeah. You've done something wrong, Howard. You've escaped from the sanitarium. No, I've done more than that, Mrs. Walker. I've killed a man. Howard! Two men, three men. I, I can't remember how many it was, but there's going to be one more. Howard, you, you wouldn't kill me, would you? Wouldn't I? What have you done to deserve your life? Uh, there, Let it ring. But, but that may be my call. Your call is coming now, Mrs. Walker. Howard, please... Put down that knife. Will you tell me where Marie is? I told you, I don't know. I don't know. And I'll wait for her. Right here. Howard, you can't. 
No, no, you can't. Oh. Yes, I can, Mrs. Walker. Hello? Hello, this is Dr. Frisbee Sanitarium calling. Is Mrs. Walker there? I'm sorry. You have the wrong number. Marie? Marie, darling? What? Why, Howard. Howard, what are you doing here? I've been waiting for you to come home, darling. Aren't you glad to see me? Why, yes, of course I am. It was such a surprise I couldn't catch my breath for a minute. Where's Mother? Upstairs. Why? Why, I just wanted to know. You had no other reason? No. Howard, why are you staring at me? I'm not really staring. I'm just looking at you, darling. It's been such a long time since I've seen you. I'd almost forgotten what you were like. Well, uh, let's go inside. No, if you don't mind, darling, I'd rather go for a ride. You're... You're all right, aren't you, Howard? I, I mean, you're... You're completely well now. Oh, can't you see I am? Yes, but I... I yes. Then let's not wait any longer, darling. Come on, we'll go for a ride. It's getting late, Howard. Don't you think we ought to go back? No, not yet, Marie. You just keep driving. These few moments we have together, maybe I'll... Marie, why are you stopping here? We're low on gas, dear. I, I don't want to get stuck on the highway. Oh. Yes, him. Will it be? Uh, uh, you'd better fill her up. All right. And uh, have you got a telephone here? Yes, I'm right inside. Thank you. Wait a minute, Marie. What do you want with a telephone? Oh, I was going to call my mother. She'll be worried about me. Oh, no, she won't. She knows you're with me. <laughs> Besides, uh, she went out for a little while. Well, maybe she's back by now. It, it won't hurt to call, will it? No, I guess it won't. I'll be right back, Howard. Well, hurry, darling. I want to be with you as much as I can. Yes, I won't be a minute. Number, please. Operator, quick, get me the police. This is an emergency. Yes, ma'am, right away. Headquarters, Sergeant Dunn speaking. Sergeant, listen carefully. I won't have time to repeat it. The murderer of Dr. John Gerard is right here in a filling station on Route 6 at the Hadley intersection. What shall I do? I can't keep him here. Does he know you're on to him? No. No, he doesn't know I read the story in a newspaper just before I got home. He was waiting there for me, and I haven't been able to get to a phone since. Well, don't take any chances. He's a homicidal maniac. Don't even try to stall him if he wants to leave. No. Just stay where you are and we'll be over there in four minutes. Oh, no, no, that's no good. He won't let me stay here. He'll take me with him. Marie. Oh, he's calling for me now. Marie. Uh, just a moment, Howard. What can I do, Sergeant? What can I do? Well, give me the description of the car, quick. It, it's a dark blue sedan. License number 468J3. We've been going east on Route 6. Oh, I can't talk anymore. He's coming. Marie, for heaven's sake, what kept you so long? Oh, I had a hard time getting the number. There was something wrong with the lines. But you were talking to somebody. Yes, I, I was speaking to Mother. You were speaking to your mother? Yes. She told me not to stay out too late. You're lying, Marie. No, I'm not, Howard. I talked to her. You talked to the police. That's why you lied to no. me. No. You did. Your mother's dead. Howard. I know, because I killed her. Howard. Be quiet. Get back into the car. You're coming with no. me. No, no, Howard. You're hurting my arm. Get back in the car. Hey, you leave her alone. Keep out of this, you fool. Leave her alone. I told you to keep out of this. Oh, I know. Hey, put down that wrench. I'll put it down. Oh, oh, oh. oh how could you? Never mind. Get into the car. Howard, why are you stopping here? Don't you know where we are, Marie? This is the cemetery. Where we stopped before. Yes. I like it here. It's so quiet and peaceful among the dead. Let's walk through the grounds. Howard, please. Why not, Marie? We're among friends. So many of our loved ones are buried here. It's nice to be near them. Come on, Marie. All right, Howard. You know, darling, we haven't much more time together. The shadow of death has fallen across our path. 
You said something like that before, but you never told me why. I'm being selfish, Marie. I know I have to die, and I want you to come with me. Why do you have to die, Howard? Because I... I haven't been true to myself, darling. I haven't been true to this power I have. The power of death? Yes. I've helped it along sometimes. Like that dream I had about my friend in the sanitarium. Like the flowers in my garden. Like those fish and Dr. Gerard's. You killed them? Yes. I knew they were going to die. But I shouldn't have helped them. That's why I'm being punished. But Howard... Why are you punishing me? I don't want to die alone, Marie. We've been away from each other so much, darling. I... I want us to be together from now on. But... Don't be afraid, darling. I'll be gentle, Marie. So gentle. But you're making a mistake, Howard. No. You are. You've forgotten what you've done. You can't kill me, darling. Why not? My good heavens, Howard, don't you remember? Don't you remember that day at the sanitarium? You said you dreamt about me. No. No, I couldn't have. Yes, you did. Didn't they tell you what happened? No. Your dream. Your dream, it was true. That's why you can't kill me now. Marie, you... You mean... Yes, Howard. I'm dead. I can't believe it. Oh, you must believe it. Here. Here. Look at this tombstone. My grave is right here. No. Read what it says. Read the name on it. It's your name, Marie. Your name. Marie Walker. Yes. Then you... Then you really are dead. I told you I was, Howard. The shadow of death passed over me. Then let it pass over me. Oh. Oh. Hey, got him, Sam. Got him the first shot. Keep out of the way, miss. He may not be dead yet. No, I... I'm sure he's dead. Well, you certainly had a close call. Took all this time to locate your car. Finally spotted it on the road. You all right? Yes, sir. I'm all right. Yeah. The name of... My grandmother's tombstone saved me. How's that? Oh, it, it doesn't matter. Say, that's funny. What? This guy was shot through the shoulder. My bullet wounds weren't serious enough to kill him. What do you mean? Well, I know it sounds crazy, but my shots didn't kill him. He was dead before I hit him. <laughs> What a shame. Wasting two perfectly good bullets on a guy that was dead all the time. Well, at least they won't have to go far to bury him. Here's one villain who died practically in the middle of his own plot. <laughs> Isn't it funny how many of our stories seem to take place in cemeteries? You know, Mary, I think you ought to open up a concession in the cemetery. And you know what you could sell, hmm? Don't say it, don't you dare. You know very well that the place to buy Lipton tea is and always will be your neighborhood grocery store. And folks, that reminds me. You'll find it wiser to buy Lipton's in the larger, more economical size packages. That way you not only save money, but you also make sure that you won't run short on a beverage that's really a household necessity. Brisk-flavored Lipton tea. <laughs> Before I put the skeletons back in their closets, I'd like to give you a parting word of advice. A body should never be left alone at the morgue at night. After all, it might become slab happy. <laughs> oh, by the way, this month's Inner Sanctum mystery novel is The Whistling Legs by Roman McDougald. Yes, and let me tell you about next week's Inner Sanctum story. Directed by Hyman Brown... And brought to you by Lipton Tea and Lipton Soup. You know, usually our stories are about people who live six feet under the ground. But for next week, we've dug a lot deeper. In fact, it takes place in China. 
<laughs> and as a special added attraction, we've unearthed a new kind of character for you. Unearthed is right. This guy's been dead for 20 centuries. <laughs> and now it's time to close the squeaking door, so... Good night. Pleasant dreams. Hmm? Ladies, if your child comes home from school for lunch, you want to give him a quick but appetizing meal. And that's why you should serve Lipton's noodle soup. You see, Lipton's takes no time to prepare, and yet it has a fresh-cooked, old-fashioned, chickeny flavor. And it's just swimming with tender golden egg noodles. Your children will love Lipton's grand homemade taste. So don't forget to serve Lipton's noodle soup. And don't forget to tune in next Tuesday night for another Inner Sanctum Mystery. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Tired of the everyday routine? Ever dream of a life of romantic adventure? Want to get away from it all? We offer you... Escape! Escape, designed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. Escape, brought to you by your Richfield gasoline dealer and the Richfield Oil Corporation of New York. Marketers of Richfield gasolines with xylene, rich lube, all-weather motor oil, and other famous petroleum products. Look for the Richfield Eagle on the cream and blue pumps. Tonight, we escape to the jungles of South America and a seething tale of terror and violence as told by James Poe in Bloodbath. Starring Mr. Vincent Price. By portaging the rapids and walking the mules in the shallower stretches, we'd managed to get our supplies and equipment more than 1,700 miles up the river. After this, further navigable passage being impossible, We'd traveled by foot, hacking our way through the thick, steaming jungle, coaxing and goading the heavily laden beasts. We'd left the jungle and begun the climb. Eleven days later, high in the Andes, we found our objective, and we set to work, hard work. And then, on a hazy afternoon in late May, we found it. I shall never forget the scene. Below us, the mountains swung down to the jungle which stretched eastward, far as the eye could see. The peaks above us had cut off the setting sun and the light had a curious violet quality. The dank, chill wind whispering and gusting set the sparse timber scrubs to trembling and shuddering and the mules, disdainful of their five strange masters, foraged the cacti and dwarf pines. The instruments were set up and the specimens were at hand, and now, crouched and tense, we leaned forward. How about it, Hess? Wait. The tube's got to warm up. Come on, come on. Wait, will you? I've waited five years for this moment. Five? Five hundred, you mean? Five million? Come on, Hessie. How about it, Hess? Mm-hmm. Okay. Give him the sample, O'Brien. Yeah, here. Come on, baby. Shut up, will you? Shh. Here goes. Switch on. Holy cow. Good. Good. It's fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Come on, Hesse. What's the word? Yeah, Hesse, give. Gentlemen. Gentlemen. Unless this machine is busted, unless this Geiger counter has forgotten its multiplication table, we have discovered the richest load of uranium ore known to man. Yahoo! <laughs> Oh, 
I won't go into the details of how we'd come to locate the orb because that's a story in itself. Suffice it to say that late in the afternoon of that hazy May day, the five of us, gamblers all, came to the end of our rainbow, found our pot of gold. The vein runs all the way up the side of the mountain. Must be worth a million bucks. A million, a billion. A trillion bucks. <laughs> do you boys realize what we've got here? Sure we do. We've got the world at our feet. Why, the man who gets the strike registered in his name can be a king. Every country in the world is going to come running up to him with trunks full of money and power. Ha <laughs> ha, you tell him, Hesse. Power? Yeah, we'll make the United States the most powerful nation on earth. Why the United States? Oh, you wouldn't sell to anybody else, would you? <laughs> I'm a businessman, Harris. You're a fool. No, no. I'm a businessman. A trillion bucks. <laughs> oh, gents, we've got the world at our feet. Split five ways. <laughs> The world at our feet split five ways. That night, as I lay huddled under my thin blanket, I wondered what it would be like being a wealthy man. Wondered if it were really true. Wondered how it would affect the others, how it would affect me. In the morning, we were to set off on the long return journey down to the jungle and through the jungle to the launch and down the river to civilization. There, we'd register our claim, purchase, if need be, the land, lease it, perhaps, from the government. <laughs> oh, millionaires, world at our feet. Uranium, enough to blow up the whole universe. Power. Harris, wake up. Uh, oh, what's, what's wake up, time? Harris, wake up. Oh, good morning, millionaire. Weems, wake up. Uh, uh, sun's coming up. Hey, uh, hey, where are the others? They're gone. Gone? gone? Yes, Dumont and O'Brien. They took the mules and most of the food and cut out. When? How do I know when? Sometime during the night. But why? Why? A trillion bucks, that's why. Oh, no, no, no. Once they get down to the jungle, they'll have to travel on foot. There's ten days' march to the river. If they beat us to the boat, we're stuck with 1,500 miles of jungle between us and safety. Fifty? Impossible. We'd never make a hundred. That's right. We've got to catch him, or we're dead. We traveled as lightly as possible. It was a risky business, doubly so, because O'Brien and Dumont had taken our guns with them. The only weapons we had between us were one long machete and two pocket knives. These would be of little protection against jaguars, bushmasters, tapirs, bow constrictors, and the rest of it. Fortunately, they'd left our number one necessity to survival. They'd forgotten to take our quinine. This and our food was all we carried. The long descent to the jungle was slow going on foot. It was here that we nearly gave up hope. We moved as fast as we could, but we were no match for men who were riding. But we reached the jungle. Then things took a better turn. Here the thick vines and heavy undergrowth was, we knew, almost an impossible hazard for a riding man. And we could see their boot prints mingled with those of the mules. We knew that they were having trouble, too. The animals were afraid of many things in the jungle. Would balk suddenly require careful handling? We pushed ahead as rapidly as possible, battling mosquitoes, pume flies, matukas, and the blood-sucking carpato ticks, and, of course, the jungle itself with its never-ending barrage of razor grasses, needle vines, swamps, bog traps, and so forth. It was hot, stinking hot, and the going was hard, but we had to make it. couldn't travel at night. We'd taken our flashlights. We'd bundle up as best we could, protecting ourselves, not from the cold, it was hot and muggy even at dawn, but from the mosquitoes. And as we progressed towards the river area, from the bats, vampire bats. <laughs> Ever seen them? <laughs> They're small, rather fragile looking little things. By day they hang, heads down from the trees, wings folded like like clusters of rotten fruit. By night, they hunt. 
They have razor-sharp teeth, bite like the finest steel scalpels. Their object is to break the skin very delicately, start the blood to coming, and then they simply hang on and sip. Without mosquito netting, we had a rough time of it, a sleepless time. But we managed to keep on going. And on the third day... Uh, it's not yours, fellas. We can't make it to the river before them. We've got to, Weezy. We've got to make it. right, Weezy. Even if we do catch up, they got the guns. Shh, shh. Huh? What are you stopping? Oh, quiet, quiet. I heard something. What did you hear? Shh. Gunfire. Yeah. Come on. It can't be more than a mile or two ahead. Come on. We ran through the jungle, following the fresh marks of the animals and the two men. And a half an hour or so later, we broke into a little clearing, and there was Dumont. Dumont. He's dead. Shot in the back. <laughs> Good old Obi. Sweet guy, that Obi. Here, come on. Let's turn him over. <clears throat> He's really been sweating, huh? Yeah. Yeah. It's malaria. You see his face? Good old Obi. And Dumont came down with malaria, probably started to slow him down. Sweet guy, that Obi. Come on. Come on, let's go. Yeah. Hey, they should have remembered the quinine. I got no sympathy for Dumont. <laughs> you know, you know what would be nice? What? If that... If that Obi should get malaria now. Yeah. He'd be helpless. He'd ask me for quinine. And I'd throw him a stone. On we went. Now there were no boot marks with the mule tracks. Apparently O'Brien was riding one of the animals. From time to time, we'd see a flurry of tracks churned up as though he had had to dismount to tug one of the beasts back onto the trail. We followed the tracks for another two days, and then on the sixth day, we found one of the mules. How you feeling, boy? Huh? Where's your saddle? He really looks beat. Look at those marks on his flanks. Vampire bats. Yeah. And that leaves O'Brien on foot. Yeah. Hey, hey you hear that? Hey, it's the launch. We're to the river. He's starting the motor. Come on. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't very far, just a few hundred yards. And the path was strewn with O'Brien's discarded supplies. Quite suddenly, we came out of the jungle and onto a narrow white sandbar. The river. And there, not 30 feet away from us, just drifting off into the deep, dark, fast-moving waters, was O'Brien and the launch. O'Brien! Look at him. He's like a skeleton. Obi! Wait for us, Obi! The launch lurched dizzily as it floated downstream. O'Brien was feeble, sweating, possessed. He had the fever, had it bad. Come on, let's go after you him. You can't. This is piranha water. Cannibal fish, they'll eat you. Yeah. Hey, Obi! Hey, you know me, Obi! Your old pal has me! Hey, what do you say, Obi? Huh? Huh? He staggered dizzily about the cockpit, trying to start the engine. He was laughing, and he was so weak that he could barely spin the flywheel to the kicker. Obi! He slipped! Good Lord, he's in the water! The fish, the piranhas! They got him, they got him! I ain't gonna look at this! One moment we saw him swimming weakly, his large, fever-ridden eyes turned imploringly toward us, and the next moment he was gone, leaving only a large, red, churning patch on the water. The piranhas are small, rarely more than 12 or 14 inches long, small fish with large, powerful jaws, teeth like broken glass, and an insatiable, maniacal appetite for flesh. The launch, caught by the deep, fast-moving waters, rocked softly this way and that and moved on downstream, away, away around a bend and out of sight. The march of science over the years has produced better than ever gasoline for your car. But now science adds one of the greatest gasoline components of all. It's called xylene. Xylene, a super gasoline component, adds two great qualities to gasoline. 
Xylene gives higher than ever Antinoch performance. Xylene means power. Today, every gallon of Richfield gasoline contains xylene. If you want a motor that runs quiet as a whisper, if you want pickup and power to spare, try Richfield gasoline with xylene. Your Richfield dealer offers a choice of two great Richfield gasolines with xylene. Richfield high octane at regular price for the average motor. Or Richfield ethyl. Ethyl at its best for tip-top results in the highest compression motors. Drive in where you see the Richfield Eagle on the cream and blue pumps. Get Richfield gasoline with xylene. Xylene, one of the highest Antinoch components in gasoline history. And now we return you to Escape, starring Vincent Price. We picked over the supplies O'Brien had left on the shore. There wasn't much we wanted. A gun without ammunition, a few tins of food, a tent and some bedding, cooking equipment, a coil of rope. We loaded these things onto the mule and set off through the jungle, downstream along the river's course. 1,500 miles to civilization. had it tough. The jungle was thick along the river's bank and we made little progress. Not more than five miles that day, but the next day we rounded a bend, keeping close to the shore and there about a quarter mile below us and nuzzling the opposite shore, grounded on the sand, lay the launch. Looks shallow enough here. Yeah, yeah, it does. Yeah, but what about the fish? How deep does it look to you, Harris, at the deepest spot on me? Oh, I don't know, maybe two and a half feet, maybe three. Most of it's less than that. I got an idea. Shoot. We got to get across the launch, see? Yeah. So here's what we do. We throw away everything. There'll be food and water in the launch, see? Yeah. Now, you see that little patch of sand in the middle of the river where the bar shows? Yeah. We go that way. That's bound to be the shallowest way, see? How do we go? On the mule, the three of us. Ah, you nuts. This mule ain't in such bad condition it can't get the three of us across 70 feet of shallow water. What do you say, Harris? Why not? All right, I'll get aboard first. Come on. Get farther up, Wimsy. You're the lightest. Yeah. Harris, you get on next. Mm -hmm. Hang on to Wimsy. Here, here. Carry this coil of rope around your neck. We may okay. need it. I've got the machete strapped to my back. Hey, you set, Weems? Yeah. <clears throat> now hold tight to me, Hess. Don't worry. If I go, you go too. Yeah. And if he goes, I go. <laughs> so let's hang on, gents. Yeah. Let's really hang on. As long as he's moving fast, he can't get at his legs. Ain't that right? He's not showing anything to him but hoofs and hair. Hold his head up, Weems. Don't let him look down. Uh, now, you all set? Yeah, all set. All right, here we go. All right, get along. Come on, you on. Come on, baby. I felt the mule Big lurch time. when he stepped baby. into the Put water. The sand was Come softer on, here than on the shore. Sand, huh? Ahead, Come not on, 40 feet away, lay the Come little on. spit of land. The mule refused to Come. run, couldn't run, and before he'd taken 10 steps, I knew he was too weak to support the three of us. Hey. From every direction in the swirling water about us came small, shadowy, dark shapes. Come on. The piranhas. Don't stop! Come on, baby. Come on. Keep moving, baby. Come uh, on. Move along, baby. He can't do it. You gotta do it, baby. Come on. Sweet Come on. mother... What are those? The piranhas were churning the water about us, and coming in from beyond them were four or five long, dark shapes, six and seven feet long, thick and wriggling. Eels, electric eels. They'll sting them. Get along to the back. Get into the sandbar. Faster, faster. Come on. <laughs> Made it. It's true about electric eels. <sighs> I can throw a jolt that'll kill a jaguar. They got jaws like a vice. So, here we are, gentlemen, stuck. Just 30 feet of water between us and the shore. Get across it, and we can get to the launch and the civilization and all the rest. Oh, the three of us are too much for that mule. Uh, only 30 feet. Why, you could run it in seconds. You see those little shadows around us in the water? I see those little shadows around us. You don't have to draw pictures. Hey, Oh, here's another bright idea coming up. As a matter of fact, yeah. Yeah, hold on to your hat, Harris. We got that curl of rope. Yes. The mule could carry one of us. That mule's not in such bad shape, you know. Yes. Tie the rope over his bridle. Then one of us pulls him over with him fast, you see. One rides, and then the other two pull him back. Yeah. yeah. And the next one gets on. Yeah. What do you say? Oh, he can't stay here. It's a natural. Who uh, goes first? <laughs> <laughs> 
Me, on account I'm the lightest. I won't tire him so much. How about it, Harris? All right. Well, get going then. Okay. Tie that rope to his bride. I'm doing it. All right, give me the machete. What do you want the machete for? I want it, that's all. Give me. No. Okay. All right, Here. now you two get it at the end of the spit. So as when you pay out the line, you don't get it caught in his legs. Well, you think of everything. That's right, I'm a smart boy. You ready with the line. You sure it's tied fast to the bridle? Yeah, I'm sure. No funny business, Weems. All we gotta do is jerk this rope once while you're over that water and you're done for. You're a sharp article. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But not sharp enough. Hey, Weems, you cut the rope. So long, sucker. The rope. Our only salvation was cut. And now Weems, grinning and riding, was out into the stream, heading for the shore and safe. <laughs> He went not 15 feet when one of the long, dark, wriggling shapes made for the mule and got his leg. The mule reared up on his hind legs, the eel clinging to his foot, pumping paralyzing shocks into him. Weems clutched his neck with one hand and slapped him on the flank with the flat of the machete with the other. The mule came down and more eels went for his legs. He began to lurch sideways. Weems swung the long steel blade in an arc, barely missing the mule's leg and connected with one of the eels. His hair seemed to stand on end. His other arm released the mule's neck. The arm holding the blade was extended stiffly, still caught in the thick, muscular back of the electric eel. And then the mule reared again, and Weems fell back into the water. The mule, freed of Weems, made the shore and vanished into the jungle. We turned away. No man could watch what was happening to Weems and retain his sanity. And so, there we were. Hess and I on that sand spit which the river was slowly washing away. Night coming, vampire bats coming, and all about us, the electric eels and the little cannibal fish waiting. There was no moon. There were evil stars, red and yellow. There was a black sky and against it blacker shapes, the vampire bats. We waved our arms and kept them off, but again and again during that long and terrible night they brushed against us, squealing and squeaking, trying to get us. Dark, evil, thirsting bats. A thousand years later came the dawn. That water's taken a lot of sand away. This thing isn't much bigger than a card table. Mm. Look at them. Look at those fish. You think they had enough to eat yesterday? Mm. Mm. Listen, Harris. No matter what happens now, at least you and I have played it square, right? Yeah, that's right, Harris. Shake my hand, Harris. All right. Because I think I got an idea on how we can get out of here. What? Yeah. Look up there. Yeah. See see that vine hanging down from the big tree? It's over the water and it must be 15 feet up. Yeah, yeah, but if you were on it, you could do a Tarzan to the shore. The rope? That's right. Now, if we can just lasso the end of that and pull tight, we'll have enough swing to make it across. Swing like a pendulum, if you follow me. One guy gets on the other's shoulders to swing over to get the start, see? Then when he gets to shore, he fastens a rock and swings the rope back to the other. Uh, that vine will hold. It'll work. It took us two hours before we managed to lasso the end of that vine. And then we tested it again and again until we were positive it would hold a man's weight. And then we were ready. Ah, you stand good and steady now, pal. I'm going to go easy on you, but don't shake. Because if you spill me in that water, I'm a gone guy. I'm ready. I'm ready. Good luck. Uh, here. No! I felt his feet leave my shoulders, and then he was off, skimming the water with his feet drawn up, and then, miraculously, he was on the shore. Good boy! Good boy! <laughs> yeah! Like a breeze, huh? <laughs> Like a breeze. Hey, uh, any rocks around there? Sorry. 
He smiled at me and shrugged and then looked down the stream at the launch. I knew that smile, that trillion dollar smile. It said, so long, sucker. Don't do it, Hess. Send me the rope. <laughs> You're too nice a guy, Harris. You and I would never get along. You, you can have it all, Hess. Every scrap of it. Only for the love of mercy, send me the rope. No, no, you'd want some. You wouldn't approve of what I mean to do with it. Hess! <laughs> he stood there laughing at me and shaking his head slowly. But uh, above him, just over his head, was another vine, thick and mottled, and it was moving. Look out, Hess! Hess! <laughs> he didn't understand or didn't hear me. Just stood there smiling and shaking his head. The boa constrictor dropped heavily and accurately a thrashing tangle of scaly muscles. <laughs> The sun was hot, blistering hot. I was alone, all alone, except for the ever-waiting piranhas. Hess's body was hidden by the low, scrubby vines and palmettos. Several hours later, I saw the boa, now gorged, slither lumpily away. I waited, and I waited. From time to time, I thought of stepping out into the stream. It would be over very quickly, I told myself, very quickly. But I... I couldn't. And then I noticed an odd thing. The current which had been sweeping the sand away had shifted slightly. A whim, a miracle. And now new sand from some sunken bar was beginning to pile up between me and the shore, grain by grain, rib by rib. I watched this. And I watched. And I watched. And at five o'clock that afternoon, I walked ashore to the lawn. And didn't even get my feet wet. It's nice where I live. Quiet little streets, nice people, nice kids. Nice country. Peaceful. Nice peace. I know where there's enough uranium to blow it all to hell. Want it? Just go up the river. Up the river, it's, uh, it's for the taking. Ask Dumont and Obie and Weems and Hess. A trillion bucks worth. Enough to give the whole world a bloodbath. Yourself included. Warm summer weather makes you think of baseball games, picnics, and holiday driving. But be sure your car's ready when you are. Get Richfield All Point Safety Service. The service that puts your car in top shape for warm weather driving. With Richfield All Point Safety Service, you get a careful All Point lubrication job that protects the chassis, transmission, and differential. You get lubricants that stick to your car's ribs no matter what the temperature. You get the protection of Rich Lube All Weather Motor Oil, the Pennsylvania premium grade oil that cleans as it lubricates. You also get a safety check of batteries, spark plugs, tires, and radiator. And expert service if your car has automatic transmission. The Richfield gasoline dealer is specially trained to protect your car against wear and breakdown. So get Richfield All Point Safety Service tomorrow. Look for the Richfield Eagle on the cream and blue pumps. Escape is produced and directed by William N. Robeson. And tonight starred Mr. Vincent Price. Bloodbath was written by James Poe. Others in the cast were Wally Mayer, Ted DeCorsia, Paul Fries, and Tony Barrett. Special music arranged and played by Ivan Dittmars. Next week... You are groping your way slowly through the dark hold of a ship at sea. Moving carefully, step by step, dreading to find what you know is there. 
death in the form of a deadly Bushmaster from which there is no escape. Next week at this time, the Richfield Oil Corporation of New York invites you to escape to the Caribbean and a grim voyage of impending death as Martin Storm tells it in his exciting tale, A Shipment of Mute Fate. Goodbye then until this same time next week when once again we offer you Escape. Tom Hanlon speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Good evening, friends. This is your host to welcome you through the creaking door into the inner sanctum. Come in, come in. You mustn't mind that covered body over there in the corner. That's Oscar, our bashful corpse. You see, we covered him up because Oscar said he didn't want to be seen dead in here. <laughs> and those folks sitting on the coffins just came in to rest their bones. Sort of a skeleton crew, you know. Oh, we're having a big party here tonight, but if you don't see any smiles, just remember, all the people here are grave characters. <laughs> Tonight's Inner Sanctum Mystery, Corpse Without a Conscience, was written by Ed Adamson and Bob Sloan and stars Carl Swenson in the role of Charles with Everett Sloan as Bellini. As they so often say, the line that separates the dead from the living is very thin. Now take tonight's character, Mario Bellini. Bellini crossed that line so many times he almost wore it out. Like the strange mystic man that Mario Bellini was in life, the small mosque-shaped tomb in which his body reposed was strange and mystic, too. In the hillside cemetery, it stood alone and aloof above the other tomb. On a stormy, windswept night in the large granite house whose grounds border on the graveyard, the elderly, wrinkled-faced woman stands at her bedroom window, staring out at the hilltop tomb. The elderly woman, troubled by a hidden fear, bites nervously at her lip. Then, suddenly... Ah! Ah! And Edna! And Edna, what happened? Charles. Charles. Well, what happened? Why did you scream? He, he's come back. He's returned from... Huh? What, what are you trying to say? Who's come back? Mario Bellini. Bellini? Yes, he was here in this room. It's ridiculous, Bellini. He's dead. He's buried in that tomb up on the hill. I know, but he's returned from the dead. Nonsense. The dead can't return. Bellini can. He has strange powers. He was here in my room. Can't you tell he was here? Well, how? That odd incense he always had burning in his place. Don't you smell it? This room, it's filled with the odor of Bellini's incense. It's just your nerves. There's no odor of incense in this room. What? Not a trace of it. Now go back to bed. You think I'm crazy. Just because I'm old, you think I imagine things. Bellini is up on the hill in that tomb. His castle is in the crypt under the stone floor. Even if he could rise from the coffin, he'd be locked in that crypt. Not that the dead can rise. Bellini has strange powers. For your own peace of mind, I'm going to prove to you that Bellini's body still rests in that tomb. Go to wake up, Horton. And he'll help me unseal that trap door on the stone floor. It's no use, Charles. You won't find Bellini there. What makes you so sure? Because of this note. What note is that? I received it from Bellini the day before his death. I never told anyone. Here. Read it. Mrs. Ferguson, you have won in life. I will win in death. I shall return for my victory on the first anniversary of my death. Bellini. You see, the prophecy in that note has been fulfilled. Mario Bellini died just one year ago tonight. <laughs> Oh, 
Please, I want to go back to the house. After I show you what's below the floor of this tomb. It's pure witchcraft, Mrs. Ferguson, coming to life after being dead for a year. My aunt is upset in her porton without your comments. I'm sorry, Mr. Ferguson. Just keep working on that concrete. Uh, yes, sir. Aunt Edna, you still haven't told me why Bellini sent you that note. I don't know. Are you sure? I told you, I don't know. Could it be because you swindled him? Swindled? I won't have you talking to me that way. Forgive me, forgive me, Aunt Edna. Swindle is a bad choice of a word, isn't it? It was a perfectly legal transaction. I obtained his property fair and open. Just a shrewd business, hmm? Well, I've always prided myself on my ability to deal shrewdly in all matters. How's it coming, Horton? You need any help? Uh, No, sir. As soon as I get this bolt loosened, it'll take the two of us to raise the door. It's solid stone, you know. I know, I know. Charles, perhaps we'd better call the police. You have nothing to worry about, I don't know. Except, of course, your own conscience. That's an ugly thing to say to me. I've given you everything you ever wanted, haven't I? Yes, you have, Aunt Edna. And I've often wondered why. Uh, there. It's off. Boat's free, Mr. Ferguson. I think we can raise the door now. All right, Horton, take hold of the ring. Yes, sir. Let's pull together. All right. Come on. It's beginning to lift, sir. That's it. Keep pulling. Keep pulling. It's open. What, what do we do now, sir? Mrs. Ferguson, you and I are going down there into the crypt. Oh, please, sir. Mr. Bellini always frightened me when he was alive. I'd rather Don't not... be a fool, Horton. The dead can do no harm. But Mrs. Ferguson said he came out to this crypt tonight. Never mind what Mrs. Ferguson said. You are doing as I say. Y- yes, sir. Ready, Aunt Edna? Yes, Charles. If you insist... I'll but... take the lantern, Horton. Uh, here you are, sir. All right. Now, you two follow me down. Uh, watch out for your head, Mrs. Ferguson. The ceiling's low. Oh, please, Charles, hurry. Moving as fast as I can. Got to find the catch on the side of the casket. Ah, oh, here it is. Oh. Pull back the panel, Horton. Yes, sir. Is, is it there, Charles? Of course it is there. Exactly as I said he would be. Hermetically sealed under glass. No. No sign of life, is there? No, no sign of life. Don't be afraid to look. But I... Go ahead. Look, 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 look. See for yourself. See how safe you are from the unrising, dead Mario Bellini. Oh. Thank heaven. He's there. And dead. <laughs> Charles, did you lock all the windows on the first floor? Yes, Aunt Edna. What about the shutters, Horton? I bolted them all, ma'am. Really, Aunt Edna, this is ridiculous. You saw his body still sealed in the casket? It's not his body. It's the spirit of him, his evil spirit. I know he'll try to kill me, but I'll fool him. I'll live through this night. Why, of course you will. I, um... I was just thinking of what the doctor said about your heart, about overexciting yourself. Never mind my heart. Get out of here. Both of you. Yes, ma'am. Good night, Aunt Edna. Good night. And Horton, make sure to lock the door behind you. Yes, Mrs. Ferguson. If you need me, Aunt Edna, just call out. I'll be within hearing distance. Make sure that you are... Now, now let's see. Is there anything I've overlooked? Yes, Mrs. Bunch. <gasps> Your closet. Oh, oh, who said that? I did, Mrs. Ferguson. Turn around and you will see. No. Oh, no, it can't be. But it is. It's Mario Bellini. No, no, no. It's just in my mind. You're not really here at all. It's just in my mind. You're in your casket where we left you. Am I? You're dead. I saw you in that casket. And I will return there after I settle with you. Oh, this is a trick. 
a trick to frighten an old lady. You're not really Mario Bellini. You can't be. You are going to die, Mrs. Ferguson. Oh, stay away from me. You are going to die for what you did to me in life. It was all legal. I, I, I can prove it. I am not bound by the law now, Mrs. Ferguson. I'm taking you with me back to the grave. No. Please, stay away. Don't come near me. You foolish old woman. Do you think I'm afraid of that knife in your hand? Do you think a knife can protect you from the dead? Don't come near me. No, let go. Cousin, call Dr. Marshall. Yes, no. Wait. Bellini. What? Mario. Bellini. Return from the grave. <gasps> Mrs. Ferguson. She's dead, Horton. She... She was trying to tell us something... What did she say about Bellini? I'm not sure, but it uh, it seems as if she were trying to accuse him. Of stabbing her? Yes, but that uh, doesn't seem possible. Every entrance to this room was locked. Horton, look. Her hand on the knife as if she'd plunged it into herself. Well, Mrs. Ferguson wouldn't have killed herself, sir. And yet there was no way for anyone to get in here. Anyone alive. I, I don't know what to think now. Maybe my aunt knew what she was saying. Maybe she did. Horton, what are you staring at? Look, sir. This was on the floor. What is it? A ring, a gold ring, with the initials M.B. engraved on it. I saw that ring tonight. I saw it on Mario Bellini's hand. While he was in the casket in his tomb. Just as we left it, sir. The stone trap door still open. The casket seems to be in place down there in the crypt. Yes, well, we'll uh, go down to make sure. Do, do you think it's safe, sir? Well, we've got to find out if this was the ring Bellini really had on his hand. Mr. Ferguson, the panel of the casket is open. Nothing to be afraid of. It's the way we left it. Let me have your lantern. Here you are, sir. Is, is he still in the casket underneath the glass? Yes, he's here. I guess we must have misunderstood what my heart meant when she spoke his name. Of course, sir. Nobody can return from the grave. Good heavens, Mr. Ferguson, his hand, there's no ring on it. Mm -hmm. Look for yourself, it's gone, sir. There's no ring on his finger. Oh, yes, yes, no ring. But it's not possible. Are you sure you saw the ring on the corpse? Couldn't you be mistaken? I sir? guess I could be, but... Well, I guess I must be, because no, I... No, 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 you were right. Mrs. But... Ferguson was right, too. Mario Bellini did return from the dead to kill her. What are you talking look, about? Look, look at the other hand. It's stained with blood, sir. I can't understand it. I can't understand how blood could be on his hand unless it was there when he was put into the casket. But it's fresh blood, sir. We must call the police immediately. Yes, I, I guess we'd better. We'll go just as soon as I pull the panel back over the top of the coffin. We'd better leave everything the way it is and hurry out of here. It may be dangerous for us to stay a moment longer. No, all right. Mr. Fox. Hmm? What is it? I, I, I thought I heard something stirring down there. Where? In the casket, sir. Listen. It's your imagination, Horton. No, there is something moving in that casket. Quick, let's get out of here. No, 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 wait. The glass, the casket. Bellini's getting up from his coffin. Get out of your mind. He's there, standing up in the casket, sir. Wait, where are you going? For the police. Come back, you fool. No, sir. Sir, you, Mr. Ferguson. I had no choice, Horton. It was your life or mine. You, uh... That was a foolish thing, Charles. Isn't one murderer now for tonight? What did you want me to do, Mario? Let him go to the police and have them find out that you're still alive? What difference does it make? They'll probably find out about me anyhow. It's a good chance they'd have after the way you botched everything tonight. Why didn't you do what you were told instead of killing my aunt with a knife? The knife wasn't my idea. I had to kill her or she would have killed me. I wish she had. 
would have fitted my plans better. You and your plans, making out a false certificate of my death, burying an empty casket, and hiding me away for a year, all so I could scare your aunt to death. Ah, oh, what a plan. It would have worked if you had followed orders. I did as you ordered, but it did not work. The shock of seeing me wasn't enough for her. Her heart was a lot stronger than you thought it was. Well, then why don't you leave? Instead of stabbing her. Why? Because it was such a wonderful opportunity. I waited over a year for tonight. I waited long enough for my revenge. So now you may have to pay for your revenge. Then I will pay for it. It will be well worth the price. Well, not to me it won't. I wanted her out of the way. To inherit a fortune. Not to go to the chair for it. <laughs> that is your problem. After all, Charles, I am officially dead, you know. Shut up, will you? Horton could have been my alibi. If you hadn't gotten blood on your hands and made him suspicious. Then why did you bring him back here? You know something had gone wrong. He found your ring. I had to prove that you were still in your grave, didn't I? All right. What are we going to do with his body? I was just thinking about that. And? Maybe I can save us yet. We'll put his fingerprints on that knife. And we'll make it look as if he had a fight with my aunt. Ah, uh, it might work. It's the only thing we can do. I'll say there was an argument between them. And in the struggle, my aunt was stabbed and Horton was shot. What about this tomb? We close it up tight till the investigation's over. There's no reason for them to suspect that you're still alive. <laughs> Yes, Lieutenant, the bodies were just where you found them. Uh, you didn't touch a thing, Mr. Ferguson. No, not a thing. My aunt was there on the floor near the bed, and Horton was only a few feet away. Uh, tell me, Mr. Ferguson, where were you when you heard the first shot fired? Downstairs in the library. Mm -hmm. And you couldn't hear anything of the argument that went before it? Didn't hear a thing. That's why I'm not sure they were arguing. Uh, all right. Well, I won't take up any more of your time tonight. Uh, I'll be back in the morning. Oh, very well, Lieutenant. Uh, uh, by the way, this window here faces the hillside cemetery, doesn't it? Yes. Uh, did you happen to notice anything strange going on out there about the time your aunt was killed? No. I told you I was in the library. Oh, well, yes, yeah, so you did. Uh, why do you uh, happen to mention the cemetery, Lieutenant? Oh, it probably has nothing to do with this case, but I had a call about an hour ago from a woman who said she saw a light out there. A uh, light? Yeah. yeah. Oh. Probably just a crank call. The woman insisted she saw two men coming out of a tomb. The one on the top of the hill shaped like a mosque. The tomb they buried that queer duck in. His name was uh, Mario uh, Bellini. Mario Bellini. Oh, yes. Uh, I guess I'll have to investigate it sometime tomorrow after I make my report on this case. It's a trouble with being a cop. You get a hundred crazy calls like that a year. Now they're bum steers, but you got to see them through anyway. Yes. It must be quite a nuisance. Yeah, sure is. Well, good night, Mr. Ferguson. Good night, Inspector. Charles. Charles. What do you want, Mario? Is it all right to come in now? Give him a chance to get out of the house. He won't come back anymore. All right, all right. Come in. I heard what he said, Charles. Well, what about it? If the lieutenant goes to that tomb tomorrow, there will be trouble. Why do you say that? Are you crazy? That stone door to the crypt is chipped. The bolt has been broken. And there may be blood stains on the floor. Well, what if there are? There's no connection between me and Mario Bellini. Isn't there? What about the false death certificate? Don't you think they can eventually trace that back to you? Oh, I don't know. Well, I'm not going to wait to find out. I'm taking the first train out of here. And you had better do the same. Run away? What good would it do me without the inheritance? Where can I go? How can I live? That is your problem, not mine. I am dead, remember? No matter what happens now, I will be in the clear. Oh, that's right. If you go, you'll be in the clear. And if you stay, then I'll be in the clear. Uh, what do you mean? There's only one flaw in my story, Mario. The false death certificate. But uh, that uh, certificate doesn't have to be false. What? It doesn't really have to be false at all. If you're dead when they open that casket tomorrow, 
And my hands will be clean. Charles. Yes, that's the only way out. No, Charles, stay where you no, are. I can't let you live. You've got to die. No, Charles, wait. No, you've got to die, Melanie. I can live. Uh, Killing you is the only solution. <laughs> What a shame, Mario, that you can't help me lift this door. Even with an iron lever, it's too much for one man to open all the way. Ah, ah now it's coming. It's a little far, but I can prop it up enough for me to slide in. Not that. Now, now I can slide through. If I do it ever so carefully. No, it's your turn, Bellini. I just pull you through the opening. Now I can carry you the rest of the way down. What the deuce is caught on the top of that door? My hand, Charles. Bellini. My, my hand is on the door, Charles. It's not you talking. It's just my mind. It's just my nose. You're dead. Am I? You're dead. You're dead. I killed you. In my own hand. You're dead. Your hand on that door is just a reflex. I'll get it loose. I'll get it loose even if I have to. Good heavens, the stone door. It cries. It slams shut. Now, now we are alone, Charles. You are trapped with me in my tomb. You're dead. You can't talk. You're dead. You're dead. I'm, you. not, I'm not quite dead yet. You did not do your job well. I've got to get out of here. There's not enough air. You you can get out, Charles. Just push off the door. Oh, the door? Yes. yes. Is it too heavy? Yeah. Of course. It's much too heavy for one man. But uh, two men could... Uh... Oh, yes. Yes, two men could do it. Help me, help me, help me. Two men could push open this door. Yes. Two normal men could. Yeah. But uh, I am half dead. I have no strength. Remember, you choked the strength out of me. Help! Help! I'm dying here. Somebody help me! <laughs> Shouting yes. won't do you any good. No one can hear you through the stone. But you... you will have to stay here with me until they find your body. No, I can't. I won't. I don't want to die. Oh, don't be such a coward, Charles. <laughs> Death is not so bad. <laughs> you will see. <laughs> and after all, we do have an elegant tomb in which to rest... In peace. <laughs> That's what we mean when we say the guy died laughing. No sense of humor, that Mario Bellini just couldn't take a choke. <laughs> Oh, well, I'll have to get along. Now, Bellini and I have a date with a couple of ghoulish girls. We're going out tonight to paint the town black. Oh, you didn't know that Bellini and I were pals? Why, of course. I've known that stiff ever since he stood knee-high to a grave hopper. <laughs> Good night. Pleasant dreams. Inner Sanctum was heard in the United States over CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System, and has been rebroadcast for service men and women overseas. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education.
on Inner Sanctum Mystery. Brought to you by the makers of Carter's Pills. Good evening, friends. Let me welcome you once more to the Inner Sanctum. This is Raymond, your host. Come in, won't you, and sit down? No, no, I'm not being polite. I'd prefer you to sit, you see. Because within the next five minutes, you're going to be so weak in the knees that you won't be able to stand. <laughs> Inner Sanctum Mysteries again has the pleasure of bringing you the famous star of radio, screen, and stage, now featured in the current Broadway success, Arsenic and Old Lace, Boris Karloff. This evening, Mr. Karloff appears in Robert Newman's dramatization of Edgar Allan Poe's famous story, The Telltale Heart. Presented for your entertainment by the makers of Carter's Little Liver Pill, the best friend to your sunny disposition. And now our story. A story based on a tale by the greatest master of the macabre that ever lived. Edgar Allan Poe. The story of a man who could hear not only every sound on earth, but uh, even things that don't exist. So, turn down the light, call in a friend or neighbor to keep you company, and listen to Boris Karloff as Simon in a telltale heart. It's early evening. The sun is just setting behind a range of low hills. On top of the nearest hill is a huge rambling building surrounded by park-like grounds. A road winds from its gates down to the little village below. Down this road comes a man. He's tall, gaunt, his hair snow white. He's so busy with his thoughts that he doesn't see the small dark man who sits by the roadside. But just as he is about to pass him... Good evening. Huh? Oh, why, good evening. Nice evening, isn't it? Nice? Why, it's the most wonderful, perfect evening. I'll ever know this side of heaven. You don't say. And you can't know what it's like to feel as if you've just risen from the dead. As if your tomb was open. And you were told that you could return to the world that you knew and loved. Can't I? You can't. You see... My name is Simon. I was a musician. Two years ago, I went stone deaf. Suddenly. Completely. Do you know what deafness means to a musician? It's like dying. Or worse. Like dying and knowing that you're dead. Oh, I went to doctors, but they could do nothing for me. And, but finally... One of them sent me to see the doctor who has the place up on the hill here. Dr. Adair? Yes, Dr. Adair. He kept me with him for six months, and now... Now I'm going home again. He cured you? You can hear? Hear? Listen. Listen hard, and tell me what you can hear right now. Nothing very much. The wind? Cricket? <laughs> Cricket. And the wind. Do you know what I can hear? I can hear the grass growing. The sap rising in the trees. I can hear the stars moving in their courses. I can hear things that no man ever heard before. Now do you know why I said that this was the most wonderful evening that ever was? Yes, Simon. But I knew why before. You see, I just left the place up on the hill myself. You left there? You mean... When I was taken there, I was blind. Oh, your eyes, yes. I, I hadn't noticed before, but they are strange. Shall we walk on together? Simon? Uh, just where did you plan to go? Well, I've been thinking about that for weeks now. All the weeks when I couldn't leave my room... I must get used to being able to hear again, gradually. From my window, I could see an old mill, just this side of the village. Yes, it's, it's deep in the woods, deserted. There's moss on the water wheel. 
and the door hangs open by one hinge. You mean that that you can see it from here? My eyes have become as good as your hearing. You thought of going there, living there? For a while, until I was ready to return to the world. Oliver, why don't you come with me? Then when we are both ready, we can go back together to the world. Yeah. I could do that. Think of what it's going to mean, how much we're going to be able to help people. You with your sight and I with my hearing. Help them? <laughs> yes. Yes, of course. All right, Simon. We'll go to your old mill. This way, Oliver. Up this path. What is it? What is it? Someone's coming. The farmer, he, he seems to be looking for something. Good evening. I'm looking for my cow. Have you seen her? Well, what kind of a cow is she? A brown and a white one with a crooked horn. Wait. I hear her. She's grazing in a field on the other side of the woods. Hear her? That's almost a mile from here. I have good ears. Good. You must have ears like a fox. But that field, that's the squire's. How did she get there? You think someone took her? Who would? Well, it's the squire's land, but he's the richest man around here. Why should he have taken my cow? Wait a minute. Ah, let me see. Yes. Yes, I do see someone with your cow. He's just leaving her. You, you can see that? Right through the woods? I have good eyes. Who is it? What's he like? Is he tall, wearing a brown jacket? Yes. I knew it. It's the squire. He's trying to steal my cow. I'd better go get her. Thank you very much. Perhaps I'll see you both again. Perhaps. We'll both be staying around here for a while there in the old mill. Why did you tell him that, Oliver? Did you really see the squire taking his cow? I saw what he wanted me to see. What do you mean? He hates the squire because the squire's rich and he's poor. But, but what? Never mind, Simon. Shall we go on to the mill? Here we are. And it's just the way I knew it would be. Quiet, peaceful, no noises, just sound. And even those are dulled by the waterfall. Yes, it's just the way I knew it would be, too. Dark, dank. The home of the rats and spiders. We'll be happy living here with them. Happy with rats and spiders? Why? Because they're like me. Rats see in the dark. And spiders spin webs. I don't understand you, Oliver. Must you always see the worst, the most evil side of everything? Always. But why? Don't you love people? Don't you think that this is a good world? A good world when I was blind for more than two years? But whose fault was that? What difference does that make? I was blind. And did anyone care that I was? No. Love people? I hate them. But Oliver, that's wrong. You've no right to hate anyone or anything. What's that? What? It sounds like wings, like... Yes, there it is, there. A swallow. Why, it's frightened, trying to get out. Why, it's beating itself against the wall and... Oh, poor thing, it's it hurt itself. Fallen to the ground. I'd better catch it. Is it badly hurt? No, I, I don't think so. Oh, just this one wing. Here, let's see. Perhaps we can uh, put a splint on it, heal it. Do you think so? Here. Here, Oliver. But be gentle. It's still terribly frightened. I will. I will. Oh, Oliver! What are you doing to doing, the bird? Doing blood, you... Why, you crushed the swallow. Killed it. I so I have. You... You killed it deliberately. You think so? I told you we all have some badness deep inside us. Even you. Here you are ready to believe the worst of me. That I'd wantonly crush her. A harmless little sparrow to death and... Simon. What is it? I... I don't know, but there's something in your face. 
something that wasn't there before. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm going up to bed. Simon! Simon, wait! It wasn't he that was blind. It was I, I. Well, he is bad, evil, clean through. He's like one of the spiders he loved so much, lurking here and spinning cunning webs to catch innocent people in. And what he saw in my face just now, there was something there. Something that wasn't there before. Death. Why did this have to happen to me? I was so happy just a little while ago. I loved everyone, the whole world. And now... Now I have to kill him. And here I am, friend. Raymond, your host in the inner sanctum. Who also loves everyone. So, Simon has decided he must murder his companion. Not because he wants to, but in order to keep him from spreading the hate and evil he seems to love. <laughs> That's a charming idea. But, if Oliver's eyes are as good as he says they are, good enough to see death in Simon's face, how will he be able to do it, hmm? Quite a problem, isn't it? Well, Raymond, everyone has problems. It's the answer that counts. It certainly does, Mr. Hurley, in a mystery drama. Yes, and in a domestic drama, too. If you don't believe it, listen to what Agnes Vale says to her husband at the dinner table. Oh, Bob, you haven't said a word about the cake, and I baked it especially for your birthday. After 30, no one wants to be reminded of birthdays. Oh, that's silly. Besides, a person's only as old as they feel. Well, if that was the case, I'd be about 60. You mean 90. No one could save up the grouch you've gotten only 60 years. If you felt as irritable, low, and out of sorts as I have lately, you'd be grouchy, too. Of course I would. Anybody would. So the thing to do is not to feel that way. What can anyone do about it? Very simple, my dear. Try Carter's Little Liver Pills. Right. And when you don't feel good, try Carter's Little Liver Pills. They do the work of calomel but have no calomel in them. For they are simple pills made of vegetable drugs. They wake up the flow of one of our most vital digestive juices. When this vital juice flows at the rate of two pints a day, it helps to digest our food and bring back the glorious feeling that goes with regularity. Then most folks feel like happy days are here again. But be sure you get the genuine Carter's Little Liver Pill. Well, friends, are you sorry I advised you to sit down before? No, I thought not. You still want me to go on with the story of the telltale heart? Very well. It's a little later that same evening, and Simon is sitting in the upper story of the old deserted mill, waiting, listening. Sleep, Oliver, sleep. Aren't you ever going to sleep? Oh, I know you're lying down. I heard you getting undressed. I even heard the thread snap when you pull that button off your shirt. But you're not asleep yet. I can tell by your breathing, the way your heart's beating. And that's what I must wait for. The time when you're really asleep. When you close those hawk eyes that can see even in the dark. That could read murder in my face when I didn't know it was there myself. Wait a minute. There. Now you're asleep. And now, I must go. Easy with the jaw. Careful. And even more careful going down the stairs. Shh. Don't creak like that. Suppose he wakes. No, he can't. He won't wake up. He can't. And, and even if he does. Uh, here we are. Door to his room. How shall I do it? Those sacks he's using as a pillow. Shall I pull them out and held them over his face and smothered him? That's it, yes. And then I wouldn't have to touch him. I wouldn't. Who's there? Who's there? There is someone there. I can see you. It's Simon. Yes, it's Simon. What do you want? What are you doing here? I know you've come to kill me. Yes, Oliver. I've come to kill you. Philip, 
You can't do that. You can't. You can't. Yes, Olive, I can. And I have to. Oh, please don't struggle like that. I'm stronger than you are. You can't get away from me. You can't. You can't. That noise. Hear it? It's your heart. Beating, pounding, driving the blood through your veins. Beating more slowly now. Slower and fainter. Running down like a tired clock. And I'm not going to let you go until it's stopped. So don't struggle. Don't struggle, please. Just a few seconds more. Uh, I can hardly hear it now. Just a faint, throbbing murmur. And now, even that's gone. Yes, it's it stopped. And you're dead. Oliver, listen. I didn't want to do it. I didn't, but I had to. You were only interested in hurting people. That's why I had to do it. And that's why I'm not going to give myself up or confess that I killed you. Because I can still help people. You understand, don't you? That's why I must get rid of your body. Hide it somewhere. Oh, what am I to do with you? I know. I'll keep you here. Tear up the floor and hide you underneath it. Yeah. Let's see now. This, this crowbar. Oh, and this one here. There. That should be big enough. And now, in you go. Goodbye, Oliver. Goodbye. I'll put these boards back. Nail them down again with the same rusty nails. And, and it's done. Now I'll spread this dust over the cracks. No one will be able to tell what I've done. No, not even with your eyes. If you could still use them. What's that? A light. A lantern outside. Someone at the door. Maybe Crystal's come back again. Yes? Who is it? It's Trent. The constable. The constable? What, what do you want? Oh, nothing much. Thought I'd drop in. Say hello. Come in, constable. Come right in. Thanks. Great time of night to be visiting, but I heard there were strangers living out here, and I thought I might... Why, of course, it's part of your job to investigate strangers, isn't uh-huh. it? Yeah, in a way. Not that you're a stranger, exactly. What do you mean? You've been around here for some time, haven't you? Up at Dr. Dare's place in the hill, I mean? Oh, yes, yes, of course. I, I just left there this afternoon. Uh-huh. And your friend, where is she? Sleeping? Friend? Why, there's no one here with me. I'm all alone. Look at that, dear said. You mind if I look around? No, of course not. Not that I doubt your word or anything like that. Oh, no, but... don't apologize, Constable. Go right ahead. <laughs> Well, Constable? There's certainly no sign of anyone else. Well, I told you so. Yes, you did. Now, I'll just sit down here for a minute. My pipe's going. No, no, not there. Don't sit there. Oh, yeah. Because, uh... <laughs> well, it, it was just that the floor looked a little rotten right there, and, and I was afraid that... Oh, I, I guess it's all right. Sure. Strong enough to hold me, anyway. <laughs> Don't stop me if I you. Good heavens. What's that? What's what? That. That sobbing. That noise. Beating away like. I don't hear any noise. But you must, you. Ah. Those ears of mine. Sometimes they're too good. It's, it's just your watch ticking. Watch? I haven't got a watch on me. You. You haven't? But then what? Oh, oh look, Constable, I, I could use a bit of exercise. Suppose I walk you back to the village. Well, that's mighty nice of you. I'm glad to have your company. But is 
no hurry, is there? Just let's sit there for a while. And... I don't want to sit. Constable, will you come now? Now, this minute, if you don't, I'll have... I don't know what I'll do. Hey, you have gotten yourself into a state. Is there anything the matter? Oh, no, no, of course not. It's... Oh, it's just that I get nervous, restless, and... You won't mind if I... If I walk up and down right here, will you? If it'll make you feel any better, go ahead. Thank you. This floor, it... Uh, it is noisy, isn't it? It's noisy enough. Constable, this... This lever here, I, I've been wondering about it. What's it for, do you know? Oh, yes. I think it opens the sluice. Starts the mill wheel turning. It does, then... Then let's try it. See if it still works. There. Yeah. Still works all right. It's quite a racket, too. It's not loud enough. Still. Constable, by heaven's sake, will you come now and leave here with me? If you don't, I'll go back. Look, look, look. There's no need to get so excited. I see if I'm not excited. I'm perfectly calm and quiet. Will you come now, right away? But I told you. I know what you're doing. Sitting there, pretending you haven't heard. Making me stay here and listen to it. Beating louder and louder and louder. All right. I confess. I killed him. I killed him. His body is right underneath you under the floor. I killed him. And that noise you hear is his heart. The beating of his telltale heart. Hello, Dr. Adair. Oh, Constable, hello. Well, did you find them? Yes, Doctor. I'm good eyed. Some of my boys will be bringing the other one, Oliver, along in a little while. Bringing him? Is it matter with him? Well, sort of. They were in the old mill by the river. Simon had evidently tried to kill Oliver, but he hadn't done a good job of it. He nailed him up underneath the floor... And uh, when we got him out, he was unconscious. He's still pretty weak. I see. Uh, bring Simon in, will you? Sure. All right, Simon. In here. Yes, Constable. Now, uh, turn him around so that he's facing me. That's it. Well, hello, Simon. Hello, Doctor. Simon, why did you run away from here this afternoon? Run away? I didn't run away. I left. What need was there for me to stay when I was cured? Oh. And uh, what you did, or uh, rather tried to do, to Oliver? Ah, uh, that was wrong. I know it was wrong, but but I had to do it. He was bad, Doctor, bad. He hated everyone, wanted to hurt them. And I couldn't let him. You know, it's strange, Constable. Two men, both mental cases because of a sudden affliction. But while Oliver's blindness made him hate, Simon's deafness filled him with love for all mankind. Deafness? You mean he's deaf? But, but, but when you talk to him, he answers you. Yes, he reads lips. That's why I had you turn him around, so he was facing me. But he's stone deaf. He will never hear again. What's that you'll say? Deaf? But I'm not deaf. Why, there's no one can hear better than I. No one. I heard everything when I left here. Things no man has ever heard before. The song of the swan. The breathing of the fish. Why, I even heard the beating of Oliver's heart. After I'd killed him. Yes, Simon, of course. I'm not deaf, I tell you. I'm not. I'm not. So, Simon did hear all the things he said he did. Even the beating of the telltale heart. And not with his ears, but with something else deep inside his poor, sick brain. Uh, speaking of telltale hearts, oh, I'm sorry, it's not a heart at all. It's just Mr. Hurley. He's knees knocking together. And if you think you're kidding, Raymond, you're crazy. Oh, I'm not kidding, Ed. And Mr. Carlos's audiences, that's the equivalent of applause. 
since everyone's generally much too scared to show the usual approval with their hands. So we won't take any chances. We'll just use words and say, thanks, Boris Carla, for your splendid performance of tonight's dramatization of Poe's The Telltale Heart. It was a pleasure, Raymond, to be able to bring our friends one of the world's most famous stories. And I'm very grateful to Everett Sloan as Oliver. This is Raymond again, your host, getting ready to close that door to the inner sanctum and say goodnight until the same time next week. Uh, in the meantime, if you care to do a little bloodthirsty reading, try this month's inner sanctum novel, I'll Eat You Last, by H.C. Brandon. Uh, in case you've already read that, why not try some of the other stories by the author of tonight's mystery drama, Edgar Allan Poe. According to all critics, this writer has quite a future. Oh, good night. Pleasant dreams, huh? Peter's Sanctum Mysteries will be on the air again next Sunday night, same station, same time, with another chiller for thriller fans. So be with us then. This is Ed Hurley, speaking for the makers of Carter's Little Liver Pills and reminding you, when you don't feel good, try Carter's Little Liver Pills, the best friend to your sunny disposition. This is the Blue Network of the National Broadcasting Company. <laughs>